<laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm gonna start streaming. Uh, okay, yeah. it is six o'clock p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, so it's nine o'clock p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time. We're gonna go over to studio now, see if we're connecting. I'm gonna let these gentlemen kind of talk for a bit while I uh, just uh, catch my breath. Just sat down and. Um, of course, just quickly reviewed some messages before I uh, got on board, so to speak. And we seem to be connected to the stream. If anyone is out there, let us know if you hear us. And uh, the usual admonition before I forget about um, upvotes, but uh, before I forget, I, I want to congratulate again people who have contributed or else I'd be in a far worse situation than I am from before. We had no contributions from the last episode, so this is an emergency fundraiser. Uh, we are facing um, rent, of course, so I need $300 towards rent, and I need another $100 for after rent is paid to last the 72 hours, the three days before my check deposits. Um, so uh, realistically, I need $400 just so I can do the supply runs in between time. Plus we need to buffer myself for the fact that the affordable connectivity program, which provides me internet at a discount, um, may very well come to an end. If so, I have to buffer for the expense of covering that bill. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go over to re remind myself of that one individual who contributed 100 United States dollars uh, on the first of the month, uh, this incredible person, and make certain to uh, to give them credit again. Um, we're gonna try and raise at the absolute minimum $100 an episode for the next three episodes uh, so that I can pay uh, rent at the beginning of uh, the month, which is April 1st. It's due on the 1st. So uh, let me log into my PayPal account here. And uh, again, allowing everybody to know that this is an emergency. As for the image in thumbnail of live stream, people are already asking me about that. That was, of course, in communion with my mother on her death day. Uh, my father's death day is coming up. And uh, so, uh, again, white is the color of death in Asia. And uh, I was in um, uh, the floral room of the estate, one of the estates. Of course, there are several estates, and some of them have larger conservatories than others. Uh, and it was, again, from Edmund Kuntz. Edmund Kuntz, on the first of the month, contributed 100 United States dollars uh, from my own golden state of California. I would say that was one of the most decisive uh, contributions that uh, kept me off the streets uh, towards the end of this month, towards the beginning of next month. Uh, all of this is uh, calculated on the basis of uh, what goes into rent at, on the first of each month, of course. And um, we already have a number of people with us. T Tank Berry says we're loud and clear. Um, good evening from uh, Tahama County, California. T Tank Berry, of course, is someone who's contributed above and beyond the call of duty. He contributed 100 United States dollars through the door slot this month, another factor in keeping me from homelessness. And he contributed two uh, heated uh, mattress pads, which um, V turned in for a $175 gift card uh, for Target, which she will give to me uh, very soon. So, um, and I will use that. Um, I found out from Peter Moon, Aristides, Nemo, Albano, everybody's pitched together to uh, identify at least three targets in San Francisco. So th there's three targets in San Francisco, uh, which I never knew, but then again, I was never looking for them. I never saw them because I was never on the lookout for them. But beyond that, I probably just was never literally near them <laughs> so it's a big city yeah it, it well it, it's 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 comparatively small but it's extremely congested yes and um it's a big city yeah anyway yeah it is it is big it is big yeah tad rickett says loud and clear love and respect eric cradle says hey doug you sound great thank you so much eric tad rickett says hope the electric blankets are pumping out the warmth i have a frankensteinian assembly of two electric blankets that are half working one is working on one side one is working on the other and they're piled one on top of the other um v has two fully functional brookstone electric blankets that were an adventure for her to get 
<laughs> and uh, she felt it would take weeks because that's what she was told by the dealers because Brookstone apparently is turned out every other... I have no idea. It's like, it's top of the line and therefore the hardest blanket to find. Um, uh, Six Sad World says loud and clear, triple D. Uh, Tad Rickett says uh, T Tank Berry, love and respect. And uh, um, so my thanks to everyone, everyone. Uh, just to give people an example of uh, kind of the uh, cuteness involved with uh, V uh, when, when it comes to the electric blankets. <sighs> Let me see now. Uh, she wrote something about getting them. Of course, she was told by the dealers that it would take weeks, uh, but she wound up getting both of them and apparently was just um, overwhelmed uh, by the size of... She got one that was king-sized and one that was queen-sized, and the king-sized one was just, uh, um, like, um, enormous. Apparently, it's like an electric uh, tent or something. <laughs> so uh, she said the box was so large, she had to drive it down to the recycling center to get it out of the house. It couldn't fit in the car. So that's that's funny. So I guess, I guess that's enough to share. But the cuteness lies, and of course, she misspells everything. She she's she's never learned to spell so she writes the electric blanket is hug and it's spelled h-u-g-h -H, um so that's that's adorable um so all of that aside uh it, people have gone out of their way to help of course uh and naturally those electric blankets at her home are not going to do me any good until she and i rendezvous uh we've set up a rendezvous day and uh there's other dates that have been set up um a lot going on so, uh, and these dates involve other people, of course, that I have to rendezvous with. I also have to take care of a number of responsibilities. Tomorrow, for instance, I have a telephonic appointment. So uh, that's at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, Tuesday. Tuesday, might as well be tomorrow. To me, it'll feel like tomorrow because by the time the show is over, it will be tomorrow. Uh, T-Tech Barry says, God bless you all. Anthony McGuire says, sad to see you in this situation. Don't worry, everything will turn to your way soon. And you are doing a great job. Respect from Ireland. Uh, God is bless you, Anthony McGuire. Thank you so very much. Uh, definitively appreciate your letting us know where you're calling from. I'm glad you can hear us over there in Ireland. Uh, of course, uh, my late and sainted uh, legal sire, whose uh, death day is coming up on Tuesday, uh, will be, uh, of course, I'll be paying him the same respects I paid my late and sainted Cyrus, uh, my mother. Um, he, of course, had uh, great connections with Ireland, being, of course, at least a quarter Irish. And uh, with that, uh, let me see if I can remember anything else to bring up to people. I do want people to understand this month. This is a rental fundraiser. Uh, but, of course, uh, I want everyone to know I'm totally aware of what's going on in the world. Obviously, while taking care of my responsibilities at the estate with the Blood Boys and the like, um, we will get onto topical subjects, uh, obviously, over the weekend that was. Uh, we have, as a result, flags that are flying at, has, at half staff in the Russian Empire, observing a day of national mourning for the 133 people who were mass murdered in the assault on a concert hall near Moscow. The attack was the deadliest inside the Russian Empire for more than two decades, and nearly a dozen people have been detained. We can only pity their fates. Uh, now, this side of the Atlantic, the American election impacts personal life at every level. Not only the presidential race, but the contest for control of Congress. The Republicans are within a whisker of losing control of the House of Representatives, just as Democrats may be forced to give up their grip on the Senate. And after November, both chambers could see a change of control. The reason that this matters is because the Affordable Connectivity Program may uh, lapse in that interim, in that interim, that, uh, that period, because millions of Americans are now on the precipice of losing home internet access if those lawmakers do not act now. So by as soon as May, more than 23 million United States households, including my own, risk being kicked off their internet plans or face skyrocketing bills that force us to pay hundreds of United States dollars more per year simply to get online. Uh, this is, of course, testified by the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. 
And this crisis is linked to a critical government program expected to run out of funding at the end of April. This is known as the ACP, the Affordable Connectivity Program, which is the only way I am reaching you now. Uh, the, uh, yeah. Yes? How, like, let's just hypothetically say it's going to be cut off. Yeah. How would this affect the elections? Oh, well, it would be profound. It would be, you would think they wouldn't allow it for that very reason. Exactly. But, but how, how, I mean, just play out how it might affect the elections. We could only speculate, but I would say that if the impoverished cannot vote, uh, that would impact both politicians profoundly. They both have a lot of poor people that would otherwise be voting for them. And they won't be able to gain access at, uh, uh, of, of information. And uh, they would also, therefore, be deprived of what in England is considered as, as much of a necessity as air and water. Uh, believe me, you're, you're, yeah. No, it's just, it's, just, it's just an interesting, I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff going on in the world right now. It, there yeah. is. There is. I mean, just to finish the thought. Uh, so, carry on. Carry yeah, on. just to finish the thought so that people understand the gravity of the situation. Uh, this is the ACP, uh, the Affordable Connectivity Program. It's a benefit that provides discounts on Internet service valued at up to 30 United States dollars per month to qualifying low income households, including mine, or up to 75 United States dollars per month for eligible recipients on tribal lands, which I am not a part of. Uh, the lawmakers have known for months about the approaching deadline, and yet Congress is nowhere close to approving the six billion United States dollars, which is peanuts in budgetary terms, that President Joe Biden says would renew the ACP and avert nothing less than calamity for tens of millions of Americans. I mean, without this aid, low-income Americans uh, like myself will be priced out of home internet service, period. The prospect of losing a critical lifeline to the modern economy has put uh, ACP subscribers on edge. Uh, many have told the Fourth Estate that they are irate at Congress for letting them down and through inaction, taking away a basic essential utility. So that's the seriousness of the situation. Aside from that, we will reflect on later in the program the fact that today is the international, well, tomorrow, but we'll be uh, tra hosting transmission into tomorrow, the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. This is a United Nations holiday, and uh, it's an international day of remembrance. So we will go into just the uh, history of that uh, briefly. Uh, but uh, obviously, in this opening hour, before we turn to Peter, uh, I do want to thank our man, uh, uh, Aristides, for sending me uh, a, a link. Uh, and here's what I recommend, Aristides. Uh, just do me a favor, aside from, of course, coming on to tell everyone about how to help with the upvotes. Uh, also, feel free to, uh, exactly like you said to me, I, I never wanted to go back, uh, but I did go back, and here's the link. Yeah, yeah, just exactly like you said in that email, just put that as a comment underneath that episode with the link and uh, with the timestamp, with the timestamp. And yeah, that, yeah. That, will, that will give everybody easy access to that because that's, of course, uh, hardly a highlight, but it's certainly a morbid attraction to the episode. And that, that way yeah. people will have context for everything that's been going on lately. So uh, y y that being said, uh, by all means, tell everyone about how they can help with the upvotes, dear Aristides. Thank you. Okay, uh, I can do that. And yes, um, I will say it is a useful tool. If you're in any YouTube, uh, you can uh, right click on the video and it will say, uh, give you an option to um, to create a link at that timestamp that you can send to someone. So if you want to direct someone to a certain point in any uh, YouTube, you can do that. And it's very useful. Um, which I did, and I'll do that. Uh, as far as the uh, upvotes, uh, as far as I understand it, you have to be logged into YouTube, uh, which is uh, free and easy. It's been a while since I created an account. But once you do create an account, you can upvote. 
and you can create other sub channels to your main account without an additional password or login. Um, they're just uh, different personalities you can use, so you can have multiple, uh, uh, you know, personality in a good way, and you can upvote with those as well. So I've already put two upvotes from one single computer uh, using that. You can go into your uh, account settings, switch account, and it gives you an option to create a, uh, a channel in there. Excellent. And um, uh, before I turn back to the chat room and then to Peter, uh, I, uh, I, I do want to say something about the other um, links you provided, uh, this Rabbi Shmuley or Shmuley. Oh, my God. Um, uh, yes, there's... there's uh, that there's enough ugliness in the world. I don't need to be exposed to that. There are people, obviously, who revel uh, uh, in ugliness, and he is obviously trying to accentuate uh, ugliness as as a thing, as a statement. And um, yeah, it, it's it's I I obviously well not obviously, so I'll make it obvious to everyone listening. I I, I don't need to see that. There's people who send me. <laughs> I know it's horrible. I know. Yeah, it's just so, it's funny because he I think he was there's this you know battle with him and Candace Owens, and he was a, he seems to be trying to clown on Candace Owens, but is he really? Cl- Clowning on himself or, or on himself. I mean, it's just like, is this how you, you know, say, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the good guy. Uh, very strange. Very, very odd. Well, it, it, it's yeah. interesting you say that. It seems to be kind of like what Peter Moon was telling us about this, uh, this individual who kept making the sheep jokes. It's like, it's, it's, it's to some people it might be, oh, this is ethnic humor and I've got to, but to other people like myself, it appears like a case of self-loathing. <laughs> it's, uh, there, yeah. yeah, there's a real self-loathing involved with, um, things like this. And, uh, but, um, yeah, it was like Nemo gave me that joke the other day. It's like, uh, these things are out there, but I just don't need to be exposed to them. Uh, the, but, um, all that being said, uh, thank you for, um, uh, otherwise, you know, everything else. And, uh, we're going to, uh, return to the chat room for just a moment. And, uh, uh, Tad Ricketts was saying we only have each other love and respect. And then he, uh, gives a shout out for Ireland. Uh, T Tank Berry says support your local renegade military historian. Anubis Publishing says sounding good. Uh, and, uh, Okay. Uh, Anthony McGuire uh, says, Ireland and America allies forever. Uh, Tad Rickett says, alrighty, 26 watchers, 29 now. Uh, hit the thumbs up and like so we can bring that number up to 50, then 100. Yes. Uh, Tad Rickett says, I saw free Palestine flags on 405 South Freeway today. Excellent. Um, and then Anthony McGuire says, someday Douglas will come to Ire and do a conference. Uh, yeah, we can only hope. Yes, let's let's hope and pray. Tad Rickett says, I lived in Edinburgh, Scotland from 1999 to 2001. Fresh air, biggest potatoes and steaks on earth. Do you know any mayors locally? That's my uh, mother's maiden name. Oh, M-A-H-E-R. Uh, mayor. Uh, interesting. Interesting. I don't know if that's the name of the franchise that I'm more familiar with, like Haley Mayer was a part of because that was spelled differently. Uh, but maybe it started off with that spelling. Or, uh, but, um, uh, of course, we'll see if I look into that, find some time, look into that. Uh, other than that, of course, uh, everybody keep an eye on um, uh, Anubis Publishing. <laughs> that um, we, If I remember correctly, I, that might be, of course, uh, uh, what's his name again? Trampus Nicholson. I, I've already bleached him from my mind. Uh, I received, of course, a communication from someone claiming to be a fan for years and that their mother turned them on to me and that they're, they're looking for books to recommend. Uh, and of course I have to be suspect of everything now. I suspect that is also Trampus Nicholson, uh, simply because it's a, if they've been listening forever, they chose a really suspicious time to suddenly approach me and ask me for a reading list. And if they have been listening forever, they should know I don't have time for that. (laughs) 
<laughs> the only reading I can recommend is the books we write. So if you haven't purchased them, do so. And uh, look forward to the next one uh, that we're about to write. Other than that, of course, I could recommend all kinds of books ad nauseum, ad infinitum, but I don't have time to sit down and uh, present a private reading list to people. Um, so people should respect that. And uh, other than that, of course, if anyone's just willing to uh, drop by moral support. They're more than welcome to. Sheila Gavin says, greetings to all DDD team. Kisses to Douglas. Your image is dreamy and incredibly beautiful. Thank you, honey. Uh, again, uh, a period of uh, communing uh, with my mother. She loved flowers and, of course, the color white for the morning involved. Uh, and uh, with that, let me hand her a kiss. And what I'm going to do is uh by the way drill 801 says full moon tonight thank you drill 801 uh definitely appreciate it and i uh want you to know just how much i appreciate all of you and uh the fact that peter moon and of course aristides are here to join us is profound um i'm because i of course just got down to uh making certain everything was operational uh, before sitting down uh, to transmission, to host transmission. I apologize for the inconvenience, but I'm going to take care of one final uh, chore. I'll be back in a matter of minutes, and I'm going to leave Peter Moon to segue us into uh, the episode. And we'll discuss, of course, when I come back, I'll let everyone know I'm back. Uh, and uh, other than that, Peter, uh, my apologies, but I know you've got this and you always do. Tad Ricketts says, Is the, isn't there a lunar eclipse tonight or tomorrow? I believe so, actually. Yes. Uh, Tad Ricketts says, on the West Coast, USA. Actually, I believe that's the case. And Peter can go into that and the uh, astrological significance of that uh, or whatever he wants to as a start. Uh, but Peter, you can handle it if I'm gone for about 10 minutes or so. I'll be, I'll be back in about 10 yeah. minutes. At yeah. the Okay, so I'll be right back. Uh, going to go mute. Turning it over to Dear Peter Moon. We've got over 30 listeners now, 31 concurrent viewers, which means, of course, orders of magnitude higher when it's published. So uh, my uh, respect to all and especially to Peter Moon. Uh, turning the stage over to him for now. Okay, well, thank you. And I want to remind people to donate to Douglas Dietrich. Go to the upper right-hand corner in uh, douglasdietrich.com, and you can find his uh, yellow button, and you can donate to him there, which is very important, as he was stating. Now, uh, Aristides, I have to call you to task here. Okay. I saw they had uh, the New York Yankees have an exhibition game in Mexico. And they uh -huh. were playing the uh, Diablos Rojos, the Red Devils of Mexico. And the Red Devils had a player named Aristides Aquino. What? Wait, okay. <clears throat> Red, it, what's the team? The uh, Devil? Diablos Rojos. Diablos Rojos. Red Devils of Mexico. Uh huh. Uh, he got, uh, a, got, a, got a base yeah. hit, knocked in a run. He's black. He's, he's black. He's. Uh, uh, he's evidently not related to you or Michael Aquino, but um, probably not. I have, I, 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 as soon as I'm just now putting uh, also the pay, his PayPal link in the chat. Uh, so if you want, you can find it there. And as soon as I do that, I'm going to have to look this up. Yeah. That's the PayPal link for uh, Douglas Dietrich, not Aristides. Yeah. Aquino. Yeah. Yes. For Douglas. Yeah. Yes. Um, no, I bet it was like, I thought that, that was really funny. Uh, because I, I have seen uh, Hispanics use Greek names from time to time. Not a lot, though. Yeah. Um, there, looking, yeah, I'm looking up now. You do see that name. They will pick that up. Uh, of course, we have discussed uh, what is it that African dictator who use that? They use that. They, they use this the, the the slightly different spelling. Than I do. I'm not going to spell my name, but it's spelled slightly differently. Um, but you do see that spelling as well. Phonetically, it's the same. However, yeah, Aquino. That now that is funny. That is funny. Yeah, I I don't know how often. Uh, I mean, I don't know what. I mean, they can use any name that they want. Obviously, anybody can use any name. Is there any particular connection between the Hispanic culture and the Greek culture? I I don't 
think so. It's not like they were colonizers like the Spanish or um uh, although I, 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 there could have been forms of that name that were among the Spanish that maybe they took over there, um, but not specifically probably with the Greek side. Um, let me see. His full name is Aristides Aquino. Uh, Nun, is it Nunez? Nunez? Yes, I don't know. So he has a, yeah, he has a last name. Um, I will. Uh, they have a lot I'll, of names. Uh, the Spanish. Yeah, yeah. It's not just Mexicans. It's Spanish. Although I pointed out to Paul, I was seeing all these names on the Mexican players are very flamboyant in terms of their multiple syllables. I said, that's not quite, it's more that way with the Mexicans than it is with the, uh, the Spanish. Although the Spanish will have, you know, Gonzalez de Garcia de Diego de whatever. You know, I mean, it just goes on and on and on because it's 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 by lineage it's it's by lineage right um right. have you uh been paying attention to the current events a little bit uh yeah i do kind of tune in which um what do you find interesting well douglas will probably we'll, we'll go into it tonight while i'm here but he'll probably go deeper into it when he's doing his monologue uh it was seemed really off the wall for ISIS to be attacking uh, Moscow, because who would benefit from that most? Yeah, yeah. Israel. There's not a, a lot of speculation. I mean, uh, who, you know, and plus, is it, you know, they they seem to be one group, but were they really propped up or funded by this other, you know, by who who's really at the end of the of of the you know the rope there? Um, there's been talk of ISIS, but I mean, you know. Well, ISIS supposedly yeah. claimed responsibility yeah. for it. And uh -huh. if that's true, uh, ISIS is associated, you know, at least publicly with, uh, um, with uh, forces of, of Islam. And for Islam to attack uh, Moscow because it's a Christian mm -hmm nation which it's really well i mean it is to some degree it's titulatory or it's in in title it's it's christian but it, it's like there eh, there's large muslim contingents that surround the area also though so I, i'm not super familiar um there's probably people i could ask but, uh, but right I, I now the islamic world needs to take heat off of itself just for what happened in it doesn't need to be pushing the envelope further yeah. because at what cost it's uh, not that any of this is based on sanity anyway but it's it's just wow well, just to say you know a lot of a lot of people can take credit, you know, for, you know, that doesn't mean they actually did it. That's a, that's a, that's a big opportunity. You know, something big goes down. I, I remember that. I seem to remember that from years ago, some big terrorist attack would happen and, you know, you'd have all these terrorist groups jump up. Yeah. Oh yeah. That was me. That was me. You know, like, was it, I don't know. You know? And um, as far as the ISIS, I'm sure, uh, I guess you guys are going to get into what really is ISIS. Um, I yeah. got a link of video here. It, you know, um, and, and who, re you know, who really created all that. So who, who would it benefit for it to seem like ISIS did it or, you know, or, or, uh, Muslims did it or Arabs did it. I don't, I don't know who the actual gunmen were or what their nationality was. Um, you know, I, I, I saw a lot of things bounced around, you know, it's like, they seem like Turks, but then there were a lot of, there's a lot of other republics around there. Um, might have been from one of them. I'm not sure what kind of uh, nationality they held. Um, I don't know. It's still kind of muddled, it seems. Um, it's it's it, it's very muddled, and and it, and, it, and as soon as things seem to be going one way, it's, it's the last thing I would have suspected is a ISIS attack in Russia of all places. Like yeah, like Russia. <laughs> it's like. I think the last thing Russia would be worried about is an attack from ISIS. 
it's yeah. it's like they've got their hands full with the Ukraine. And who did uh, so? You know, who did Russia issue a statement? Uh, what they believe, who they believe is responsible, or I believe so. Did they want to point the I, finger I at Ukraine? It's just, I don't believe the ISIS story is disputed. Uh, I don't really. I haven't followed it that closely. Um, and Putin finally uh, court charges four men with act of terrorism and no Ukrainian involvement. Uh, three were marched blindfolded into a Moscow court while the fourth was in a wheelchair. The Islamic State group, or IS, said it carried out Friday's outrage. Russian officials have claimed without evidence Ukrainian involvement. Kiev says the claim is absurd. The four were named, they name them, which are uh, hard to pronounce names. Uh, video showed three of them being marched blindfolded. All appeared injured. Uh, they appear to be Islamic. Uh, One was from Tajikistan and admitted his guilt in full. Yeah, that was it. Uh, all four are said to be held in pretrial. Uh, the men were arrested hours after four gunmen night stormed the hall, began firing on 6,000 people. Uh, the roof collapsed. They claimed the attack within hours, stating it was carried out by a branch known as the Islamic State as in Khorasan or ISK. It later released graphic footage of the attackers firing on the crowd inside the concert hall. No Russian official has acknowledged the claim, instead suggesting that the attackers were being held by Ukraine, helped by Ukraine and were in the Bayansk region preparing to cross the border at the time of their arrest. Uh, Ukrainian president calls it absurd. Seven other people have been arrested in aiding the attack. Russia is in the crosshairs. The U.S. warned Moscow earlier this month of a possible attack, then issued a public advisory to citizens in the country. Uh, it was dismissed as propaganda by the Kremlin and in an attempt to meddle its presidential election. Washington said that the attack that it had no reason to doubt the IS claim. It would not be the first time IS and its allies have attacked Russia or its interests. The group claimed the bombing of a Russian plane over Egypt in 2015. Uh, it also claimed a 2017 bomb attack on St. Petersburg Metro. Security analysts said the group considers Russia a primary target for a slew of reasons, including the country's role in destroying IS's power base in Syria, while securing President Bashar al-Assad's rule. Moscow's two brutal wars in Muslim-majority Chechnya in 1994-2009 and the Soviet area invasion of Afghanistan. ISK cheaply operates in Afghanistan and parts of Central Asia, and its name is based on an old term for the region. It is among the most able and active of the IS offshoots and was responsible for deadly suicide attacks at Kabul airport during the chaotic American withdrawal of August and September 2021. The offshoot frequently criticizes Vladimir Putin and its propaganda. Well, if we take this at face value, uh, the Muslims hate the Russians and they hate the Russians just like they hate uh, Israel and the United States, which is, Russia is traditionally been a supporter of Arabs, or at least trying to be on their good side. But it just shows, as they say, if you take it at face value, the world is a lot crazier and un more unstable than we might give it credit for, uh, and that not everything is all planned.
Douglas yeah. will probably have a lot more insight into yeah. this. What were you going to say? It's very, I mean, the, you know, the politics over there are very, I, I assume are very complicated in, in Asia and uh, we're getting into Asia, you know, it's kind of on the borderline. We're more used to thinking about Europe and maybe the Middle East, but it, and there's a lot going on over there that we surely don't completely understand. Well, in the, in, in the Middle East, many of the countries are tribal. They're all by tribal leaders. Uh, the Arab countries in, uh, and many of those old Russian Soviet satellite states are Islamic. Yeah, yeah, and that's true. To the degree they're not controlled by family tribes, they're controlled by, the Islamic states are controlled by mullahs, uh, the wise men of the Islamic faith, the, the clerics of the Islamic faith, which, uh, you know, can have all sorts of, I guess it's just a very different lifestyle. And yeah. we don't think of Russia as being Western, but it is comparatively a Western country in comparison yeah. to uh, some of these other places. It's, yeah, kind of borderlines, kind of got a foot in each, uh, you know, hemisphere, so to speak. Take it back to the first uh, Gulf War. What Preston Nichols always said, he says that the, the one thorn in the side of the American hegemony is that they couldn't control the Arab culture. Yeah. It was a big problem because it was just uncontrollable. And I've always thought that the biggest control authority in that culture is Great Britain. And many people of those cultures would agree. People who live in those cultures. Iran, particularly. Because of just yeah. incredible influence in the Ottoman Empire of dividing up those countries. They, you know, they put those countries on the map. Great Britain did uh, as a result of World War I, which also you know, uh, set up Palestine to be Palestine so that it could eventually become a, a Jewish state. In fact, uh, there's every reason to view the British Empire as being completely aligned with the Edomite Empire. Sure. Um, several reasons. I can, believe, I can believe that. Well, might have the appearance of Muslim, you know, or t uh, terrorist, you know, a lot of things do. And I, I don't have very specific information or any way to point a finger specifically. But I mean, to me, it, it reeks of something that could be a prop up job, you know, like, you know. Well, that, that, goes, that goes with almost anything yeah. that, that takes place in, in the press. In fact, sure. the alternative community has been yeah. conditioned to look at everything as a conspiracy. Yeah. So if there's a shooting, right, there's right. people immediately they, uh, breaking it down and saying, well, mm -hmm. these actors and all this sort of thing. And yeah, well, everything is a conspiracy until proven otherwise, right? And so, to <laughs> some, yeah, and many times, uh, I'm there. back, by the way, just got that. Yeah. So, well, we were yeah. just using over the attack in Moscow. Yes. You know. So, uh, and, and, you know, we, we can't really conclude anything. I just said taking it at face value, it looks like, uh, in my opinion, the, the party that would stand to gain the most is, is Israel. Interesting. Okay. And, uh, and the reason for that yeah, is, the please. reason for that is, yeah. Israel is like sort of the bad guy on the block in terms of most of the world view. Yes. And they don't need to be uh, the, the Muslims need support from places like Russia right now. 
Yes. I don't know if Russia would ever support them, but you know they, they don't. But apparently, from if you take it at face value from the reports, this is this ISK organization. They said it was ISIS, but it appears to be IS, which I think is different than ISIS. Initially, they reported ISIS, and can, just so you know, the uh, they changed the name from ISIS to IS in terms of international reference because they didn't want to confuse it any longer with the pagan goddess. Okay, so so they were not linking it, of course, to John McCain. They were linking it. To, <laughs> yes. they, they were linking it to you know disgruntled uh, factions of Syria, Afghanistan. And other, uh, another country that has grievance, genuine grievances with Russia, mm-hmm. and that you know they they're just and they've attacked Russia before, mm-hmm. and it's like th- this is like Putin coming out to give a speech and getting a pie in the face like they gave to Bill Gates. It's kind of like a pie in the face. It's not really damaging. It's just publicly embarrassing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as I say, Putin doesn't need more enemies right now. But to me, it takes attention off of Israel. Mm-hmm. And Israel right now is moving in mm-hmm. to Gaza. Yes. And, and my question is, it's like these people are displaced. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like we are the world. The support... Everybody gets out and raises all this money, and they buy a bunch of food and send it to countries, and it doesn't get to the starving people. Because the issue is not money or food. It's the distribution through the dictators that are causing the starvation in the first place. Mm-hmm. Or yes. facilitating it or enabling it, and they're not about to stop it. Yes. So here we have... Uh, you know, this so it's like we have all this support and food drops for Gaza, and it's just a matter of time, in my opinion, mm-hmm. before everybody forgets about the plight of the Palestinians. Mm-hmm. It'll become a non-political issue. It'll never be a non-issue, but it'll be a deflated issue. That's what the Israelis are counting on. Yes. Well, that's the way things work, unless somebody keeps it alive in the press there's no attention on it. You know, you might have, like, Sean Penn was going into Haiti delivering relief efforts. Mm -hmm. Uh, Recently? He was in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You think he's going to go over and bail out the Palestinians? He might. It's hard to tell with him. I mean, he's Jewish, after all. He might be on the other side. (laughs) It wouldn't matter to a hero like him. (laughs) You don't know, you know, as they say, if you take him at face value, you think, oh, I've got to go help these Palestinians. And he was over in the Ukraine, in the war zone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, why would somebody want to put themselves in a war zone? I will. A hero. <laughs> yes, yes. That's a... maybe, maybe he can do some good. One would uh, hope, yes. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you don't know if he's... I mean, he's going to be accused of all sorts of motives, perhaps correctly. <clears throat> and perhaps he feels guilt for all the money he has. I don't know. I have no idea. I just know that he has an extreme personality. Right. That's all I know. Yes. Uh, that was borderline psychotic. Yeah. <laughs> At one point, you know, he's matured since then. Yes. He might not be borderline anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, Sean Hannity will have, will have him on his show. Uh, does he actually have him on? Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, and, and they will respectfully disagree with each other, and they'll talk, and they'll talk something meaningful about Ukraine, I think I saw and they had, uh, I didn't pay any attention to it, but they had uh, Tucker Carlson interviewing Chris Cuomo. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, they are 
at the opposite ends of the spectrum politically, but they were respecting each other. You know, and why why you would even have Chris come on your show is like, you know, you you've had worse. Well, I don't know. You know <laughs> So, I mean, this is a guy who's going out in his backyard and dunking the basketball to look like this macho guy, but he's really short, and the basketball hoop is short, too. Uh, <laughs> the basketball hoop is 10 feet, and, you know, he ain't going to jump 10 feet. <laughs> he might be this able to jump 8 feet. So you know you can you can take these basketball things and adjust them up or down. And he was out there looking like a badass, <laughs> but looking more like a dumbass or a lame ass. Yeah. yeah, I mean this is who he is. You know. What? Why so, is Sean Penn even relevant anymore? I mean, I feel I feel like I mean like back in the like, what like the eighties or something. No, no, excellent. Like, I I appreciate your question. That's who cares? a yeah. It, it Aristides is right. How is yeah, how is Sean? In other words, why is he relevant? He was relevant to what was going on in Haiti, which is, a, you know, another disaster zone right now. But because they were having, you know, this horrible uh, tragedy with the earthquake or, or hurricane. I don't remember which it was. But, but there's I mean, so many. <laughs> people were starving and stuff. And he was going in there and bringing aid. Uh Personally, you mean, financing. That Clintons were giving him children? What? <laughs> well, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the other side of the coin. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just don't know. I mean, uh, and then he was in the Ukraine. I mean, if he's trafficking, I never heard that one. But <laughs> Well, uh, the, the hot rumor is that they're all involved. Uh, it, it's even the Reagan, when I gave him the credit for what he did over that phone call uh, with Menachem Begin years ago, uh, certainly has been charged by any number of people uh, with being a pedophile who uh, raped them when they were young or, or they were brought to him to uh, have his way with. Uh, it, it seems almost, uh, as we've brought up before, pre prerequisite in politics uh, to be compromised. Uh, and uh, that's part of um, a, the process, apparently. But, um, yeah, such being said, uh, uh, I back to Peter for now and, and, and uh, well, you know, along these. There, there's a whole article here. It says, can Sean Pren prove his worth as a humanitarian hero in the magazine called The Guardian? Uh, it says there are two Sean Pens, and we decide which one's real based upon our own political leanings and overall cynicism. There's the attention hogging pen, a self important blowhard hypocrite leveraging his celebrity to affect the appearance of a selfless do gooder while enjoying a life of fabulous luxury on his own time. And there's the activist pen, a workhorse putting in the effort to separate himself from the A listers, merely posturing as Mother Teresa's in training, who talks a big game about changing the world. But won't hesitate to put his money where his occasionally foot-shaped mouth is. In the new documentary, <laughs> yeah, they did a, he says in this new documentary, Citizen Pen. Now somebody does a documentary on Sean Penn called Citizen Pen. There you go. Uh, director Don Hardy isn't particularly interested in promoting one image of the actor director over the other. He'd rather let the footage of devastation and recuperation in Haiti do that for him. Though Penn may have provided the household name required to get a low-budget nonfiction project such as this off the ground, the man himself isn't the subject as much as his deeds and the legacy of public aid he's created. I don't want to put myself in a place of being a mouthpiece for Sean Penn's PR, Hardy tells The Guardian. There are other people to do that. What I hope comes across in the film is honesty. He admits to some of the tough lessons he's learned through all this as we take a little trip through Sean Penn history going back to the early 80s. But if viewers can walk away thinking, huh, I still don't get the guy, but I'm impressed by the work he's done, that's good enough for me. That's what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. It sounds like uh, it's portraying him as somebody who has made a lot of money and is trying to give back in the world. Uh, yeah, uh, how, I don't even know where his money's coming from. It's What, what he, is his he, output? He made movies. He made a lot of movies. Now, when you make movies... Uh, generally what happens 
you start producing your own movies, that's okay. where you make real money. Okay, okay, there you are. It's like when you get a big name, like Tom Cruise bought a whole studio. There you go. Okay. So it's like you, you know, you find out where the money. And many of these people, like like Dan Aykroyd from Saturday Night Live, you know, he produced movies and then and they'd star in them. Mm -hmm. I think this movie, Driving Miss Daisy, he produced it and he starred in it. He had a bit role in it. Right. And it gives it some credence and it made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so this is where, you know, you make uh, you make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because they have big egos and whatnot and and I mean I'm open to believing that he's done some good in the world I really don't know I wouldn't put anything past anybody in Hollywood mm -hmm. you know, I'm saying he did right but it it wouldn't uh, it, it's you know. basically collateral yes <laughs> it's collateral good <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah like like you know and, and like, I remember long ago, before Donald Trump was ever a political figure, there was a story how he, he read of a woman who lost her house, and he sent her a check for the mortgage. Mm -hmm. You know, he just read the story and felt bad. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. That stuff happens. Yeah, some beneficial uh, fallout from these people, yes. Yeah, in other words, the, you know, and none of these people, none of them, except with a rare few, are all bad. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not 100% bad. I told, the story, I told the story of how Nelson Rockefeller put a cafeteria for the, uh, you know, schools in Southampton because many of them were Shinnecock Indians who, who didn't have any money for lunch. So mm -hmm. they went to school with his kids and he found out about it. He put together a cafeteria, was held up for two years and fed all the kids until his kids graduated and then his kids didn't have to look at starving Indians anymore. Jesus Christ, that makes me sick. <laughs> I don't know why. I Maybe somebody else continued it. I don't know. Uh, this was told to me by the medicine man who was a recipient of the... Thing. Right. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, you know, he, he knew so many things about celebrities and different people mm -hmm. from his own... Uh, his own... Experience. Uh, experience, yeah. Um uh, yeah, so we have uh, tomorrow mm -hmm. a lunar eclipse. Yes, it'll be followed on April eighth, which is the beginning of the Book of the Law days. Mm -hmm. The Book of the Law by Aleister Crowley was transmitted eighth, ninth, and tenth. Um, we have a solar eclipse on that day, and the eclipses are hitting what are called the nodes, which are the natural is the interest interstices. Interstices, yes. Interstices yes. of where the path of the moon hits the path of the sun. Mm -hmm. The north node and the south node. The north node in astrology is where you are headed. You might call it the horizon. Mm -hmm. And the south node is where you are coming from. Mm -hmm. And where you're coming from, like say, let's say if you're taking uh well, let's take that familiar story the lord of the rings if you're heading from the shire where the hobbits live to <laughs> to uh you know ultimately the main character to mount doom you don't go back to the shire that's the south node yeah you're going to mount doom Mm -hmm. That's where you're going to put the ring in and save the world. Yes. And then on your way back from Mount Doom or Mordor, you're heading back to the Shire. You don't go back to Mordor. You go back to the Shire. It's where you're going. Uh, just like when you are leaving high school mm -hmm. and you're going to matriculate to college, you go to college. You don't go back to the eighth grade. You're right. This, this is how to view it. And right now with the North Node in Aries, this is going into Aries, which is the natural first house of the Zodiac, which concerns the self, the individual. Mm -hmm. This is a time to be me, mm -hmm. to go sing that 
stupid Sammy Davis Jr. song, I Gotta Be Me. <laughs> look in the mirror and say, I gotta be me, you know, and and identify, find your own identity, who you are in the world for yourself. This is a time, generally speaking, and it's also a time to put the distance, the, the relationship factor in the background. You don't define yourself by relationship. Doesn't mean you can't be in a relationship or can't continue your relationship, although many will fall apart, but you don't define yourself by relationship. I mean, you can say, yes, I'm in a partnership, in a marriage, whatever it is, but you have to find yourself. And in this area is where is, is Chiron, which is the wounded healer. Chiron was the teacher of many warriors, including Herlicles and Achilles, and he was wounded and considered himself a monster being half man and half horse, a centaur. And that was probably his greatest wound, that he wasn't pretty hmm. or wasn't looked at as normal. But he was, but it, this is a wound. Hmm. And everybody is born with Chiron in their chart. Chiron is an asteroid. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting, Douglas, and this, this applies to our situation, what I'm going to talk about tonight. Yes. I I looked at my own uh, Chiron, and it's in Capricorn in the fourth house. Which, I mean, in the extreme, it says, oh, you, you know, the fourth house is a home, the hearth. Because you come from a broken home. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't really, I didn't come from as broken home as you did, you know. <laughs> you, know you know, but I mean, I think what it was is, I think the, the biggest wound of the fourth house for me was when I moved when I was 10 years old. I was ripped out of my neighborhood. Oh. I wouldn't say I got over that <clears throat> until my best friend died. Oh. And now it's like, I'm not going back to that. I always wanted, always part of me wanted to go back and live on the same street with him. Interesting. Okay. Buy a house in that neighborhood and, and right. buy my old house because it was at sale for one time. But it, it's like, you know, I've now that he's gone, I've, you know, I'm over that. <clears throat> and I got to deliver a eulogy in the Catholic church where I went to church for a few times, you yes. know, a season or two. Uh, never understood a single word because it was on Latin. <laughs> and just look forward to the donuts afterwards. But, but the thing <laughs> is, is that, um, uh, and you know, I, I do remember trying to think, you know, well, it's good if I go to church. Like I'm, I, for a point, I thought I was scoring brownie points by going to church for a while. I'm like only four years old. But, you know, no, it, it didn't work. <laughs> it, it, it just it just it was discontinued due to a lack of interest uh on both myself and my mother uh my brother and sister were never subjected to that and the only reason i ever went to church is because of my own self-interest i asked my mom to take me i was curious interesting uh there was never any push oh we got to go to church no 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 <laughs> i mean she got she knew the rigmarole she knew it well um but anyway because i got curious you know i got curious and but but it was it was so i guess fulfilling to go back to to that old parish and deliver a eulogy for my best friend and see how i just you know with graduated that consciousness of my life that went back to when I was four. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's like, this is, this is, this is long in, in history. You might say that was my South note, but, the, but, the, but to be ripped out of that neighborhood was just completely devastating, even though I fit in seamlessly to the next neighborhood mm -hmm. and then moved again. So it's like I never, you know, had a 
permanent home. Now, what was all this moving all about? It was uh, it, That's a good question. It's a good question. My father was a petroleum engineer. Mm-hmm. Okay. And he was situated in assigned to Long Beach, California for like he was there for at least eight years. Mm-hmm. And there was always saying, God, he never gets transferred. People would to stay five years for these guys was a long time. They like to move them around. I don't know why. Interesting. I don't know why. They so, move them around. Yeah. It was like they like to play roulette. I don't know why. They they so, thought that rotation had an advantage and that the experience was necessary to broaden everybody's experience or some crap professionally. I don't know. They they put my father in in uh, the oil fields of Taft for five years because he was a very good teacher. I learned this out a few years ago from one of his old colleagues. You know, okay. I communicated with on the internet who really appreciated my father. He says, "Oh, he really taught me so much." And they taught him there because there was so much oil and you know they could teach these guys how to how to you know determine if there was oil in an area and and so it was like this wasn't a good job to choose if you wanted to have a stable location for a family but but you know it's like what was he doing he was pursuing a career to feed his family right you know he, he wasn't in such a position that he could you know, say no. Shot. Yeah. And so that took its toll uh, on I get. But but the positive was, is that I got to see different cultures. Yeah. And I got to live in different cultures, starting with Southern California, which which I called an Art Deco Winchell's Donut. Um, <laughs> Disneyland. Surf surf culture. Yeah. The, the the ocean was a big part of my early life and and then to move to a redneck oil culture which was these people were very friendly very friendly some of the friendliest people unless you were different right i wasn't different enough ah you know, if i would start to talk too much you know, like like say when I got into the eighth grade, I'd start to, you know, rag on the culture there because it was so. And then you know, they'd say, "Where where do you come from anyway?" You know, it's like, and you know, <laughs> it, I I did not want to be there. And then then I moved to Northern California and Davis, which was extremely left wing, intellectual, mm-hmm. which that was probably the biggest culture shock of all. Ah. And, and to be able to assimilate and started studying Asia and um, and you know going to the first whole Earth week and being exposed to you know the hippie culture which is that's that's what it was it's there was no there was nothing else except maybe some uh, a few. I guess what you call, uh, I don't know what you call them, opposites. Right, right. That would beat up. Contrarians, the contrarians. Or, yeah, beat yeah. up the hippies. Yeah, and, you know, it's like, so uh, they, they didn't, they didn't make too big of a mark, but uh, uh, yes, yeah, so, so that, 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 that was different. But, but this is like, what I'm talking about the wounded healer, the wounded part of me was was the home the heart and i i've had great upset in my domesticity with my divorce that i had you know with my wife and my child you know was very uh you know, hurt by that um and so that was like you know fourth house it's called <laughs> and I, you know, it's okay, and then and then then also in my home in the Sea Org in Scientology, mm-hmm. that was an ever changing situation too. Hmm. I was on this ship, then I was on that ship, then I was back on this ship, then I'm back on that ship, then I moved to Florida, and you know you go to different rooms. Like for example, I go I go on vacation, and I come back, and and I should have known better. I come back and I had no, no birthing space. Ah, oh my God. 
And they go, well, where's my bro? Oh, they moved your they they moved your stuff out to the QI. Uh, <laughs> the QI quality inn that was like about ten miles away that they had purchased a hotel for where they had all the children stay with the parents. So like, why do they move me out with the parents and the children? Hmm. Yeah. Makes well, no sense. Yeah. I don't have children because they have they have the children. They have a nursery out there. No, I don't belong out there. The reason they put me out there was well. He's not here. He can't say anything. Chuck him out there. You know? And oh, my put God. His, put, his, put his stuff here, and I had to go find it. This was, oh this was common. So I find it, and I have to, you know, kind of hustle and find my own, find a bed. Anybody sleep in here? No. Okay. Fine. I find a bed to sleep. Oh, my God. You know, I, I, I go talk to my old roommates. Is anybody here? No. You, you can move in. Wow. You just... You know, it just find it, and this is very disconcerting. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, it's like so. You know, the thing is, when you're not there, when you go away, you to re not represent yourself. You're not there. No, it's so true. The then... Organization does not give a shit about you, and you have to come back and and forage uh, for your own survival. Jesus and, Christ! Well, yeah, it's like you know, you you get over it, you find your place, and now you're happy again, as long as you don't go. Um. So, um, but, uh, and, and of course it was my home and home was bigger than just a room. You know, you had friends, you had all sorts of stuff. So, but it was a, it was an odd, it was an odd home life if I think about it. Right. And, and, uh, I think my most stable home has, has been in Long Island my entire life. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so, uh, but so, but the other interesting thing, because it's in Capricorn, mm -hmm. Capricorn is a sign, I'm, I am a Capricorn, it's a sign of achievement, it's the sign of career. Uh, Capricorn is the ultimate achievement sign of Zodiac. But to have Chiron there, I was learning, is no recognition. Mm. That's your wounded healer. So. Capricorn is when, you know, like, well, you could even wonder if President Nixon had it because he got recognition, but he got it in a bad way, you know. Yes. So, uh, so no recognition. And I can see where, like, like in my, but in my, but see, there's mitigating factors with me because, okay, I also have Mercury conjunct there, which is my business and my communication. So it means I can get, uh, and my greatest strength is my communication. And uh, my business dynamics are definitely strong. Mm -hmm. they, they're not like Donald Trump. Like I don't have uh, gold dripping off of my fingers. There are some people <laughs> whose gold drip off of their fingers. Yes, and they are. It's just, and that's their their birth sign. It's Jupiter. It's just very very good. Now, so in other words, I don't get recognition yet. I've had more recognition in my life than most people will have or public recognition, and I've had more than I ever wanted or dreamed of. So yes. It's not so bad. But nevertheless, I'm not properly recognized because because they like say they do a uh, a documentary and then they'll omit me or they'll put Michio Kaku in to oh, lie about God. Yeah. the time reactor. So in other words, I, I, I always get the short shrift of it. Right. Does it bother me? No. No because it's to be expected. Mm -hmm. I have a moon in Aquarius, which is completely distant emotionally. Like I can be totally, I don't care. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to go be what they are, they can be that. But then what what's positive about the, so the, the wounded healer, now this affects you and me because, you know, like I'm your partner spokesperson in this endeavor. So That's right. Yeah, yes. so this is why, and, and the fact that I, I'm okay with no recognition means this is why I can tolerate all the disrespect you get, yes. let alone me. It's like the disrespect <laughs> it's mostly generated at you. Yes. But it's generated at me by default because I'm working with you. Yes. Uh, I'm not considered as despicable as you are. <laughs> yeah. You know, but I'm you know, because I've you know, they despise me already, and uh, I survived that. They don't. But but then again, 
Uh, so, but then what happens is I have a very good placement of Jupiter in Taurus, which trines or makes a 120 degree angle, which is very positive in astrology, with the Chiron and the Mercury. <laughs> and it's in, in an Earth sign, Taurus, which is uh, resources, resources, money. And it's also in my eighth house, which is the house of other people's money, the house of the occult, and the house of sex, death, and taxes. Ah. And so, so I can, it trains my wounded healer, and it gives me, and my communication, so it makes my communication and business convertible into money and in convertible into expansion mm -hmm. and it also gives me uh, a bond with death mm -hmm. this is why I wrote the Montauk book of the dead and and so uh, th th this is a strength because it's it's well aspected and so right now people have everybody Chiron is in Aries, 19 degrees Aries. That's where the eclipse is. <laughs> Approximately 19 degrees Aries, I think. Is and so so this is going to make uh, for in general people are going to have changes in their personalities, <laughs> and they, they need to change positively, or they were encouraged to, and to leave behind associations or relationships where people in my opinion would benefit particularly those who are uh, in in the Scientology post Scientology arena all these people are multiple YouTube channels that have become too numerous to even consider watching mm -hmm. uh, they're trauma bond yes they're trauma bond yes and you know it's good for you know a few sessions to but then you want to get away from that because you don't want to sit around drama bond it's it's kind of like you know going to the high school reunion too many times <laughs> I've never been to one. <laughs> uh, but, or going to the the football reunion mm -hmm. when you won the championship. You go back too many times. Mm -hmm. It's like, is there nothing else going on in your life, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's nice, but then this is all you can relate to. Mm -hmm. um, so, moving away and you know Yonda explained it to me mm. uh, years ago mm -hmm. years ago she said you know it's like all the people that you know are in they're, they're gone mm -hmm. you know the people that used to do this and that they're gone it's like you know p people come in waves like schools of fish they come in waves she was explaining how all these people are just gone and they're you know, they did what they did, and they're gone from our lives. Mm -hmm. She's still there, which is which is really kind of neat. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and and so, um, how? And, and of course, this there there are astrologers who are going into the whole big cycle of what's going on in Israel, and that there is a chance for peace. But apparently, that could be short-lived uh, as Venus moves into Aries, which it will soon, it will then be in the house of war, mm -hmm. which makes it less likely peace will be achieved. Yes. What And, and what I'm curious about, and so th this, these are things that are going on, and, and pe there's tons of videos people can watch. and. They'll break down, okay, if you're a rising this or a rising that, it'll tell you what to anticipate or to expect, generally speaking, and you may or may not be able to relate to it, depending on uh, how 
how much the the particular astrologer fits the fits the reading. But I, I was able to see that, uh, uh, and and of course the wounded healer is always something you can work with and recognize. It's uh, nobody's born with a perfect you know score because you're here to work something out and I think one of the biggest tragedies is to be born with a gilded life where you think there's nothing wrong right and then you because you don't see what's wrong because everything's you know that's kind of how the life of the Buddha is portrayed he was born with everything yes but then he did his work and he figured it out that, you know, he figured out right away that this was not the way to, to live right just just be oblivious to everything um, but with with regard to Israel mm -hmm. and as they say all of these displaced Palestinians mm -hmm. I don't know I it's you can't it's hard to keep up but I I mean there are apparently millions of them that are displaced starving yes uh, they throw food at them but that doesn't work mm -hmm. and the attitude of not the soldiers I'm not speaking for the soldiers but the citizens is like the hell with them mm -hmm. because they attacked us now the soldiers are probably more virulent about that Perhaps, but, yeah, you know, likely I so. But go on, yeah. But the point of it is, and and none of these countries seem to want them because, why, you know, they won't want them anymore. The United States seems to want people a lot more than these other countries. <laughs> yes. And, and so what, you know, I mean, where are they going to go? Are they going to become food for the chow? It's, uh, yeah, horrible what, situation. What? Go on. Yeah. Pardon me? Oh, I was just saying horrible situation. Yes, go on. Yeah, yeah. so it's like, uh, I, I imagine there are UN and other organizations paying some degree of attention to it uh, with probably flailing efforts at best. Yes. Uh, but the bottom line is, if you were one of these displaced people, <laughs> Like this, this girl and her mother I met from Palestine, that they had a hairdressing place in Toronto. Well, they would, they'd just go be living in Toronto now. <clears throat> but they weren't from Gaza. <laughs> so they, they had homes in Palestine and in Toronto. <clears throat> but these people in Gaza, I mean, the first thing they're going to do is, you know, call up any relatives they have in other countries and go there if possible. Yes. And even if it's not possible, you know, they're going to be afforded more sympathy than if they were just, you know, trying to immigrate. Mm -hmm. They're going to be afforded a lot more sympathy. But then again, getting into the United States, if that's where it was, would might be a lot more challenging. Yeah. So that they're definitely refugees. And I've never been to a refugee camp. I've never seen a refugee camp. But it's not a place you want to see. And the first thing you want to find in a refugee camp is, I'll give you a good example of from my own life. It wasn't a refugee camp. Mm -hmm. I'm coming home from work on the Long Island Railroad in 1986. Mm-hmm. And I remember it very specifically. I don't know what the day was, but I remember it, the the train stopped in Mineola, and they said, "Oh, sorry, no more service. Uh, you know, trains track repair. A bus is coming to get you. We got a bus is going to take you to your next destination." Well, wow. so okay, wait. So you know, you wait. There's no bus. And you, so I go into the bar, and I, I remember there was an. It was the year the Mets won the World Series. They were playing an exhibition game against the Boston Red Sox, and then that's on the TV. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, you know, uh, 
probably called my wife. And then I, I go out and I look and you know, I see all these cars coming and picking people up eventually. Mm-hmm. Like, when's a bus coming? There's no and you know, they, they never there's no bus coming. There's never, there's no bus. <laughs> Jesus never Christ. Coming. And I was the last one to figure it out. <laughs> Oh my so God. I, I finally call my wife and tell her what happened and she comes and gets me, you know, <sighs> it's like, and it, you know, it's going to take her, you know, at least 15, 20 minutes to get there. Right. And it's like, okay, but, but it's like, you know, welcome to Long Island. You, know, you don't mm-hmm. get a refund. You don't get, you know, I mean, Jeez. it was a monthly ticket, but it's like, yeah. it, it's just like, that's what New York can be like, mm-hmm. you know? Now that that was not a horrible horrible situation. I never forgot it though, because it's just like there's just no sympathy. You know, it's just like that train's not working. <laughs> you know, there'll be a bus. It's just a lie. It's you know, it's it's like uh, like the Germans told the the Jews. <laughs> Get on, get on the train. We're going to go get some food. <laughs> They're being taken to a death camp, a concentration camp, God knows where. You know, it's like, it's like you know, you tell them something, you give them some false hope. Uh, you give them some false hope. And a refugee camp, you're going to be fed all sorts of bullshit lines. Yes. Uh... <laughs> it's like um, there was another good one I heard on the news they said that this famous announcer for the New York Yankees he went back to God back to the 40s I think his name was Bob Shepard and he died <laughs> and, and, they, and they were saying oh all the Yankees are going to come to his funeral and none of the Yankees showed up to his funeral oh my god he, he was an announcer you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. He was an announcer. He was very famous. But and they said on the news, they said, well, there was this rumor. Well, uh, the, the the bus the Yankees were on, it, it broke down. The bus broke down. <laughs> it was all a lie. Oh, my God. Nobody was going to get up and go to his funeral. You know, because he didn't really know them. Right. He announced them. You know, he was... A, he, he was an iconic character, but he didn't, you know, he wasn't friends. He was an old man, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's like, so in other words, it's like a PR lie. Yes. That is really, it was kind of, the whole thing was very insulting, but, yes. but, but then what we're talking about, um, being in a refugee camp, <laughs> it's like, you don't want to be. Uh, you, you just want to get out of there. Yes, of course. Of Any course. way you can. And if the cartel comes up and offers you a situation, mm-hmm. might seem a lot better than staying where you are and waiting for Joe Biden's people to come and give you a ham sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, you know. It's, it's, uh, so back to the Palestinians, this is a real human, uh, like I'm very curious mm-hmm. about what's going on with these people and yeah. are they being aligned to be food for the Cho or food for the ghoul or whatever? Mm-hmm. It's like they're, you know, they're. They're already in the desert. Yes. yes. And it's not yet summertime. Yes. I, I, it could get a lot worse. And I'm sure there are humanitarian outreaches, mm-hmm. some out of conscientiousness, some out of necessity. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's never enough. Mm-hmm. And that's where... You know, somebody like Sean Penn coming out there, getting hands on. I'm not saying he's going to Israel, but I mean, that whole idea 
but of course, I don't think you'd have too many people in Palestine, I mean in Hollywood, going mm-hmm. to Palestine because Hollywood is uh, got a lot of Jewish interest in it. Yes. Which um, I don't know if you you have any knowledge or comment on the Palestinian refugee situation. Oh well, I could go on about that, of course, for hours, and it just uh, it's uh, something that I'll probably go into in depth during monologue because I will have to monologue tonight. Uh, George Knight will not be. Uh, appearing with us except for maybe about an hour or so uh he wanted to spend the night with us if he could but um his schedule has been impacted so i'll certainly be monologuing tonight and i will probably go in depth into palestine but uh it's mostly along the lines of of course uh the uh well every aspect that i can cover about it that would be geolytically uh pertinent i think the most pertinent thing is that President Biden refuses to pursue the most obvious way of de-escalating these tensions and uh, thereby ultimately avoiding American deaths, which would be the demanding of a ceasefire in the Gaza. Um, As Peter himself has pointed out, uh, Mr. Schumer, of course, has acted as the proxy uh, for Biden, but it's obviously not enough. And uh, but Schumer has been very forthright. And of course, Uh, What he said has uh, definitely uh, been welcome. Uh, It's uh, something that, of course, we need to see more of. Uh, He uh, stood up to Netanyahu and, of course, has been trying to put uh, pressure uh, on him. Uh, But, uh, you know, Netanyahu's not going to listen to that pressure. He is uh, on his own uh, timeline. He definitely feels... That he can act with impunity and uh, will, of course, uh, continue to do so until the repercussions uh, come back to impact him. Uh, that's the uh, most important thing to uh, uh, get out uh, in the open right now so that everybody is dealing with the uh, uh, reality of the situation. What the Israelis want to do is drag the United States of America into another war, and in this case with Iran. Um, and uh, Peter also pointed out that Iran has been unusually quiet lately. Um, people could make the argument against that, and uh, of course, that would be found. The argument against that would be found in the Houthis, uh, because the Houthis are sponsored by the Iranians uh, more than anyone else, and the Houthis have been profoundly active. They've impacted world trade. Uh, world trade has had to uh, avoid the the Suez Canal because of the Houthis and as a result it has to go all the way around the Horn of Africa and uh, the end result is of course that uh, the um, uh, world trade is losing uh, untold hundreds of millions of dollars as a result of these diversions Uh, so the Houthis are getting their point across loudly uh, (laughs) quite loudly and the Americans who have quote-unquote struck back at them obviously have not impacted them to any profound degree. Uh, But other than that, Peter is quite right. Uh, Other than that, the Iranians are not really pressing the situation. They're not pressing the advantage. They're not trying to start a second front war for Israel uh, by triggering Hezbollah. And of course, these elements were always very hard to control at any rate. Uh, The Lebanese, of course, don't want to suffer what Gaza is suffering. And that would be brought upon them uh, if Israel expanded uh, the conflict uh, in response to anything they might do. But uh, the uh, Israelis, on the other hand, um, if the Hezbollah does not fight now, um, there's a certain uh, sensibility in that. But it's also foolishness because the Israelis will turn on them eventually. Uh, Once they expand into the Gaza, they will uh, turn around and do the same thing to the Lebanese. This is, uh, if it works once, they'll do it again. Uh, So uh, in the interim, they want the Americans involved, uh, committed on their side, uh, via the war with Iran. And this would destroy America, um, which is ultimately the Israeli objective, of course, because they're insanely self-destructive. 
Uh, so uh, you, this is something that uh, needs to be confronted by the Americans as a population base. They need to be uh, made aware of whom the enemy is, and it is the state of Israel as it stands today, particularly or definitively under the regime of Netanyahu in particular. Uh, so it, it's the, these are points that need to be made. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, with, with that, um, again, the rest is detail. Uh, I'll go into it. The horrors of what the Palestinians are suffering. Uh, the uh, the reason that the Americans feel such an affinity with this, uh, uh, based on their own history of expansion and genocide, uh, uh, the Americans actually have a historical parallel with Israel's current development. Uh, the uh, first the. Uh, concentration uh, in the most negative sense of the indigenous peoples and then their extermination. Uh, to speculate on the fate of the Palestinians, of course, is it's uh, futile. Uh, we can only say it's going to be bad. Uh, that much we know. Uh, there's going to be uh, plague. There's going to be uh, famine. Uh, all of this in the conditions of crowding. Uh, and as Peter said, the summer's coming up. It's only going to get hotter. Uh, dehydration, everything else is going to set in, and uh, uh, it's it, there's, there's nothing good will come of this. We are going to see an effect of genocide. So many of that, these... That, that, yeah. that actually is exactly effective genocide. In other words, okay, nothing's going on. Okay, oh, that's, oh well, all these people are dying, and it's like, yeah. it's, it's purposeful. Yes. It's not an accident. And yes. Uh, I want to share here something from the, the U.S. Sun, it's called. It's a newspaper on the Internet. And it says that uh, it's in the headlines of, on, of not only the paper, but it was on the, on the news feed, is that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was considering trading uh, 800 Palestinian prisoners in exchange for 40 hostages that were taken on October 7th. Now, Many of these 800 Palestinian prisoners are considered to be criminals, at least from by Israel. Mm -hmm. But here's the tragedy: is now since oh we're going to get four oh yeah we'll release 80, 800 Palestinians. Mm -hmm. What are we going to release them to? The desert? Yeah. Where are they going to go? You see how sick this is? Of course, of course. It's like yeah oh here's 800. You you can all go. You can go from prison, and come out in here to the sand it's like yeah and why would hamas oh they get why would they let these people go it's like it's uh it's 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 brutal now at the same time there are protests as of yesterday uh huge protests against netanyahu mm -hmm. in israel they're from Is israelis yeah uh, oh, about time. <laughs> well, they have, they've been protesting a lot. That's true. You don't hear about it because this is not what the American uh, press, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're, they're very much more pro Netanyahu than they are pro the people of Israel. Yes. Because I don't think most of the people of Israel want anything to do with Netanyahu or his agenda. Because most people are people yes. they're humane yes. yes it's it's only certain ones uh that are uh um inhumane yes yeah ensuring that gaza no longer possesses a threat to israel yes uh and which could mean the complete annihilation of anybody who lived in gaza who was palestinian i mean it could be construed as that mm -hmm. because uh, wow. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a, uh, well, this is a pre-war world. We are in a, uh, these are the Spanish civil wars and uh, Ethiopian invasions of uh, the um, uh, next world war. And uh, this is all part. Well, I, I would say that we're in the world war. Yes. It, yes. At what point does it, you know, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, like when we had a war in World War II, it was declared a war. Yes. Eventually. 
eventually. But as you say, we're in a war now. When I mentioned the Spanish Civil War, the Ethiopian invasion, this was all after uh, the Japanese invasion of China in 1937. So the war was already on uh, by any proper historian. Well, the war was yeah. going on. But yeah. in the United States, yeah. Yeah, as you said, they asked about the war, but yeah. and it was in the press. But um, my mother told me that when they'd see the films of Hitler yes. in the 1930s, in the newsreel, the movies, they thought it was funny. They just thought they looked ridiculous. Interesting. You know, with all their tanks and marching and stuff. They thought it was funny. Wow. Uh, now, because, look, it's far removed. Yeah, yeah. She, she was in Denver or wherever, and yeah. it's like, ah, ah, ah. Jesus. Because uh, <laughs> it's far removed. But by the so, way, oh, go on. Yes, continue. You were in the United States yeah. in the 1930s. Yeah. You had sugar rations. You had different rations. You were poor. Unless you were from a rich family, you were poor because you had rations or restrictions. Yes, there was a lot of poverty, so you were already under the under the eight ball, so to speak, in the United States. Yes, when war was declared, it animated the entire country. Yes, it, it gave America an esprit de corps which it did not have during the Depression. Yes, yes. So, you know, that's like. Wow. And the American servicemen were admired all across the country to give a lift to a serviceman. Yes. Because America now had a spirit which it didn't have. And you could say that that spirit was destroyed by, you know, the Wall Street crash and the Depression and, you know, all of the glory of Herbert Hoover and all that administration and previous administrations. Mm -hmm. the Woodrow Wilson era and the legacy of that and then FDR comes along and paints himself as a hero mm -hmm. and yeah. it did a very good painting yeah so uh, and, and you know everybody's living under this tremendous illusion nevertheless it gives an esprit de corps to the American people that they did not have mm -hmm. who could have who could have an esprit de corps when you're going through, you've got the Workers' Progress Administration, you've got uh, people in bread lines. It, it was a sad, sad situation. Yeah, not to mention, yeah, go on, please. Not Continue. to mention what? Oh, the sheer hypocrisy of the attitude towards the military in those days, sailors and dogs keep off the grass. Those signs uh, uh, prior to uh, the war, uh, then everything uh, spun on a dime and uh, servicemen were heroes. But go on. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. And were they heroes? Well, it, it's, it's, wow. It's like we got a team to root for now. Yeah. We got, we got a stake in, in the game. And you know what? Lives got better. Yes. That's the crazy thing. Yes, true. Lives got better and there was prosperity all because of war. That's right. That's right. And did it have to be that way? No, it didn't. Yeah. But it was. Yeah. So, but the, the point I was making here vis-a-vis -vis what's going on today yes. is nobody was in, and there were a lot of people that didn't want anything to do with this war. Yes. Not everybody was broke. <laughs> That's true. Yes. Yeah. But by the way, c continue along this uh, train of thought. I, I need to take care of the problem I was taking care of earlier is still not resolved yet. So I'm going to check into it, just making certain that my electricity continues. The bills are paid, but it's the weather lately has been uh, flooding the basement of my landlord. So uh, there's flickering of the light. So I want to just talk to him again about the circuit board or what we call the fuse box. We still use those old terms. I'll be right back and um, hold the stage. Please continue. You're doing fine. Okay. okay. I'll all let right. you know so, Susan, back. I, 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 all right. So what I was saying is that you had so many of these people in, in our current culture today were, well, the difference then is whether well, the war was not brought to them. It was really never brought to them on this continent, except for the Fugo balloon bombs which were mostly over unoccupied areas. So the actual, the war was taking place 
primarily, not exclusively, but primarily in Europe and in Asia. So in today's world, the war, the, the worst war we have right now is going on with all the border invasion and all the crime in the streets. That's bad enough. And, but when we talk about war, this becomes the big, the big question. Yeah, there's, there's war in the Mideast. There's always been war in the Mideast. Uh, Russia is having war with Ukraine. Uh, can I add I, something, Peter? Go ahead, please do. Yeah. No, I, I just, it was funny because I feel like I saw in the news recently uh, that we bombed uh, Iranians in two countries that weren't Iran, which, so whatever that means, it's just like, wow, you know. You mean there were Iranians in... Uh, yeah, yeah, they're, they're saying that there's uh, Iran-supported elements, you know, I guess in other countries, you know, groups or whatever, that, and they're targeting them, but it's funny that we're attacking Iran in two other countries that aren't Iran, in a way, you know? I mean, it's like they say, hey, it's because of Ar Ar Iranians or whatever, but we're bombing two other countries. Um, that's, that's bound to at lead to something not good. Like, I don't think these other countries are kind of be like kindly like, oh, that's right, we want to get this terrorist over there. Just go ahead, please bomb them. Like, somehow it's not going to work out so gleefully, you know? It says here, now this goes back to December. Biden orders strike on Iranian-aligned group. Mm -hmm. uh, Iranian black, Iranian-backed militia. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's a uh, bombing Iranians. That, I mean, that's interesting because I didn't know there was a sufficient Iranian population outside of Iran to... Well, uh, to, I don't know about big population. They're certainly targeting supposedly Iranian-backed, you know, groups. You know, there's all these sects and different, you know, like kind of different, uh, what would you call them over there, militant organizations. They're Here often backed says, by other countries. Uh, today, multiple attacks target US, ba U.S. bases in Syria. So it, it sounds like uh, <clears throat> this is following Thursday's fatal drone attack on a U.S. base. Uh, so the, the bases in Syria are being attacked which I didn't know. Um, a constant war going on. But as I say, the war, I said this long ago, the war is happening. We're in World War III. Right. It's just not called that. Right. It's just not declared. Now, it looks like they're trying their best to make it happen. I mean, now, so what, a NATO country's about to you know, officially put boots on the ground over in Ukraine. I mean, that's kind of a big step. Which country? Which country? I think France, here, France is like, you know, France is like now leading the charge, you know, right? And that they're, I think they're uh, actually sending dudes. I don't know if they're on the ground yet or what, but like, you know, I mean, there was, that's kind of a line to cross where it's like. I, I learned that France had occupied, I, I don't mean occupied in a threatening way, uh, the country of Moldova, which is in between um, Romania and the Ukraine. And they're there to protect Moldova uh, versus a Russian invasion. And I don't know why the French are so eagerly aggressive, except that they've hated Russia for centuries, going back to Napoleon. France and Russia have never been on the best of terms. Hmm. But I, I don't know why the French would feel so uh, either threatened or emboldened. But the Mideast is a, uh, you know, <laughs> hotbed for oh. insanity. Yeah, it sounds like France is like kind of leading. I don't, I don't know if that's what they're considering taking the lead in the NATO stuff. It doesn't seem like, you know, we're not sending people there. I don't think uh, 
British are stunning people on the ground there, but I think France is. It's the first time I've ever heard of NATO, a NATO country yeah, being I, so aggressive. Uh, I'll have to get the update, but I think I, there's talk of them officially shipping people out. So, you know what I mean? But it's kind of a line, like if like, you know, between providing aid and like actually sending your dudes and like boots on ground, you know what I mean? That's like you're officially in the war now. Yeah, I, and I even wonder how many people in France would appear as we would consider traditional French people from the movies that we knew, you know, in other words, because France is such a melting pot. You know, every place is now a melting pot. So like, if you come to America, you know, I, uh, I, I'm often in places that are just not that white, if you know what I mean. They're not that white. And in France, I I don't know. I haven't been to France, except in the airport. And that doesn't really mean anything. But I wonder how many people in France appear traditionally French versus immigrants whether it be from Eastern Europe, North Africa, or wherever. That that would be my question. So I find it interesting that their, uh, whatever their national imperative is to protect, to protect their interests, they become a great advocate for Western civilization, or so to speak. I don't know. Um, so so I, I, I'm really, I would like Douglas to go into some of his uh, rhetoric. He'll go into it in great detail. I will hit on some other subjects. Um, if he's not up to doing that right now. Okay. But what else what else is on your mind? Obviously it's gonna be a shit show. It's not going anywhere good or as war, but what else? Well the question I would ask is what what positive can come out of this? That would be my question. Like we have like I mentioned the World War II created an economic boom. Uh, and it did. Doesn't mean it was r- the right thing to do. And I grew up in the wake of that. And when I think about the times that I grew up in, it was a time of abundance. And then, as uh, you move into the 60s, it's all issues of social injustice. Because while there was an abundance for, you know, make America great again people, meaning white people, which is where I lived, it was quite the opposite in, say, uh, several miles over in South Central Los Angeles, which they called Watts which was, you know, probably a 20-minute drive away that you never take. Um, To say nothing of East Los Angeles. So it's like, yeah. And and now we're living in times when there's, I don't, I mean, I don't study these statistics, but there's great poverty in the United States. There's tremendous poverty. And and there's this kind of like attitude that in, in it, it's on both sides. It's on the people who are the victims and it's on the people who are the perpetrators. 
it's like, well, these people can't make it. And they can't fit into society. So they become homeless in one form or another. And I can't compare um, homeless people of today to the homeless people of yesteryear because they're different situations and they're different people. But there was a, a common problem with the homeless people of yesteryear. I can't say it applies to all, but it certainly applied with a majority, is if you tried to get them to live in a home, they would refuse it. Whether it be from pride or they didn't want to be under the control of a system or under the influence of a system that they didn't trust. Of course, they weren't necessarily doing it on a political soapbox, these people had rejected living in what would be called a... Okay, I'm back. Thank you. I was just talking about the difference between the homeless of today versus the homeless of yesteryear. Thank you. And I, I said I wasn't trying to compare the two. Mm -hmm. But if you... in The homeless of yesteryear, traditionally, commonly, mm -hmm. not traditionally, commonly, if, if they try to put them in a home, they would refuse to help because they didn't want to be helped. They didn't trust the system. They, and they had already rejected the system. Hmm. So they're playing a game of rejection. They're rejecting playing by the social norm. Mm -hmm. They'll live off of the scraps of what's left. Mm -hmm. uh, are you just talking about kind of like the old traditional hobos of the Depression era? A hobo is different. Yes, yes, very a much hobo so. hobo is, is, I think you've talked about it. Yes. But the hobo is somebody who wants to work. That's right. He can't That's find correct. work, so he creates a subculture. That's right. We're talking about, they haven't rejected society. They're coping with it. They, they've built a new society to cope with the fact that society won't let them in. Okay. I'm talking about people who reject society. Okay. I can't play by those rules anymore. In other words, they're saying, I can't play by those rules. I'm not. I refuse to play by those rules mm -hmm. uh, because they find it too psychologically incompatible. Right. Now that can well be a mental dysfunction on their part. Oh, of course. Uh, you can, you know, there, there can be exceptions to that, mm -hmm. but it's like, and what what's happening in today's society, there's huge portions of it, mm -hmm. and it's like young person today is like very challenged to survive in this world. At all, yes. It's not impossible, but it requires a tremendous more get up and go. Yes. And tremendous more application of intelligence and skills and know-how. Yes. So, uh, and then you, you know, you're on a on a ship and you're serving the ship. And say if it was back in the old sailing days, you get a cut of whatever the ship hauls in, whether it be whales or imports or whatever it is. You get a you get a piece of the action. Mm -hmm. And that's the but now what if the ship takes in nothing? That's the risk. Yes. That's right. And also go down at sea. This is the this is the risk of and you, you could maybe take one venture and live for the rest of your life on it if you were in the right situation. Yeah. So this this is a, essentially the challenge of life. Mm -hmm. And I, what I would say is the challenge of life is much more challenging than it used to be. Yes, definitely. <laughs> this is, and so then that increases the number of people who cannot meet the challenge or refuse to meet the challenge. Mm -hmm. 
And then there are other people who are meeting the challenge through unadulterated criminality. Yes. And, and that become that's a whole other, uh, you know, paradigm. Yes, indeed. And, uh, yeah. it, you, and go, go ahead. Oh, no, no. Uh, you continue. Uh, round out your thoughts on all of that, please. Well, it, it's like these are just social issues that were, and as they say, um, my time is not spent investigating them. Right. I'm working on your book, which will unleash a lot of things because people are, uh, and, and it's it's very heartening to know there's so much resistance against Netanyahu. There's that. Because yeah. He's just like, you know, we look at the lack of prosecution on Hunter Biden. Mm -hmm. um, we looked at the lack of willingness to call Joe Biden a treasonous president. Yeah. Uh, the prosecutions against Donald Trump mm -hmm. seem to be wearing thin for a variety of different reasons. They seem more politically motivated uh, and it doesn't seem like they're going to stick. But who knows? <clears throat> but the, the point of it is, is there's no, it's like there's no captain of the ship. It's, uh, and even if Trump is to win, <clears throat> he's going to be fought and detested in many quarters. Most certainly. Uh, and particularly by the press. <clears throat> and So the uh, I, I don't know what to say except that this is uh, you know to, to to sit there and compile statistics on everything uh, is is not my forte. It's not what I'm going to be doing. Right. It, it's definitely uh, well. Your responsibilities lie elsewhere, and our contribution to society is not economic analysis per se, but definitely to give people the occult reasons behind the deep politics as to why the world is in as bad a situation as it's in today. When I had to go do uh, what I could with the landlord. Uh, I, we were speaking about the geopolitics, the pre-war situation. I don't know um, how far you might want to return to that because obviously I'll be covering that heavily in monologue. But I do have some uh, uh, good uh, news about the um, upcoming developments or incoming developments. Uh, one is that we've had a contribution of 25 United States dollars from our dear friend, our brother from another mother in Manhattan Island, or that's where he used to be. Of course, now he's taking care of his mother on a diff in a different borough of New York, and that's Stephen Myers. So Stephen Myers uh, sent uh, uh, a quarter of a hundred United States dollars. Uh, $25 is excellent, and uh, other people are now encouraged to follow in his footsteps. Uh, also encouraging is the fact that I've received a notification from PayPal that they've ruled in my favor. They've decided the case in my favor uh, concerning Trampus Nicholson's claim uh, against the $27 he contributed and then immediately disputed it. it immediately he filed the claim uh, against his contribution uh, simply to try and uh, impact my record at PayPal. But PayPal has decided the case in my favor. If there was a hold on this transaction, it has been removed. So uh, yeah, I've been given the case number and the notification of that. Uh, so everyone is free to contribute now. Uh, there will uh, certainly be no interference with your doing so. And of course, you are encouraged to do so. Uh, in interim, what I'll do is I'll um, uh, go on screen share. We should be able to uh, see if... Uh, um, okay, Aristides, can you see the cursor moving in particular? Just uh, showing Aristides something here, Peter, so he can better help yes. with handling moderation. Um, so uh, here we are. Let me I, take can, I can see the screen. Okay, excellent. So uh, just going to see if we can scroll up further. 
And uh, so if I scroll scroll up, you uh, uh, this you it's right between it's 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 pretty much near the beginning or you know a little after the beginning of our going into the uh, uh, y y announcing uh, our show and uh, just getting into the opening hour. So you should be able to find this. If not, let me know. Uh, that would be one. I, I the I scroll first thing I hear is loud and clear. It sounds like the beginning, and I'm not. I don't know. Okay, uh, then you're not seeing it. It's then. on my phone. I don't want to. I I do this on my phone so I can move around. Oh, um, got and it. I have the session up on the computer without joining the call. I'm just okay. in the chat. Okay. Um. Yeah. But I don't know if I try to join from there to get. I can't join from both at the same time, can I? I, oh. I feel like that's. That'd be like crossing the streams. And with, like, the <laughs> hey, good point. Good point. Yes, that's right. That, I've never chanced it. Yeah, the other one's at the bottom. Okay, just for future reference. And uh, so, so uh, thank you for for bringing that up. Yeah. And Go ahead. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, stop sharing for the moment. And okay. uh, other than that, I'll I'll check into what you were able to provide. And uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. 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 Go ahead. Yeah, we'll keep working on it. It sounds um, sounds good. Okay, at least you found yeah. that one. Oh, you found that. Yes. Okay. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. And then the other two, for some reason, are not. Uh, yeah, appearing. Uh, so uh, at any rate, we, Peter and I will now continue. And again, this person is uh, is previously blocked, and they got back in. This is this is this is uh, uh, his name, Trampus Nicholson. Again, I I need to congratulate myself. I have a talent that other people simply don't have. It's due to the compartmentalization capacity brought upon myself by my psychiatrist, Dr. Tao Tran. I can literally block these people, bleach them from my minds. That serves one advantage, but for my for my psychological and mental health. But uh, per another uh, case such as this, it's not always advantageous. Uh, so that being um, said, going to uh, go in there now and block the Anubis publishing, just going to hide the user from this channel. Uh, and so this is what's going on, Peter Moon, is that Trampus Nicholson is just uh, appearing repeatedly under various channels. And uh, he, it's, uh, it, it's something I'll be dealing with for quite some time. Um, he is, of course, uh, uh, programmed. And what uh, Brendan Zogit and I were able to ascertain by his behavior as Anubis Publishing the last time he was in the chat was that he definitely has alters uh, because uh, when he was in there as Anubis chat, his, his publishing, Anubis Publishing in the chat, uh, his old lady alter is much more witty and actually somewhat, um, uh, somewhat funny. Uh, so it took a while for us to figure out it was him, but it was definitely him. And um, when I go to the channels themselves, there's nothing on them. They're, they're just like literally made yesterday uh, or, or today, uh, like right before the show. So it's uh, there we have that. Um, but going back to, of course, far more imp important topics with uh, the uh, Peter Moon himself. Uh, and of course, the book that we're writing and everything in the world around us. Uh, by all means, Peter, whatever comes to your mind now is welcome. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm going to go, uh, I want to talk about, it's good that I approach this before I, uh, I go. Yes. And, uh, this is, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to leave on time tonight. Mm -hmm. Uh, understood. I might be back in the morning, but, uh. Always welcome, of course. Yeah, but it uh, might be. I've got a dentist appointment later. I might, might need to catch up on my sleep. But uh, uh, this is a, okay, this has to do with the fact that, you know, we're trying to get together with you and Yonda. We have, me you and I and Yonda are going to have a meeting. Sounds good. And, and and also, I want you to thank her for, for letting me know about what she's doing to teach the kids about Nikola Tesla. Well, that's a separate issue, and yeah. that's better talked about by her because okay. I'm not. I mean, it's it's great yeah. that she does that, mm -hmm. but um, there's. Um, I had an exchange with her because see, this is the thing. She offered to get together with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she gave specific timings. Yeah, but they didn't jive with your schedule. The only day you had was Tuesday, which wasn't good for her. Right. I think she said Tuesday, April 1st. Is that okay with you? 
Oh, uh, let's look back at my calendar and uh, we'll do the calendar. Sh we'll do the screen share again. And this way I can educate people about the uh, different holidays that uh, I take advantage of to, uh, of course, spend time at the estates, teach the blood boys in exchange, of course, for my sustenance. And uh, here we are with uh, what's going on is... Uh, uh, Tuesday, uh, she said, uh, that's, uh, of course, my father's uh, death day, and uh, I'm committed to a number of other things I have to do that day. Uh, so uh, Tuesday is not good. Um, then uh, when it comes to the other days that were mentioned, of course, these are Asian holidays, Guan Yin's uh, birthday, um, and uh, we have Taiwan Youth Day. Uh, and uh, so, uh, aside How can from you celebrate all these holidays, I mean, I, I can't even keep, I, I wouldn't even have time to keep track of them <laughs> because they they're serious. I mean, how can you, how can you, I mean, where do you have the physical means to keep track of all? I mean, to follow all, I mean, you're always doing this, and I, I mean, I'm curious because uh it's uh it's part of giving the blood boys an international education that's something that has been a requisite uh per their uh shall we say their everyone else who's a tutor basically uh tutors them uh more or less on the days that everybody wants to be available to uh to work and uh it's like doctors uh when you first thing you discover when you have parents like I did who are were requiring constant care in the last 10 years of their lives is that whenever they need it it's not there uh, doctors are only there on weekdays and they're only there during uh, working hours and uh, they're not there on holidays and they're not there on weekends and guaranteed that's when my parents would just drop just guaranteed they just explode into uh, uh, some horrible emergency uh, uh, like time bombs, uh, programmed only to uh, keel over uh, at that point. So uh, I take those days that uh, everybody wants off. Uh, and of course, many of the tutors are of Asian descent. This is why they can tutor in the uh, subjects such as chemistry and math and all of these other accredited subjects. Uh, I, of course, teach history, which is considered a liberal arts major. So uh, the people who follow up on uh, homeschooling or these various other kinds of programs as inspectors for the state, you know, don't even give a shit. They just dismiss it with a wave of the hand. Uh, so as far as they're concerned, I might as well be telling fairy tales uh, because, uh, as they said, history is just meaningless when it comes to employment. So uh, when it comes to, uh, however, fortunately, my son's husband wants the, the students to get uh, history as an important uh, part of their lives, a real education in, in current events and history. Uh, he understands the true importance thereof. And so the best ways to do that is by honoring the cultural holidays. So uh, because of the fact that Taiwan does so much business with Japan and that uh, it, Taiwan is so heavily Japanized, the Chinese and Japanese holidays are honored respected and uh, this is the best time to teach the blood boys about uh, these other cultures and what they're involved with. Um, of course there's other international cultural holidays that we do also respect. These are the opportunities I have to teach my history lesson and uh, give it a thematic and uh, and of course earn my blood. So uh, that's uh, that's what all this is a part of and that's that's you know that's why I keep such track of it. That's my job and uh, or what I do for food. <laughs> So then we have Easter Sunday, of course, which uh, it, which is also Transgender Day of Visibility. And uh, then we have uh, the uh, uh, April 1st would be possible. April 2nd might be possible. So uh, let's take a look at April 1st or 2nd as being a potential for she, us to she, do. She suggested April 2nd. Okay, yeah, let's make it April 2nd then. Yeah, what's the latest time that's, in the day? Yeah. Uh, I don't know what time. Yeah, okay. So but I'll just I I'll put three-way call. Yeah, okay, so I'll put three-way uh, call. Yeah, which means she'll be coming over here. Excellent. She won't, it won't, but but this is this is what I said, please, because it was like, what I'm discussing with you now is the evolution of yeah. getting you into an environment where you're... Uh, where I can finally so thrive, I'm, yes. Yeah, we can thrive around, and and I I'll, I'll never forget uh, 
my translate my Bulgarian translator, and we were on our way to the Sphinx. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to ask me a question, you know, and she asked me the question, and I answered it. She says, "Can I ask you a question?" I said, yeah. So I said, "Can I ask you a question?" She says, "Yeah." I said, and I said, "She says, you know, you're really good at organizing." I said, "I I need help with." just organizing my whole office. And she says, well, you have to be surrounded with the right people. And at that time, I was not surrounded by the right people. That's right. And uh, it's, it got better. It could always be better for me. But we're talking about with you. So anyway, when I there was there was a, a you know it was awkward in trying to get her to you know i was hoping i said okay let's meet tomorrow oh, okay let's meet tomorrow. you know it was just it just didn't happen easy in other words there's a little bit of sweat equity in in finding a time for the three of us to meet that's okay? right yeah on, on her end your end and my end because i'm the go between yes you see okay effort yeah, and yeah I, you're and the I, point I, man I, yeah <laughs> What? You're the point man, yes. Well, yeah. And then I had a realization I had to tell her because she's like processing. Uh, she's processing. What did she say here? Um, it was a dialogue that happened. Mm -hmm. And I said... In the process of communicating with her, I realized something. I said that you have guards or guardians around you, which are making this meeting more difficult than it should be. Ah, yeah. Barriers, and, obstacles. And this is what I realized. Yes. I said, underneath, and she recognizes this. Yes. She said it in her own words. Underneath all of this, what's the word? Uh... It's not charade. It's a, it's a, it's a word like charade underneath all of this illusion. Mm -hmm. It's not the right word I'm looking for. Is a very pure Shinto spirit. Ah, oh, that's so beautiful. Very, this is my own observation. Yeah. Underneath the facade, the projected persona. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Around this pure spirit are ninja style guardians and kamikaze spirits. Yes. Yes. Around those spirits are different guardians that would be associated with Asian criminality. Mm -hmm. Yes. And around those are Temple of Set Michael Aquino type energy. Yes. Yes. Parasitic. All, yes. And, 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 and I said, you get the idea i said to you there are some of the energy i said these are some of the energies you need to be aware of and what you are contending with and trying to help him yeah and she says i appreciate these words as they are true yes absolutely. i was up i was up at 3 a.m this morning she says with the land energy mm -hmm. and then she tells me about a dream mm -hmm. but uh massive fields are balancing i uh and, and I, 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 I could not deal with this stuff if, if it wasn't for what I learned in the Scientology experience and also what I learned with Qigong. Yes. Uh, and my teacher, it's like it, it, I understand and I don't, uh, yeah, I mean, but this is just the way it is. And, and you know what? If you had a, you know, if you didn't have these energies around you, you would be kind of like the Mongolian Messiah. You know, you'd have Henry Wallace, you know, in his his own dirigible coming after you. I appreciate your saying that, and I want people to understand how this shows. Um, I get uh, e feedback even in the chat about, say, my photograph in uh, thumbnail of live of live stream. And uh, people say good things about it. Tad Rickett says, I agree with Sheila Gavin about, and he puts it in uppercase, art slash creations, in quotation marks, 
Dreamy and Bella, and that's appreciated. Uh, Peter Moon can testify to the fact that my hair is pure snow white. It's ice white ever since the night of the Broken Circle. When you see my hair otherwise, it's dyed. So uh, I leave it white, of course, when I'm in mourning or communion with my parents. But uh, it goes along with what Peter is saying. Uh, quite honestly, what Yanda senses together with Peter, what both of them are uncovering, is what I have the potential to be. And uh, the potential is held back by, um, some might say, a lot of baggage. That would be a simplistic way of saying it. And uh, right now, the challenge that uh, uh, Peter and Yanda are taking on is each in their own way working with what Yanda described as somewhat something similar to diffusing a weapon of mass destruction's trigger mechanism and uh, are, uh, are trying to defuse a bomb. And I appreciate what she's saying profoundly. She knows the gravity of the situation. She's aware of what she's trying to take on here. Um, so in that she has, should have everyone's respect uh, with the courage she displays with that. And uh, when it comes to uh, what I brought up, I don't feel she felt the need to keep that private about her teaching children. It shows how she relates to what I do as well. I think that's what she was trying to trying to convey was the fact that she relates to what I'm doing because of what she's doing. So she and I both have our responsibilities in that regard. And that's what kind of binds our schedules. But when it comes to what Peter's doing, the most important thing of all, uh, as far as the rest of humanity is concerned, is to hear the message. And Peter is making certain that the message is something people can understand. He's putting it in a language that people will be able to understand. That's Peter's contribution to the world. Um, as Peter has said, he's had a lot of experience in life. And he's done with he's he's basically dealt with profoundly important people. Um, obviously, uh, when it comes to Dr. David Lewis Anderson, um, the technology that he brings to potential use, uh, which has never been exploited yet, simply because our system. Uh, as it stands, probably could not handle the technology. It would uh, alter our system in such a manner that the system, as we know it, would not survive. If you can imagine something that produces its own energy, which is what D David Lewis Anderson is asserting the time machine does, then that, of course, changes everything uh, to such a degree uh, that we simply have no precedent by which to uh, contend with the technology. So there's a reason it's uh, being uh, tapped, if at, if at all, extremely uh, surreptitiously in a very limited sense. Uh, but of course, I am convinced personally, uh, David Lewis Anderson uh, he is, is very de detached from whether it is or not. It's, he's not personally invested in it being used because uh, of course, my conviction is that he's not a human being and is not thinking on human terms, uh, that he's an Evanesser and is thinking on entirely different extra dimensional terms that uh, are um, a, that uh, he could take it or leave it, whether humanity uses what he's presenting or not. Uh, of course, uh, yeah, as Peter Moon has brought up, uh, then they bring in the detractors uh, to uh, make claims about it, like Michio Kaku. And uh, in my case, of course, uh, it's just an endless campaign of character assassination and, of course, assigning uh, n nothing less than terrorists uh, to myself. Uh, people like Trampus Nicholson, who then appears in the chat room, which he did in the last episode no less than three times under three different altars with three different channels, uh, all of which, when they were traced, showed absolutely no evidence of being real whatsoever. They were all established literally within minutes of the program as tonight's uh, channel was. Um, so this is uh, what we contend with, um, uh, to say the least, when it comes to my case. But as Peter has had experience with people as tremendously important as Dr. David Lewis Anderson, that's on a level of the entities my mother was dealing with to, uh, to um, without exaggeration, uh, that's on a level with dealing with some of these uh, extra cosmic entities 
that my mother was dealing with in the cosmic struggle that uh, uh, the world knows as the Second World War, which has never ended. It ended uh, certainly in the case of the Japanese Empire, but never in the case of the uh, European, Atlantic, and Arctic theater of operations. Uh, um, so this struggle is still ongoing, and uh, uh, Peter has tried to educate people about that, but the uh, suppression has been immediate and has been overwhelming. Uh, Yanda is trying to help break those bonds, those barriers, in an energetic sense, and we can only uh, all together pray for her success. And uh, of course, it will require all of us working together to do that. In the end, as I continually stress, it is your war and you have to fight it. It is up to you. You few here who are listening right now um, need to spread the word and uh, as far and as wide as you can. Uh, perhaps other advantages will be provided uh, to myself in the near future or the future period through your thoughts and prayers. Uh, so that uh, as the word slowly gets out there, which it inevitably will, uh, in a worst case scenario, not in our lifetimes, but let's hope that it does in our lifetimes when we can actually provide the most help. Uh, but that brings us, I'll turn it back to Peter with that. Uh, as Peter said, uh, uh, hopefully with some of these boundaries and communications being broken by himself, the energetic boundaries, being broken through the work of people like Yonda and all of yourselves, uh, then we will see me able to provide the kind of help that uh, was denied humanity uh, when my mother had to order the killing of the Christ child in Outer Mongolia because of his abduction by Henry Wallace to be brought to the United States and exploited by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, in a manner that FDR thought would render him immortal, healed and immortal and healed, regenerated, immortal. Uh, and uh, that, of course, uh, uh, should be unacceptable to any one of you out there, the potential for that, if you are familiar with the history that we've articulated. Um, and if not, you must make yourself so. Uh, and uh, make others uh, aware as well. Uh, and of course, push the books. Uh, Peter and I will, after this book, work on um, expanding and revising the Vampirology book, and uh, that uh, will hopefully bring some uh, additional uh, enlightenment and elucidation uh, to the world uh, about a subject that they're constantly romanticizing about and uh, uh, have done to death in the most uh, tedious of ways. Uh, but, uh, okay, um, back to Peter with all of that. Of course, I hope he's still with us. And uh, uh, he's gone on mute. And, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I was on mute. Uh, no worries, uh, no worries. I, this is one of the great benefits of discussion <clears throat> and communication because it, it brings up uh, points to consider or to review and to look at uh, again in, in a new reference of time and, and that's what you said about David Anderson and it's like um, there is uh, what you say has a lot of logical merit to it thank you like why would yeah it, it, and if it's not uh, if it's not absolutely true or there's enough truth in it to you know, to, to warrant it being a serious prospect. Now, where this becomes um, rhetorically interesting, to me especially, but it would be rhetorically interesting to anybody, is if this is all true, and this, this technology remains uh, outside the bounds of human use and responsibility why did he come out of the woodwork to the degree he did and introduce himself to me this is a very interesting rhetorical question oh i would uh, I personally i would say that uh first off uh understand that uh i think anyone uh even uh an evanesser would uh 
want uh, some credit for what they have done. We'd want the world to know that uh, a contribution was made, uh, even though, uh, as I said, the reason for the Evanescer, which I am convinced, I'm going from that filter. This is my axiomatic paradigm from which I'm operating when it comes to David Lewis Anderson, um, is that uh, he, of course, presented something to the United States government in exchange for what benefits him, uh, a source of energy uh, that uh, he could settle into. When it uh, comes to, uh, however, the fact that he did this, uh, it's almost uh, uh, insurance policy, of course, that uh, he have someone outside of the government circuit make it known that he did this. If he were a mortal human being, it would be an insurance policy for the sake of uh, a backup, a dead man switch. The fact that uh, people know why he died if he is killed. Uh, but I don't view him as that, but that would be the logical well, rationale. Well, there, there's, there's some evidence to suggest that is the case. Mm -hmm. um, but if I go back into the history, uh, when, when I first met him, he had a very small machine. It didn't do too much. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it did, it was generating more power then it gave out, but he didn't reveal that at the time. Uh, and, excuse me. Mm -hmm. No worries. Uh, what he did, um, this kind of all came out in dribs and drabs, and it wasn't until I was able to put it together, you know, some five years after his uh, his release of this information in Romania that I began to really kind of twig on what it was to the point where I could explain the theory cogently. It was already on his website. And as I say, there was one scientist, notable, relatively notable scientist, who had figured it out and, and had said to my girlfriend, Marianne, he says, well, God, if this stuff gets out, you know, I'm not going to have a job. <laughs> I mean, what a what a petty, what an incredibly petty circumspect yeah. perspective. Especially when you consider that this guy was so well-to-do, he didn't need a job. Yes, yes. And uh, he was also a, an alcoholic. Of course. Oh, but, of course. But this is indicative of what David said. He said this, this extreme pettiness people would uh, show themselves to be when it came to something they couldn't control. Yes. They'd become very threatened by it. People in positions of power or authority that he had to deal with. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that's interesting. It's, it's a fact. Now, what had happened is when he sent me this mysterious postcard, he said he told me that the reason he sent me that postcard is because, and it was completely indecipherable, and it was never deciphered by anybody to anybody's satisfaction, except that he said there was a code within the code, and and that it basically would lead the way to where it would reveal where this time reactor patent was. Ah, but. I don't know how I could have ever figured it out. And this was before he released the time patent, which he did. Mm -hmm. And then he told me that he wanted to, uh, he said if there, if, if he, he thought that he might be a goner when he was in Israel. And he says if, if, uh, that would if be, I, of course, a good place I, to die because they're killers. Go on. <laughs> He says, I wanted it to get to you because I felt like you're the only person who could maybe do something with it. Yeah. Which I thought was off the wall because I'm, I'm not, you know, a technical person. However, uh, I, I'm sure I could project management it into, into life if, if I had the resources. <laughs> the problem with that would be, would be the scientists. 
because then they'd start wanting. And so he he told me on the first day I met him, he kept everything very compartmentalized. Yeah. So the left hand wouldn't know what the right hand is doing because people are going to, you know, get out of control and act like human beings, yes. which is, you know, potentially problematic, if not dangerous. Yes. So there, there's, there's that aspect to it. And then uh, uh, I don't know if it's so much about credit. Oh, that could be a factor. It's like, plus, I was in the ballpark by writing about the Montauk Project, which I think greatly intrigued him and interested him, and he thought it was all very real. <clears throat> These time pro he had he, they're viscerally real to him. Yes. So that gave me credibility in terms of I had an open mind to be able to deal with this stuff. And yes. he really appreciated my, you know, non-prejudicial mind in dealing with this subject, which is a subject that, I don't know, I guess it, it really can make people act crazy. Oh, well, the very words, uh, time travel, most people are just going to immediately turn off uh, because they, they're... they're they're going to be indoctrinated into immediate skepticism, uh, almost uh, pathological uh, in terms of their reflexive reaction. But um, go on. Yes. Well, there's also a question of, it's just like this guy saying, I'd be out of a job. Yeah. Somebody could say, I'd be out of a life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody, I'd be out of a life. Yeah. And that's, uh, but as I, as I get older, I'm thinking like, well, you know, the, the, the older you are, the less of a life you'd be out of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it becomes a lot less threatening if, if it were threatening in that context. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm not really, uh, uh, you know, but, but well, to, to get back to, to what I, I was, you know, saying is that um, he, he put me in a, And his opinion was such that he thought I was relevant to the to the playing field. And then uh, when I questioned on him him on it, he completely redirected the question. <clears throat> he redirected. He did not want to go down that alley. He he didn't answer me. Uh, and whether he did that on purpose or not is, you know, doesn't really matter a whole lot. It's just that he, he did redirect me uh, instead of uh, sticking, answering my question in, in with the consistency of the previous uh, comment he had made. I didn't make it. Right. So, uh, Yonda has her own take on him mm -hmm. energetically which we'll probably explore between the three of us. Okay. Maybe not, maybe not publicly right away. Okay. Uh, because, uh, you know, she thinks he's kind of gone. Interesting. Yeah, like, I, I can well, see that. Not, not in a, well, sort of not that much different from what you said. Yeah. But he's not, you know, up to participating in the so-called game. My my ostensible agenda would be to uh, trace down what knowledge I can of it and share it with the world. That's what I do in, in terms of writing books. In, you know, but what is the uh, relative value and safety of all that. This is something I cannot, you know, necessarily account for. What he did say multiple times is th the main weapon of politics is censorship. Yes. So this is what 
we're definitely dealing with is censorship. And this, this whole subject is very censored. And then when we deal with censorship, the most advantageous person to work with is Douglas Dietrich because, Thank you. Uh, yeah, he's lock, stock, and full of issues of censorship. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's what it's all about. And, and so as Yonda goes through these various chapters, I don't think she has any particular uh, experience or knowledge in reading about H.P. Lovecraft. I wouldn't blame her. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But by the way, today is the 150th birthday of Harry Houdini. So uh, a few side comments on that are welcome as well, but continue. Well, the comment there would be what Jack Parsons says. You don't understand a man's contribution to the world till 100, 150 years after his death. There we go. But he, it's, more, it's not 150. He died in the 20s. 150th so, birthday, I said. 150th well, birthday. <laughs> so we're not even 100 years. Yeah. And, you know, we'll probably contribute to his 100 years when we finish this book. It'll That's be, right. You know, and then, you know, people will read it by that time and they'll say, oh, uh, this is who Harry, who Harry Deany was, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But um, there, so, you know, she's going to read the chapter. Well, she's already read the chapter. Excellent. On Houdini. Okay. And, okay. you know, she'll read all these different chapters, whether it be on the Cho, yeah. Houdini, uh, the Nano Blood, yeah. the, uh, all of them. Yes. And then we'll, uh, address them and I would hope by the time we get to talk yeah in about a week about 10 days that excellent she'll have read everything up to that yeah uh, and and then it's uh excuse me no worries also a key of you know working with the energy uh, not only around you, but around around the data that's to be uh, um, worked with, presented, uh, organized, so forth and so on. Uh, so, so all of this is, uh, you know, it's it's a work in progress. But now we're not just dealing with the data; we're dealing with the energy around it all. Yes, but because it's not. Uh, what can I say? Uh, it's not for idle ears. That's right. And uh, so I look forward to this, and it's going to be quite the experience. And uh, uh, shout out to Maureen O'Brien, who has just joined us. She says, oh, my God, I had you guys on my Bluetooth speaker, and it came on just now. <laughs> so there you go. Some people, uh, you know, we just suddenly turn on. Uh, that's, uh, that, that shows you the level of censorship that, that interdiction that uh, we suffered. So uh, that being said, uh, I want everyone to know that uh, it, Peter stays up late for these shows. Normally, he goes to bed at 10 uh, p.m. And uh, for these shows, he stays up well past his bedtime. Well, about two hours at least, sometimes three. Uh, and uh, it's amazing the amount of energy that he has uh, for doing that. Maureen O'Brien says, Douglas cracked up. It was so fucking loud. She says, I almost had a heart attack, but laughter is infectious. So I had to crack up. Whatever Peter said must have been uh, great. Uh, she says, uh, he's very dry at times. Yes, Peter Moon can have a very dry sense of humor. An actual dry sense of humor, not a psychotic monotone like uh, Brandon Young. Uh, oh my God. Uh, y you know, not that I mean to uh, dwell on that character, but we've been dealing with the collateral from that uh from that idiot for days <laughs> so <laughs> and yeah, anyway. my, my friend roberto said, said uh, i said something very funny uh last transmission yeah very I, I wanted to know what it was because, uh, <laughs> I, I can't remember per se, but you're very good at what you'll do is you'll 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 relay in a dry tone uh, the various bizarre behaviors of people or organizations. Uh, generally, um, you'll you'll relate something like that, 
in a manner that uh, betrays the absurdity or the surrealism uh, without um, without simply saying that it's surreal or 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 bizarre, uh, you you uh, will understate or or simply accent your tone of voice so that people understand uh, the absurdity of the situation that we're all confronting or what we're confronted with. Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. I play it down like I'm not I'm not trying to be funny. Yes, uh, but it is uh, is it is it is funny. And I, I'm not. It's like I'm, yeah, understating it. I, I, I now, now I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, as as opposed to uh, Lewis Black, <laughs> who sees the insanity of certain things, and he just, you know, he's in a level of anxiety. Wow. He's you know he's in anxiety. That's that's pitiful. Who is this again? Well, that, who, who is Lewis, Lewis Black? Black? He's he's a very funny comedian. Oh, okay. He wears glasses. He's a little overweight, and he's okay. very, very funny. Okay, like he'll start talking about anything from COVID to whatnot, and he'll just, you know, he'll just focus on the neuroticness of of whatever it is society's dealing with. And this is what comedians do. Mm-hmm. They 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 see the pain of society, and they they can't deal with it. Mm-hmm. So. They release it through comedy, yes. but it's often like, I mean, the guy is tremendously funny. Mm. He's tremendously funny, but he's also anxiety ridden. Interesting. And there's nothing. I mean, because yeah. you know, like he sees the, you know, the insanity and the absurdity. It, what is this? Yeah. Jerry Seinfeld uh-huh. is renowned for making stupid observations. There we are. Yeah, that that just... aren't funny. Yes, thank it's you. Not Thank not you. funny at all. However, he can he can make a salary as a comedian because you know there's there's an art to standing up and talking and getting clapped at. Yeah, there's an art form. It doesn't mean you're good. Like like if if you can, there's certain performers that I grew up with. I didn't grow up with them. I'm watching them on TV. They were just middle of the road, particularly in the country western area or the Lawrence Welk area. (laughs) Just, just, or even in Major League Baseball, not so much in the playing field, but in the managerial area, you could just be middle of the road personality. And by being middle of the road personality or middle of the road competence, like be good enough to play a country western band and even some of these guys who are super talented are dumber than hell (laughs) Glenn Campbell is one of them dumber than hell (laughs) one of the most talented guitar players who ever existed well you brought Lawrence Welk I had to laugh I mean to me Lawrence Welk is intrinsically funny Uh, I never understood the appeal uh, he was just eminently safe. There's nothing else to say about the guy, but Bubbles. I remember the theme was Bubbles, and I think it was him that was doing the wonderful, wonderful. Was that him or some other dude that did the... Uh... Yeah, he was wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was just awful. And who's the guy doing the, uh, the the New Year's ball drop in New York? It was not him. It was some other guy. Guy Lombardo. Guy Lombardo! Guy Lombardo! Guy Lombardo! Yeah! They were. I would conflate the two of them. What is the difference between them? They're like da, da, quite da. a bit. Quite a bit. <laughs> Guy Lombardo has a street named after him, and and Freeport, Long Island. It's and then you wiggle your way down there, and you'll go to what they call the Nautical Mile, and there's all sorts of fish restaurants. Uh, but Guy Lombardo was. He had a little bit of. Uh, I guess what you'd say, a little bit of class. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lawrence Welk was just pandering to the lowest common denominator (laughs) of of entertainment, (laughs) which he did entertain people. 
but he was from an older generation. Yeah, it was a completely different kind of entertainment. No kid would stare at that today, no younger person. <laughs> and uh, it was it it was like, see, this is where L. Ron Hubbard, you know, talked about implant stations. His music was kind of like out of an implant station. <laughs> ah. Because it was very sort of trite, well rehearsed, well executed, always well executed with competence. But it, it was nothing that, uh, you know, it's the opposite of visceral. Yes. In fact, uh, John Lennon would criticize refined musicians in, in, in the so-called pop era because, you know, people like John Lennon wanted to be more raw and innovative. Like rock and roll was in the 50s instead of, you know, what might be called pretty boy music. Right. It wasn't called pretty boy music, but something like a refined rock band. Like even like Crosby, Stills and Nash, which was very harmonious and had a lot more, I guess what you'd say. In fact, John Lennon hated the Hollies, of which Graham Nash was the one of the founding members. Yes. Because they were they they did a song, I think, of the Beatles that was not like the Beatles did. You know, they Preston Nichols who you know, claim to have recorded so many of the Beatles' records. Mm -hmm. now, I'll make a case for that in a second. <laughs> but he said that you know, he said their their music was crap until until they started sculpting the sound. Interesting. Yes, that's that's I I believe that. I believe that. That I can buy. I can buy that. Now, what's very interesting about Preston Nichols and the Music of Time, the book. Uh, that talks about his experiences in the music industry. Most, I think, ironic or amusing is that the first record he ever cut was with a label called Time Records. Mm. Wow. Time Records. It was a it was a hit called wasn't much of a hit, but it was a hit called I I've Had It. Hmm. Okay. I've Had It. Uh, but the um, the thing is is that there's this uh, group of musicians called the Wrecking Crew. <clears throat> and a lot of people have heard of the Wrecking Crew, and they've got a lot of videos about them. <clears throat> and the, basically, people like Dick Clark are saying, just, nobody knew about the Wrecking Crew. We weren't supposed to tell anybody about the Wrecking Crew, because if they found out, it's basically the same guys doing all the records. Now, when we say the same guys doing all the records, you take Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, who was like the genius behind much of the music, mm -hmm. most of it, mm -hmm. and he'd go in and work with the Wrecking Crew. And he <clears> might bring the guys in to do the vocals. Did, didn't he somehow get his entire life hijacked by his psychiatrist in this? Yeah, but that's a different story. <laughs> and and, and that, that brings further credibility to the, you know, Doc, uh, to Preston Nichols. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you know, what he dealt with. But here's Dick Clark's thing. Nobody was supposed to know about the Wrecking Crew because you have these people that add riffs and, you know, arrange the music. And I, I've tried to tell my this to my daughter so many times. I said, all you have to do is study arranging. <laughs> arranging is everything. You could take proper arrangement and turn Old MacDonald had a farm into a hit. <laughs> cool. Yeah. The, yeah. You could yeah. if you knew how to arrange music. Yes. And it's like, and that's like all the cleverness and all the um. It it's uh. I'm trying to give an, uh, an analogy of it in a different field of reference. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's kind of like 
taking a a dry story like Mary had a little lamb mm -hmm. and then you pep it up into a story yes and you see oh she had a lamb and it was a wolf after the lamb and, and all of a sudden you know you turn it into a story and you know she was having an affair with little Jack Horner or something like this <laughs> you make it more interesting than Mary had a little lamb yes and you know and then you uh, analogize it to Mary, the Virgin Mary with the Lamb of God, you know, and something like this. And you, 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 you add to it, you enhance it, you take it. And this is exactly what Brian Wilson did when he first heard the songs on the radio. I think of Jan and Dean. He said, no, they're not doing that quite right. Because he knew how to arrange music. But then he'd go in with a wrecking crew and they would just polish it off but they were polishing off all of these songs mm -hmm. and and you might bring the singer in whoever it was and as you see Dick Clark and other people Glenn Campbell was a member of that wrecking group he also played with the Beach Boys mm -hmm. but the thing is is that it was kept secret they didn't want anybody to know it was the same old people Right. That's the point. So if you're keeping something secret like that for years, you'd keep Preston Nichols even more secret. Yes. You know, and then, then it's like, what else in the hell are they doing with that music? And I think the first person Preston got involved with, if I recall the book properly, was Phil Spector. Mm -hmm. And he described Phil Spector as having a wild Afro-type hairdo. I said, I never heard of Phil Spector having an Afro-type hairdo. I never saw that. Mm -hmm. And then later, when Phil went to trial for his murder, which mm -hmm. he was convicted of, he showed up with that wild hairdo Preston talked about. Interesting. Uh, now, I, you know, but he looked like a fool. He right. looked like a jerk. But, I mean, he wouldn't have looked probably as stupid when he was younger. Mm-hmm. And it was very chic to have your hair looking like that when, you know, uh, I don't know how good it looked, but it was certainly popular <clears throat> and, and common. So uh, Preston, uh, I mean, why, why wouldn't they keep a, a Preston Nichols secret like that? <clears throat> and then versus what did he know and how much of it did he know right i don't it, it just so people understand the significance of this is that phil Spector murdered um a beautiful young model who refused his advances uh lana clarkson if i remember and uh perhaps is wearing that uh fro into the uh, uh courtroom was to try and get off on a claim of insanity by actually looking insane or uh, god knows what the logic was I don't, I don't, he, you know you know, he claimed he was an anti-establishment figure, and he was about as anti-establishment as Bruce Springsteen. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's currently making a fool of himself. What's he uh, doing now? He's appearing on stage, and he's just, he's hes very sad. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very pathetic. Well, the tour with Obama was the death knell. I mean, they... <laughs> <laughs> oh, renegades, do it. Put was that an actual tour? It was a book. Was it a tour? It was. Yeah, I'm sure there was a book tour. <laughs> but, oh, uh, a book tour. but uh, I thought it was a book about them, not it, by. Them. It, it's something. It, I never bothered to. I mean, just the ads for it were enough to make me look away and never look back. But it was. Uh, it, that was the death knell right there. That was absolutely. They, they called themselves renegades. That was the funny part. Renegades. Yeah. <laughs> In Renegades, yeah, yeah. I saw that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, uh, to uh, just uh, in my own way through the experience that we're dealing with as of late, kind of add a uh, it, you know, what this brings to my mind uh, before uh, Peter retreats into the gentle night, uh, with his dental appointment tomorrow. And everybody give him thoughts, give him thoughts and prayers for that. But Peter has not had good experiences with dentists sometimes, so every once in a while, there's 
Oh, you know, uh, hopefully he's got, hopefully you've got a different one, Peter, than uh, that guy last time who, uh, you know, told you what he did and didn't treat, you know, what was obviously an emergent situation. And it just got worse. It, it was a nightmare. No, no, this is, this is the repairing of the truth. And, and this is, uh, you know, just the last time I went, they didn't fix it. They didn't, uh, uh, it was the lab guy. They, they do a scan and they screwed up the scan. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how you could not, how can you can scan a tooth and it comes back. Does this have something to do with your implant falling out? Well, it was actually not an implant that fell out. It was the post that fell out Okay. or the abutment. It's called the abutment. Okay. And uh, it didn't, it didn't fall out okay. or the abutment fell out. And then, <laughs> then when I went in, he didn't need that abutment, it, that need that abutment. But uh, he put, um, but the tooth wasn't, it didn't fit. Oh, God. So he said, okay. So, you know, he had to, you know, they have to go back and make a new tooth. Yes. And yes. because they screw it up, I said there had to be some human involvement mm -hmm. in screwing up the tooth. In other words, you, the, the computer's going to read it out perfect. It was way too big. Somebody, he says, yeah, somebody probably adjusted something. Oh, that's manually. They go, well, well, it doesn't look good, so I'm going to do it this way. And Ooh. Uh, that's probably what happened, but who the hell knows? Yeah, that's true. So I'll, I'll go in tomorrow and hopefully uh, I'll come out of there with a new tooth. Yes, yes. And um, people in the chat room have been saying um, hi, just relaying their respects. Uh, uh, Tad uh, Ricketts among them. Love and respect uh, to P.P. Moon and. Uh, so uh, aside, aside from that, uh, yeah, what this reminds me of in terms of more recent experience was that Brendan Zogit and I found it uh, very um, uh, pertinent. We, we find it relevant that uh, Trampus Nicholson, the individual who uh, betrayed himself as Sid um, with his uh, maniacal psychotic break um, that he had the other day, which has since been time stamped by Aristides. I'll talk to him um, before I go on break to uh, make certain to uh, enter that underneath the um, episode on our channel. I'll, I'll show them how to do that. Uh, but uh, the timestamp that is. But when it comes to the this individual, he has these memories as if they were his own memories. He's clearly um, older than any unemployed person or any person who has never worked a day in their life should be. Uh, but, uh, meaning he's in his forties, somewhere in his mid forties, at least. Uh, but at the same time, his memories are like somebody who's more in their sixties. Uh, he continually talks about Mama Kaz and these various, like, uh, hate Ashbury oriented, uh, experiences as if he had been there at the height of of the phenomenon and uh you know we'll, we'll like uh travel over to the heat ashbury district and sit there and cry over the former location of uh rasputin records which is like uh uh certainly a landmark establishment back in the day but that day was a long time ago just very bizarre so uh these are definitely cascade mem memories uh brendan zogit and i have concluded from uh basically old victims of the mk ultra operation who are like uh leftovers and remnants from the timothy leary days when he was involved with the cia and these uh people's uh memories have been since cascaded among other things along with altered personalities into the trampus nicholson character who was assigned to us uh, basically to do all the damage that he did, uh, including, of course, uh, loading up the chat room with links to completely drown out and suffocate anybody from talking and and, uh, and just basically driving people away. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that you deal with when you're an individual like myself, a micro-influencer uh, who is uh, a true renegade, uh, someone there the system is desperately trying to suppress. And that's what Yonda and uh, Peter and I will be uh, dealing with when we speak on uh, the second day in April, on uh, Tuesday, uh, as he said, uh, a mere 10 days from today, essentially. Um, so, Peter, any other I thoughts? Wanna, I yeah. want to run now, and I yeah. want to remind everybody to um, donate to Douglas Dietrich, if you can, even if a small amount, douglasdietrich.com, uh, upper right-hand corner, yellow button. Thank you. And uh, Douglas, I'll be back with you on Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday. Yeah. 
be here before we know it. And, uh, and I hope to listen yeah. to some of your show on uh, if you go into the political uh, stuff going on. Oh, of course. Yeah, I'll be going into that probably the remainder of the night. We might have a bit of a roundtable wait to see if George shows up for an hour and then uh, then uh, monologue after that. So we love you dearly, Peter. Thank you so much for all that you do and all that you're doing. Uh, uh, your contributions, of course, are uh, priceless. And, uh, well, have yourself a uh, blessed slumber and sweet be thy dreams, okay? Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night, dear Peter. <laughs> Okay, that's Peter Moon, SkybooksUSA.com. And uh, what we're going to do now is start our uh, calls. We're going to bring everybody we can online, and let's see who responds. Okay, pressing all of the buttons. Pressing people's buttons, that's what Douglas Dietrich does. Okay, um, and of course, uh, Aristides is welcome to... Um, uh, let us. You certainly do, Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so let's take a look. Of course, my buttons get pressed by all kinds of things. Um, uh, uh, gonna hit S or tempted to hit uh, com. Kamaka. That's true. That's that's <laughs> true. But I will. So yeah, that may be true. But I'll say one thing. Like you saw, you know, I guess we could say, you know, you saw that uh, I did get a message from Brooke. Yes. And, yes. Yeah. She had said, oh, no, you know, I'd be happy to ban him if there's a good reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but yeah. no, she said her, you know, her carrier was getting changed on her phone. She wasn't getting messages for a while or something. So, hey, you know, maybe that's what it was. So it's not always the worst case, you know, maybe the majority of the time. Dude, some of the dude, time. dude, you don't know the half of it. Then yeah. after that, I get this message that is, uh, call me when you can. And then I tried calling her multiple times and uh, no response. And then I uh, left two messages with her daughter who responded very quickly the last time that I uh, sent her a message. Yes, uh, you, um, how would I say expressing my concern? And uh, it's uh, just uh, she uh, but she didn't respond. Uh, uh, I only managed to speak with her for a few minutes, um, just prior transmission to, uh, just get some impression of what's been going on. But with, yeah, what happened after you got that message was not reassuring. Uh, I'm more reassured now that a contact was finally reestablished, but, uh, something's going on there. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have no idea what technologically what? perhaps. Yeah, yeah, technologically. Well, I, she, I didn't hear anything else after I said, call me if you want. If not, I mean, I'm sure you'll catch up with the gang, but, you know, just like good to know. Right. And um, I said, I don't know. So maybe she was, so, I mean, I guess if you get your carrier change on your phone, it can fuck things up for a while. If you switch to from. Something happened. To another... Yeah, so, something happened there. Yeah. I'm, go I'm so going to. That's what happened. So I believe that she didn't seem, uh, you know, out of sorts. She actually seemed pretty uh, friendly, her response. So. Okay. You mean friendly, like for Brooke? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, I'll yeah. block him if he gives me a reason. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. But for her, that's that's good. Yes. Yes, that's right. Uh, now I'm writing to Kama Ka Pualani Pahinui uh, and asking her. I see that you are active. Uh, would uh, you like? me to bring you on transmission and uh we'll see how she responds to that everyone else i've called and uh let's see who responds to that okay oh it helps i've got to always enter their names and got to edit what? that yes hello dear brendan uh and how Oops. are you doing catch us up on the latest occult siege activity uh, hopefully there's none but uh, in your life, uh, it's almost a given. <laughs> you were saying what? I said, catch us up on your latest occult siege activity. Oh, I've got, oh, I've got a list. Right <laughs> it's unceasing. It's fucking unceasing. Oh but my yeah, fucking god! I'm actually, I'm working a an overtime shift. I'm overseeing this. Um, uh, it's called an iftar. I'm oh. like working on, you know, who iftar yeah. like the ancient goddess? <laughs> no, no, no. If Iftar, 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 iftar. iftar. Okay. The, it's like the fifteenth day of Ramadan. Oh, so okay. They're having, they're having like a party, and I, 
I volunteered my time at this. Well, not volunteered. I'm getting paid overtime. <laughs> I'm at the school to oversee the situation. Uh-huh. And how's it going? It, does this mean that you're going to be taken away from us because you're so busy or what? Yeah, I'm trying to catch up on. So I'm using it as to my advantage to catch up on other stuff that I'm supposed to do here. Oh, got but, it. Got it. Oh. So it's like two birds with one stone. So the rest of the week I can just sit down and do nothing. Oh, God. I, I so hope that uh, you accomplish that. Uh, so but can you spare a few minutes to talk with Aristides while I refresh myself? Or do you want me to hold off for a few minutes while you do something specific? Can you wait until midnight? <laughs> you midnight no, pacific daylight I, time uh yeah i would i would prefer not to i would prefer to refresh myself now but uh do you uh it, you know how about we just hold on till somebody else shows up but you know just keep checking in with us um uh, certainly I got, I got concerned that you called exactly at 901 i thought peter defected or something uh, oh no thank god no no he's just uh he has to see a dentist tomorrow so um oh. he needs to catch up on sleep so uh, I can understand that. No, normally, just so you understand, he normally goes to bed 10 p.m. every night except transmission yeah, nights. True. Yeah, yeah. So he, he just stays up late these nights, and I'm glad that he um, went to catch up on some sleep. He certainly has earned that. Um, so, so such oh. being... <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, I just said, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, aside from all that, I was sharing with him, of course, some conclusions you and I had drawn about Trampus Nicholson, about his cascade memories from, you know, old has-beens from the old MK Ultra programs during the Timothy Leary days and shit. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, yeah, all of that being said, uh, are you, um, okay, I'll, I'll hold off till midnight if, uh, or well, until somebody shows up. Yeah. How about this? As you do, you do a quick one. Uh-huh. And then after I'm done, I will join you guys. Again. Okay, okay. So, so I'll, I'll do. That's not okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a quick one for a few minutes. Okay, I'll be back as soon. That uh, you know, just as short as possible. Then as soon as I'm back, you can go back to what you're doing and and then join us again. Right? right? That's the plan. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So let me go mute. Because yeah. because if I let, if I just leave those all yeah. those people un, unattended. Attended. You know, yeah, yeah, they're gonna just, yeah, they'll just, you'll, know, they'll, they'll wind up wrapped up in an orgy or something. If, <laughs> well, that's haram. But if, if, um, if I, yeah, if I didn't speak Arabic, they would have taken over the whole school. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> like, like they only, they're only listening to me because they think I'm Muslim. Yeah, and they, some of these kids, um, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. There, there seems to be a delay. Yeah, no, there definitely is. is the delay you, you were glitching a little bit. They're intercepting you. Is it They're improved? Int- yeah, it's improved. It's improved. Okay. Yeah. So, but yeah, you won't. Be- yeah. Some of the kids, were, they wouldn't let these Mexican girls inside. They were like, no Americans. <laughs> oh my God. That's funny. That's funny. <laughs> so I was like, I had to like, I had to like, let open the bathroom for them because like the other, the Muslims were like, yeah, you can't come in. Yeah, no my Americans. God. Oh my god! Oh my god! That's funny. That's almost cute. So there, there goes your multiculturalism. Sorry, um, sorry, Biden people or whoever you are. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's all yeah. Well, it's, it's very one-sided. I'm not being political. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. But that's how yeah. everybody is. Everybody's like yeah. that, though. Everybody's like that. And yeah. uh, you know, you had to you know, imagine the irony. Brendan had to explain to. The, to these kids, yeah. they're not American, not by white people standards. Yeah, yeah exactly. there you go. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Pretty much. Oh my God. Uh, it's, uh, okay, so uh, it'll only take me a few minutes. I'll be right back. Um, oh, Aristides, please come on mute, and uh, that way you can hold the conversation with Brendan. That okay. would help. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just in case I have to go deal right. with something. Yeah. Uh, understood. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll be right back. Uh, I'll All let right. you know. So yeah, they're like I'll riding around on chairs, like. Supermaning on chairs and shit. <laughs> they they think they're flying carpets. Okay, I'll be yeah, right back. Pretty much. <laughs> okay. So yes. hey, How's Brennan. So like this activity is going on right now where you're at. Like people are flying around, sliding around on chairs, and there's yeah. people, like there's people there now. Well, I'm just I'm actually here just to work some. Uh, like yeah. Uh huh. So there, there's well, people currently there. Like, is there I, still I, a delay? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. A little bit, but I thought you were like uh-huh. basically the night guy, and there was like nobody around. 
Usually, usually, but I'm working a special event. Oh, I see, I see, okay. Um, but that's, you know, all right, that's what's okay. going on, basically. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, cool. Uh, what else, what can you tell us about how it's going for you? What else? What's it? Well, I mean, pretty much everything's, everything's going well, you know. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Just well, trying to keep, yeah, just trying to keep kosher, stay, you know. Dude, man, I'm impressed with your ability to keep turning around situations and keep fucking going, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's rough. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not ideal, you know. It's definitely not ideal, you know. So, but it's like, yeah. yeah. But uh, do you have any topics like other than that? Yeah. There you go. You go. Oh gosh, uh, man. I don't know, man. What do you What have you been seeing? You know, we're talking about news kind of stuff going on in the world right now, but like. We can, we can bring some stuff up. Just just give me a second here. Hold on. Yeah. But I mean, it's easy to uh, tune out of with, uh, uh, you know, everything going on in your personal life. Um, we were uh, uh, talking about uh, expanded war in the Middle East. And uh, what else did Peter talk about? Uh, Covered the uh, the Moscow shooting incident. Uh, some astrology. Peter's good on that. Uh, Peter uh, talked about moving around a lot when he was a kid. I'm just kind of going over what we talked about so far. If you're just tuning in, uh, the uh, yeah, expanding World War Three. Uh, France uh, possibly moving troops into uh ukraine let me google that right now is france uh sending troops to the yeah it came right up a lot of people must be searching this uh let's see french military chief backs macron over possibility of sending troops to ukraine two days ago so it's like it's being put out there as a possibility that France could send troops, which I think is significant that a Western nation is ready to put boots on the ground and not just send aid, just kind of crosses a line. Um, let's see. And of course, you know, I don't know, France. Not everybody likes Macron in France. I was listening to a guy, a uh, French guy in a, in a voice chat, and he pops in and with a super thick French accent. The very first thing he said is, Macron is a faggot. Yeah, so... You know, he's got his uh, tractors over there. Uh, let's see. What else we talk about? Um, yeah. France is long-time rivalry, rivalry with Russia. Um, so, apparently they had a war. I mean, how many wars do they have? Let's see. France, Russia, war. Uh, I see at least three different dates coming up. Uh, France, let me try again. France, Russia, war. 1854, 1805, 1870, 1860. So it's like for a lot of the 1800s, uh, France and Russia were going at it. Uh, what else did we cover? We talked about David and Lewis Anderson a bit, the time scientist. Uh, who? Are you, hello. Yeah, Are you still there? Yeah, I'm just. I was on yeah, mute. I've just I been on. talking through. Like I had notes written down about what okay. we talked about in the program, so I was just kind of giving like a okay. little summary notes about that. Uh, what we talked about? Uh, oh, cool. cool. The Moscow shooting yeah, thing. I, I had to confiscate the chair. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's probably smart, dude. You just gotta <laughs> calm it. You just gotta take it down this time. Of yeah, night. take it down and I'll just take it down. Yeah, 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 guys. Yeah, we talked about you know a lot of a lot of a uh, lot of uh, talk about. The, the shit going down in Moscow, this uh, like shooting thing, this terrorist incident. Yeah, yeah. that was interesting. That's yeah, kind of the big thing. Happened there, they don't, they aren't releasing much info. On. Um, that? yeah, just uh, talk about other shit we talked about. Yeah, war looming there. Uh, I kind of brought up France. I thought it was significant that France is like stepping up to be the first Western country to like put boots on the ground in Ukraine because it like. As for as uh-huh. much aid as you send, as soon as like you send your troops in and they hit the ground, like you're in the war now. You know what I mean? Like 
Uh-huh. You're not just you're not just like kind of a secondary party sending aid. You're like you're in the war. Yeah. So right. it's stepping well, the up. The French, the French have like the foreign legion and all that. Yeah. Stuff. I mean, they're more yeah. international, but still, I mean. And like, it's funny because France like has a lot of historical animosity with Russia. I guess is that. I don't know. Uh, What'd you say? Does France have a lot of like historical like animosity with Russia? Like, oh, big time! Yeah, of course. They've Napoleon. had wars. Yeah, they've had wars. Yeah. They've had wars. Yeah, right. Napoleon. They had the whole Napoleon beef still. Yeah, that's yeah. Napoleon. Right. Like there's still beef. There's still like they may have had treaties at some point, but there's like there's always like that. Eh, fight, yeah. You know, like that kind of beef yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what else we talk about? Um, yeah, revisit. I mean, there's uh, a uh, huh? uh, there's yeah. like um, an eclipse happening tonight. Did you guys talk yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Well, when uh, lunar is that the that oh, okay. lunar, lunar. Okay, because like the one, the solar one starts so across the U.S. That's in April. Yeah, yeah. But there's like uh, there's a pre, you know, there's a lunar 30 net. days before that. There's this one. Uh, well, wow. What a uh, okay. So it's like a two for. <laughs> hold, on. hold on one second, one second. Yeah, yeah okay i'm back i'm back uh oh, okay. yeah and uh so uh let's see if our friend needs to go back to work or or not and uh, okay. uh but i'm back for you what were you talking about uh, uh, just, uh he had to go i mean for a couple minutes so i just briefly summarized stuff we had been talking about for anybody that just joined us Ooh. and uh, uh and then he uh popped back on Ooh. and he's and he's trying to calm down a, uh, like, usually you envision him, he's, like, in this empty building, you know what I mean? He's, like, the night guy. Yeah. Like, there's actually shit going on. He's, <laughs> there's people, like, people, like, do chair surfing around. And, uh, <laughs> oh, he's trying to calm calm that down, too. But he did a good job. There we are. And uh, that's so funny. So uh, let's go on a screen share here. Uh, and uh, can, can, can you see this, Aristides? Uh, yes, I can see. Okay, Pretty good, yeah. good. So uh, here's what I'll uh, try and show you. Let's see. First off, live streaming seems fine. Uh, it's still got numbers. Uh, oh, yeah. So this is, of course, as you know, this is the infamous episode in question. And uh, so just uh, scroll down a bit and wait for it to stabilize here so we can get a good look at uh, where we're at. So this is the infamous episode in question. And um, Am I still audible? Yes! Yes! Oh, by all means. Uh, uh, I'm back, but you're, you're, wel- yeah, you're welcome to stay with us as long as you feel safe doing so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I personally feel, feel fine. It's just I had to confiscate the chair again. Okay. Okay, I mean, uh, de- definitely stay with us as long as you feel safe doing so and that you don't need to supervise all these people. But I'm trying to show Aristides that what I'd like him to do is is go to this infamous episode. And he wrote me this email saying, you know, I told myself I'd never go back, but I went back and here's the link. And just say the same thing right here. Just enter it as a comment. I'd really like for you to do that, Aristides, so that way people have that timestamp. You know, okay, right, it, let me, yeah. okay, while you're talking, okay, I'll work on that right now while you're talking. Yeah. What's the scandal with this infamous episode? Oh, yeah. God, you know, it's it's, it's our favorite. Uh, it, it's basically when Brandon Young uh, provided this stinking bait that he threw out there. And I had to obligatorily address it publicly because of course otherwise uh the it would be told to peter moon in a in a far worse manner indirectly so yeah. and peter moon took that stinking bait and ran with it <laughs> when i informed him about it at the yeah. time at the time that it was brought up uh instead of condemning uh brandon young he character assassinated brooke gibson uh you know it is what it is and uh that's uh yeah, so that's the episode. And what happened was our man Aristides said, I, he sent me this email. I told myself I'd never go back, but I went back and reviewed it. And here's the timestamp. So I'd like him to actually say the same thing, you know, put it in the uh, bottom of this episode so that people can take advantage of that timestamp and just listen out of morbid interest to what, in a sense, is the negative highlight of the episode. But that will hopefully get them to listen to the rest of it, which, of course, was a good episode it, it was retrieved uh it, of course uh due to our dear friend uh jennifer hawkins who after that suffered a terrible occult attack and a series of them and uh and and that of course threw off her interview interviewing myself 
which we had scheduled. So the enemy accomplished what they wanted to accomplish. And uh, in that sense, uh, but other than that, um, I, uh, as I said, um, because of the tremendous uh, favor that was done by Jennifer Hawkins originally, I consider her and I to be even, uh, and uh, we'll just take it from there. Uh, so, all all that being said, uh, yeah, yeah. Other, other than that, Brendan, um, you said that the you know it's it's unending, ceaseless these attacks. What have you? Something new happened lately that um, should be brought to our attention, perhaps. Yeah, it's like they've taken it to the point where they've they've tried to freeze my accounts oh. uh, to the point where I was almost left without food this morning. Oh my god! So I go oh. to, I go to try to use um, the um, what's it called the you know like a contactless payment like yeah. similar to Apple Pay these kind of in, uh, electronic payments. Yeah. Which I know better not to, not to use typically, but this is like my last bit of money. I didn't have any left. Yeah. And and it, it said that the card was expired, quote unquote. Yeah. And even when I called the the provider and asked them, I said, these are digital cards. They have no expiration date. And they said, yeah, we've never heard of this before. Holy shit. So Holy basically shit. They, they've resorted to casting money drying spells to the point where my money's locked in. You know, yeah. Basically, they're hitting me from every avenue to get me to stop helping you. In other words, yes, yes. You know, that's... so first it was first yeah. it was me. They couldn't kill me by making me homeless, so now they're just going to shut off my money. Yeah, yeah. Basically, it, yeah. It, it's 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 so. Dis... It's important to say it publicly that it, that's what's going on. Because even the bank itself had no explanation. They said, and they were able to remedy it, but it was just an anomaly. They just basically said, "Oh, that we've never seen that ever happen." <clears throat> So I, I chalk it up to supernatural. Yeah, no, no, it is. It is. Uh, it, it, you're, you, you're, um, you're, you're suffering for your uh, allegiance to myself, which, of course, says for people who do not know, uh, Brendan Zogit tried to play the neutral party, but they would not allow it. They uh, have only the uh, paradigm that you're with us or against us. And uh, he's been paying the price ever since, but uh, to his credit, and, and uh, he is uh, standing fast, uh, and, and we need to maintain him in our thoughts and prayers, by all means, dear Brendan, thank you for what you yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, to let people understand just how Brendan Zogit, they're trying to, of course, drive him ultimately to delete the channel. He has the nuclear button. Brendan Zogit is a, basically who helped me establish my channel, therefore has the back door into the managerial page where there is a big red nuclear button that says delete channel. And uh, they're trying to drive him to press that button. Um, you might ask, why don't they just go in and do it themselves? There's several reasons, as I said before, that the NSA just does not uh, avail itself of that kind of power. They really do not... Uh, uh, the government doesn't do anything itself anymore. It outsources everything, um, even uh, espionage. So uh, the point is that it's become increasingly difficult for the government to take unilateral actions like that. And uh, they have to go through YouTube and they have to do things like file reports to YouTube that are violating YouTube standards and then have YouTube shut me down. Uh, so the only other way is to get the person uh, who manages the channel to shut it down. And, of course, the closest thing to myself would be Brendan Zogie. Um And this is why they hit him um, again and again as hard as they can um, in this manner. Uh, so uh, hopefully that pe gives people an understanding of the gravity of the situation. And um, so thank you, Brendan, for your loyalty yes. and um, your, your standing fast. Uh, anything else that brings to mind that you'd like people to know about? Um, pretty much... Uh... No, that's that's all I have. But I have some topical stuff. Like there's an eclipse happening yeah. here in an hour or so. Yeah, tell hours. us about this. Tell us about what you feel about the implications of this, or what you know is written in the stars, so to speak, that should be brought yeah. to our attention. Yeah. Well, um, things that are like just noteworthy, or like the eclipse itself is like um, it's happening in sidereal. Let's see where the moon is. I'm looking at it right now. Mm -hmm. So let's see. We got okay. Sidereal Virgo. Mm -hmm. So it's in Hasta Nakshatra, which is like the beginning of Virgo. 
Mm-hmm. So it's gonna, it's definitely has to do with like markets, the marketplace, like productivity. Mm-hmm. And then the solar eclipse is gonna happen in Pisces mm-hmm. around that area of the zodiac. So that's more like international trade, right? Mm-hmm. Water, trading over water. So there could be like a. Oh, great. The Houthis I'm, are gonna I'm sink. The Houthis are gonna sink the U.S. task force. Anyhow, go on. <laughs> yes. Oh, wait. We have, we have some naval battles going on that i don't know about oh yeah the well, houthis are of course uh theor- they, they the russians claim they launched a hypersonic missile or tested a hypersonic missile in the red sea or in the uh you know in the persian gulf area region the arabian peninsula which goes into uh the um at any rate uh it's is it the gulf of aden uh yeah near the gulf of aden yeah. that yeah. the american task force was getting near so they if that's true they have the ability to take down some heavy duty military ships but but uh, right. they, they certainly have been active and they forced many people to divert their maritime traffic away from the Suez Canal and go across the Horn of Africa. Uh, so they're costing hundreds of billions of dollars in trade. It's already, already begun. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's affecting. Yeah, it's affecting global trade on the seas. And yeah. then um, it's also going to affect like and this this isn't just the eclipse itself, but this is like multifactorial, the yes. whole chart in general. Yes. Of the sky, the whole sky. um the, the celestial spheres activities it's basically um there will be conflicts on water and it will disrupt global trade even further so it looks like sounds like we're already there i don't yeah yeah, yeah we it's are to predict when it's already happening right? <laughs> yeah well what it means is some some intensifying incident some incident yeah. will will definitely take place that will intensify everything go on yeah right because like Pisces is like the water, you know, the oceans of existence, etc. Yeah. So it it'll as above, so below. It'll project onto the plane, the Earth, planet. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's going to be interesting. Yeah, to say the least. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Right. And um. Okay, I I have to go check on stuff. There's like some. Uh, like the fuzz just showed up, so I have to go check. Out oh that. shit! Okay, good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Anubis Publishing yeah. showed up, and I blocked him again, banned him again. But right. he came back after I yeah. banned him. He came back. Go on. Uh huh. Okay, take care of your problem. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Bye for now. All right, that's Brendan Zogit. Now we're back with Aristides and um, Aristides. Okay. Um, yeah. Let me so show you. you blocked it. You blocked him, but is that like forever or per episode? It's supposed like, to be. It's supposed to be forever, but obviously it's per, per episode. Yeah, because it's right. like he's well, he's part of the establishment, right? No renegade there. I mean, he's just like I said, he's a product of some MK Ultra program. So let me go back to sharing screen again and just uh, okay. So you can see the cursor moving, right? Um. Well, it's very small on my phone, but I can see your live screen. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Great. So, uh, go to switch over now to. Uh, so the fuzz showed up. Police showed up at his school, and then he had to hang up. So I see yeah. that you entered it in the chat room. That's that's okay. That's that's fine. What? Thank you for that. Where? What? You, huh? Vril. That's you. It's... Where? Where did I enter? You... Oh, the ep- <laughs> yeah, yeah. I entered that, but that's the point of the episode. But then on the episode, I put the comment. Oh, let me see. Let me see. Okay. Um. Okay, I reset it, and it says two comments. Oh, your comment, for some reason, is not visible. Why is that? Uh, I'll go check. Huh? Yeah, you, well, the problem is you can see it, maybe, but... Uh, you yeah, know, it might take a minute. And okay, it might, got it, got it. It might know. take a while for um, it to... Yeah, it, probably YouTube screening right. it to make sure it's not a it terrorist might. threat. It could be. It could. I think sometimes... Because like when I was looking for stuff before, it just it seemed like it took a minute. Uh, okay, to come got up. it. So it might take a minute and it come up, but I see it. Okay, so 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 so, so 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 yeah, uh, we'll check it again later. No big yeah. deal. But thank you, thank you. Okay, or, so you do know what you're doing. <laughs> yes, you yeah, do know. Kind what of. <laughs> I kind of. Or or what I can do is I can go see what time that is and just be like, hey, go to this time. Uh, uh, um. Yeah. Uh, well, that's your timestamp. Uh, that's your timestamp. Yeah, right, right, right. But for some reason, my link doesn't show. I'll put in another comment with the actual time, which is okay. I three, get it. Three hours, oh, got it. Three got hours, it. Three hours, forty-eight minutes. Right. Okay. So okay. So I'll stop sharing. In the meantime, uh, Aristides uh, has got this, and that's that's excellent. Thank you. And 
Okay, now I'm going to breathe and I'm going to prepare for potentially monologuing, uh, you know, right now because it's, uh, we obviously have uh, a lot of people who may or may not show up, um, but uh, uh, just a message to everybody. If you do show up, let me know you're here, and I will uh, uh, thereafter take it and uh, work with it. Um, and uh, just checking some uh, private messages coming in, and uh, oh my god, so uh, the package from Amy Como arrived. It is so fucking weird. She received a notification that it arrived on Friday into last weekend. It did not arrive until like days and days after that, you know, um, very bizarre, absolutely bizarre. Uh, but, um, oh, uh, aside from that, Aristides, before I go into this kind of prelude to the monologue, um, anything you want to bring to our attention? Hmm. Uh, uh, I'm thinking, let me keep thinking on that. Sure. Um, sure. I had, uh, let's see, the other time you were going, I was like, I thought it was funny that, like, basically, like, I don't read much into the conventional news, but I saw that we were we were bombing uh, Iranians in two countries that were not Iran. <laughs> By the way, that's not that's uh, that that's I yeah. That, how do I say it? it's funny, but it's not funny. It's ironic. Right. Yeah, ironic. 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 Right. Exactly. Yeah, ironic. You got it. Yeah, I don't think Peter, <laughs> Peter got it when I was saying, it, but I was just like, how like just. Whatever that means, it's not good. It's like we're not even bombing them. We're like, well, people from there are over here doing stuff, so we're going to bomb these two other countries. Uh, but it's, yeah, but, but it's, it's Iran. Yeah, but it's symptomatic. It is symptomatic right. of what's to come, and uh, so potentially, yeah. fuck. I hope America doesn't get involved in a war with Iran. That would be just so fucking yeah. stupid and pointless. And you know, I I do not like their form of government at all that that they need a fucking regime change uh believe me uh, this is not something that's hubristic or bigoted like oh uh, who are you to say uh, a people needs a regime change believe me the iranian people want a regime change okay <laughs> that's uh, uh believe me it, it, it's uh, uh of course if i had my way I would reestablish the Achaemenid dynasty, or the Achaemenid dynasty, but uh, meaning the Shah and their family. Uh, I uh, looked it up the other day because I never really knew, uh, but the Shah was buried in uh, the tomb of kings in Egypt, which uh, is interesting to me. Uh, and uh, so that's cool. Um, I was glad to see he wasn't buried someplace in the United States. That would just fucking suck. But um, so uh, there you go with that. And that's fascinating in and of itself. Uh, but um, yeah, what else comes to your mind? So we, yeah, we're obviously, we're, yeah, obviously doing weird things all over the world. What, would anything else yeah. stand up? Yeah. yeah. Let me think. Let me think. Uh, what else did Peter bring up when you were gone? He was like, oh, he brought up some, he just like, remember that it was like it was like a baseball thing apparently there's this team called the red devils or the uh, uh this base let me see i saved the link here and there was a guy so there's a guy on this baseball team uh which the this it's spanish for the red devils it's uh let me see, wait, no, no. oh diablos rojos del mexico All right uh, Mexican baseball, and the guy's name is Aristides Aquino. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. fucking right! I didn't I mean, even so notice now, now that. Go on. Huh? I didn't even yeah, notice so that. that because he he had sent that to me earlier, and it didn't yeah. register. All that all, all right. that registered was the Aquino part, and I didn't yeah. even notice he said the guy's name was Aristides Aquino, but yeah, he did. Right. Oh my fucking god! That is so fucking funny. That is. I know. Is there... Now I'm done. Yeah. Now I'm done for. Now I'm like. <laughs> or he has a last name, uh, oh. Nunez or or something. Okay. So Aquino's but his like, middle that's name. His middle name. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. It like that's his like show name, but yeah. like yeah. It's, it's, then it was his like full name. Okay. Aristides Aquino Nunez born. Yeah. 1994 yeah. Dominican professional baseball outfielder for the Diablos Rojos no, del man. Mexico. Yeah, they ought to ensconce him in bronze. They ought to ensconce him in bronze just for that name yeah. alone. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. that's funny. Uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, the, and uh, like I said, it, you know, when Peter writes me these messages, half the time I'm just preparing for the show, and God, people have uh-huh. no idea just what it's like. It's it's like yeah. literally just balls to the wall every time. Oh, so. Right. So and then you must have gotten home and then you saw my message with the video of like Rabbi Shmuley and then you're like you were just like totally like it is out, like oh God. It totally killed your vibe. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, no, it's awful. I mean that's it's like yeah. Yeah, I mean just for future reference, yeah, I don't need to see things like that. That is like literally well, nobody does. Yeah. Nobody does. That's, that's the point. Yeah. Nobody ever needed to see that. Yes. Why did you that yes to himself no less to himself no less himself and then just like it's just i I mean more importantly to us it's more importantly he he did us a disfavor uh, yeah yeah did us a wrong reflect well on anyone yeah whatsoever yeah especially he's got children there he's like saying weird shit too i don't know it's like yeah like you know i'm that guy right and they're like yeah yeah that's just horrible. That's just horrible. Yeah, That's true. Right. That is a form of child exploitation, by the way. It really was bad. Yeah, yeah that so, is. Like, you know, I mean, they were, you know, I guess it was Jewish children there, but I, I still felt bad for them. Yes. <laughs> by the way, that's hideously funny. That is hideously funny. I, I, I like that. I like that. He came out all wrong. I mean, he, he, know, he doesn't mean it like children, that. But... They're children. They don't, they don't, yeah. you know, yeah. they don't. They, it's yeah. just, yeah. what could they think of that yeah know. yeah no no that's awful. damaging very damaging yeah but but of course it's it's uh of course the child that he picks up is notably blonde notably blue-eyed and could be mistaken right. for you know a teutonic or some other uh right. a, a nordic right. ethnicity or something but it's uh-huh. like uh which is what they groove off of i mean it's like yeah. uh uh honestly to, to just uh let it be understood that there is a certain kind of personality type that gets off on um, being as repulsive as possible and catering to all the negative mm-hmm. stereotypes. And um, I have no idea what this is or what it's about. There's this Jewish guy whose comedy shtick, if you could call it that, is he calls himself the amazing racist. And so he'll, he'll go around and his comedy shtick is that he'll do all this racist shit in front of people and get them all uncomfortable and then... And then later, it's only a joke. That's if he says that to them at all. Uh, you Just know, a different guy. You moved on to a different guy. Uh, yeah, he moves on. Yeah, he moves on with each show. Uh, I, I of course have not kept track of this person, but I just saw his shtick because it comes up on my YouTube feed, probably because of everything I say and, you know, the analog machine goes into action and he's talking about Jews and racism and he'll love this. Yeah. And so I get this shit thrown up at me on my feed. But uh, yeah, a good example of what this guy did was he'll like uh, um, somehow be, so maybe these things are set up, but these people look like they're genuinely dumbfounded uh, but he'll be like at a gas station and then uh, a black guy shows up with a white woman in his car and they're in a convertible so you can easily see them. So this this could very well just be a setup. Maybe all this was arranged and orchestrated because, you know, very few people drive convertibles because, you know, it, it's it's like so that's almost done with intent so you can see them. Uh, so that's almost a, a setup. But, you know, they play act like they're completely appalled. But, you know, the black guy will try and refill the gas and the white woman's sitting in the car. So then he'll run up. Are you all right? Is he abducting you? Are you safe? Do you want me to call the police? Uh, he'll go on with his shtick while the white woman's like melting into the car. Like, I wish I wasn't here, you know. And, and so it's like, OK, if that's what you get off on, like, I, I don't know. Maybe some people find that funny. Uh, I just find it stupid and uh, and a waste of time. So that was the last time I ever looked at. But I see he keeps cropping up and it's always the same shtick, uh, you know, doing something different with different people. But there you go. Uh, and, and so some people groove off that. They just feel like... Uh, this is like yes. the, their thing. Um, uh, this so, was a comedian. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. He's probably uh, like. I mean, we could probably look up his name. So let's let's look up the amazing racist comedian. Uh, amazing uh, racist racist <laughs> comedian. Uh, and of course, he's got all kinds of videos out there. And uh, uh, inappropriate comedy. Ari I'm Shafir. Gonna, uh-huh. Ari Shafir yeah. as the amazing. We racist. have to go look that up. I like the way he gives himself 
a right. a a Arab as hell name. Uh, he of looks course. he looks painfully Jewish. <laughs> um, the uh, called the racist comedian. Was it? What's it called? The That's amazing the, racist comedian. The amazing. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so then he like here he is asking Jews to sign petitions. Uh, he's probably going around asking Jews to sign petitions for you know uh, a new Holocaust uh, or something. Right. Uh, All right. Shafir. Ari Shafir. Ari Shafir, yeah. Yeah, uh, okay, so yeah, of course he could be a racist comedian, but yeah. like, you know, if you're a different kind of racist comedian, oh no. <laughs> no, that's so no, true. Can't have that, can't have that, no, but he can be racist, right? Yeah, yeah, and of course he does who's shit. He, who's he yeah. racist against? Who did he say he was racist against? It, it, it's like, he, well, like I said, he looks painfully yeah. Jewish, so it's not like he's okay. hiding so anything. Like, okay, he's racist, so he must be, like, hating on somebody. Who do you say he was hating on? Well, he his, his job is just to piss everybody off. He's like, some of these people, they just go around triggering people. Right, With right. his trip, like, right. he's asking, there's well, one video here where he's loaded up by, I notice all these things are loaded up by somebody called the Sham Wow guy, which itself is funny. That's funny. <laughs> the Sham Wow guy part. Right. But anyhow, they say, the amazing racist asks Jews to sign petitions. So obviously he's making Jews uncomfortable. I have no idea what the petition is, but I would yeah. guess it would be something like, oh, sign this petition to get all the Jews kicked out of New York or something. Probably something stupid yeah. like that then he'll ask I mean, okay i don't know it could i i i got he's being racist only against jews oh right? no 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 it's like i said he's a he yeah. he just triggers it like he wears a kkk hood in the middle right. of los angeles and shit right. you know uh, i mean something okay, like that might like i'm wondering like yeah. if you're really racist like that's not like a victim of victimless crime you're racist against somebody i was just wondering who he had it in for like, <laughs> did he be like oh i hate blacks i hate whites i hate uh, he, he, he's, like, he's trying to just or, say that he's he like everybody. not really like i was like i'm not really gonna say who i'm racist against i'm just i'm just racist uh, yeah it's it's just it's just he's trying to trigger everybody uh theoretically right. theoretically right. but the excuse it's is just a shock it's like a shock yeah but the excuse is Hey, it's just a joke. I'm Jewish. That's what it comes down to in the end. Uh, you know, right. and, and uh, I, I, right. I, you know, people might call me racist, but yeah. I find it hard to believe this guy would be Muslim. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's he's going with a Muslim as hell name, but uh, he, he, um, normally a Muslim's got other things to worry. A Muslim would be genuinely concerned for his life. You get what I'm saying? It takes right. a real sense of privilege to do this. Like somebody yeah, truly yeah, feels yeah. a sense of immunity. So he apparently was an opening act for Joe Rogan in the late 2000s. So this started it all. He was an opening act for Joe Rogan. That explains everything. Yeah, that, that, yeah, there you go. That's the level at which Joe Rogan operates, which is. Yeah, well. In- I, he must not have been a very good racist because I've never heard of him. <laughs> really, honestly, it's news to me. Uh, yeah, that's funny as hell. Uh, fuck, I hope that, I, I hope uh, Brendan Zoe gets okay. I know he said he'd be back around midnight, but uh, it, when you think about the fact the cops showed up, that'd be funny imagining him and everybody else getting cuffed and shit, you know? And uh, I, I doubt it. Yeah. Like, the cops will, like, what happens? They'll hit a scene. Yeah. And they'll like they of course they have to do an assessment like what's going you know they hit a scene they don't know really who's at fault or really yeah. but then they'll be like within a few minutes they'll be like this is the responsible guy like yeah. he's you know what I mean like he just he's just got the calm you know yeah. I'm in control here demeanor like here's how it is man like, <laughs> you got him like, down oh, yeah. yeah you got him down yeah <laughs> yeah he won't he'll, he won't get in trouble I I, I but, you know we'll smooth talk him. <sighs> No, that's pretty oh, funny. Yeah. And I'm just a janitor here. Yeah, you're right. They were getting pretty wild, you know. Yeah, I know. I did my best. Calm down. Thank God you're here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it being, is not that like a, a classic trope for a horror film? They're in the haunted schoolhouse. Somebody gets possessed and shit. <laughs> that could be what happened. Yeah. They were, he said they were all chair sliding and shit. So they uh, uh, could be one of them. Uh, yeah. Yeah, started exhibiting, uh, you know, the signs of the head twist and the green uh, pea soup vomit and all that. Uh, yeah, but we'll see what happens. He'll have a, he'll always have a story to tell. But go on. Yeah, I came across, you know, I like I browse channels with like books and stuff, and I came across what was an interesting book about basically in like early Judaism equivalent of like Christian possession. Um, that they apparently have that 
had that kind of thing. They had. Yeah. They, yeah. Thank you. And, and please share references. It. These are always fascinating. Yes. By all means. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. Let's see here. I can pull it up. I, get, I could actually send it to you, but it, it has a lot of like, they, they actually considered cases of like a demonic, like a possession also. Mm-hmm. Um, Between Worlds, the book is called. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, a di- di- Dibuk is like a, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. They're in their name for like. Yeah, no, yeah. you're doing a great job. That's that's a good <laughs> I, pronunciation Jewish of it. Exorcist and early modern Judaism. So I, I paged through it. Uh-huh. Uh, I didn't have time to read it all, but like they had their uh, their take on people being, you know, possessed also. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pretty interesting. No, definitely. It's uh, it, it's something that uh, uh, be happy to look through it myself. So thank you for whatever. Yeah, uh-huh. uh, yeah I'll send it to you. I'll yeah, PDF or the, the uh, like. Yeah, and... a lot of references. You know, it, it's interesting when you go back to like, the, you know, it's like almost like a, you know, the big bang of religion and it all came out like there was a lot of similarities between uh, you know, some of the early forms of everything. Mm-hmm. It wasn't so concrete as it is now. You know? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. It's, it's like, uh, uh, it, it always seems to be, um, how would I say it? So much more, uh, uh, pure or legitimate when you look back at the old days, rather real uh-huh. old days, rather than, you know, the crap we're dealing with now. Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, I'm, uh, you know, it'll probably take me a while to find it. I'd have to look for it. Uh, but there's a, um, incredible, um, cover, uh, that was done and it was a photograph, photographic cover of a, uh, wax model, uh, that was, uh, done for a horror novel back when horror was really big and exploding in the eighties, uh, about a, uh, Jewish possession story. Um, about a man who's, who's a Jewish man whose bride is possessed on the night of the wedding. Um, so I'll, I'll have to find that because it's like uh, the wax model was done so well that they, they took photographs of it from several angles. Uh, but, uh, y- you know, this was back in the days when we did not have computers uh, and people uh, would buy a, a, uh, a novel, a paperback novel based on the cover, uh, and the covers could be quite creative. They would fold. Sometimes covers would fold in and out, and they'd have like, uh, be like a panel, almost like a cover that had like uh, two or three covers. So this was like one of them because the, uh, the wax uh, model was done so well, they took uh, photographs of it. So one was on the back of the co- cover, back of the book where they had the so, text. Oh, it, yeah. So it wasn't just like, didn't like, Pornos would have that where it would be like the cover, like or like you know swimsuit editions and stuff would have like where you fold out the cover. You yeah, kind of, kind, kind of like that, cover. yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. But it wasn't like a centerfold. It wasn't like a centerfold right. where it was like what so they had it for other things. Yeah, yeah, they had it for other things. Little paperback books would have that, and little paperback uh, books used to be published uh, that had uh, um, what would you call it? Uh, photographs. They used to be published, but they don't do that anymore. Uh, yeah. They got so fucking cheap, and then the old uh, paperback books you used to buy that had photographs in it, they stopped putting photographs in them, and then uh, it, it's it's just awful. So, um, okay, so it says, accept files only from people you trust. Yeah. You know, I trust uh, Aristides. And obviously yeah, he looked through this, and nothing happened to him. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> His computer, that is. So I'll I open don't it think later. so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yet at least, yet to manifest. So there we are, between the worlds. Fascinating. I'll, yeah, I'll I just put the P- I don't have a link for it. I can't really share it because I just got the actual file. Itself. I don't have a, a web link for it. Got it. So I'll open that later. Yeah. Okay. Um, so forgive me why I yawn. Other, yeah, let's see what other interesting books. Uh, currently, uh, whew, somebody had me look up uh, obscure little pamphlet on general Patton and apparently he believed in reincarnation and he thought he was a, you know, a big military guy in many in- incarnations. Yes. You ever heard of with Patton? Yeah. Yeah. He, he, yeah. he, he had, um, in fact, the way, the first time I encountered that was as a child, uh, with the book of lists. One of my favorite books was the book of lists and, uh, the book of lists had all kinds of lists. And uh, one of the lists was, you know, General Patton's past lives. <laughs> yeah. He had. I could, yeah. yeah, I could send you the pamphlet. You can sure. uh, a zip file. You can deal with that, right? Yeah, I think you so. Can unpack a zip. Yeah, I right. think so. If I have I problems, I, I can always ask. PDF. Yeah. No worries. If if I can't unpack it, I'll always ask you for help. Yeah. So not yeah, a problem. Right. 
And yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, do me a favor yeah. with both these files. Send them to me in the private messages. So oh. because um, okay. It, it's okay to send them in the public messages as well, okay. but always double it up because when you send so you can, right, yeah, find it in yours, yeah. Yeah, later after the call is over. Otherwise, I have to dig up the call. And then I have to yeah. remember which call uh, the subject was brought up in. Yeah, it gets very, <laughs> yeah, once you see the list of old calls, you don't know what's. And yeah. if somebody comments, you know, it, it, the order can change. Uh, uh, forgive me. Oh, anyway, what I'm doing is I'm just kind of like uh, prepping to... Yeah to uh, go into prelude monologue mode uh, with um, Patton. Uh, his uh, yeah. reincarnations went all the way back to caveman. He said uh, at one time he was a caveman hunting uh, uh, field and stream or for glory of tribe or something like that. You know, went all the way back to that in the list that I remember. But yeah, he was definitely con convinced that he had always had a military life. And uh, which goes to show that um, he loves war and that he has uh, no growth, <laughs> no personal growth whatsoever. He's just stuck. Right. Uh, and, um, and yeah, well, I mean, I do see it. It's kicked around a lot. A famous, supposedly famous quote, like after the whole World War II thing. Supposedly, I, I've verified it where he said, "Well, this we fought the wrong enemy." Quote. You probably seen that. No, no, that's quite true. That's that's yeah, actually yeah, quite yeah. true. Yes, go yeah, on. Which is pretty significant. Pretty, yeah. pretty significant. Well, be, be, beyond that, beyond that, um, you can look up the fact that Patton was a member of a military cabal that believed uh, Jews to be a security threat to America as mm -hmm. the Nazis had perceived them to be a security threat to Europe. So uh, in terms of uh, in anybody mm -hmm. who tries to quote-unquote uh revise they you know, some people would use the term rehabilitate but that doesn't really fit for my paradigm or axiom uh but they, people who try to revise Patton and and fit him into their mold uh you know they, they have their own agendas but the reality is that Patton would be what modern people would perceive as judeophobic uh of course i use that term instead of anti-semitic because of all the reasons i've articulated already ad nauseum but yeah, he uh, definitely, so he wanted to help reestablish the Wehrmacht. He wanted to uh, uh, mm -hmm. basically uh, have the Jews uh, recognized as a security threat in the United States. Uh, he's not mm -hmm. somebody that the modern uh, people, the modern and, establishment would like. Yeah. <laughs> so they killed him. And he died under, yeah. and uh, keeping that in mind, he didn't, he die on, under somewhat disputed circumstances. It, it, well, he was, he was assassinated. No, yeah. definitively he was assassinated. Right. Just so people understand that there's uh, the people have investigated this and what? it's, it's without question. It's, it's not right. a, it's not a theory. It's, it's, it's what happened. Um, there's a, uh, I, I called in uh, on Coast to Coast AM uh, a few times when they had an individual who had done an enormous amount of research and had a book published on the assassination of Patton. So um, he, he took all my points well, and he was, uh, there was another historian on Patton aside from that I had spoken to on Coast to Coast AM when I used to call into the show. So, uh, yeah, uh, all the calls were taken well, except for one when uh, there was some attorney who was trying to make money off the zombie craze and said, how would they handle zombies in different cultures? You know, the phenomenon of zombies. And, you know, uh, I called in to let him know that that had already been handled in Japan uh, because the kamikaze were already considered dead the moment that they uh, assigned themselves to kamikaze status. And then after the war when a number of them had their orders uh, basically uh, revoked because uh, they, it wasn't necessary anymore. Uh, they uh, came home and uh, they were already dead, so they couldn't come back to their families and they all joined the Yakuza. So the, the Japanese have a precedent for handling men who are considered dead. <laughs> and so uh, the, uh, but when it comes to uh, the, what was the other question I had asked? Yeah, anyhow, that wasn't taken well by Ian Punnett. Who, by the way, had to ultimately quit the show. He he resigned because, of course, he was just um, a poor bastard. I had nothing really against him, but uh, he just had a lot of quirks that weren't pay were not paying off. One of them was that he would read all of the books, and you just that's not what people want. Anyhow, uh, Brendan, uh, welcome aboard again. It, uh, what happened with the fuzz? What happened with the cops? Aristides said that you would talk him down and. 
let them know everything was in control, that you had the way about you that would yeah. defuse the situation? Is that what happened? Or are you calling us from jail and you need bail? <laughs> no, everything's everything's good to go. I explained the permit was valid till 10 p.m. Okay. Yeah, uh, we're good. We're oh, good my good. God. Oh, my God. And, uh, so, yeah. And so the cops took off after that. So you had to be the front man. You had to be the point man, the advocate for these people. I hope they appreciate it. Yeah. No, um, so from, from what I can ascertain, they do. So. Okay, good, good. But like I said, it was only because of that I was... Uh... Speaking Arabic, yes. Did they think you're a Muslim? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, it, learn, learn languages, people. It helps. It, yes. It. Yes. Now, explain to our listeners your background, that you're uh, from Lebanese Christian background, correct? Yes. yes. Syrian. Yes. Syrian. Excellent. Thank you. But the, well, I would say Levantine. The Levantine Antioch yes. Christians. Yeah. Antiochian yeah. Orthodox. Go so on. Pretty much that's like Syria, yeah. Lebanon. Before, yeah. before the Brits and the French came in, it was all one place. Like Yeah. Yeah. It's called Al Sham. Yes. Al Sham is like that whole area. Yes. So yeah. They consider it, yeah. And the the guy that was running the place, he was um, he was uh, for, I'm trying to translate back to English. He's Phil, from Philistine. Yeah. Um, Palestine. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I got it. I got it. I had to get, but, but, but 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 they but they, 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 was, they yeah living oh. in Lebanon. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Go on. That, that was the story. Yeah, yeah. Well, just so people know, yeah, it's also known as the Syrian Orthodox Church, the Antiochian Orthodox yeah. Church. Uh, but um, Lebanon yeah. was, of course, created by the Christian Crusaders as a yes. uh, haven state for the Arab Christians. Uh, they had their own nation yes. state. Uh, then, of course, what happened was like being stupid Christians and trying to be good Christians. They allowed all the Muslims in who started bre breeding yeah. like rabbits and uh exterminated yeah. them all uh so that's um that that's essentially what happened with lebanon um just so people know that's right. it was formerly the paris of the middle east uh the um beirut beirut was the paris of the middle east yeah. and uh, of course now um the many people in lebanon are hoping um that they can be retaken or reintegrated into france as a department again because of course they're just giving up they on <laughs> Yeah. They, they're probably on their knees begging for that one. Yeah, yes, they are. They are. The French, of course, are afraid to do that. Uh, but I only hope the French ultimately... Well, a lot of, take, yeah. Like a lot of the French billionaires, they like yeah. launder money out there. That's like what happened with um, the guy the guy that was the Nissan, the corrupt Nissan chair. Who yeah, was, tell people about that. He, he, yes. ran off, he ran off to Lebanon to <laughs> escape any kind. And the Japanese caught him, so... Yes. Yes. Oh, no, well, no they, they he escaped to Lebanon after he escaped Japan. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He had to hide himself in a suitcase to yeah. escape Japan because the Japanese. I think we talked about this before. It's like the second you're yeah. um, taken into Japanese custody, it's like you'll never. Um, the conviction rate's like 99%, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, it, it's, uh, and he was convicted. And then he escaped through a, uh, they put him in a container box. A container box is what it was. It was a uh, father-son team, uh, and uh, at least one of them was special forces. And the Japanese demanded their extradition, and Biden extradited them to Japan so they could go to jail and serve time in a Japanese prison. <laughs> uh, so there you go with that. And I thought that was funny as hell. And... Um, of course, uh, shows that uh, the Japanese won the war uh, so they could make demands like that. Um, all right. Uh, so such being said, I think our man is going on mute. Um, he's probably uh, busy working again. Um, Aristides, of course, is still with us. And uh, now, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell Brendan about this Aristides Aquino Nunez character. Uh, yeah. But that, that will amuse us for for years to come. <laughs> that will gosh i hope not <laughs> all right I'm, I'm trying to see if i can find more about the uh the, let me take a look at some of my past yeah. um talks about the nissan company 
where I was uh, speaking about uh, uh, Nissan. Of course, oh Jesus. Here's one from 2023 where I uh, actually uh, painted a picture for Brooke. And at that time she was still going through a lot. She was still processing a lot. And uh, yeah, his, his name was Carlos Ron. Yes, yes, that's right. Yes, you remember. Uh, We're talking about the Nissan guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's right. And uh, that he had that, to hide as a pair of speakers or something in a box. That that's that's right. And then, like I said, the Japanese demand extradition of uh, uh, the men who helped them escape, uh, father and son team uh, with U.S. Army Special Forces. And uh, yeah, they were American mercenaries. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the Americans under Bison, they uh, they um, extradited them to Japan, where they'll, they'll right. now spend a good part of their life in jail. So, uh, did you say bison? <laughs> uh, by, did I say bison? I almost said M. Bison. Yeah, thinking of Capcom and the Biden, I meant to say. Biden. Okay. Yes. I mean, Jesus, I'm already tired. But uh, so, so did you hear there's this baseball player for the Red Devils? Uh, 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 what, how do you say that in Spanish again? Diablo Sorojas. Uh, he's, uh, he's Aristides Aquino Nunez. Aristides Aquino. No <laughs> so that, that, that proves that Aristides is a shell. He's on your show. Yeah, that's, that's right. A, that's right. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, he's, he's That joking. would be their logic. That would be their, like, yeah logic. yeah that's the enemy logic uh, it, it, of course aristides you can tell when brendan is joking can't you unlike yeah. unlike brandon uh, yes yes yeah. thank you yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. he awesome. does give some hint of uh, uh emotion and sarcasm <laughs> and meaning in his voice yeah, yeah. so so tell oh, us God, these guys yeah. left okay. a bunch of food <laughs> <laughs> cool yeah. cool you won't start yeah. for a while they, they kept trying to feed they kept trying to feed me and i I was like trying to explain like I don't eat meat and then they gave me something that supposedly didn't have meat in it but I was I just had like one bite and was like yeah I don't know you could taste the meat you could taste the meat right away or it had been cooked in meat oil or something right yeah you, you could taste or like it. my yeah like my grandma it's like yeah. they don't count like chicken stock as meat like they're just I know I know it, yeah. it's very yeah. bizarre it's very bizarre yeah. uh <laughs> they, they they don't understand that a person could taste that I mean when I was re reacting allergically to shrimp uh yeah. i could feel it when something had had some shrimp in it yeah it's right. yeah i'm no longer allergic to shrimp thank god uh it, it, maybe to a degree but uh not not nearly like i was before um so uh aristides so here's what's funny brendan is that aristides yeah. sent me an email that said i told myself i'd never go back <laughs> But I went back and I time stamped it. So he listened to that horrible thing with Brandon Young. Aristides, tell yeah, how us, was it? Was what was your impression? Tell us your impression now that you um, suffered it a second time. What, what's yeah. it like the second time around? Well, this was the uh, incident of the uh, 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 fanciful storytelling by Brandon <laughs> Young, and he didn't say like it started out talking about Oppenheimer and it got wrapped in this whole well like there's an Oppenheimer who did all this stuff and he like like uh yeah and then it like because of the previous I think that was the third uh uh revisit of the uh it was like dolphin you know penises um and stuff you know and all like something <laughs> Ah, by, the, by the way, uh, Aristides is almost, he almost feels guilty even relating yeah. this. He's, what he's trying yeah. to say is this is yeah, like the third like, revisit of dolphin penises. Go on. Yes. Oppenheimer, and he took like these creatures to space or something, and then he was like, yeah. And that's when he kind of transitioned into, and there's like a porno movie, and, the, and for some reason, the words, uh, uh, the names Peter Moon and Brooke Gibson came out of his mouth, which I don't for understand. Some reason. <laughs> I don't understand why they would be in an, a movie uh, having to do with Oppenheimer, let alone in a pornography sense. But apparently that was his assertion. Then he said he had the video and he said, oh, yeah, Peter, like, sent, you know, it's in my Gmail. And then he's like, he's like, but like, I have to go look for it. And that would take me a couple minutes and I don't have time right now. Um, I'm like, oh. Yeah, really well i mean it's yeah, so absurd to, i mean try to, yeah so... try well try to send me that link there so i could see what you're talking about buddy yeah 
You would uh, watch that? Oh my god! It, let's not let's not fall into the trap anymore. Let's it, just put it no. well, then then Sid pref- uh, fanned the flames. That's when yeah, uh, yeah. Trampus Nicholson tells us what he said. Yeah. Trampus starts chiming in. Yeah, it was. It, he kind of kept it calm for a while, but then something. And he just I don't know. He launched it. I forget the words he said. It was some like sex thing. It was like uh, he kind of liked yeah. to uh, kind of really talk up that whole dolphin. Bigfoot, big Bigfoot yeah, well, with a dolphin. Yeah, why, yeah. why are you guys like that? <laughs> yeah. By the way, he's not talking to Aristides. Brandon is rhetorically asking the mm-hmm. air, but but indirectly aimed at Brandon it Young was like, and yeah, Trampus no, it was Nicholson. Like going yeah. and like going and w- getting bait, and then it was like getting you know getting raped by Bigfoot in the woods, and it's like it just how does how does it go there? Yeah. Oh, uh, why? Or why does it always go there? Always go there. Right. It, it, yes, it always goes there. And uh, and and did, did he bring up his stupid uh, baddragon.com again? You know, because uh, right. that's I like think that was a different. I don't know. Either that was. Uh, I don't know if it was in that section. I didn't hear that. Um, that might have been another night. This this I mean this all happened over. It was building over multiple like what three different times. Yes. 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 Yeah, the uh, weirdness. By the way, I, I've just I just hearted your comment. Your comment appeared, so I hearted it and uh, put a thumbs up on it. So everybody, do that for his comment and mine on that episode, please. Uh, it, you can go back and upvote mine as well. Uh, bring some extra attention to it, perhaps, and then that way people will. Uh, it, it's a pivotal episode, so uh, it led to a purge. <laughs> just so so people should be reviewing it, uh, if for nothing else, to see that we're not overreacting here. This is like uh, something that. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, it'd be good to get other people's takes on that. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and, and then yeah. yeah so so yeah. Uh, tell us, tell us, we're not crazy. <laughs> Wait, what was that? I missed. I missed that. What was that? Uh, basically, what Aristides is saying is, yes, it's yeah. good to get other people's take on this. Please tell us we're not crazy. You know, let us right. know that we're yeah. hearing what we're hearing, um, and. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, oh man they're glitching you yeah they're glitching you yeah so uh yeah. go go, yeah. go on brendan find yourself a better yeah. cell reception area yeah i was saying was it about what they said yeah like yeah of course yeah we, we were talking about what they were saying the uh, uh the sheer audacity of uh these idiots just taking it to new heights, and they're doing this knowingly. Uh, I, I think that the way I'm hearing it, uh, that Trampus Nicholson was trying to act the part of somebody who's naive and just rolling a, a, along with the story because that's what he was claiming when I returned, although I yeah. had no idea how bad it yeah. was. So when I returned, he was claiming, oh, you know, I, I just didn't, you know, I, I just uh, thought I, uh, I was just, uh, you know, thought he was serious. And uh, it was only later I realized, uh, you know, he was... Uh, going off the edge or something like that is just some bullshit. I mean, it's definitely in the episode that he says that. But the reality was he knew, he knew, and he kept inflaming it. He kept inciting it, inflaming it. Yeah, knowingly. So yeah, I mean that was my take too. Like, yeah. like it was. Uh, I thought it was strange, but how like well him and Brandon got along. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like with right. the with the Stephen King and all that, it was yeah. interesting. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 They're definitely on the same side. They're they're working for the same team, and uh, they're they're just. Uh, it was always inevitable with Brandon. It's just he uh, it, 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 he showed his colors uh, when he said, "Oh, don't don't." Don't link your posts to my my timeline. I don't want people to know I'm affiliated with you because I'm investigating the enemy and infiltrating them. I'm infiltrating the enemy, and everybody knew he was affiliated with with me because he was on my shows. So he yeah. could not infiltrate the enemy. So there's no way he could infiltrate the enemy. So uh, obviously he was on the side of the enemy. <laughs> that alone was something. I tolerate it for the longest time because they did try to kill him, but that's because he's expendable. They he doesn't mean anything to them. 
<laughs> and uh, so it, it's one of these things that uh, eventually you just have to face up to it and just get rid of them, uh, confront them. And uh, it, it's, yeah. I should have done it a long time ago, really. But it's one of those things that... Uh, you know when he shows up after months and starts promoting uh Aquino's books and uh and then says uh that he didn't say what he said you know he's like, they're people just like you and me and then when i s- asked him about that the next episode i didn't say that but calling me a liar even though it's on record that he said what he said <laughs> just that's well, he was trying to from what i get the, the impression i got was he was trying to quote unquote play the devil's advocate and saying someone could say that about them with that information no 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 he was coming on you saying they're pro-life they saved us from the evil right. chinese and their shellless turtles right <laughs> well but someone like me was was just assuming like oh maybe he was saying that that's what people would imply but you're right like and a, a new listener would just not even hear that kind of context. Thank you, but but even you shouldn't even. You're you're giving him like too much credit for one thing. It's like yeah, which, maybe I let <laughs> I, maybe I just let my bias because he was like a Tolkienite. Yeah, it, my bias because 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 he yeah it is he is a look he's a tragic loss in the sense that yeah he had some some uh, erudition he had some erudition. Yeah uh prior to his uh disintegration and his spiraling uh you remember he even knew about the inklings and for those of you who don't know there were like basically only three inklings that i know of it was c.s lewis uh tolkien and one other guy who wrote some horror story about a man going to hell uh hanging on to his own intestines (laughs) <laughs> but I don't remember that guy's name. But anyhow, those three guys were basically the Inklings. And so he would know about these things because he had a fairly literary background. He had also personally spoken or had been uh, received some tutelage from uh, um, Chomsky. No. Noam Chomsky. No. Yes, yeah, see, you, you got that out before I did. So, yeah, well, that's something I didn't. It's not that I neglected to mention it, but I <laughs> didn't have a chance to get it in last time we were talking about this. It's like... Yeah. That shows how high level his family was. And he yes. had said that himself. Yes. He was like, I'm really lucky to even have been taught by this guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's true. It's true. His, his family is definitively privileged. Who's like, yeah. it, for, okay, I don't, I haven't listened very much of Gnome, but the impression I get is he's like the, he's basically like the, the arch nihilist that's still alive. Like or something is that it, it, it's is that like, like I, I, I think basically if you if if for beginners uh, imagine an old white professor with glasses and then put him in an Osama bin Laden get up and just imagine him with this kind of militant uh, anti-American stance that it, it, it's just every stance he takes is reflexively anti-American. It's not even. It's not even logical anymore. It's just, uh, it's now just reflexive. And uh, so you, you, the only way to appreciate him is to kind of just narrow down to the linguistics, which is, was, he originally was a linguist. A linguist, okay. yeah, yeah, and so his linguistics, there's some contributions there, but in all fairness, uh, I could understand his appeal uh, obviously, he appealed to me at a point in my life where you're trying to look for an alternative perspective to conventional media, which for the longest period of time was simply pro-American. That was the bias. Uh, but at this point in history, it's almost like it's how would I say it? he's he, he, he's we've gone so radical beyond <laughs> the the stance that he took, which was just kind of like anti-American imperialism and that America is intrinsically a p- imperialist. We've gone to the stance now, of course, that's often we're in space at this point with people who say, and the world's really flat and uh, they're killing babies under a pizza joint, you know, and the Democrats are eating them. And, uh, you know, at this point, Chomsky is like an anachronistic scholar, like somebody out of the Middle Ages who's talking about how many angels can dance on the head of the pin. He, he's, he's, in, he's inapplicable. He's completely irrelevant. Uh, so it, it's like it, it's like it dates uh, our man uh, Brandon Young, that he was a product of a different time in a different place. Uh, but, um, y- you know, you've got to balance that out against what does he do when he's on my program? So what does he, do he, he of course, uh, 
it does really, generally speaking, nothing. <laughs> sadly, sadly, he he came on a few times, and there was deep talk about Tolkien. Yes, when Brendan is there to force the subject. Uh, but if Brendan's not there to force the subject, that's not where uh, Brandon goes. He is effectively goes nowhere, right? You get what I'm saying? He's just like, uh, um, and uh, I, I wasn't there uh, when he started talking about Stephen King with, uh, with uh, Trampus Nicholson, but Trampus Nicholson was claiming after he had dropped off the show, Brandon had dropped off the show, Young, Brandon Young, so people don't confuse him with Brandon Zogit. Uh, uh, when Brandon Young had dropped off the show, then Trampus Nicholson was saying he was claiming he couldn't keep a straight thought, that he kept jumping from one topic to another concerning Stephen King without uh, working out a trend in thought about the Stephen King subjects, which is easily easy to believe with me. Uh, it's, it's believable, but yeah. for someone that's on acid to say that, and and a bunch of belladonna to yeah. say that about someone else, yeah, yeah definitely yeah, shocking. Yeah, yeah it, it's pot kettle black. Yeah, it's pot kettle black. So either Brandon's gotten really bad; <laughs> it's just getting worse and worse. Well, even if, even if it's not acid. So what I did get yeah. out of that whole mess, I think at one point, yeah. uh, quote unquote, said it was like that night when all that went down yeah. and. Then he was like, like they call it spurging. He was like spurging, you know, like a hundred messages to everybody. He was like, yeah. then later on, he was like, I had just like blasted off on like three and a half grams, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, that explains. I, I'm not saying that to you. I'm just saying. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, which explains some things, and it's like maybe even if you're good at no, it. No, he was like that with that baseline. That's my baseline. Opinion. Yeah, by the way, no, that's... right, right, right. But yeah. like, and that, but that's even worse. It's like you shouldn't know, be like you're helping to host a radio program. I don't care if you're good at it or not. It's like I've shouldn't. noticed that a lot with like, you know, typically people with addiction issues. It's like they'll always blame it on some kind of substance. But Thank you. Know you. Right. Thank right. you. But but two things to observe here. Honestly, um, Aristides is to be appreciated with that input, and yeah, it's it's I certainly agree. yeah certainly not to be dismissed. And uh, the, no. one of the things to be taken from it is that it might not have been Brandon. It could have been Trampus Nicholson is so fucked up on his his recreational narcotics that he can't follow a train of thought and then projects yeah. it onto the other yeah. person being unable to maintain it. I think it's a combination yeah. of both. Yeah. I mean, you the, ket the like, ketamine wait. prescription like Elon Musk yeah. and shit. Yeah, yeah. Ketamine and who knows. Did, whether you, did you hear about that? Uh, I didn't hear about it, so tell us about it. Yes, about oh, Elon. Hear, where Don Lemon's like in, interviewing Elon Musk. You guys must have heard about that by now. It's like, yeah, I try to avoid Elon Musk because I don't okay, want to get so, depressed or outraged. Go on. Yeah, outraged. <laughs> well, this time it was pretty funny. It was like Don Lemon gets a job on X, like that's his new job, and then he like does this bomb quote unquote bombshell interview and like ambushes Elon quote unquote, uh. and then he's like instead of asking him political questions, he's like what's up with your prescription of ketamine? And he's like, that's kind of like a personal matter. And it just made, it made Don Lemon look so bad. Like, honestly, that's funny. Just, yeah. you know, uh, you know, I'm not, he too... like walked right into his trap, Elon's trap. There you go. There you go. That's uh. so there you go. These guys try to, anyways, I'm saying like him and Trampus have that in common. They both have ketamine prescriptions. Right. I mean, just that as like a prescription, like, you know, I thought that was like kind of a niche thing. Now it's just like, Oh, you just no. Now everyone gets it now. It's like legal. Seriously. Right? It's like, you can just get prescribed it. Yeah. yeah. Holy as shit. an antidepressant. Can you believe that? Oh, cause oh that's, God. that's like the solution, right? If you're depressed, you just dissociate. Low dose reality. Because that's it's, like yeah. Right. Solution. Because like it must be a strictly controlled dose. Cause otherwise like you just completely dissociate. Like you're not depressed because you're yeah, not but even when, fucking reality. When has giving you give a, someone who's depressed and a prescription of 30 ketamines, they're not going to just take the recommended dose. I don't know. Dude's right, going to yeah. be snorting it or whatever kind of craziness. Well, well, doing. well, yeah. In in the case of Trampus Nicholson, he had it in a fucking salt shaker. He was spreading it like salt on, you know, his little uh, fucking cupcakes, his truffles with the sugar <laughs> skulls and shit. Yeah. I, I mean, no, it's it's disgusting. But the um, obviously uh, it's only uh, dwelling on this to make the point of uh, what was said by uh, 
Brandon Young that uh, he, he was exacerbated, exacerbated by Trampus Nicholson. But um, such things uh, put aside for just a moment, just for the sheer fun of it, just the sheer, you know, to piss and shit on Trampus Nicholson. Brandon Zogit and I were observing the fact that this guy truly has never worked a day in his life and yet has an incredible source of income and does not pay his rent. I mean, so the guy's got endless amounts of money to splurge on everything. He's, uh, but he's told, uh, he's been very adamant he does not pay rent. I mean, I'm trying to raise money for rent tonight. So, yes, everybody, I do need your contributions. But this fucker, you know, and here I had this fucker on my show who was bragging about never paying rent. Because uh, uh, he, he... And then he took, yeah. back his, he took back his 20 bucks. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, PayPal took it back for me. They, they, they rejected his case. They, they, they ruled in my favor. Uh, oh, good. Yeah, that's <laughs> so they sent me the message that uh, uh, that it's it's completely available for me to use. Uh, they ruled the guy. I didn't even lift a finger. I didn't even fill out any forms or you it's, know. It's because that it's a common thing to yeah. fraud people by like sending them money and then refunding. Yes. Yes. So I think they probably just they flagged it as like a fraudulent kind of scenario. So yes. they just straight up let you keep it yeah yeah thank you thank you and and uh and thank you to paypal you know which is why you don't do that stuff to people man yeah thank you yeah yeah thank you and hopefully he gets flagged as you said hopefully he gets flagged for pulling that shit um most likely yeah because uh it's like even if you like hate someone and it's like you already sent the money it's like you might as well just count it as a loss yes yeah so true and but you know him and the only two people who have ever done that are Trampus Nicholson and Jameson Reese. So yeah. what does that tell us? Yeah. Yes. yeah, Douglas, you should start selling merch. Yeah. Oh, God. Like what, what T-shirts and stuff. Yeah, somebody was talking about that before. Like, what kind of merch should I sell? I mean, that would be like... Uh, uh, we, we'd have to work on it. Sure you yeah. can come up with something. Well, t-shirts with my autograph. Maybe, maybe you know. not your old artwork, your original artwork, but yeah. something. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, that might sell pretty well. You never know. Yeah. 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 Yes. You could sell. You should sell autographs, and then you should like bite the paper with your like vampire teeth and be like, <laughs> it's like it's like printed. It's like a seal. Oh, that's cute. Uh, yeah, I, I like that. That's, yeah, that's it'd be worth like what? 20, you know what? <laughs> I'd be worse. That's a good. That's like a dub. That's a good dub. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, these men are on my side. They're they're helping to think out of the box. Yes, we're, yeah. we're thinking of different things. The um, uh, at any rate, in, in terms of the, produ- uh, the producers get a cut too. Don't forget. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we got to work something out like that so Team Dietrich truly uh, is rewarded for their efforts. That's that's a good idea. No, it's important. Uh, and uh, so glad that we got it down to the unkillable core before even considering such things. So hopefully uh, it gets better from here. Uh, we'll do our best. I'm working on my end to try and do something uh, new, you know, make some new things happen. Uh, no idea with terms of projects, mind you. I mean, obviously just trying to get the books out with Peter and all that, but, um, you know, trying to improve my living situation and the like. We'll see what happens. So uh, all, all that being said, uh, we've got, uh, let me see, two people with me and taking a look at the live stream, a good number of listeners um, all the viewers. No, no, no. We've got a good number of listeners. Uh, uh, yeah, we maintained the general number that we had uh, at the time that Peter left, so that's excellent. Uh, even higher than at some moments when he was here, really. So um, I could go into kind of a uh, prelude to the monologue, or we could continue talking with a bit of a roundtable. How how busy are you at the school right now, Bre- Brandon? Well, I'm trying to clean up this aftermath, and <sighs> then... I don't think I can be here past a certain time because the alarms go on. So I'm trying to like just do what I can. Do do, do you want to like uh, rejoin us at midnight? You want to just uh, go yeah. mute and take care of that, and then I'll and then yeah. j- join us at midnight. Okay. This whole this whole last like, when I, however long I've been on is like Peter's worst nightmare. It's like breaking glass and chains. <laughs> 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 so. Yeah, Peter. But it adds to the ambiance. So that's what my argument was. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll rejoin you guys later. Yes. Uh, Peter calls uh, Brendan Zogit crisp crinkle. Calls him crisp yeah. crinkle. Yes. <laughs> so, so I turned it up to 11 tonight with all the chains and shit. Oh, fuck. That's funny as hell. Okay. okay. Well, stay right. safe and be well. Okay. And um, yes. uh, join us around midnight. And uh, what I'll do is go into a little bit of a prefatory monologue. 
um dear aristides of course oh yes as always we we don't want to keep you up too late and what time is it where you're at it should be about 1 1 a.m 1 30 a.m yeah after one yeah it's a little okay. after one okay so uh, i'm doing okay for the moment okay okay and uh just uh, uh but feel free to slide off into sleep whenever you wish and um hopefully we'll have someone who jumps in later maybe nemo or uh george knight certainly for about an hour or so and maybe nemo uh but if you do fall asleep um just leave the ringer on just in case i'll try and wake you up first by shouting and if i can't wake you up by shouting i'll wake you up by a ringer that's if i if only if it's an emergency you know like i really need to pee <laughs> So hopefully that doesn't happen and hopefully someone else would be here to hold the stage. But, um, okay. So, uh, take your time. Uh, you, do you want to say something before I suck all the oxygen out of the room? No, I'll, I'm going to hang around okay. and see how you, uh, what you pick up there. And, um, sounds good. And, uh, do you have something? What do you want to talk about? Well, I'll start just by explaining the international holiday shortly, you know, summarize the international holiday about uh, slavery awareness. And uh, then I'll go into the current events uh, around, um, of course, geopolitics. And that will inevitably lead us to the Russian massacre or the massacre of Russians. Yeah, in this case. yeah Peter and I, we did a, a bad job of covering that. So you need to... <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you tried. Yeah, you tried. yeah. I'm glad you tried. That's that's funny. That's cute. That's uh, could you could you summarize how it went? Well, summarize how it went. Just kind of speculating. I don't. I, I, I don't know. Uh, as far as like, is it really Muslim influence? How much Muslim influence is there, or is it just like, you know, it's easy to blame the Muslims, or I I don't know. And I saw it seemed pretty pathetic. I saw some of the video of these guys that caught. They were just like, I don't know, uh, where are these guys from? It was unclear. Like, you know, they could be from one place, but they could be like, oh, they were this organization in this state, but they're really propped up by these guys over here. And it's like, it, it gets very convoluted. And what did I say that they were, the guy said they were paid the equivalent of five thousand dollars to pull off this attack it's like you gotta know you're not coming back from this like, <laughs> yeah you're know, ah! gonna go just shooting up a place in mosque and like escape what do you get you're gonna like these guys they didn't look brilliant enough to escape let's put it that way like they just you know you're not gonna just just get away with that thank you yeah i mean <laughs> so what though yeah it, yeah no it's it's not worth yeah it's not worth half a million dollars let alone five thousand no that's that's outrageous it's bizarre sammy romero has joined us so uh we'll be roundtabling for a little bit now at least while sammy's with us so uh welcome aboard and of course aristides and Let's sammy look. know each other how you doing, I, sammy yes uh, hey how you doing aristides hey pretty good pretty good how are you doing there uh my kids man they're kicking my ass yeah. but uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you do. you know how it is man Yep. yep. Yeah, and Aristides actually knows. He actually raised one. Yeah, well, yeah, one, one, yeah. I'm, Sammy, how many do you have now? Um, I, I have two. I have two. Two? Oh, good. Good for, oh, good for you. <laughs> yeah, you poor bastard. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, that was his tone of voice. Yeah, it's certainly mine. Technic no, that's great. That's, yeah, that's great. <gasps> Technically, Doug actually babysitted my kid for about maybe a minute. Yes, when, yes. When yeah. I went to prison. So, yeah, he did a good job. He did a good job. He didn't. You didn't drain their blood. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Job, yes, yes he, he does trust me. Sammy trusted me. And, of course, our joke is there right above you, Sammy, is the entry from Aristides of uh, what was pointed out by Peter Moon that uh, with the Red Devils, the uh, Diabolos, how do we say that in the Espanol? Uh, Diabolos uh, yeah. Rojas. Uh, yes, it, there's an Aristides Aquino on their team. Uh, and so that's funny as hell. They don't yeah. use... Yeah. Do, do you know how many Aquinos are at my job? Especially, well, there's a lot of Filipinos, so... Yes. 
Yeah. So it's even common age. So I'm I wouldn't be surprised, you know. Yeah. No. No. It's it it is common. It, it actually is, which makes it all the more frightening. Uh. So, but uh, Sammy, so tell us about whatever you're willing to share with us. How things have been for you recently, and um, I certainly appreciate uh, what you said in the uh, private messages, and I hope my response kind of covered that. <laughs> yeah. That it, it, it makes sense. Yeah. It it kind of makes sense. It just you know just I was just curious, anyways, but. Um, honestly, just been checking in, man. Um, I've been trying to keep up with the show and, uh, you know, the ladies on, you know, the backstabbing and, you know. <laughs> yes. So, so did, were, did, were you listening that night of, uh, the, uh, the, the whole yeah, affair? I, I, I was, to be honest with you, though, uh, I was, I really did not pay attention to it. One, because, you know, Brandon Young is, you know, Brandon Young. Yes. He, he um, he, uh. It's his accident, you know, I kind of chuck it up to, you know, his accident. So, because right. he always used to, you know, when, he's, we, when I used to be on with him, you know, he used to always, you know, bring up, you know, uh, because I lived in, uh, you know, in the city and it's, you know, I lived in the ghetto. He always used to, you know, kind of, you know, humor me by saying, you know, oh, I, I've been to Compton and I've been to, I've been to LA too. And, you know, just trying to, break the ice with me so i never really took him seriously in the sense of his outburst but what kind of got my head scratching was him um him bringing up temple of sad and peter and uh what's that guy lavinda yes that? peter lavinda there yeah. The, yeah go on so when he started bringing up that he's reading these books and that they, he, they were interesting and, and almost complimenting them uh, i'm like well isn't this the same guy that, that put a hit on yeah, you yes thank you, know, you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, you, you why? As he, it's part of my language, but like, why are you sucking him off? You know, like he, he's gonna try to kill you. Yes, but, thank you. Come you on. know, it, it is what it is, and and then, you know, it's just one of the things that just makes your head scratch. So that that was a little odd. That was, <laughs> but in a sense too, though. Um, I don't know. It's just maybe going through something because lately. When you try to respond to him with his girlfriend, and what you try to do is bring his girlfriend in and just, you know, introduce him, introduce herself to yourself as far as, you know, his partner. I don't know if they're still together or not, but I'm certain they're not. I'm certain she, this, yeah, the, just to, just to lay this out for our public, this is what I think happened based on everything I can put together is that uh, it basically Kelsey couldn't stand him anymore and just left. And then he tried to get back at her by uh, talking shit about her on my show and came on my show and said, oh, she suffered this horrible chemical accident in this basically a junior high school lab. And a junior high school lab would not have corrosive acids or anything like that. And uh, But he was trying to claim that she suffered terrible burns or something that resulted in all her hair falling off. Uh, and uh, this, this is not something that you would hear about this nationally. If something like that happened in a school, this would make national news. Uh, but beyond that, he was claiming that, uh, you know, then he went through with the usual stupid joke spiel after that, saying then she grew hair on her tits, even though she lost all her hair everywhere else. And uh, this one, when he said this to Brooke Gibson and I, and we asked him, are you serious? And it's like, oh no, I'm joking about that part. And it's like, how could you joke about your girlfriend who just suffered a terrible accident? It's, oh, you gotta laugh or you're gonna cry. It, you know, it's just basically, it's it's he's just a pathological chronic liar, and he was just trying to get back at this girl who left him. But go back to Sammy. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, everybody gets their heart broken or have disagreements, but um, really, you know, I was. That's really when I was just started scratching my head in a sense of yeah. where he was. Thank you. Uh, and I don't claim to know him. I don't. And uh, I never thought he was a bad guy. But, yeah. you know, I, I do know that it was a terrible accident he did suffer. And um, yeah. knowing you know, knowing his, a little bit of his background, his family, and, and you know, they're a well-off family, you know, yeah. uh, part of the white elite. You know, it's, yeah. um, I really do think, though, a lot of the times with people with this type of background, um, being associated with yourself is very threatening because, uh, you know, they're they're privileged. Yes. Um, this is one of the reasons why uh, George Knight gets a lot of flack because you know he's 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 uh, he's British and uh, him, uh, you know, uh, being a supporter of yourself, it's um, 
it's very dangerous because well now you know you the, the mouthpiece in the sense of unfortunately um, Americans are gonna disregard uh, being yeah. Asian I mean you're yes. you're a minority of a minority it's I true say. it's it's so true it's, go on yeah um if you you really haven't assimilated as an American I mean let alone obviously you're you're not completely human. So, um, <laughs> yes. But definitely... Um, you Compounds the, the issue. Uh, but go on, yes. Right. Don't fit the stereotype Asian, yes. you know, accounting or doctor or yes. engineer. Yes. Or, uh, or you know, where's the geek? You yes. know, you don't, you don't have a bossy Chinese wife, you know. Or, you, know <laughs> you, don't, you don't live in San Rafael in the, in the suburbs, you know. I don't know. You know, it's, it's one of these things where the stereotype, people kind of put you in that box, at, at least, especially your generation, you know, it's just, yes. they put you in that box. So, um, definitely, uh, you know, I, I've noticed this, that in a sense, um, they really try to go after uh, the non-minority, yeah. minorities, quote unquote, that uh, support you. Yes. And uh, it's one of these things where, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, Brandon Zog is going through it. Yeah. In the sense of "quote unquote" his validation, because uh, yeah. you know he also poses a, a threat in the sense of uh, you know this this platform. This yes. platform um, is very much relies on his expertise as far as producing it uh, along with yourself. But yeah. um, it, it saddens me a little bit, and I'm not I'm not I don't know everything the whole details. Maybe you know we can catch up. But what I can say is um, you know. Uh, definitely, it, it, it kind of it, it, at least it weeds out in a sense people that are, are just not in the right space to support you. Thank and you. That's, all, that's really what it's all about. It, it's support. Thank you. I don't, I don't, I don't think you expect people to completely agree with you, but yeah. definitely the support is needed. Uh, Thank you. And uh, obviously, when um, people start making claims of certain people of Team Dietrich are sleeping with each other, which, you know, <laughs> and, you know, especially, you know, the people that he talked about that don't necessarily, aren't the, they don't, they don't get along. Like, well, actually, <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> the sense is just, you know, um, it's just very high school days. It's just very unprofessional in the sense of, you know, where you want to, where, where your goal is to you know, to spare awareness, you know, um, and especially, you know, what's going on in the world. So definitely, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised, but at the same time, you know, I don't know the details, but it, it's just very odd for someone like him to start, you know, praising a person that tried to take you out. Yes. You no, know, that's, it, yeah, it go makes, on. Yeah. It makes me wonder if uh, maybe, you know, while he's in the hospital, maybe it, Maybe it happened the same thing. In, in other words, what happened to him, it may be what, let me let me gather my words. It reminds me of maybe a lot of Lena Shea in the sense of yeah. someone snapped their fingers and he yeah. switched. Yes. So no, maybe, I appreciate what you're saying. And to put this into uh, further perspective, you know, finish your thoughts. Finish your thoughts. Yeah. In the accident, you yeah. know, uh, you look at uh, Daniel Rolla, same yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and maybe his case is a little different because, you know, he was just obnoxious to begin with. But uh, <laughs> since, too, though, um, I don't know. It, it's because, really, I mean, Brandon, you know, was, 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 you know he, was, he wasn't he was as off as just these last couple months. It's maybe the last year and a half, you yeah. know, ever since he really wasn't mentioning his girlfriend. Because yes. I actually did. I was actually really happy for him in the sense of him finding a partner, having stability. It, it, it seemed that way. I don't claim to know him. But in a sense, too, though, uh, you know, to me, it's like someone snapped their fingers and all of a sudden he's mentioning, you know, the opposition, which really he never really cared for. He always, you know, when he brought on John Evans and when he talked about Tolkien and, um, and you know, in other words, he, there's a certain level of of diversity that, he brought, you know, and him, he, him being in the in the education field, you know, all these, all these, you know, anybody that that uh, knows Doug or, or just the way you speak, Doug, you're not a dumb guy, obviously. <laughs> <You're> not, <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I, and I don't mean that as a joke, but 
what I'm trying to say is uh, I've noticed a lot of these people that have all of a sudden started trying to help you are losers yes. in a sense of, in a, to put a point blank, um, they don't have actual careers. Yes. And I'm not saying no one's better than the other. It's just what I mean is, um, yeah, they're just they're just bombs. Yes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, and I'm not saying anybody on here right now, but you know, and I think you know what I'm referring to is just yes. So it's very, it's very odd for him to to be like this. All of a sudden, it's like someone snapped their fingers. In, in other words, like maybe while he was in the hospital recovering, you know, maybe he had some type of programming. I don't know. Um, yeah, let me put that into context, because I certainly appreciate what you're saying. And what Sammy Romero is saying is, uh, obviously, Sammy Romero is doing his best to try and understand how did this come about? And this is a uh, thesis that, uh, based on our experience that is actually plausible, but I'll put it into further context. It's uh, it, why it w really wasn't like that. It was uh, basically what had happened was that um, when uh, you take a look at the example, the other parallel case that would first come to mind would be Daniel Arola, who also suffered an automobile accident that put him into a comatic state. Uh, and uh, the, the, there's a difference in that case uh, that I can go into later, but it's it's basically the biggest parallel that Daniel Arola and, uh, of course, Brandon Young have. Uh, however, Brandon Young's case has far more in common with what happened to Amanda Yu, in that they both were in a very similar type of car, which was a security car used by a security agency, like a police force or an intelligence unit, such as the Secret Service, that suddenly got put on a government auction and uh, one was purchased by Amanda Yu and another one wasn't the same auction, but in a very similar situation was purchased by Brandon Young. So those situations actually are far more parallel uh, and they both uh, were uh, rendered almost dead in their cars by an assassination attempt in both cases. Uh, but the thing about Brandon Young was, uh, and hopefully Sammy says, he says, by the way, if I drop off, I probably received a phone call. Understood. Understood. Okay. So, uh, and, uh, but do un unmute if you are comfortable unmuting and that way we can hear your response. Uh, because, uh, yeah, what happened with Brandon Young was he really exposed himself when he said this, when, cause I was doing what everyone else is doing. We all want to give him the benefit of the doubt. And uh, we want to say it's the brain damage. We all want to say it's the brain damage. But he confirmed it was not. When I tactfully confronted him that day that everything uh, went into meltdown and I was in the hostage talk down negotiation crisis mode and I was talking him down like, right. do you really need to get everybody laughing all the time and you know how important our laughs, right. etc. He said, uh, and when I brought up the brain injury, he said, no, I was always like this. And that's when he pointed out there was this one kid who was bullied at school. And so I called him up at home saying, I'm the bully. I'm coming over to kill you. And that's when the kid went apeshit, started threatening suicide. He said, better to kill myself rather than uh, have the bully come over and kill me. And that's when his parents called the police. And then he heard all these sirens and found out the police had been called to this kid's home. And he said, and I did that when I was really young and years before the brain injury. And I said, you're not helping your case any. So that is on record where I said that twice. I said, you're not helping your case any. So it turns out he's not brain. He's not, he may be brain damaged. Yes. But beyond that, he's also baseline psychotic. This is an individual who saw the impact of what he had done and decided he was going to behave like that the rest of his life because he suffered no repercussions. So at this point, you're talking about somebody with a lack of empathy, which is diagnosable as psychosis. But beyond that, he had explained in the very early days of Revolution Radio, and you may or may not remember this, but if I bring it up, maybe you'll remember it. Uh, in the very early days, he brought up that his parents were uh, a, a satanic ritual abuse family. And that one of the reasons that they had been involved with this new age channeling of the nine was why Peter Lavinda had written about them. But he felt Peter Lavinda was defaming or slandering his family. But he said when he was young, 
that and he brought this up on the you may not remember this specifically but he brought it up at revolution radio uh, an episode and a few of them he said yeah i had been in an arranged marriage with a young girl of another high level family and we were pray she was impregnated by him he said she was pregnant all the way to the point where it was showing and maybe towards the later trimester and he said they had the baby crib they had the baby crib and everything and then he said she went up north to canada and came back and the baby was gone and um he he never uh knew what happened but he obviously never bothered to really investigate it was almost like he was demotivated and deflated and just didn't pursue it and then um but it could have been trafficked it could have been aborted as but it sounds like a sacrifice sounds like a ritual sacrifice thing and uh but he insinuated that himself but that's the level of the kind of background that he had so he was always in this milieu and what basically happens is someone born in those families maybe like him they might be earnest and they might say oh i want to break out of this i want to do something good but unfortunately he's unemployable he's teaching young kids because his, his family got him that job it, he, he's obviously i think his position is objectionable and i think he should not be teaching young kids but such being said he has that job only because of his familial connections and then what happened is that uh, he's realizing as he gets older he needs to stay in the will and since he needs to stay in the will, what does he do? He comes on my program and starts letting them all know, look, I really am on your side. Starts preaching, you know, Michael Aquino and, uh, you know, uh, Chinese communism and just, uh, you, you know, starts coming on my show and talking about this like these are good people and they're, they're really, right. you know, human, which implies, of course, that, well, what does that make me? If I'm their enemy, then I must be the bad guy. Uh, but th this is basically... He's showing it. Yeah, go on, please. There you go. That's the context. No, now that you, no, I do remember actually. Now, it's, now that it's coming back. Yeah. I, I also him. I do remember him saying that he even met uh, Ivanka Trump in a sense of uh, uh, Trump's daughter. Yeah, yeah. I do remember him being associated with. Uh, I think also he mentioned that he was. Um, I'm not sure if it was either the Clintons. Or maybe even the bushes, as far as I guess. They I think used, it was the bushes. Yeah, uh, go on. Yeah. They use children as like, I guess, standees or something, like some type of campaign or something. That's correct. He, go on. So, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense, and, and you know, now to mention it, you know, unfortunately, when when you start mentioning all this, it, it makes perfect sense in the sense that it's almost like, well, he. He pretty much was evading the inevitable in the sense of his connections. Yes, I, I think when uh, you come from that background, it's hard not to give in to the privilege. Yes, and in a sense, uh, you—it's almost like the royals when they go to you know Africa and try to act like they're poor. Yeah, you know, they really, <laughs> yes, you know, they don't really want to be poor. They just—they're rich, but they you know they want to feel like quote unquote. Oh, I want to you know. Be like the commoners, quote yes. unquote. The simple so life, can, the simple life I, fantasy. I leave, yes, right. I can leave when I want, and yeah. you know, yeah. whatever. But you know, it unfortunately, it, it it's uh, it's it's not it's not the first, you know. And unfortunately, it may not be the last, but yeah. you know, really, it's just uh, it's almost disappointing in the sense of uh, identity. Yeah. What I mean by that is. You know, there, there has to be a point at least where you have to have some type of identity and not resort to, you know, um, or give in to uh, what your what your family, you know, is usually steeped into, which it's it's hard to say, but it's just, um, it's I don't know how to explain it, uh, because I'll give you an example. With even with my family, I have a cousin who's a pastor, and actually my uh, uh, I went to a uh, it's like a christening. It's almost like a christening, you say. Yeah. And I was talking to him, and uh, very good speaker. That's one thing I, I do. With my cousin, he's a very good speaker, very good, very good sermon he gave. Um, but I, I, when I was speaking to him, I was, I was trying to relay a little bit of, uh, well, some things I've learned about you in a sense of. Um, one thing you talk about is with as far as evangelical is sometimes we don't we have the 
we want to talk in the microphones off, or, or in the sense, kind of like what you're telling yeah. me, we can't hear the. Yeah, word stepping guy. on the mic, stepping on the mic. Right. Yeah. And in the sense, um, you know, for you, for our you, listeners, you, for our listeners, that means when you do all the talking, you won't be able to hear God. So go on, please. Right, 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 right. One second, Doug. Give me one second. Sure, take your time, right. and uh, we'll take advantage of this moment to. Uh, maintain Sammy in our thoughts and prayers uh, because of course he has this incredible responsibility uh, that would crush myself and uh, in, and he's wonderful for it and I'm, I'm so glad that he's uh, you know honestly he's he's been through so much as well uh, and uh, he, he, this was um, how do I say this uh, there he is he's on camera oh what a beautiful child Oh, uh, what a lovely young child. Incredible. She's an angel. Yes. And uh, looking at her dad, Vin Diesel. It's yeah. Vin Diesel and child. So. <laughs> um, no, but uh, hold on. This, this whole Skype thing is like really. Okay. All right. So, no, um, I pretty much had to pick her up. She was telling me to pick her up. But, Understood. Uh, Understood. Honestly, though, what, what I was saying to him is. Um, uh, doctrine is one thing, yeah. and uh, you know, a certain. But our, our, I don't know my belief system is is pretty much the same. It's just what what some of the things that I I was I was trying to look for is in a sense, um, culturally, um, one of the things, for example, uh, Revelation of the Magi. Yes, which I was trying. I was gonna bring up to him, but it's just it wasn't the right setting. Right, but understood. Did, yeah. But it was what, what I was trying to relate to him was um, finding a, a way to be vulnerable with each other as, as far as as men. Yes. And, um, and a lot of it has to do with I, I don't really I don't want to um, get into the politics of, of faith or of religion because that's not how I, I get to know somebody. Or when I do talk about someone about Christ. I don't talk about, oh, you know, what religion are you? Or, you know, oh, I'm right. so-and-so. Right. So, in the sense, what I'm trying to tell you is, is in other words, be a human being. Or yes. have have this, this type of foundation where if we want to speak about our, our faiths, then let's, 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 let's start with, uh, with the foundation of, of we're doing this to understand each other and not, um, you know, uh, hit each other over the head with our interpretation you know yes but anyways uh back to what i was trying to tell you um um all this to me is really just almost like it was the timing the timing yes. of this new book yeah. where it's about to drop and they are trying to circle the wagons to try to derail yes what is going to come out the, yeah. And this happened last time with with the book, yes. The, the, you know, the last book with uh, our former executive producer and um, the Muslim kid. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> you know, yes. It's just it's one of these things where it happens where they want to derail or uh, missing, you know, not uh, in, you know, create dissension where yeah. all of a sudden, well, you know. We're doing our best to try to stop this, you know. Yes. And uh, you know, it kind of speaks to. Again, it it, it kind of speaks to. Um, you know, it, it kind of vindicates you in a sense of who you, who you are. Thank okay? you. Yes. Um, what I was saying to one of my coworkers, who is actually very curious about you, as far as your, you know, what what you talk about, <laughs> and he he's uh, he's listened to some of your transmissions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of these things where he's young. This, yeah. is, and this is a young kid. He's maybe about twenty-two. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and all these subjects that you talk about, it's it's so. It, I mean, I'm I'm not young and I'm not old. You know, I'm, I'm a young adult. I still yeah. consider myself one. Yes. But this new generation, Doug, is really they're not. They don't. They're not even. Um, they're not even aware of some of half the stuff you talk about. Yes, it's it's almost you might as well be talking about you know uh, Star Wars. Yes, yes. 
because it's just not it, it, culturally it's just not as celebrated as it once was you know yes. uh, if, so it's it's almost it's it's a reintroduction to history yes but it's this is different because you know you you you're polarizing you this gets in this gets in the ass of this country yes. and it's something that it stirs up a lot of a lot of questions and it's very dangerous because uh influence is it's probably the most the most powerful influence uh, 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 power yes okay sammy of course has to take a call and uh he will oh there oh. you are go on yes um but yeah. influence is, is the most powerful thing to have because yes. you can move the masses so yes that's right and uh go on are you back doug yes back. oh go ahead yes thank you yes back, he'll call us back and uh that's samuel romero whose input is always most welcome and uh he's left the call for now hopefully he'll rejoin us soon and um what i'll do is i'll continue it should get a notification when he shows up uh hopefully he'll enter a message when he uh returns what i'm going to do now is just kind of go into a, a brief talk about uh the holiday today or um, if we could call it a holiday because we're now uh into midnight uh on the east coast and uh, we might as well take it as the new day for uh, the majority of our listeners and uh, today's day is the international day of remembrance of the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade uh, the international day of remembrance of the victims of slavery and the in and the transatlantic slave trade try and say that three times fast <laughs> it was uh, established under the initiatives of the United Nations, which is observed on March 25th every year. Uh, the day honors the victims of the transatlantic slave trade that spanned over four centuries, over 400 years, and impacted an estimate of nearly half a billion black African men, women, and children. The day was first observed in 2008, uh, during the great uh, year, year of the great economic crash, the great financial uh, fall of capitalism, with the thematic, or the main theme being, breaking the silence, lest we forget. Uh, every year, Exhibits, film screenings, and discussion panels are planned at the United Nations headquarters and should be ongoing today. And institutions from all around the world are requested to pay respects to the victims of this unthinkable horror. Uh, as for the history of how this got started, well, slavery has existed since time immemorial and has been in practice, a practice, in almost all cultures of the world. Slavery as a punishment for crimes has been a long-held standard for nearly every past civilization. The transatlantic slave trade marked an egregious turn of events when West African leaders sold their subjects, mainly captured people from raids and prisoners to the Western and European slave traders. The formal import of slaves began in 1525 and lasted until 1866. In total, more than uh, 12, well, I'd say about uh, well over 24 million Africans were shipped to Western countries, um, out of which maybe only half that number, about 12 and a half million, survived. The total number of victims of the centuries-long exercise hangs in terms of the impact it had on the environment, um, entire families that were severed, entire families that were produced uh, by forced breeding here in North America, as well as other places. As I said, numbers to well nigh uh, 500,000 peoples, or nearly half a billion. Um, International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade is an annual observation initiated by the United Nations in the year my mother was murdered, 2007. 
Uh, and each year, a new theme is adopted by the United Nations to bring focused attention to the layered lessons about slavery, because obviously many different lessons can be learned the United Nations considers the tragedy of the transatlantic slave trade as one of the darkest chapters in human history. Uh, the observation calls for the establishment to mobilize, educate, and inculcate future generations about these horrors, lessons, and consequences of the transatlantic slave trade. Even though we have come far in our quest for progress, uh, African Americans and African Europeans continue to face racial discrimination at an institutional level. To this day, racial discrimination and racial profiling are the biggest causes of death of African Americans. <clears throat> so this day aims to create awareness about the prejudice, the prejudgmentalism and racism felt by the African or the black diaspora uh, spread, the population spread across the world, uh, certainly across the Western world because of the transatlantic slave trade. So when you think of the black African diaspora, it's the black Atlantic that we think of. And we include the ocean itself because um, infants were of no use. And infants were thrown into the sea. They were delivered on board the slave ships, which would take months uh, to reach uh, the New World. Um, many of these women had been raped by their slavers, uh, not necessarily whites either. These were uh, tribes that were hunted down by other blacks. The blacks went inland and they uh, um, captured these uh, other tribes, mostly raided the agrarian tribes. Oh, Brendan Zogan has rejoined us. Brendan, should have let me know you were back on. Um, so uh, feel free to come off mute and join us in uh, the discussion. I'm just kind of filling in time by talking about this holiday. Um, we'll see if you can talk. Yeah, if you can't, I'll just return to subject. <laughs> no, I, I'm here. I'm here. I was just listening to what you were talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's definitely just so people understand Europeans did not bathe in those days. So blacks could smell them coming from a mile away. So the Europeans could not go inland into the heart of Africa to hunt blacks down, uh, not only because the blacks could smell them out, but because they would die of malaria. Uh, there was just this yeah. wall of mosquitoes. Uh, so it was other blacks that raided the agrarian tribes and thereby denuded Africa of its farmland, resulting in massive reforestation, which helped lead to a miniature ice age because those forests, along with those in North America with all the Indians that had been exterminated, resulted in a massive carbon sink and resulted in the little ice age that could caused uh, the Thames River in uh, England to flood over, uh, to freeze over, to freeze over so that people could ice skate across the Thames. So uh, Brendan has rejoined us. And uh, so what's it like now? How are things going over at the Haunted Schoolhouse? Things a little less hopping or did everybody leave? Are you, there's still people? Uh, yeah, everything calmed down and I locked it up. And yeah. So everything's good you know, as far as I can tell. But but it was pretty hectic there for a while. It's like, um, are you I driving home? Are you driving home? Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. So go on. Are you safe? Are you safe talking? You're on the speaker. Yeah. Okay. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. So go on. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, uh, yeah, everything went well. It's just, uh, if that was anyone else, they would have gotten eaten alive by the, the immigrant. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Not, they, not, not, literally, not literally, but like, they wouldn't have been able to handle it. You know? Oh, fuck no. They would have been, they, they would have uh, gone away from the experience, traumatized, racist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they would have been, yeah, it, it just would have been overwhelming for them. Uh, you're in an incredible position. I mean, they don't know how lucky they are to have you at that fucking school or in the right. state of California service, period. Uh, yeah. and, and with what happened lately with uh, fucking with your finances, I am, I am appalled. I'm, I'm so sorry. I was so traumatized by what you were describing. Did you find any resolution to this or is it going to be resolution to this? Yeah, we got it resolved, but it was so anomalous that it was like, like even the bank itself couldn't figure out how that happened. Like they were saying, like we, they've never seen that happen. Well, it's so 
Yeah, definitely. It was, yeah, go on. It was supernatural because I, I assumed at first I assumed it was hacking. Yeah. And I was, but it was actually something really like pretty much like uh, like you know like in Wicca you can do money <clears throat> like money abundance spells with water. It was like the inverse, like the drying, the the stifling the. The stopping of money spell. Well, this is actually something that uh, it could be something like that, but that's more like at a primitive level of, say, somebody working outside the system. So uh, yeah. just to remind you of what I've spoken of for many years, and um, it may be difficult for people to grasp, and it really requires uh, a lot of, what should I say, just, you know, requires a lot of context. But to uh, put it to people as a uh, basically as possible, uh, Michael Aquino was part of a project which was taking into account the computer revolution because it was the military that was creating the computer revolution. And since the military was creating uh, the computer revolution, he was already thinking of ways to uh, basically bypass their uh, security in an occult sense. So, uh, as I've explained before, when one thinks of the Kabbalistic sense of the different planes of existence, uh, the plane of numbers, uh, the worlds of Beraya, uh, that are completely spiritual upper planes that embody concepts, what uh, Plato and other Greek philosophers thought that in this space existed perfect shapes, for instance, like the perfect square, the perfect circle. Uh, this baryolic plane of numbers, this is not the kind of uh, consciousness produced by thinking machines or machines that are coming into consciousness. There is a kind of uh, uh, astral for machines, a kind of astral plane for machines. This is not that, that uh, cyberspace. It's not that machine consciousness space. This is uh, basically the realm of numbers, this virtual realm by which Aquino could access computer network cyberspace by magic uh, without identification codes or passwords, completely uninhibited by electronic firewalls. That something like that was used to simply reset your account. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So th this is, yeah, it, this is at the state level. We're not talking about somebody, you know, uh, burning some money in effigy to, uh, <laughs> you know, fuck your day up. This is, uh, yeah. They, yeah, they just went in through the, uh, uh, the plane of numbers and uh, directly altered uh, the substance of uh, yeah, yeah, Brendan Zogit's way of life <laughs> as much as they could to fuck his day up. Like, good right. morning. Good morning, you know, happy breakfast, you know, if you can find one in the trash, that kind of shit, assholes. Yeah. Yes, so, uh, yeah, take it from there, uh, you know, other than that, hopefully. Yeah, and, yeah. and we actually, last time you, uh, a while ago when you brought that up, uh, yeah. we, we referenced the Pegasus uh, hacking system. Yes. Uh, yeah, so yeah, so yeah. That, that was like a U.S.-Israeli joint op like black ops or what, what would you call it black budget kind of project yes, yes. like uh, industrial espionage yes so the pegasus the first pegasus was just something that worked on like encryption hacking mm -hmm. but then they invented or came up with this second like 2.0 the pegasus uh uh, but what would be what would it be called like a Trojan horse virus? Basically, yes. What it is. Yes. But the second Pegasus is literally supernatural, and it can get into any computer network, any cell phone, even like different systems. Yeah. So usually it's like, right? You write a code for one system, yeah. like it Linux, PC, Mac, whatever. Yeah. But for some reason, this one can get into any system and any encryption, yeah. and it's basically like you're speaking of it, it uses this kind of magic yes thank you extra. and it what really gives it away is the term pegasus so pegasus is not only was it the mount of perseus yeah. um, in the mythology but uh in the nakshatra system the constellation of pegasus is uh one of the aspects of it is um, a nakshatra that is ruled over by the entity uh, it's a Vedic entity that corresponds with Baphomet, and it's the uh, it's the un it's basically the star of the dark magician. Yes. 
And so there's a reason they use the term Pegasus. Because there you have it. Go ahead. Yeah. That's a constellation that's in between uh, Aquarius and Pisces that is the star of the Dark Magician, basically. Yes. So. Yes. Thank you, and uh, very important and very profound. Uh, I'm so glad you're here to remind me of these things because I forget about them otherwise. Um, if you can find any links or any articles on, on that program, please send them to me, okay? And uh, in the private oh, yeah. messages. Yeah, and uh, feel free to enter them into chat as well if you wish. Uh, and uh, so, but uh, aside from that, yeah, um, whatever else comes to mind, share it with us uh, now that we are gifted with your presence for a little while. And uh, yeah, I do. I do have a funny uh, thing that I found. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Let me just forward this to you. But I do have a funny thing I found. So there's this book I found. They had it like hidden in the staff room at the other school because they're like moving. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're moving schools, so they're like digging through all their old paperwork. Yeah. And there's this booklet that was from 1999, right? And once I say the name, you're already gonna laugh. The Sam, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, is the one who published it. Oh my God! Oh yeah. my God! Yeah. That's old. That's old. God. Before I even say it. Yeah. So, so these guys are just. Um, what what would be the word for them? They're just. Let me just explain what the book is. Yeah. It's called New Lexicon of Hate, and hate's in capital letters. The Changing Tactics, Language, and Symbols of America's Extremists. And on the cover, it has the SS Skull and the Aryan Nation Room. Oh, boy. And then it says, and then it says a Simon Wiesenthal Center report. And then so, of course, I saw it, and I was like, oh, shit. Here yeah, you know? cool, <laughs> cool. And what's funny is, like... Uh, they like made this as like an anti they, they were trying to make the white supremacists look bad but then when i'm looking through it it makes them look good yeah, yeah. it shows that they're using runes yeah and and all kinds of stuff as their insignias and stuff yeah so it goes through all the gangsters all the white white supremacist gangsters for talks about white supremacy etc the kkk whatever right yeah. and then they throw in nazi yeah neo-nazi all that jazz right yeah the National Socialist Vanguard, the, the uh, ANP, the Adolf Hitler Free Corps, yes. the National Socialist with, uh, you know. Yeah. These were in the law. days when I had much more sympathy with the white supremacist movements before they, yeah, yeah before they were all infiltrated by the Temple of Set and went QAnon and shit. So, so go on. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then they also add Christian identity movements, which nowadays they were harping on, people were harping uh, oh, they're going to lump in Christians with this Christian national shit. Well, guess what? They've been doing it for 25 years already. Yeah, thank you. And one thing, you know, one thing they always leave out is it's always, and obviously Wiesenthal is a Jewish company or whatever. Yeah, for, for those who don't know, Simon Wiesenthal was the original, yeah. quote-unquote, Nazi hunter. He was the man who started right. it all. Sorry. Yeah, so. Right. Okay, thank you. Yes. So then it shows, so my favorite page so far is, Tattoos, quote unquote, used by racists, right? Yes. There's the Celtic cross, right? Of course, that's yes. going to be problematic. Um, then they have the life rune, which is the the Igrasil rune, yes. which is the Algis rune that I tell people to use. Yes. So, so by their logic, I'm immediately, I, I'm just there. I am. You know? Yes. <laughs> there you are. So basically, they have runes equal evil, right? Yes. Yes. So runes equal evil. They literally have the whole runic alphabet in here. <laughs> the skinheads alphabet. Like, you fuckers, man. You motherfuckers. <laughs> like, that is, that's like me taking Hebrew, yeah. right? Yes. And saying some shit about it and saying, yeah. this the, is the... Uh, some whatever. kind of terrorist. It's some kind of terrorist code. Like saying yeah. that's a terrorist code. Yes. Yeah, go. this is the banker's alphabet, right? Or something. You yes. Know, like absurd. Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you. You're taking something historical and applying it to something modern and then saying it's evil, right? Yes, yes. In other words, it's a form of cultural genocide that this culture yeah. must be wiped out. The culture is identified yeah. as evil and must be wiped out. Yes. That's, oh, that's horrible. It, yeah, no. no. 
Yeah, go on. All my sympathies were with uh, these organizations for the longest time. Uh, uh, everything collapsed uh, when it started, um, you know, around the year 2000, really, uh, when things really started right. going south and the Temple of Set and the various satanic movements began to infiltrate them and turn them into what they are today, which is nothing like what they once yeah. were. But go on. Yes, please continue. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. If you can find like a electronic a PDF of that and send me a link, that would be perfect. Or, you know, right. in a worst case scenario, some days photocopy it. I don't know how many pages it is. It sounds like it's a substantial. I, I can actually, I can actually, there's more copies. I can just send you a copy. Oh, you please. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. Yes. Excellent. Because this is like historical at this point, like a historical document. Yes. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So I was thinking about yeah grabbing one for you so I could send it. Thank but, you. Um, Go on. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Just what they're saying about here, like this, the runic alphabet. They're saying the runic alphabet was common with the Norse, the Teutonic, and the Celtic peoples. It has been embraced by white supremacists who believe that these ancient groups were the forebears of the white race. Like, okay, yeah. First of all, yes, they were. Yeah, I was about to say. And well. that doesn't. <laughs> that doesn't equal white supremacy because just because it's historically true thank you thank you and then they have all of the, the elder truth arc set yeah. and then they have uh this part's really funny they have numbers so apparently they're right there yes the class 88 which means they're h and h yes yes and this right here it says used as a greeting by nearly all races Okay, first of all, I've never gone up to someone and said 88, and they're like, yes. <laughs> and then by that explanation, the Chinese, when they put 88 on everything, they're just saying, how Hitler, that doesn't matter. Yes, thank you. Thank you. you the know? Chinese use eight all the time as a good luck number, yeah. and the more eights, the better. And yes. if you, yeah, if you double it, it's even better. Yes, so, yes. And, and, and just so... Uh, there's people, a whole point. Yeah. To Chinese Nazi yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. But just so uh, people understand, the uh, uh, this is one thing that always uh, that I was truly sympathizing with many of these groups about is that if you had young white boys in particular or young white kids that were using this in school, then teachers would claim that they were part of a hate group. And in other words, you can right. have all this uh, ethnic pride in all these other cultures, but white people cannot have any sense of ethnic pride. That was the that was what uh, made me sympathetic to many of these groups. Is it's simply a Caucasian ethnic pride uh, movement? Uh, but of course, it got completely subverted and derailed. Uh, the yeah. uh, so uh, uh, that that part is valid, but I mean, at its core, I yeah, it was obviously I mean, yes. like you said, yeah. like and and it just goes like it just is logical, like okay, yeah. yeah, even if it is a negative movement, it's like if you suppress it, it's gonna like. Fester, right? Yes, like, uh, societies end up so, perpetuating the very thing they seek to destroy. But, but yeah, uh, so by the way, Aristides has asked happened. you a question. Answer Aristides' question. Uh, he says that, Brendan, what PDF were you talking about? <laughs> okay, so if you can find it in PDF, that'd be cool. It's called The New Lexicon of Hate. By the Simon Weisenthal. Yeah. yeah. The, just look for The New Lexicon of Hate by Simon Weisenthal Center. Do you need to me to spell? Report, yeah. yeah, yeah, a Simon Weisenthal report. Yes. So. Yeah, and their symbol, their symbol is like a, a star of David that's on fire, which is funny. <laughs> All right, that's enough for right now. I'll look. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, let me welcome Jim Scott aboard. He said, "Wow, thanks YouTube for rabbit holes. Special people. <laughs> yes, thank you." Yeah. Uh, and, and there's more. There's more on this. The, the numbers code because it just gets more um, nonsensical from there. Yeah. In my <laughs> like they're they're really reaching for some like some of these they're really reaching like uh, the next one is uh, number eighteen right which corresponds to the alphabet A H which is Adolf Hitler. So anytime you write the number eighteen you're just like praising Hitler. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that one I don't get. I don't understand that one. <laughs> oh my! Uh, well, like, what if I just had like yeah. a bomber jacket with eighteen on it, like I'm a, I'm just, 
yeah, yeah, this is this is what makes uh, these uh, shall we say um, uh, people who are ultra sensitive. It turns them into downright paranoid people. Uh, just so people understand the semi logic here, the logic is that A is the first letter of the alphabet and H yeah. is the eighth letter. So therefore, eighteen means Adolf Hitler. But you know, it, I mean, that's really stretching it when you see this. Uh, the guy turns eighteen and he's happy about it. I guess he's turning Hitlerian. But yeah. there you go. It's the insanity. This is what led to the world we live in now. the The problem is that the backlash. The backlash has not been healthy. It hasn't been more of this. It's been instead the descent into the satanic, perverted QAnon and all the rest of that uh, phantasmagoria that uh, Aquino pushed through his QAnon. Uh, but uh, back yeah. to Brendan, yes. And you, and you notice there is this kind of, you know, uh, this like undertone of Satanism because they're against, they always add in the Christians to it. Yes. Which, yes. But, but in reality, as you said before, like Boyd Rice and these people, they were like openly satanic. Yes. Yes. So yes. Kind of like, you know, they never mentioned, notice that they leave that part out. They yes. They never say, oh, there were satanic skinheads. Yes. Right? So that must mean that that's who, you know, they're at least, um, what would be the word, on the same team, you know? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. They and, begin. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Yes. But by the way, just so people understand, the problem is the modern Christian nationalist movement or this kind of white evangelical movement, which offers this kind of cultural whiteness to converts right. is indeed racist. But that was not the case. It's something that right. was created. It actually has been created by this shit, which lumped yeah, by, yeah. by, by, by which was lumping actually congealing Christianity, conflating it. It was conflating Christianity with neo-Nazism back in the day. Uh, so, right. yeah, and, and that's what led to, you know, they created this Frankenstein's monster. So, go on. Yeah, now it's their last refuge. Like, and, you know, and it's very dangerous, actually, you know, as far as, like, if you push the, the American white people to a corner and they go to the Christian route, yeah. they're just going to get esch esch eschatological and fuck us all over. Yeah. So, it's like, so that's like the idea. That's what they want. I mean, yeah. in my opinion. You know? Yes. Well, they were hoping they, they were hoping that then they'll convert to Jew worship and, and breed Which red heifers. Did. Yeah. Breed red heifers for them to sacrifice. Yes. That's, that's the worst aspect of Christian nationalism these days is that it's, yeah essentially Jew worship is claiming it's Christianity. Uh, so yes, yeah. continue. Yeah. So the next number is, this is where they lose me here. Number 39, right? Is C I Christian identity. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So that's and then you have uh, 93, which is I C identity Christian. Yeah. And then you have the number 19. So, uh, so these guys get 18 and 19, lucky guys. Uh, Aryan identity, yes. corresponding to 1 and 9. Yes. Uh, then you have 58, which is E-H. Yes. This one is, this one's like really funny. Uh, E-H, 58, extreme hatred. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know of anyone that would ever rep that one. That's incredible. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is almost like an instruction manual for people who want to get something started. Like, oh, here's the codes you can use. That's, that's what happened when I saw it. Like the teacher, like I, whatever teacher put it there was like, yeah, we can like, I can like show my colleagues like what these are really about, what these people are about, because, you know, we're going to fight it. And then I'm like over here like, oh, cool. You know? <laughs> yes, that's how I always felt about those things. Yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, they, they uh, truly they uh, they feed the fire which they're trying to put out um, there. But then again, they do so anyway by their sheer hypocrisy their, uh, uh This is, you know, in in back in the day, uh, it really was this kind of uh, extreme political correctness that I struggled against. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it took a lot of work on the part of the enemy and uh, the success of these Edomites and the Herodian insurgency to uh, basically have to centralize myself. I had to centralize myself because yeah. uh, the, the radicalized right became extremely co-opted with the Russian insurgency. It became a Russian insurgency and they became... Right. 
uh, extreme worshippers of we got to breed red heifers for the Jews to sacrifice at the Temple Mount. You know, once they rebuild the Temple Mount after killing all the Muslims and shit. And uh, yes, Peter has said they're they're definitely going to try and get away with this genocide against the Philistines. They consider the Palestinians, of course, to be the Philistines. And they're going yeah. to try and finish them off. This is a ethno-religious war to them. Uh, and um, yeah, so back to Brendan. What else? Uh, what, what what else comes to your mind about uh, this or anything else you wish to talk about? Yeah, we, we don't even need to keep going with this, huh? This, but, well, the the one that I kind of like was the eighty three H K Hockenkreutz. Oh, cool! And they have <laughs> and they have to put German for swastika, right? In, like, hey. <laughs> of course, of course. Or, or quotation marks. Yes. Or, what's interesting is they put German for and then swastika is in quotation marks, which is odd. Yeah. 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 Well, I can understand why because they're trying to they're trying to show that that's the term that's being referenced, but still, yeah, right. it's oh, um, yeah, that's what I would have done it's because gramma- it's grammatical. Yeah, it's uh, grammatical. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. I see. And so uh, then, uh, uh, and then they have the hate acronym. Uh, mm. What are some of those? <laughs> Uh, Rahoa, Racial Holy War. That's right. Oh, my God. Akia, yeah. Akia a Klansman I Am. Yeah. That one is just ridiculous. <laughs> CIS, Christian Identity Skinhead. Uh, SWP, Supreme White Power. You know, they had to, like, put that one up a notch. <laughs> WP wasn't enough. Zog. <laughs> uh, Zog, Zog you use a lot, so... Douglas, you're, you're already in it. Yeah, I'm already in it. I always have Biden, been, yes. Occupational government. Yes. Uh, skin, skin head, which is stupid. Mm. Wood, pecker wood, which are, these are gangs. Yeah. War, uh, war, white Aryan resistance. Uh, yes. Wigger, white nigger, which they actually print the word nigger, by the way. <laughs> and, then it says, and then it says a white drug addict. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, yeah. Is isn't there a w, WPOD white punks on dope? What about? <laughs> I don't see it here. Yeah, that figures. Yeah, I guess. But, uh, well, it has a lot of historical documents too. Internet internet posting predicting possible biological attacks on U.S. cities. Uh, it has these different kind of things that you can look like. When I send it to you, you can look through it. Uh, but it's uh, there's one called Schluting. Excellent. Uh, yeah, what's shooting. that? Schuling, Schuling. So yeah. they're using a German word. Yes. When older skinheads attack younger skinheads to, quote unquote, teach them a lesson. It's <laughs> so stupid. I mean, Americans just make uh, this thing look bad, you know? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, well, boot, go boot on. Party, a boot party, which is a group of skinheads committing a violent assault. Yeah, uh, that's that's because they all used to wear steel toe boots. And so yeah. they'd uh, be kicking people in with their steel toes. like yeah. American History X, you could see, like, uh, getting, um, like, curb stomped and all that crazy shit, you know. Yes. And, in uh, detail, in painful detail that no one... Yeah. <laughs> w- uh, WCOTC, the World Church of the Creator, which I'm assuming some group... Uh, oh, yeah, that's, a, that's an old one. I mean, these are like what um, the younger kids would consider old men's religions. And uh, they, these yeah. were like, back yeah. in the day, Christian identity was based on Anglo-Israelitism, which was the old uh, Anglo-Israelite movement was the idea that the Anglo peoples, the Anglian peoples were the true Israelites. So this was based on a lot of people were buying into the thesis that uh, everything in the Bible is really taking place in England. Um, you know, this is just one of those things where they try to localize the religion out of some sense of self-importance. But uh, then it became uh, essentially a identity of uh, the white race as the true Israelites and that the uh, Jewish people are uh, this kind of, uh, uh, shall we say, an opposier, opposier race. And um, in a very real sense, when I've, uh, of course, explained what's going on with Israel... That is the case with Israel. Uh, so, uh, Brendan Zogit's now giving us an image. So, thank you uh, for that, Brendan. Yeah, I wanted to <laughs> see this, Douglas. So, what they have is the death rune. Okay. Okay. It's used on the, it's the Algis rune inverted. <clears throat> right? So, yeah. like what the peace sign would be. Yes. Used on the graves of SS soldiers signifying the date of death. Yes. Men in the movement wear this tattoo, which means they have taken a life, it's a taker of life, quote unquote. Right. Yes. So, but they're perverting these runes because, I mean, 
yeah, like they use them, but these, like these are actually holy symbols that you can use to protect yourself. Yes. You know? Such as the, what they did with the Hockenkreuz and all that. Yes. Yes. Uh, definitely understood. And I want people to understand that. Yeah, the SS graves dif did indeed have what they call, uh, what I saw on the SS graves was more like the, the life rune. The, I would see the life rune on the SS graves yeah. because you're honoring yeah. the man's life. Uh, so uh, that was, uh, so in other words, these guys don't even, they don't even understand how these were applied. They, they really don't. Right. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, but um, basically, so, basically, the gangsters just took that and inverted it, say, yeah. basically showing that they were murderers. killers. Yeah, <laughs> to show that they were killers, right? But but that's what uh, they do. And a lot of this was done in prison because you've got to intimidate everyone around you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, the uh, white supremacist gangs—they're all just part of prison enclaving. By the way, I don't know if you noticed, Aristides entered the um, uh, a PDF. Which may be. Oh, you got a PDF. Good. Yyes. Okay. Good. So he's got the PDF. Oh, so this one's yep. like an updated version because they look so stupid by now. Okay. Yeah. They're, by now they've become almost in unrecognizable. 2000, yeah. In 2009. Yeah. yeah what? Uh, what? Uh, our man. Rabbi Abraham Cooper. That's. Yo. God. Yeah. Did you say his name was Ramfa? Ramfa Abraham Cooper. Uh, his name was Rabbi okay. Abraham. Okay, thank you. Associate Dean of the Simon Bees and Salt Center. I see. Okay. So these people, these people get paid to write this, which is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tax dollars, tax dollars, yeah. no less. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. What What I noticed is they completely edited the photos. There's no photos. There you go. Oh, the oh wait, wait. There are some photos at the end, but mm -hmm. they're like actual photos of people's tattoos. Okay. Yeah, uh, it, it's no, it's much better in the book that Brand, Brendan has got. Brendan has got this book yeah. that is much more definitive. Probably because people were taking the typeface and just copying and not like, using it. They're yes, like, there. Yes, see, and uh, they said, "There you go. The Jews got it all set out for us. Now we can make it easy to uh, right. identify each other." Yes, yeah, so they had to take that uh, circulation and turn it into something. That not even the cops can use. The new edition, the cops can't even use that to really identify things or try to understand them. Uh, right. So there you go. That's uh, uh, a. Yeah, and some of them are bonkers, like the Odin rune. There's a yeah. basically there's a bind rune that's like it's like let me see it's like Burkana and something else mixed together, but or I mean uh, it's, a, it's a two Jira and something else. There's two runes mixed together and. Yeah, it is the Odenic rune, but I don't think it has anything to do with white supremacy, in my opinion. They probably use it like all the rest of them, but it shows one, one's faith to Odinism, a pagan religion. Odin was the Norse high god and the All-Father, which is popular with what? Racist. Oh, okay, so they do qualify it. They say, although it is popular with racism, Odinism is not a racist religion. Okay, well... <laughs> but but apparently christianity doesn't get that uh, no no of course well you, you know the jews always hate christians they they really do uh they're uh they they feel that christianity has persecuted them from day one and uh it, and of course the for thousands of years the common uh christian stance was the jews killed christ <laughs> that was the right. uh, so uh the jews are still they're, they're still butthurt about that um, and, uh, so they've done their best to try and, uh, uh, disabuse people of Christianity for generations. Uh, they're, they're, they're part of this great movement to, uh, uh, de-Christianize the American population. Uh, a lot of that had, uh, it, this Jewish cultural backing. The other thing that comes to mind, of course, well, there's so many things, cause I'm getting a lot of flashbacks, just looking at all this old stuff. It reminds me of all the old stuff I had to look at back in the days of the Department of Defense. Uh, a totally different world back then. The gangs were different. Uh, the ideology was different. Um, there was a lot of sympathy to be had with these movements. Um, all of that, of course, is is changed now. And uh, the the um, these movements are no longer like that. They're too polluted by uh, all of the Herodian and Satanic insurgency that has Russified them. Uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't negative when they had that movement that was white pride worldwide and they were trying to include Hellenic, uh, Slavic, uh, just all, all these different Caucasian or Caucasoid races, 
But, you know, that's since changed to this Eurasianist uh, ideology of Duganites and all the rest of that. So it, it's become uh, just overwhelmed by the Russian propaganda. And that combined with, of course, the uh, Jewish insurgency into Russia and their, their uh, incredible control over the Russian state, uh, that leads it all going back to the Jews all over again when people are involved with the right wing at this point in history. For those who don't know, Netanyahu's son is, is completely in bed with the radicalized right. And uh, like he promotes the, the picture of the old Jew wringing his hands that looks like the, the, the laughing merchant. You know, yeah, Netanyahu's son uses that shit. And the radicalized right in the United States calls him one of their bros and shit. So then, and uh, the right wing Israelis view the right wingers of Europe and America today as their next of kin. They really do. It's uh, so the whole movement has become. Uh, you talk about a Zionist occupation government, a Zionist insurgency. It's become Zionized, uh, just Russified and Zionized. It's it's uh, disgusting. So, uh, but originally, of course, in prison. You have to ethnically enclave. So this was the only way to survive in prison was men uh, began wearing these tattoos, uh, joining these <laughs> gangs. And uh, this is like, uh, you're in this the rest of your life. Uh, oftentimes was the old days, uh, but things have changed again. And now things are like, uh, you know, it's just like uh, this shit's all over the internet and then everybody grabbed it and diluted it and polluted it and... Uh, um, so it really needs to be reclaimed, honestly. There, there, there needs to be a white cultural renaissance movement that is not uh, it afflicted by all this conspiracism. That's the, uh, that's, that's the horror that they're facing right now, is that they're compromised. They're, they're completely compromised. Uh, but, um, yeah, so, so whatever else comes to your mind, uh, or anything uh, else that, from the book that bears mentioning, yeah, by all means, share it. Oh, there's a lot. There's like the Holocaust denial. They have like, um, basically, this is when the internet was still like Young. new, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so there's like, they have lists of websites, and then they have like these screenshots of '90s websites that I find kind of funny. Like they're quaint. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, like but that, basically, at that time, like they could just have their own website, like Aryan Nation. That, that, that's right. That's <laughs> right. Stormfront. I think that's actually pretty funny. Skin.net. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, it was it was almost naive. It was almost naive. Yeah, uh, yeah and, there's like this Australian, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, not Australian, uh, Arizonian, right? Police against the New World Order. They were associated with what, like the McVeigh kind of people yeah. or whatever. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, yes, that, that was, uh, uh, just so people understand, this was when the bleeding in began with the militia movement. And that yeah. was essentially the beginning of the end, really. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, Troy Bellamy, who is up way past his bedtime, how did he wake up? Uh, 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 let me respond to him, and I will respond to this on air as well, on record as well. He, Troy Bellamy says, "Why are you? Why were you sympathetic to racists? Uh, what about the?" Uh, what about their ideology was appealing? Okay, valid questions. I feel that I've answered them, but we'll answer them again. And as I point out, I have sympathy with Afrocentricity as well and have uh, expressed such. Uh, look, uh, cultural pride. What is wrong with cultural pride? And the point is, here's the problem is that in America, the, the uh, biggest issue is that there really is no reason for many people to feel a American identity. What exactly is the definition of an American identity? We didn't get it out of World War II. Out of World War II, you had a racist identity. And that racist identity was basically a white America uh, where blacks knew their place and where Asians were the enemy, period. Uh, they would try and say, oh, there's good gooks and there's bad gooks. But since you couldn't tell them apart, it wasn't like they were going to disambiguate. Uh, their bombing campaigns in Indo-Asia led to mass starvation throughout the Vietnamese peninsula, which led to the Vietnamese going to the communists. So it's not like the Americans knew how to work this with any sense of cultural sophistication. It was just basically white was right. 
Uh, this was different when you had the white movements develop as an identity movement back in the day when we're talking about the 80s. Uh, you had basically a bunch of people who were trying to develop some pride in their lives about their white heritage as specific. There's nothing wrong with that any more than there is about blacks who were trying to do the same thing. And so my sympathy was with anybody who was taking a sense of cultural pride in themselves that should always be encouraged because uh, that America otherwise has nothing to offer in and of itself as a cultural identifier. As I said, America is cultureless. It is a basically a culture, uh, what I call a prison rape anti-culture. But um, also along with these, you had La Raza, the belief in the race. And this is, of course, the Chicanos, as they used to call them, what feels like hundreds of years ago, <laughs> the, the Chicanos, that they had this concept of La Raza that was developed. And then they went into more or less the Aslan movement, which, by the way, translates as White Earth. So uh, this is, of course, the Mexican belief that uh, they have their own Aztec heritage and their own indigenous heritage uh, in which to take pride in. Uh, none of this is to be discouraged. It's to be, of course, encouraged where, as I said, I foresee a future North America where we will have cosmopolitan areas, city-state areas, or hybrid zones where cosmogenic people, the products of uh, mixed-race marriages, like myself, which are the growing number of births in America are all generally the growing number is mixed race births. Uh, the, the city has always been the environment for us, but uh, there should be, of course, uh, nations that have ethnic identifier status. Uh, and this was, of course, how the former Soviet Union was organized. It was like a Canada with 14 Quebecs. All of these republics that seceded from the greater Soviet Union were all ethnically uh, based in terms of their identity. Uh, so we can easily have a black America, a white America, a Latin America. These are, there's room enough on the North American continent for everybody. And most certainly the majority of the land uh, towards the West and the North uh, should be indigenous population oriented. Uh, even though they could never be the majority again, in most cases, they should still be the cultural identifier for a particular, uh, shall we say, ethnic enclave uh, that could be quite vast geographically with almost nobody living there. Uh, that's what the majority of Canada is, as a matter of fact. So uh, that's one reason why Canada allowed the uh, semi-autonomous status of the indigenous nation of, uh, oh my God, what do they call it again? Uh, Nunavut, uh, N-U-N-A-V-U-T. It's been so long since I've said that. Nunavut, uh, that is now like semi-autonomous status and is supposedly administered by its indigenous population. So that is a big deal. And uh, we could multiply Nunavut uh, about uh, at least a half a dozen times over, if not a dozen times over in North America. Uh, and, uh, so, so such being said, that's, uh, that's how I felt about this. So I felt it was unfair that when you had white people, especially kids trying to identify with something, they usually try to establish with that a moral criteria for behavior. It's usually a positive because they're trying to uphold something, uh, just as uh, people who develop a pride in their ethnicity will try to at least uh, represent their identity positively, this is usually a good thing. So this is something to actually be encouraged. But instead it was, dis it was uh, discouraged, it was persecuted, and that resulted in its uh, pollution by other opportunistic movements such as Satanism the uh, Herodianism, the, uh, uh, the, the result that we see today, conspiracism. Uh, Troy Bellamy says, sympathy? No one needs sympathy. Uh, perhaps empathy or understanding, respect and exchange of cultural ideas would be better figures of speech. Violence has been the hallmark of Eurocentric culture. I've certainly made that argument myself. Uh, have I not mentioned that today was, is... 
Today is an international holiday, to be emphasized again, the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. So, uh, of course, uh, this is a real factor in history. Uh, this is uh, a, a product, obviously, of European imperialism and obviously needs to be recognized as such. But as well, we need to recognize the Muslim slave trade. And we need to recognize, of course, that slaves were sold as far as China and Japan. That's how one black slave became a samurai uh, when he was freed by Oda Nobunaga and ultimately instated into samurai status. These are elements of history that are collateral. Uh, this incredible act of violence, and as I said, it impacted uh, half a billion uh, blacks uh, in terms of even children. Lives. Now, to wrap it all up, however, and drive the point home, uh, people, of course, uh, shudder at the name of uh, my biological father, Adolf Hitler. Uh, Brendan Zogit was bringing up how Peter Moon, of course, because of his own bias, uh, Peter Moon was a Scientologist in a day when L. Ron Hubbard was still alive. Peter Moon was serving L. Ron Hubbard in a liaison status, essentially, uh, similar to my position with Michael Aquino on the flagship of the Scientology Church, the Apollo. And uh, Peter Moon uh, thinks that L. Ron Hubbard is hated more than Adolf Hitler, that he incites this visceral reaction. Only among Scientologists, maybe, but the rest of the world, especially new generations, they don't even know who L. Ron Hubbard was, but they do know Adolf Hitler. And uh, the real person everyone should feel the cringe factor with is not my biological father, but Christopher Columbus, Christopher Valbo Corlombuenos, who started the transatlantic slave trade. And he was ethnically Jewish. So when it comes to these incredible losses of life, losses of life so staggering that they lead to a change in climate, uh, Christopher Columbus's uh, commencement of the extermination of the Native American Indians so that a new Zion, a new homeland could be found for his Jewish peoples in the new world. Uh, specifically with that intent in mind, he proceeded with the annihilation of all of the indigenous population, started the trend that would never end because it still continues today. Uh, through alcoholism, drug abuse, uh, the Native Americans are still suffering genocide. And that needs to be taken into account, but it all starts with the Jews. They're responsible for not only the annihilation of the Native Indigenous Americans of the Western Hemisphere, but throughout Africa, they started the slave trade because all the Indians died off in slavery. They had to find replacements. The blacks out of Africa were hardier, lasted longer, and uh, they brought them over by the millions. And uh, so when it comes to the genocide on that level, it resulted in reforestation on either side of the Atlantic. All of the land cultivated by the Indians became reforested because they were all dead and no longer farming it. All of the land cultivated by the black Africans inland in Africa reforested because they were no longer around to cultivate the land. The end result was massive carbon sinks on either side of the Atlantic and the creation of a new ice age. Uh, and this also resulted in many millions of deaths. Uh, all of this traced back to uh, the Zionist desire of the Jews to uh, annihilate the population of the New World, enslave the population of the Black World. How come no one looks on the Jewish people as the villains of history when my biological father was exterminating them? He was avenging you, Troy Bellamy. He was avenging the blacks. When my mother seduced him with a blowjob, not once, but more than once, at least twice, uh, to basically take his sperm, as was uh, as she was ordered to do by her emperor, 
uh, got him dressed up in a kimono, got him relaxed. He spoke to her of his uh, fascination with the movie King Kong, which he felt was an allegory for American slavery of the blacks out of Africa. In the movie King Kong, they're on a Pacific island, Skull Island, but all of the native inhabitants are portrayed as distinctively black. They are all not in blackface at all. They are definitely ethnically black actors that were hired uh, to play the role of the natives of Skull Island. Kong is abducted, taken in chains to the New World, where he breaks free, and uh, every fear of every white man uh, grabs the white woman and uh, runs off. This is uh, archetypal of the American pathology. This is what Adolf Hitler observed to my mother when uh, they were having basically casual talk uh, as per her seduction of him. When it came to uh, the uh, Nazi propaganda posters about Americans, they, you can look this up. Nazi propaganda posters in World War II portrayed Americans as wearing Klan sheets. They understood the Americans as racists. Uh, yet the Americans project that onto the Nazis, portraying Hitler, a man who understood the uh, nuances of the American films such as King Kong, the real symbolism, uh, the emotive power behind it. They portray him as the greatest race hater of them all. This is, uh, of course, uh, the propaganda of the Jewish war machine, the Zionist occupation government. Uh, so this is what needs to be clarified. This is my sympathy for these white supremacist movements identifying with Nazism as they were originally incepted. And uh, we have to understand now that they have been corrupted, that there needs to be, of course, a clarity uh, in both, uh, as I said, uh, white identity and uh, Afrocentricity. There's a room enough for both black and white nations in America, as well as zones where people can just be people. Uh, but with that, uh, if Brendan is still with us, uh, or Aristides, uh, feel free to join back in. Of course, Troy Bellamy is welcome to join us, uh, uh, since he's still up. <laughs> and, of course, provide us with uh, uh, his own perspective on these topics. Uh, uh, otherwise, I'll just retreat, retreat back into monologue. Our friend Brendan brought up the fact that Yasuki, Yasuke was a man of African origin who came to Japan in the Sengoku period, Warring States period, uh, became a retainer in the household of Oda Nobunaga. Uh, thank you, Brendan. Uh, and, uh, so that's the Black Samurai. Uh, he says, what is this? Uh, uh, the untold story of Douglas Duane. Who knows? Uh, yeah, it looks weird. Yeah, this looks weird to me. Uh, God knows. I have no idea. So, probably some new hater or uh, controversial figure. <laughs> uh, weird shit. <laughs> Use an AI. Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, this is... Uh, uh, damn. Weird shit. <laughs> oh, this is shorter than... Uh, this is shorter than, uh, you know, what I uh, had the other day in the telephone conversation that was recorded. And, um, yeah, AI really does a fucking number on me. Uh, so, uh, that's, uh, oh, oh, I, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, well, at least words getting out. Use the Schwartz real estate. <laughs> that is funny. That is funny. Okay. I, um, what can I say? I'm, I'm at a loss. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, so thank you for that, Brendan. Can you come on now? Can, can, can you come back on now? And, uh, all right, let's see if our man can come back on. Uh, and if not, I'll just return back to, uh, what I was saying before, uh, what I call a preferatory monologue, uh, which will last until George Knight shows up and then we'll, uh, talk with him for a while. Uh, presumably, if he shows up at all, uh, then get back to uh, where we were. <sighs> oh my god. I am sometimes 
left speechless. It looks like uh, Brendan uh, Zogit is not uh, uh, coming back. Uh, he is maybe checked out for the night. But here's what I'll give him in return for what he shared with me. And uh, we'll just uh, take it from there. Uh, and um, okay. Says, by the way, we're not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. As such, viewers will experience buffering. Let us know. Uh, Brendan he says, uh, he, he, he's, uh, oh God, how did you manage that? Am I audible? Yes, thank God. A little echoey, but at least you're, yeah, so you at home? Yeah, the most absurd, I'm in the warehouse with the, the single light bulb. The, you're you're the back? Why, why are you back there? Did they kick you out or is everything okay? What What's going on? It's, the project is delayed, but okay. I'll, I'll speak to you privately about it. Okay. Yeah, I'm in the the single light warehouse again, but okay. I, I'm okay, stable, stable. Yeah. So what's your but, what's your impression of this? Your own impression? Oh my god. It, well, the whoever posted it seems to be like, I mean, it was like positive. It was yeah. like he's you know he's an intriguing figure. You might learn something or something. Yeah. yeah semi sympathetic. Semi sympathetic. Yeah, semi sympathetic. <laughs> and then, but the but the sinister part is they had Russian techno dubbed over it. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't trust Holy it, shit. Or it was like a, it was almost like a Tetris dance tune. That's how I describe it. Oh my god! Oh my god! Yes. So I, I wouldn't trust them. Yeah, <laughs> no. The good point. Your point's well taken. And they had to use a Jewish as hell name, Schwartz Real Estate. You know, which could be German. Well, use but, use yeah. the no. Use the Schwartz comes from Spaceballs. Uh, okay. Okay. So instead of use the Force, they couldn't use the Star Wars reference. So they okay. say use the Schwartz, which means black. Use the black. Is, is what they're saying. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Black and German. Exactly. Uh, so exactly. use the Schwartz real estate. So it's space balls, which of course is, is I hate space balls. <laughs> and, uh, it's, a, it's a Mel Brooks film. It's of Jewish course it's Jewish. Yeah. It's Jewish as hell. And uh, so it's going to be anti-Nazi and all that shit. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, so there you go. It's bizarre. That is bizarre. It's almost like they're trying to, uh, you, you can't make heads or tails of it. It's like they're trying to, yeah. how would I say, insult me uh, or rather make it sound like you better not listen to him because the Jews and the Russians are recommending him. <laughs> That's what it comes across as. Holy and shit. And I, I wonder how he got the prompts. It's like for the the images, it's like he was typing in like, van, uh, you know, sexy vampire talking into a microphone with the background of san francisco yeah that, yeah and oh i'm God. not i'm not i'm not being facetious it's like that's literally no that's what would have to, have to that's what he would have to say yeah oh <laughs> uh, yeah because if you see the images like i'm not promoting it i'm just i yeah I'm just, i found it after i sent it. it no no they're definitely uh what you would call um ai sex appeal images they're ai sex appeal right. images and uh so it's um it's cute it's cute so far at least and uh so yeah uh nothing to complain my first about. thought was that it was sid but it was a day ago so it wouldn't be no him. no no it, it's it's you you know he doesn't have that that capacity right. that would require creativity that would require you know some level of discipline He'd have to have some level yeah. of discipline. It's, but then again, you, you know, At he has first, alters. I thought it was Aristides because he was the one who was sending me those AI images. Yeah, but... yeah, that's true. That's true. Because Aristides does do AI. Aristides, yeah. it might be him. It might be him right now. Do you recognize this Aristides? He's 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 asleep. He's asleep. I think. Uh, okay. Yeah. But uh, it, there, there you go. Uh, uh, I gave you back something. What's that, funny yeah. is it's called the untold story. It's like that's all you do is tell the fucking story. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nothing untold about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, but why doesn't it he should use... be called suppressed stories? Suppressed. Yes. Thank you. Why doesn't he use my last name though? He does. He uses oh, all three. What does he? Yeah. I, I, I didn't notice it. Yeah. Open the video and you'll see. Okay, because I did open the video, but I was so so shocked by what I saw that I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't really... Oh, I see. It kind of blends in. The colorway is bad, yeah. Y yeah. I, I, yeah, I see the optical illusion. Yeah, yeah, it's so... so it... And this is his only video. Use the Schwartz oh, video. Oh, Jesus Christ, that's Oh, scary. no, he does all kinds of stuff. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. All right, so... He's so real. it looks like he he just makes content, but he's not getting any views. So <laughs> comparatively, yours speaking. actually the funny part is yours has the most views. I was about literally. to say. I was about literally. to say. Yeah. <laughs> there's one other video, but there's a naked chick or like a half naked chick by a beach. But so that would get the know. most hits. Yeah. So it's those two videos, yeah. yours and the other one. 
Yes. Oh, that's fucking funny. That's hysterical. Uh, oh, well, uh, praise be thus far is uh, what we can say. Uh, and uh, yeah, so what did you think about my... Oh, he, he went on pause there, our dear Brendan. So hopefully he's not being eaten alive by warehouse rats. Uh, oh, there you are. So, Brendan, uh, what did you think about what I said in response to Troy Bellamy? What did you think of my response to Troy Bellamy? Let's see if we can get Brendan to talk. He's muting and unmuting. We can't hear him. He had to leave, so hopefully he'll be back. Uh, yeah, he's in the warehouse. There he is. Let's see. If... Hello? There we are. Okay. So, so what did yeah. you, what did you think about well, what before it... I respond to that, yeah. before I respond to that, I was going to say the, the telltale giveaway that it's an enemy is they, the first line, they use the word claim Douglas Dietrich's claims. Okay. Okay. There yeah. you go. So it is there, an enemy. There's the answer. Yeah, there you are. So, so there we are. So, uh, ne nevertheless, it's still got the more hits than anything else he's got. Right. Yeah. Uh, it at uh, least makes you like, yeah, intriguing. Yeah. Like, someone's going to like look for you now after that. Yeah. It's yeah. like an advertisement. Yeah, it's an ad. It's an ad. Uh, uh, but he, yeah, uses the term claim, though. Uh, Got to get rid of that term. And uh, he, it's, it's and nice. Yeah, Douglas. Yes, welcome aboard, George Knight. Good. The two of you can now uh, help me by speaking to with, with, with each other. I mean, I'll be here with you throughout the, throughout the time, of course. Uh, you have about an hour with us tonight, George, or how long? I think so, Douglas. A good, yeah, between half an hour to an hour, hopefully. Uh. Fingers crossed. Yeah, thank you, Douglas. Yeah, some things um, um, have just um, <laughs> transpired, so unfortunately I won't be able to remain with you for the rest of the duration of the show. Mm -hmm. But there is some dates coming up where I can be on um, for that long duration. I will, I will enter them into the private messages for you. Ho hopefully next Sunday will be, we'll try again next Sunday. Excellent. Coming Saturday. Yes. Is everything all right? Yes, yes. No, it was, um, yeah, a few altercations with, um, yeah, arrangements with, um, yeah, just my schedule planning and all that. Yeah, so oh, yeah, it's nothing, nothing Normal to be stuff. alarmed about. Yes, <laughs> these things happen. Yeah. yeah. But no, thank you for having me on, Douglas. Yes. Oh, of I course. I apologize, I can't be on. Oh, I was looking forward to it. No worries. I was looking forward to it as well. We all are. We all always do. But um, yeah, we'll do it next Sunday, hopefully. And uh, hopefully, you know, yeah. we'll 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 get around to it definitely. Um, and uh, and tonight I'll just go into monologue. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. if you look uh, further up the, um, uh, were you able to hear my response to Troy Bellamy? By the way, earlier, were you able to hear me? Oh, I was. I was listening, Douglas. Yes, I saw his comments in the um, the YouTube um, comment section chat. on the live feed. Yes, in the chat section. Yes. Yeah, so okay, so see, and yeah, you did hear my bit, response yeah. to it then. You you did oh, hear. Oh, absolutely. And and oh, completely oh. agree. Completely agree with you, Douglas. Yeah, hundred percent. I could always add things to it. Oh yes. please, yes. Oh, and please. and uh, and and before you do, Brendan, how did you feel about my response? What did you feel about my response there? Oh yeah, I very much appreciated it, and the fact that you brought up. Uh, that no one ever, or not, I don't think you said it directly, but that there was the Muslim slave trade, there was yeah. all this other stuff, there was, yeah, Columbus, everyone glazes over when I say oh, Columbus yeah. was the most evil bastard in all of history, and they're like, well, you know, he discovered, it's like, no, he didn't discover anything. Thank First you, of all, thank you, he, go on. He freaking, he, they, they already knew this was here from, yes. the, the Vikings had been here. He yes, thank you. Like, like, and the Moors, and yes. <laughs> talk about you know whiting whiting black history the moors were also here yeah. you know yes. and they they glaze over that before columbus <laughs> you know but all uh yeah what you said about there there is room for you know their own uh everyone's ethnic group can have their own nation yeah yeah and that um during jim crow and stuff that actually manifested almost fully because yeah. of the separate be equal and the black communities had their, um, they were running numbers, which were like their own lottery systems. Yeah. They had a very strong middle class. They had, um, you know, like you said, during the World War II, they act, or after post-World War II, they actually obtained a lot of the, um, the lands that were taken away from the Japanese. So it's like they had a lot of wealth and their own, their own stuff. Yeah. Where yeah. nowadays we would consider them to be extremely successful. Um, yeah. You know, to the point where they were running lotteries in their own, only in their own communities, and spreading the wealth further, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, but all of that got nuked when in the 80s and the 90s, when 
they were like, I don't know what to call it. He, like, he got nuked with integration. Nuked. He got nuked with integration. Nuked black culture. Yeah. 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 Integration destroyed all that. Yes. It, yeah. it destroyed it and created uh, the poverty that's endemic within black culture today was yeah. integration. Uh, yeah. And they had strong churches. They had, you know, like they had a culture that yeah. was actually made worse by what, whatever we have now. Yes. Thank and, you. Um, thank and you. it was done deliberately. You know? It's yeah. like, uh, yeah, well, that's, and, that's and, um, so, okay, reconnection successful. So I want everyone to know we got disconnected there, but the reconnection has been successful. If you missed anything, it shouldn't have been too much. We were talking about hindsight being 2020, and we would have preferred, of course, the Malcolm X version of a black future, which would have been good for everyone involved. Uh, but uh, my question is uh, why, you know, Troy Bellamy is constantly shocked or consistently shocked by what should be expected by now <laughs> when I'm exhibiting sympathy with uh, the old uh, style of uh, the um, uh, Nazi movements. Uh, by the way, Brendan has rejoined us. He's having sound yes. issues. Uh, let's see if we can hear you, Brendan. Say something. Yeah, no. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, good, good. So, um, so, so before uh, we go any further, um, George Knight, take a look a few yes. steps up. Of, if you scroll up in the entry, the comments section right yes. here in text box of Skype, not not chat, mm -hmm. but in Skype, right. you'll find that right. somebody's created some little thing here, and uh, you know, I don't know what your impression of it is, but it wasn't me. Uh, so, some guy put this up, and. Uh, um, you know, whatever your impression is of it, feel free to share with us. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, at any rate, uh, while our man George Knight mm. is reviewing that, um, of course... Uh, Something was put in the chat room? No, 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 no. I, I was saying the only thing that uh, we were referencing in the chat room was Troy Bellamy came on and said, uh, uh, mm -hmm. how are you sympathetic to the, the to, to the racists? What about, you know, uh, their ideology is appealing and it's like, Okay, how is this new to you every time? It's like it's new to you every time he asks that question. Uh, it's like, uh, how is this unexpected? Like, uh, it, it's kind of <laughs> like, I mean, he's been listening. He's been listening. It, it's yeah, like, right. you, you know, uh, yeah, forever. It's, it's like, uh, but he's still constantly shocked at where I'm coming from. Uh, it, <laughs> But it's yes, it yeah, it's just uh, the way it is. But it gives us a chance to you know reiterate our message. And um, mm -hmm. so um, <laughs> that being said, uh, and and just so people understand, it's not just Columbus. Uh, this Jewish propensity for genocide goes all the way back to the Canaanites and uh, mm -hmm. the annihilations of people in their vicinity and uh, yes. uh, simply went global with Columbus. And uh, when you think of what happened with the Bolshevik Revolution, which of course yeah. uh, created a commasocracy of uh, overwhelmingly Jewish ethnicity uh, yes. that uh, created the Holodomor and the mass starvation, the system of gulagri, or the gulag camp system yes. i mean we're talking about the jews being the most genocidal people in history to the uh yes. tone of billions of people dying billions <laughs> this is not this is like uh this is not something that is uh brought up in history and what they're repeating in palestine today is simply a reiteration of this pattern it's uh so um it needs to be taken into account when people are indoctrinated to see them as the eternal victims the ultimate victims uh this is the insanity of the world we live in so uh this does have to change so that being stated um uh brendan's gone mute again um so george we turn it over mm -hmm. to you yeah and, and brendan yeah I'm, it, yeah I'm but both of you, yeah both here. of you whatever input you can provide but, so did you get a chance to look at that strange thing uh there george that little or do you know what i'm talking about no no i just browsed over it all douglas and um, yeah I'm, you probably have to tell me specifically what i'm looking at or what i should be looking at i've just looked well, over the um the comments but comments who's the person that entered it oh no 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 it's in text here in skype text not in the chat in the skype chat in the skype text yes i'm scrolling over it now but um toxic male gamer that one or Anubis. no 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 that's uh, chat that's chat that's, that's chat. chat no uh we mean in the skype call if you go into this skype call can you turn yes. on here's what i can do is i can show you a screen share so um, yeah, okay. can you see the oh, wait, cursor? It sounds like George. It sounds like you were there. Just scroll down to the most recent. Okay, okay. thank you. No. Um. Oh, maybe. 
Uh, can you see my cursor moving? I'm sharing yes, screen. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. this. Can you see this? In the text box of Skype. Uh, our apologies. Yes, uh, that's where I am. That's where I am. Oh, oh okay. Okay, so oh, you, you can review that and uh, then uh, okay. whatever, whatever impression Somebody's... you Somebody's... Yes, okay. Thank you, Douglas. Yes, I will do. I have um, made some uh, notes. I've got some notes to read out. I, I went back to review the um, the 13th of March episode. Oh, yes. Uh, Tell us about that. Yes, I I went, Aristides went back, wrote um, something really funny. He said, I... I I, I told myself yes. I'd never go back, but I did, and I timestamped it. So he actually yes. added a timestamp for people, but go on. Yes, uh, yes, us, so with so us. This, yes, thank you. This is the third time I've reviewed it now. Um, and some things that I didn't actually note before, but I've actually written some notes down about it. Let me yes. just get it. Please, got it here, thank Douglas. you. Um, it, was, it was referencing, it was when it was just them two, the Brandon, the Brandon Young and the, uh, the Sid, I don't know what his real name is, Douglas. No, oh, Trampus right? Nicholson. His name, think Tramp, Trampus as in Nicholson. Tramp and Ass, A-S. He used to be a double Trampus. S, but he legally changed it because he couldn't st stand everybody calling him Tramp Ass. But yeah. Trampus, Trampus Nicholson. Who has yeah, a criminal right. record? Brendan, help me out here. Mm -hmm. He has a criminal record for a felony assault that was dropped only because the landlady said he was entering rehab on condition he entered rehab, right? Yeah. Oh, you, yeah, you said it. It was it was dropped, but the 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 oh, yeah. on condition it was dropped on condition he into yes. rehab, but he's not living yeah. up to his conditions. Yeah, he's drinking all the time. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, but it was definitely there, like under his name. If you just look it up, yeah, you know, yes. whatever whatever county he lives in, I forgot right now. But we can pull it up. We have to. He's got a criminal record. Yes, he's he, got. A, it yeah. was assault of. Uh, it was it was him. The the court papers, and this is public record. This isn't me like doxing him. Yeah, it's like you just type it in, and it shows up. Um, yeah, it's on it public was, record. Yes, yeah, it was just a public record of, from California because some of these have to be legal. Uh, legally put out into public record. Yeah. So it was him against the apartment complex, and he had like done a violent act against the management. That's literally what it said. And then, um, and pretty much because he was an asset, they they went through all of the paperwork, and then at the very end, it said charges dropped or something. Yeah. That you know. and this is because he's an asset. He pays no rent. Tell him, Brendan. He he, he pays no rent. Yeah, kind of like what I gathered from what he was saying is like, yeah, he doesn't have to pay for rent. And I was like, he's exempt. I, he, I never got like a answer for that. He just said, oh, yeah, I just, you know, he somehow he can do it. I don't know. Yeah, what magically, is. magically, because he's a fucking asset. Which no one, no one in the greater Bay Area yeah. doesn't know how their rent gets paid. I mean, it's expensive. <laughs> <out there. laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you can't like just... Like, it would have made more sense if he just said, oh, I deal drugs, and then I would have been like, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, but we, we, we know that would be a lie, because if he dealt drugs, he'd be cool, he'd have chicks, and he, <laughs> you know, the, yeah, he'd have friends, he'd have friends, he'd, he wouldn't be lonely, because everybody yeah. want, you know, everybody would want to be his friend, right? You get my point? Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. That yeah. I, that I get. yeah. Uh, and, and, and like you said, they'd kick, the, what, they'd kill him in a heartbeat where he lives. Oh, within seconds, yeah. Yeah. East East Bay, yeah. Yeah. Done. yeah. yeah. That that's if he was if he was serious about dealing drugs, he'd be moving into the yeah. territory of real men, men who actually handle yeah. guns. Well, those guys are like you know I don't know if you ever heard of the rapper E Forty, but they're yeah. all from that area. You know, it's like these yeah. are actual gangsters. Like, yeah. yeah, these are actual black gangsters. He, yeah. Dude who gets smoked in like thirty seconds. Thank you. The first deal. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. What you doing here, white boy? Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah, hey, that guy stands out like a cue ball. Yeah, it, 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 anyhow, uh, we don't need to go any further than that. Uh, we'll wake, we'll, we'll wake Troy Bellamy up again. It was, uh, Somebody calling me. Somebody's calling me. <laughs> George, so, so, uh, yeah, at any rate, George, please, by all means, go through your notes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. They um they were discussing about the Oppenheimer movie and yeah. they were trying to um talk about the historical references from um from the in from the actual person what Oppenheimer quoted about that the bomb would cause a chain reaction which will destroy the world and it's Thank why you. he was referenced as the the, the, the destroyer. For I am become the world, death. Destroyer the, the destroyer of worlds. By the oh, way, that's yes. the Bhagavad Gita. He was referencing the he was quoting the Bhagavad Gita. Um, uh, but go on. Yes, yes. he was. 
Oh. Yes, thank you, Douglas. Um, but when you listen to the conversation between these two individuals, Brandon and um, and uh, Sid, Trampus, Trampus, and Trampus, Nicholson. <laughs> Trampus, <laughs> they he was going well according to Douglas, and he was asking Brandon a question. He's going well according to Douglas that this is um, an actual common or general knowledge. Is this true, Brandon? And Brandon said to him, "No." And I was just like, automatically, I was thinking, well, this is historical. They even put it in the latest Hollywood movie. Thank Oppenheimer. you. <laughs> and even though, even though, yeah, this is how it's how so preposterous what he's, what they both stated. Because uh, I actually asked a friend who reviewed that movie. And it is in the actual movie. Because I've not reviewed the movie itself. But it is actually referenced in that movie. And it is historical. So the fact that these two individuals actually have disregarded uh, yourself, Douglas, of what you've always said, and you're not referencing anything from any external sources. This is historical. This is from fact. So that was the first thing I noted was the, the fact that they were actually trying to maybe discredit you or not take, not take you seriously or just question um, and I've come on and said it as well. I've come on uh, multiple times and stated um, about the bomb, about the test side trinity. I've, we've gone into that historical um, topic before. Uh, and so, um, yeah, that was the first thing I noted on. That's the first thing I entered in my notes. Um, and Brandon stating that he gets fan mail, that people find him funny. That I found a bit odd. Did you? Yeah, you yeah no, that? no, that was just insane. That was just he's. Do you talk yes. about somebody who's out of their fucking minds? Pathological. Uh, yeah. yeah. Go on. I, I mean, yes. it, it's like the, the, the idea, and he said it was physical because I said literal physical letters. You heard my voice, the incredulity yes. Of, yes. of of my voice. You're like, I don't get any fan mail. Yes. Uh, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> It, 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 yes. it's like uh well believe it or not i i do get letters but it's like uh and and they're rare but you know people do yes. write me but you know there's a reason for people to write me nobody's going to write to somebody who appears on my show for right. a short period yeah. of time uh is yeah. you know barely comprehensible and uh it, you know just just on and on oh it, it, but go on yes please yes but oh please. yes and I do apologize by bringing this up, but um, I've just written down that Brandon um, brings up an erotic homosexual feature scene starring Brooke Gibson and Peter Moon, which Peter emailed Brandon and linked to it. And he goes, that's a fact. And he goes, he'll share it with, um, he said, um, it's in my Gmail, so I can't dive in and get it right now, but he'll look for it and then send it out. Um, and Aristides was there. He heard that as well. That was yeah. reference into their conversation. This is when, obviously, Douglas was on the break at this point. And uh, this is what they were talking about um, amongst themselves. And obviously, I think it was um, to um, incite or trigger Brooke to come, let her come on or something. That's what we concluded, I believe, Douglas. No, that's um, what he was when... claiming later. He was claiming. Oh, yeah, I was going to say that's what he said, I think. Yeah, he said yeah, that. He was hoping it would bring her out. Yeah, but that, of course, makes absolutely no sense, because why would he assume she was even listening? That's yes. that's the crazy he part. She goes to bed early. Yeah. Yes. I remember listening to you say that, Douglas. Yeah. So, no, that's what I just written down in my notes, because um, that was something that um, I brought up on the last transmission, but I didn't reference those bits. I went back to review it again, and um, I thought it was just um, important that I bring that up. That's what I noted. Mm -hmm. People could go back and review it themselves, because it like Aristides has said, he's timestamped it. And it's on public. And by the way, he, I, I just deleted Aristides' comment because he's new at this and he timestamped right, it incorrectly. Right. So he gave the wrong timestamp. He says three minutes and 48 seconds in. He means like he doesn't know how to do three the hours. three hours thing. So, yeah. you know, so he's got people listening at three minutes and 48 seconds. They aren't going to hear shit. Um, so yes. so oh, yes. <laughs> there we are. Um, so I had mm -hmm. to delete that and I'll tell him about that in the morning. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, or I'll write him a note yes. if, if I wind up leaving early, which I hope doesn't happen. But anyhow, so continue by all, all means. Yes. No, definitely. Yes. It was Brandon was trying to rationalize it later, but if he wants to bring Brooke mm -hmm. on, there are other ways to, if she were listening, why go with, uh, oh yeah, she's, she's having sex with Peter Moon. It's, it's just so inflammatory. It's yes. just, yeah, none of this is meant to be. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, there we are. Thank you. Yeah, I found it offensive, Douglas. Um, yeah, and then yeah, I just mentioned just, just it's it's not really anything any relevance, but um, Sushad fuck <laughs> because he threw away his shadow, and uh, yeah. that was just like yeah, that was just ridiculous, <laughs> just like just completely um, abrupting, just um, disrupting the show, <laughs> just yeah. 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 
oh yeah but that stuff into really it's no not any relevance but that was just um yeah that was that segment during that period and what i mentioned um <laughs> Uh, before um, you know, really mentioned about Doug Splain, and he just threw in that comment just to yeah, it's just ridiculous. Oh, yeah, just salt in the wound Enter. after he stabbed me in the yes. back. After he stabs me yes. in the back, then he he throws salt in the wound, and and he still thought things were totally copacetic, and uh, you know, just this, this is how crazed yeah. and manic this individual is. And he came on again tonight, even though I banned his Did channel. He? Yeah, even though I banned his channel. He came back in the chat and I had to ban him all over again. Uh, so this will probably be episodic with each episode for a while uh, is that he's just going to keep coming back. And he continues to write me emails under different names. Uh, so it's it's just going to go on for a while. Uh, he, he, so, yeah, there, there we are. He's, he's obviously, well, he and Brandon's, Brandon Young were working together to try and disrupt the program. Um, yeah. Sammy Romero came on earlier and was with us for a few minutes and of course he uh, felt bad for Brandon because we all want to remember quote unquote the good Brandon so he was um, yes, of, course. of course chalking it up to the brain damage but I explained to him you know in, in reality there it, it, there never was a good Brandon. Uh, it's not brain damage. He's baseline psychotic. That this, you know, and he said so himself by saying what he did. About the bullying. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> he, um, he called that individual up the street that when he was growing up, and he said he was yeah. going to kill him, and so rightfully so, the individual called the police. Yes. Uh, yeah. And the police, um, yeah, and he, he that was the another part of that um, <clears throat> the conversation he had with yourself, Douglas, when you returned. And um, yeah, you said, well, I don't blame the individual. And he yeah. goes, um, yeah, I saw the police um, cars rush past the house, went to the individual. And um, he said, oh, I thought the guy thought I was joking. Like, no, if you tell someone you're going to kill him, you've got to take it seriously. Yes, thank it's, you. Yes. Oh, yeah, you no. cannot yell fire in a crowded theater. You cannot run behind. No. So, say some old man is taking a piss at a urinal in a public restroom. If you ran up behind him with a pencil and jabbed it in his kidney and said, this is a knife or a gun and stick him up and he suddenly dies of a heart attack, you are guilty of manslaughter. That is not a joke. That is not, uh, you know, you would be held responsible for that. These things are not, you can't casually do these things. Uh, but the fact that he <laughs> suffered no repercussions and decided yeah. that was fun. I'm going to keep doing this the rest of my life. My love. Shows a total lack of empathy, which by definition, psychologically and psychiatrically, means you're psychotic. <laughs> it shows yeah. you have no capacity. Yeah, yeah for empathizing with someone. So when he says that, plus, as I said, uh, I brought up with Sammy Romero, his background in terms of his family, uh, by his own uh, claims, uh, being satanically, ritually abusive. Uh, <clears throat> and as he gets older and realizes, hey, I'm unemployable, I need to stay in the family will, uh, then he came on my show to show he was on their side by preaching Michael Aquino uh, and like Sammy Romero said, he couldn't believe it because, you know, he's like preaching Michael Aquino, Peter Lavinda. These are the people who tried to kill him. And, uh, but, you know, to them, he was always expendable. He was obviously not the sharpest knife in the drawer. So <laughs> they, uh, Another useful idiot. yes. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, now that he gets older and he comes to terms with that fact, now he's trying to get back in their good graces. I know I'll go on Doug Dietrich and just subvert the whole fucking program. Uh, it, it wasn't enough to say I've been reading Temple of Set books, not enough to preach Chinese communism. No, he had to go and try to incite a flame war with Brooke and uh, Peter Moon. Uh, and of course, unfortunately, when I had to confront this with Peter because it's on public record and someday Peter will learn of it anyway, better he learn of it from me and speak to it publicly, uh, it, Peter Moon took that stinking bait and he ran with it. He, he, he instead yeah. of condemning Brandon Young, he started character assassinating Brooke Gibson. And uh, it, it's it's just the um, uh, in a sense the enemy knows what they're doing. Uh, but uh, sometimes you just have to uh, get these issues out in the open, no matter how painful they are. And better that than um, the other options. Uh, just so people understand why I do what I do. Uh, but such being said, yeah, whatever else comes to your mind about that, bring it up or any other observations or, um, you know, impressions that you have from yes, that. Thank you, Douglas. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I do wish I had much, much longer. I, I will remain with you for a 
few more minutes, Douglas. But um, yeah, the other thing was I did review um, or listen and tune in when um, you were talking about the bullying aspect, which was very important. I appreciated that. Okay. You know, um, asking your child when they're at school, um, did you um, was did did, you, did everyone have a friend at play at playtime yes. uh, in the break? Which is very important, and it's a good question to ask um, your child. Um, did, did, did anyone um, was anyone left out during playtime or during the break period? And if they have, just give them a smile and ask them if they want to join in. And so it was like little things like that, which Thank you. I really appreciate, Douglas. And it's, it goes such a long way. And then this is what people value you, you for, because you give them an education, uh, an education that people. Um, are very um they're abs it's very absent in people's lives they don't really teach this they don't teach people critical thinking and so um yeah, i really appreciate the these parts which i wanted to add i've got that on my notes just bring up the the, the part where you um later on in the transmission when you went into monologue you went into the bullying aspect and the other thing was um you were mentioning about parents um when children um when children commit acts of terror, I should call them acts of terrorism. Um, and that just brings to mind the latest um, Moscow shooting, the mass shooting in Moscow. And I've just been, yeah, before I came on, I was looking at uh, Vladimir Putin's um, public response to it. And we'll go into that maybe another time or maybe later on, Douglas. But um, yes, yeah, the um, the fact that the um, the parents can now be liable for the actions of their children because yeah. they are neglecting their children and they're not monitoring or asking them questions and that is a very fundamental aspect of um, of uh, people need to take into regard they need to look and ask their children questions um, they need to be um, monetized I should, I should say just look out and listen to what your children are talking about and what they're saying monitor do away mo mo monitor yes, yes. monitor them a bit more closely because a lot of parents they nowadays a lot of parents they do neglect their children they don't ask them fundamental questions about their lives and um, you can find the telltale signs early on by just asking them questions this is why we need to do away with bullying and um, I appreciate what you mentioned about Andrew Tate also the, the Tate you. brothers Thank and, you. and toxic masculinity and misogyny um, that's another issue and a problem in this world that causing bullying but this is why we need to do away with bullying yeah. And um, most bullies are, you know, these mass shooters, I should say, mass shooters are a collateral or a response to being bullied. Yes. Um, but this is more the more, more the more reason to do away with bullying entirely. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, I found that very important. It's I was hoping to, you know, talk about in extensive depth with you, Douglas, um, that aspect of things. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's very important that um, parents get an education on this. Yes. <laughs> and to um, take note of what Douglas is actually saying. Yes. And definitely that's another, if Aristides or Nemo is great, it also if they can timestamp that part as well. And that was on the last transmission. Yes. So that was last Wednesday's transmission. If anyone can um, yeah, timestamp that, or I can just grab it myself. Um, but that was, I, I enjoyed listening to that, Douglas. Um, so thank you yeah. for that. And uh, yeah, if we go back to, oh yeah, with, um, if I mentioned Vladimir Putin very quickly, that he, um, he tried to say that they've detained 11 suspects or the, the 11 individuals that were um, committed or conducted the um, terrorist attack right. in Moscow. And at the, at the um, I believe it was a Crocus. concert. I yeah, believe. Crocus concert hall. Yes. And he tried to see that they were fleeing to, or they were planning on fleeing to Ukraine to, def to, to. Um, oh, they're going to torture them until they say that. Go on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Of course they will. Thank you, Douglas, because he even admitted that also. They will, um, they will receive the ultimate punishment for, it. and he called it punishment. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so obviously, this, I think it was like a hundred. Was it over a hundred people were massacred? during this it, it, it's coming children. oh god yeah it's it's coming closer to like uh almost uh, 130 or 140 That's something right. of that yeah i mean because oh, don't yeah. forget there are injured people that are still in critical and then they die so these numbers yeah they increase but con continue please yes yeah so i was just um listening to his response and he was you know obviously blaming um i think he he goes they had um i think a middle eastern um ethnic i'm not sure who if it how accurate it is but i know the um the ukrainian government have uh, denied all allegations um mm -hmm. that was um allocated towards right. ukrainians being involved 
Um, so I, 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 I had to explain to Peter Moon because Peter Moon, yeah. he said, oh, they call it this IS, but that can't be ISIS. So I had to explain no. to him that um, IS means Islamic State, and that's what they began yes. to call ISIS so that people wouldn't confuse the movement with the pagan goddess. So I had to explain that yes. to him that IS is ISIS. Yes. So, yes. so, so, yes. so, so, uh, yes, by all means, uh, continue. Yeah. And, um, yeah, just from, yeah, just with those observations. Um, so, yeah, um, there was actually, I saw one article calling it a false flag. <laughs> I actually saw that. As that well. That's always going to come up. That's always going to come always up. Going to come uh, up. Of course, with, of course, with the Russians, you really have to, it's, it's almost a legitimate uh, question, so long as it's not a claim yes. or an assertion yeah. to at least ask. Yeah, it's, but anyhow, so continue, go on. Yeah. yeah, exactly, Douglas. No, thank you. And so, yeah, so I think that the ethnicity of these, these individuals, the group were, um, yeah, Middle Eastern, I believe, from the Middle East somewhere. That's the only information that I got regarding their identity. Um, if they haven't really publicly um, given out any other um, identity statements or details on on the suspects, but um, yeah, I was just looking just looking at that just briefly, skimming over it just before I jumped on, um, because that's just hitting the headlines at the moment. Um, but yeah, to go back to Troy Bellamy just earlier on, Douglas, uh, um, yeah, just to add to that, I I'm, I'm appreciate you talking about Christopher Columbus or Christopher Cologne. Yes. Uh, the um, he, and the identity, the ethnicity of the individual. He was a crypto Jew, yes. and he was the man responsible, or he was the man who started the transatlantic slave trade. Yes. And this is what Troy Bellamy, I think, yeah, he, he really got to come to terms with this, this reality that, and the the man, the individual, uh, Christopher Columbus, he was um, he was liaising, or he was working under orders. Um, or I should say just cooperating with um, these Jewish, um, prominent Jewish merchants, uh, such as Don Aiso Calprofano and Gabriel Sanchez. Um, he would always consult these individuals before he would consult the King and Queen of Spain. Yes. King, is a, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And the whole um, objective, the whole goal was to create a new Zion, a new homeland or a safe haven or the um, self-determination of the Jewish population the jewish people in across the atlantic in the new world uh in the americas and so that's why he conducted a conquest of holocaust a holocaustus generating forest fires killing off the indigenous populations uh slaughtering the Ara the aramak and the taino or the i hope i pronounced that correctly uh, arawak er, and yes. tai Taino or ta you know Taino. either way it's fine there's there's no one to yes. teach us the right way to say it because they're all dead no. <laughs> but there you yes, go. thank you yes. appreciate that yes yes and it's yeah yes thank you Douglas and it's um that brings up other things other aspects of like the um, apocrypha from the um the the book of revelation or um the the magi the sage kings that came from China that brings up um I think his name is Brent Landau uh, brings yes up, um because he was a translator in the, he was a, or a nationally or internationally recognized translator in the Syriac language, which yes. he translated the, um, the, uh, I think it was the, because um, um, Jesus himself spoke Aramaic. I believe that's the term, isn't it, Douglas? That's how yes. you pronounce it. Yes. He spoke Aramaic and he translated the, um, the, the book, the Revelation of the Magi into English. And he took several years for him to translate the, the scriptures from the um, scrolls or ancient books that were deep within the Vatican. That's and correct. He translated this into the English for the world to review. And it's um, I've read the PDF um, file of that. And yeah, so it, like you said, it's it's a language that's lost because um, there's very few people that speak it because they're all dead. Mm. So yeah, that just brings to mind that. Um, so yeah, it's a shame I'm not on for much longer, Douglas, because we can go into depths and so many different, go into different topics. Yeah, uh, certainly things that I've learned from yourself over the years. Um, but yeah, so a anything, any, well, any, yeah. Well, well, Please. certainly what I want you to know is. Uh, uh, I'll certainly, of course, go into the topic of the Moscow massacre uh, in monologue. Yes. Uh, I, I will put it into context, of course. Other than that, of course, with, like I said, when you get time, there was a, um, a link to um, one of the um, former episodes that hopefully you'll find a chance to review if you haven't reviewed yet where I timestamped it because I was talking mm -hmm. about, uh, of course, England. And then you and I, of course, got into England with the last episode, yeah. the latest episode. Yes. And 
Um, yeah. So uh, a, again, Hall, yes. one one thing uh, certainly before you go, speak a little bit to the new case of Royal Cancer and what you feel we should uh, what you feel we should uh, make of this situation. Um, or um, please, uh, of course, yes. I do. You 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 know what I'm talking about, of course. <laughs> the new case. Yes. Is, uh, no, no, I, now forgive me. Yes. yes. No, 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 no. Yes. Um, um, I'm talking about, of course, uh, who was the lady who, uh, uh, let me look this up again. Okay, new case, case, uh, uh, royal uh, cancer. Yeah, that's the lady who was uh, accused of CGIing her uh, her oh, photographs, the Princess of Wales. Middleton. Yeah. Oh, Kate Middleton, the yeah, Princess of Wales, yes. Sir. Yes, so the Princess yes. of Wales said Friday that she has cancer and is undergoing chemotherapy. Oh, right. Chemo so this yeah. is truly a strain. Um, I wonder how bad those people feel that complained about her hopefully they they don't feel bad enough probably but yeah hopefully they feel some uh, they like shamed her into taking her photos down or whatever uh, it, like, it, on, uh, yeah, this is the insanity well, we, we it, yeah, yeah but we could always it discuss already. it again I, we didn't really discuss it i mean the fact is no. everybody does this uh, is they alter their photos. Certainly all the normal people do out there who are trying not to look so fat and ugly and shit. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, oh my God. Well, like what George said before, it's like all of Instagram, it's cool for them, but it, she doesn't it, want, you know, it's so yeah. Uh, uh, yes. And, yeah. My impressions of Instagram, it's just, um, it's just saturated with nihilist materialist yes. um, individuals. It's just the embedded Western, um, just indoctrination where people only believe what they see with their own two eyes and this is you know it's just um i could go on about it but i could go on a tangent with it it's just you just see it all the time and this is this is one of the reasons why i was bringing up with the bullying parents don't um really um console into their children because they're too busy with these uh, these um social media platforms it's this is just one, but I don't want to get in that direction. Well, well, I mean, so. it's a, it's an important direction in its own right because yes. I do want people to understand this much. Uh, uh, understand that after weeks of conspiracy theories mm -hmm. uh, that this woman was subjected to so brutally, mm -hmm. uh, this is basically her. What's coming out behind her uh, cancer disclosure is really. Uh, she's offering an appeal for public decency. This is really what's behind that. Um, people were online calling for her private medical information, if you can believe that. Uh, this is the insanity of Richard K. Cole Jr., uh, where he's trying to dox me for everything uh, conceivable uh, while maintaining total privacy for himself. Uh, so she's offering a moral plea and uh, this is somewhat uh, anachronistic because uh, you, you've got this uh, modern population that understands none of this. Uh, they don't understand the Victorian concept of moral outrage. So uh, it, it, this is maybe something that will hopefully uh, at least force people into trying to put forth a pretense of decency. Uh, though I highly doubt it, it may have some uh, impact. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'll go a bit into that uh, w when I go into monologue as well. But uh, continue with whatever else comes to your mind. Just wanting to let you know that's not you did not have a uh, irre uh, your 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 the track you were on is not irrelevant. So go on. No, thank you, Douglas. <laughs> yes, thank you. Much appreciated. Um, it's it, again it's one of those things where i wish i had more time so we can go in multiple directions and then make it all try and make it all sound coherent or try and make a comprehension of it mm -hmm. i'm just looking now actually i've just typed it in on um search engine yeah about kate miller to make her cancer that announcement and uh, in the hope that the kind of fight back is needed and kate kate's wishes will be respected when she looks into the people's eyes so yeah i'm just reading some I'm just scrim scrolling over some articles right at the moment, Douglas. Yes, mm -hmm. that was only that was only announced a, a day ago or published a day ago. As well. So I you just found out about it now. You you just you. found out about it now from myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you, Douglas. Oh yeah, I appreciate God. that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because um, I think over the weekend I, I tend to stay away from it, and then I get back to the week, and then I find out everything. 
that has been transpired over the weekend. So yeah, like with the like with Vladimir Putin, for instance. <laughs> yeah, I just found out that this morning. Yes. Not about the shooting. I heard about that before. <gasps> but yeah, no, thank you, Douglas. Okay. Yeah. So um, no, anything if you anything to discuss before I leave, or Brendan, do you have any um, questions or anything? Anything that anything that's relevant or. T- yeah, Brendan. Any, any anything? Yes, uh, we hear. Yeah. Well, well, we still have nothing, George. Uh, yeah. Nothing off the top. Okay. Um, no, I appreciate. It. Thank yeah. you. And uh, so, I mean, I think just your being able to show up has been wonderful. Um, I'm going to ask Brendan a favor: is I might take a very short break and then uh, go straight into monologue um, for the I'll night. I'll stay with Brendan. Yes. Uh, you. Oh, 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 Brendan. You, oh! You can do that. You can do that. I will stay with Brent once you refresh yourself. Okay, no, I'll, I'll, I'll be back in just a few moments then. Are you sure this won't throw you off schedule? It's just to take me no, a few no, minutes. No, okay. no, no, More than happy. Yeah, me and Brady can have a, have a talk, yes. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So I'll be right back in a few minutes and I'll go mute for now. Thank you. Yeah, much appreciate. Thank you. Yes. Hello, Brendan. Now, how are you, how's everything at your end? Yeah, you, you, you work in yeah, today. Yeah, I actually did. I had a, I don't think you heard it. Maybe you did, but... Um, I had a special assignment to uh, basically oversee one of the schools. They were having this Ramadan event. They allowed these people to do this Ramadan dinner. So yeah, I was the one who was like, you know, dealing with that, and it was it was quite hectic. Interesting, so. yes, and yes, and uh, when they when they're conducting um, Ramadan, when they 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 break that the, they break the fast. Is that correct? They they go yes. through. And what foods do they consume? What do they um, indulge in? Like to um, break so, it. So they offered me some food, but because I don't eat meat, I could only eat like a little bit of it. One of them was like, so it was just like rice and meat. It was it was like the standard yes. uh, Middle Eastern fare. Like yes. if you go to like an Afghani restaurant, or um, that's what it was like. A Persian restaurant, it's kind of like a lot of stews and stuff like that. Stewed meats and rice and meat. I think yeah. So pretty hearty meals. Interesting. Yeah, I, I did see that. I did um, because um, we have like a similar platform with with the mm-hmm. organisation I work for. We've got a, like an in house equivalent to Facebook. It's mm, it's yes. a, it's a it's only it's you have to be um, um, an employee of the organisation in order to access it. And oh, yes. uh, yeah, I did see some um, things regarding that that they would break the fast using either boiled eggs and rice or meat or rice. So that's the reason why I asked it because I did right. see that <laughs> uh, over. I did see that last week actually. So no, much appreciated. Um, yeah, so you, they're eating good. <laughs> yes, thank you. And did you hear what I said about you know our last transmission? We went into um, uh, the Hockenkreuz or the swastika. Did you? Yeah. Did you manage no, to hear anything? No, I missed it. I think I actually fell asleep. Was it like right no, after I got off? Yeah. yeah. Much appreciated. Yes. Yeah. So um, yeah, because I know that you um, found those books. You got those books yes. that were obviously discarded. They were thrown in the trash can or thrown in the bin. Right. And, uh, you may you're able to salvage them. And I, I found another one that we were talking about earlier. The um, if you scroll up a little bit in the chat, you can see it. It's I saw them. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that one was interesting. Save them now. Yeah. Yes. And obviously, you got the SS, the SS bolts. <laughs> right. <laughs> the shoots of bolts. Yeah, it was like this yes. book, How to Counter the Hate Groups in America, from like 1999. And like for me, it was just like a historical reference or like some cool designs i was like oh this is cool it like did the opposite of what they were trying to you know go for they were they were like trying to shock people like oh this is the new the new face of hate or something and i'm like oh this is yeah exactly (laughs) yeah exactly no thank you yeah exactly i've always i've just i asked just generically um in the past i've asked people what their impressions of when you see the swastika what does it do and obviously you know we've talked about it people start to yeah. go into in an in emoting state they start to um you know become either defensive or resilient um but the the impressions that they have is they they view it as a symbol of hatred or white supremacy and um the, the, it's just so it, it just the, the just the sophistication of indoctrination that has been embedded in people for generations, for decades, and just they cannot. Right. Um, and when you show them that it is a universally recognized symbol and it is a ward, and you show them every culture yes. has adopted the swastika, apart from Semitic peoples, of course, that we've dis- that we've um, disclosed in right. the past. Um, but most people are unaware that it is culturally um, embedded and culturally adopted by every single ethnicity on earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
practically. And so, and that's yeah, like unequivocal, just... un- like undeniable uh, at this point. Yes, thank you. Yes, undeniable. Absolutely. It's okay. just, um, yeah, it's just it baffles me. And that's me. what was it's interesting all... about that design book I found. It had mm-hmm. Gre- Greco Roman, it had Egyptian, it had Japanese. So, this yes. is all disparate regions of the earth. Like, they had, um, what was the other one? They had like Russian designs, and they all had, <laughs> absolutely, you know, they all had a, a version of it. You know, yes, yes. Celtic, um, the Aztecs, yes. every every single culture on earth has adopted the yes. um, the Hock and Cross. The, ho- and the Indian, so, the Native yeah. Americans, yeah, all of them. Yes, and of course, um, yeah, me and Douglas brought up the Earth's a major constellation, the um, the Great Bear, that it rotates yes. in the skies, in the heavens, it rotates in the same direction as the swastika throughout the yes. seasons. Yeah, so yeah, we did we did bring that up, and I just thought, yeah, because of course you you're the one that um yeah that um. I, I, well, which what what's the word in basically um tr- triggered me to talk about it? Yes, and mm-hmm. um, that that got me in that topic in that direction. So yeah, I no, appreciate that. Thank you for salvaging right. those um those. Yeah, photos. I did hear I did hear a bit of it now. Now that you remind me, yeah, I caught like the first bit of you guys talking about it. So. Yes, no, thank you, much appreciated, uh, Brendan. And and like it, the good news yeah. about the internet is it's like people are making like you know those like uh, collages or montages of like look this <laughs> this symbol has been around it's not just German you know like so slowly more people are learning about it oh yeah it's not it's just a the, quote unquote the, the, the Nazi symbol it's been, yes no exactly it's been it's been around far older than Christianity itself it's far older right. and it's more right. and it's far holier as well it's far more yes um, as yeah. as we outlined it is the um award is a, a sigil yeah. that repels diabolism which is yes. the very reason why the national socialists adopted it in the first place yes. it was um incepted due to the um the collateral to the uh, American army in the Navy flu after World War One. Um, the German Workers' Party, which is yes. the precursor to the National Socialist Group. Excuse me, I do, Brendan. Can, can you hold the stage whilst I make a move? I do have to go now. But yes, thank you so no much. I yeah, no worries. Thank you, to Douglas, for me. Yeah. Carry on, then. Yeah, no worries. All right. Yeah, the Blessed Isles. Uh, George is coming at us from the Blessed Isles. He's gonna carry on and do some work there. Um, yeah, so in the meantime, I was going to actually bring up a few things about uh, what's happening in uh, the Japanese sphere. Um, there's like this Japanese uh, baseballer who is world famous. He's like the top of the leagues. He came to America. He was like the prodigy. Uh, his name is Otani. But <laughs> apparently the uh, the guy he had overseeing his the interpreter he had overseeing his you know stay in america actually stole a bunch of money and was using millions of his dollars to pay off gambling debts you know um and then this guy was working for the dodgers the la dodgers as well um which is what uh, the team that mr otani uh, okay i'm back Shohei yes. otani. Yeah. yeah yeah finish yeah, your so thoughts george, on this george scandal had to make a move uh, george had to go so oh was, okay. i'm sending Sending his regards. Oh, thank you. Him. Thank you, George. Through, and thank yeah. you, Brendan. I mean, both of you, of course. Uh, uh, and that's when I segue. This is the, like, <laughs> just immediately, I, within seconds, I just. See, you're professional. This. You've got professional acumen. Uh, so, yeah. uh, yes. I mean, I've always yeah. been able to do it, but you kind of. Yeah. Yeah, you had to crack the whip a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, go but, on. But no, I, I'll give you the credit that you actually, um, you know, before I was on the show, I never was able to do this, but now I can. Thank you. But yeah, Otani, Otani's interpretation, I mean, excuse me, interpreter, he like scammed him out of a bunch of money. <sighs> and this is, you know, and I bet you the Japanese are saying, look what happens in America. Yeah. You can't trust anybody. As well, they should be. As well, they should be. Because. <laughs> Because now yeah. it makes them look bad, or it yeah, makes course. him look bad. Yes. That his interpreter is like a criminal, and it's yeah. like, you know. But yeah. what did they expect? It's America. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. What else are you gonna get here? I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, if the guy's, uh, you know, even if he's ethnically Japanese, uh, once he's been Americanized, all hope is lost. 
yeah. Yeah. Uh, he should be. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, he was born in Hokkaido, moved to Los Angeles when he was a child, and graduated yeah. from the. I like how they made sure to make that clear. That was the first paragraph. He yeah. graduated from a university in the United States. <laughs> yes, yes, there we are. Uh, uh, that that's already bad news. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As far as the Japanese are concerned, he's they ex. What's the equivalent of excommunicating? Uh, like yeah. Oh God, just ex- yeah. How would geopolitics? It, yeah, yeah. It's uh, just, Let's just say he's ostracized. Yeah, ostracized. He, yeah. Because there are many Japanese people that were born in Tokyo and they get cultural uh, acculturated like in London or America, yeah. and and no matter even if they still have a Japanese passport, they'll go back to Japan and they say like I feel like an alien, like an yeah. outsider. Yeah. Because they can't reintegrate because the Japanese will never, they'll never give them a hundred percent pass. Yes, you know? that's right. <laughs> that's right. So that's a complaint I see on. Um, online a lot when people are interviewing these mixed um, some of them are mixed but some of them are actually ethnically japanese and they still they said if it wasn't for me looking japanese i would have my life would be hell basically <laughs> yes yes but, but, but the thing is is the japanese they could tell by their demeanor yeah that they're not um they weren't raised in the japanese culture like it's very to them, yeah. Oh, of course. The behavior yeah. is completely different. The, yeah. the, the behavior is... They're more outspoken. They have, yeah. like, you know, there's many things that make it clear, but... Oh, too many to count? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, to a, a Japanese person, you see it immediately. Uh, yes. uh, immediately. It, it just, uh, like, it, it's painful. It's painful. Right. You, you, you see somebody, especially if they're trying to pretend to be Japanese, if, if they're just yeah. trying to... Yeah, you know, I'm like you. You know, I, I'm really, uh, you know, no. Yeah, from what I've heard, they really don't like that. Like, yeah. They they appreciate it if you're like white and you try it. it you yeah. Know, like it's nice, but yeah. If you're like, you know, if you're any other Asian and you try to do that, it's basically like game over. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yes. Like you're not gonna have a fun time in Japan. No. No. It's uh, it's uh, you just act like yourself. Just act like yeah. yourself and try yeah. to. Uh, be polite as possible, of course. That's that's really important. Smile a lot, but but by the way, this is good advice for any culture. You know, be very careful whenever you laugh. It's like you can smile a lot, but laughter can be misinterpreted so many ways. So yes. Uh, yes. yeah, no matter where you are in the world, just control the laughter, and um, you know, don't laugh unless everybody Which is else why around Americans you. Americans are like. The hated they're the most hated because they're loud and annoying yeah yes that's that's right uh uh i cut loose here in america with a maniacal laugh but yeah uh, that some people have compared to the joker quite seriously <laughs> but other than that obviously i behave differently in different countries or i wouldn't have come back alive so uh yeah just remember that there are, and as for yeah whatever you do it's like i was saying the other day when i was r- ruminating about uh woman like uh hey maybe what's that Oh, I'm just walking around. I, I oh, heard you. Okay, yeah, when I was ruminating about women the other day about where they could go travel, and I said, maybe it's not good for women to travel anywhere outside of Europe, England, Canada, <laughs> Japan. Uh, and, yeah, there, yeah, there's a valid, I mean, that's a valid point, because yeah. uh, they're either going to be sorely disappointed or yeah. actually injured. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, terribly assaulted. Like that, yeah. like that one chick that was saying, I went to Pakistan and they were like grabbing me and pulling and and she was like I tried to like you know she was trying to slip off the hijab yeah and yeah they, and they would like grab her even more it's like yeah. oh my god like and she considered that like it was their bad you uh, know? yeah yeah no it, like but, you're in their area what what you know? what makes it what makes it everything about her was so mind blowing it was right. just literally I don't like my, bring it up but yeah 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 but 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 the. That, like I told Victoria, you know, Victoria, you know, is, it has been somewhat apologetic about bringing her on. And I said, no, no, she was fun. It was traumatic. But it, we always go back to it because it's so much fun to try and 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 like uh, pick apart this case study in insanity. Right. It, it's but uh, the the thing about her was 
I understand her point to a degree where she was saying, oh, well, you know, if people keep telling me you in their country, you've got to respect their ways. But she's pointing out that they still come to America and they behave the way they do back home. In other words, yeah. their, their women are still dressed in burqas here. Like, why aren't they acting like Americans? Right. You know, why yeah. aren't they like I, I get the point? Yeah. So I her, get her, her point. point yeah. But that is the that being said, knowing that why would you go there she had to have enough knowledge of the place to know what she was in for you if she had gone in totally blind i can't believe she would have come out alive because they would have just gang raped her to death you know right. she had just gone in there you know yeah, the, and the silly part about it is like yeah, she was i don't know if that's the right word but <laughs> she she survived south india and then goes to pakistan it's like, yeah I mean, from the on. frying pan into the fire from yeah. the frying pan into the fire it's it, almost like she went there and she was like, yeah, no one, no one tried to grab me and throw me onto a bus. I might as well go somewhere it, dangerous. It, yeah, it, so, it yeah like, somewhere really. It was bizarre. Yeah, it, it just everything about her was in, <laughs> in sheer insanity. It was, uh, uh, and we're, everybody's on the dole in her world. We all got a grift. We're all grifting. We all got yeah. a scam. You know, what's your scam? Hey, what's your scam? Asking yeah. George if he was on the Yeah, on yeah, the, the dole projects. and shit. Yeah, you in the House of Projects. That's like so, asking someone, are you in the project? Yeah, yo, oh, he, he, yeah, I would have been. It's amazing he didn't take offense at that. It's, uh, oh, my God. It's like, dude, right. you know, honey, he works for a living. He's right. one of the few people here, aside from Brendan Zogit and Aristides. That's yeah. Notice something: you, Aristides, and George, you're all employed. Notice that you're one. Yeah, of basically, we can just assume that they're enemies by like how much they work. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> it's yes. almost like a formula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess the good thing about it is we we have like a checklist now. Like yeah. I was saying, when they yeah. said claimed. Yeah, yeah. That's like true. how many times do they say claimed in a sentence about it, Doug? Yeah, it's yeah. Like, it's it's like just once is too much, you know. That's uh, unless right. I'm staking a claim for gold, you know. But other than that, right. yeah, they never say it that way. No, uh, yeah, that's always a bad start. But you kind of give them a pass because the rest of it seems so. <laughs> the rest of it seems so much of an ad it's such an ad yeah. you got to give them a pass you know it's just basically a free exactly. ad <laughs> yeah and, and somehow it's getting hits on a channel that otherwise gets no hits so right. yeah weird shit um it's like you're ripped ripped vampire ai photo versus the chick on a beach it's like, yeah <laughs> yes yeah that's funny uh so that gives me hope we should we should just make ones that are just straight uh was a clickbait yeah yeah just me and drag and, secret yeah secret well you have to add the word secret so it's intriguing secret vampire living in san francisco who's also related to hit you know you'll get so many hits <laughs> Oh my god. We, we might try that. I might try. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah, give it a try. Fuck if Aristides and this guy are just cooking shit up out of nowhere, you might as well do it right. as well. Uh might as well have someone on my side do it. I mean personally the question I have is when am I gonna stop getting YouTube? how can I get YouTube to stop sending me AI bullshit? It's, you know, they, they, they send me most of this AI shit and I, I can't stand it. I mean, it really is bad. I mean, people have no idea. AI is bad. It's like the houses have no foundations. The trees have no roots. I mean, this is, this is not artificial intelligence, people. This is... No, I mean, it's like nothing is grounded. It's like cities don't, they don't fade into the distance with a comprehensive uh, sky, you, you know, uh, what do you, skyline. It, it's, it's like they, they just blur. It, it's just, an, right. and, and you get this, you know what you get? You get this fucking, what is that dream movie that you said uh, nobody should watch because it's traumatizing? Uh, that 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 dream film that uh uh like it, inception no, yeah no, yeah no. yeah oh, that would oh that... you're saying paprika paprika no no yeah. no that that inception or something it's called yeah. yeah is that what it's called a dream movie the one with leonardo dicaprio yeah 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 inception inception yeah, yeah. they all look it like it gives ins... you a headache everyone it, came out of the theater with a migraine it, yeah. yeah yeah thank you thank you it, that ai pictures all look like inception to me especially when they're trying to do cityscapes <laughs> Yeah, when, when when they do cityscapes, it's just right. like it's... and the ones where they do the time lapse or whatever they try to do the animation with it. Yeah. It's like those are so gross. There's like something wrong with them. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank yeah. you. No, no, they just like they, it doesn't come out right, and uh, and people are looking at this like, oh, so beautiful and shit, and uh, or at least <laughs> until they get tired of it. But uh, no, it's horrible. It, it, it's... Those people should be like talk about re-education camp. They need, oh God, they yes. Can... Oh God, yes, yes. But, I mean, yeah. People need to be trained in aesthetics. Aesthetic, yeah, yes, aesthetic. There's, aesthetics. Yes, there's no sense of aesthetics. They just, uh, they, they've been uh, like, uh, you know what? What p the problem is? All of these people were primed or programmed for uh, this horrible AI art by CGI because the CGI sucks yeah. so bad. You know, like uh, that. Uh, you know, it makes you cry. Like, how could they expect me to believe that horrible? <laughs> CGI is Godzilla or King Kong and 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 they like fucking go underground and they like glow everything's glowing King Kong is glowing <laughs> King Kong is glowing I mean and Godzilla is glowing and every, everything's glowing and it's like like who the fuck this is like Flash Gordon back when you had uh who were the gay guys singing uh, you, you know the uh flamboyant uh uh queen it was queen it's like Flash Gordon queen, with yeah. queen you know, he'll save every one of us, you know. It's King Kong and Godzilla. They'll save every one of us, you know. And then they come on with this, <laughs> all this faggot glitz and shit. You know, everybody's... Like show like, tunes? Dude, it's, it's like fucking pixie fairy dust. They're all like shedding like fucking <laughs> glow, glitter. It's like glitter. It, it's like fucking they're emceeing the gay parade and shit. Look, it's the Pride Parade with Godzilla and King Kong and shit. You know, they're smashing buildings and glitter comes out and shit. It, it's like, uh, it's, it, it, uh, yeah, like, right. what is it? Uh, the identity party for the gender, gender reveal. It's like a gender reveal that you get through <laughs> King Kong versus Godzilla. I can't stand it. I want to cry. Uh, it, you know, this, this isn't, uh, everybody thinks it's pretty or something. Uh, Oh, I, 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 I weep. So this, this is the world that we live in now. And, uh, but the worst part of it is, how did they get underground? Godzilla just burns his way through it with his, with his breath. It's like, no, that's not even... Cheesy, dude, yeah. No, no that, that would take... You know, he could blow out the ground for years and years before he gets to cross that thing, okay? It's like, uh, it, it, it's, it's like, that's not even... You, you, that's that's yeah that's not just cheesy it's just like it's literally unbelievable you can't i mean sure you might say well godzilla and king kong themselves are unbelievable well to a degree there's 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 like degrees of unbelievability right there's what's called the willing suspension of, of disbelief uh but there's got to be a better way to do unterland than the way they show it it's everything's upside down no, there's no gravity you know, all this other weird shit that they're, they're portraying. So it's it's like uh, they got everybody thinking Unterland is like, uh, it's like a trip up in SpaceX and shit. <laughs> like you go down there and you're weightless. You saw the shit they did, right? Have you watched these movies? Are you... Is this the newer Godzilla? Yeah, yeah, this is the new King Kong versus Godzilla. They showed a bit of it in the first one, but now they're, they're coming out with a new one and shit, which is just going to be more of this shit. No, I didn't. I... I oh, you, so you it. haven't, you haven't, you, you haven't seen, you did, then you didn't see the other King Kong versus Godzilla, right? I think the last one I saw was like King Godzilla 2000 when I was a kid. Oh, okay, I mean, okay, I, so you haven't seen this shit in a long, long time. time. It's been a long time. 25 yeah. years. Yeah, uh, it, you know, I mean, it's not that there's not redeemable elements to the concept of what they're doing, but um, it's, they, 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 they go off in just weird directions and I can understand it to a degree because Toho... I went, miss the old kaiju, like, of course. Godzilla vs. Ultraman, like the OG ones. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Men in rubber suits, yes, uh, right. yeah. It, this see, Mothman, like Mothra versus... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mo Mothra, of course, people don't know it. She has all kinds of movies. They, they don't usually make it to the United States, but she's got her whole franchise in Japan that I think has more movies than Godzilla. Did you know that? Jesus Christ. It's And she's supposed to be like a girl's monster. So it's like, um, it is what it is. And, and they yeah, do that. Yeah. But, I but, didn't know it was a she. I had no idea. Oh, Mothra's always a she. It's always a she. Okay. Interesting. Uh, yeah, but... So sorry I called it Mothman. Uh, <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, but, sorry to the character. Yeah, Mothman. yes, yes. Because Mothman is actually pretty pretty ugly looking or can be. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, but when it comes to uh, yeah, Mothra, I of course like, I, like, I always wonder yeah. about those Mothman stories because it's always like in New Jersey, and you're like, maybe that was just some crackhead. Yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like it's hard to say. Like, oh, it, you believe it? Jetpacks too these days. Uh, no, believe it or not, there's something to it. But it's like, um, but of course, it's in New Jersey where let's just say that the veil is pierced a lot more because, of course, you know. <laughs> It's just because kind of, of uh, yeah, all kinds of factors. Called? Yeah, a lot of them being drugs and shit. Yeah, I mean, it, did you see the movie with what's it? Was it Richard Greer? R Richard Greer was in that Mothman movie and shit. And it, it's like uh, somebody Gear, Richard Gear. Gear, thank you. Gear, yeah, they, they the guy calls him up and I I'm watching you and he says, oh, can you see me? I'm watching you right now. Yeah. Oh, what am I holding in my hand? And he's just like a number two pencil and he drops it all scared and shit. You know, all I could think of was, of course, a much more realistic scene. What am I holding in my hand? Your own dick. Yeah. Then he gets all scared. Oh, shit. Fuck. <laughs> he, he, what else would it be, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. I mean, How could, yeah, what would be that scary? Uh, yes, thank you. Like, why would you care? You, you know, just the fact that somebody's even, like, uh, you know, taking the time out to watch you is, shows how little... You know, they got to be someone like Trampus Nicholson. They got nothing but time on their hands. They don't work for a living. Yes, that's... Uh, right. And so, there, there you Sounds go. problematic. It always is. So in, oh my God, I, I don't want to ask questions about it. So I should lay, lay off the topic, but are you comfortable in the warehouse? Can you sleep? Are you warm? What, what are your needs met? Do you have enough water? Well, I, I have a, yeah, I have some supplies, but I also have a sleeping bag that is like okay. rated to like whatever, minus whatever, 10 degrees Celsius or whatever. Okay. So, I, so at least I'm like comfortable. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember that idiot John Miranda who claimed he was sleeping out in the ice and ice fishing and all that shit? Uh, when oh, I, yeah. Whatever happened to that guy? Well, well, hopefully he froze to death. I mean, I don't want to say <laughs> that, poor son of a bitch, but, uh, it, you know, um, that was the last time, of course, we heard from him because I did, in a sense, go off on him. I confronted him. You know, dude, are you happy? <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. I'm <laughs> happy. And I said, you remember what I told him? You remember that? I, I said, no. 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 I, I said, it's like that Tracy Ullman act where she falls in love with a wooden dummy and she's telling her relations and her friends who are all upset, you know, why can't you all just be happy that I'm happy? And one of them frankly tells her, you're not happy. You're crazy. <laughs> That's, uh, that's what I told John Miranda. I said, you're not happy. You're crazy. I brought the Tracy Ullman example. I, I said, D dude, you, you know, I mean, yeah, exactly. you're talking about, do you remember, you remember he, he married a woman from the nation of Georgia, had two kids with her. She was marrying him to move to the United States because her entire family had been wiped out by the Russians. And then he tells her, we're not going back to America. I'm here to help the Russians. So that they can ultimately oh, this, liberate. This was recently. This, yeah, I remember this. Yeah, Wait, yeah. So that was John Miranda. Yeah, that's John Miranda. <laughs> For some reason, I got him confused. Yeah, okay, got it. Because I got him confused with the other guy that went to Georgia to get like whatever. Oh, oh, uh, the guy that uh, yeah. um, uh, Brooke Gibson and I call real dick, real dick geek. Yeah, yeah he, he's right. real tech geek, but we call him real dick geek because he was bragging about how big his dick is. <laughs> oh, I don't know if you ever caught that episode. Where... Flames. Yes, right. yes. Can we can we do that? Yes, we, I guess well. guess we could use that word perhaps, unless um you know unless the I... photograph is there, which I'm not anxious to look at. I assure you, <laughs> but right. yes, he. Uh, yeah, I... I was about to say unverified, but I don't I don't want it there. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Just... Especially it's, out of the blue, it's just like yeah. We're happy with the claim. Happens. We're happy with the claim. You know he yeah, that's good. Yeah, point. he he can say it says. I'm not saying I don't believe. <laughs> yes, it's, it's just we don't we don't know. Right? Uh, yes, uh, I I I do. Brooke might. Yeah yeah yeah. No, nah, she wasn't interested. No, but she had no end of fun with that. Yeah, she kept saying. Well, what his, was weird about that yeah. is like okay, if he if that is true, then why is he going to Georgia to like do like. You know? Uh, it's like, well, um, from what I understand about the situation, he has a wife from communist China. My yeah. understanding is, I, I can only speculate, <laughs> but my understanding is right, they don't, don't, like, they don't sleep. Yeah, we're I not making know. fun of them, but my understanding is they don't sleep together. Like, 
they, if they, that was uh, the case, oh, okay, I got it. I got yeah, it. yeah. So, sense. so my because otherwise it wouldn't make sense. It's like it, you're already, some like, deal you're was made. There. Some deal was made where she gets U.S. citizenship and he gets to yeah. say I'm married. Is again, we're only speculating here. Hey, hey, we don't really know. Yeah, we're speculating. Yeah, just putting the pieces together. But, but I was trying to make it. Yeah, I was it, just, yeah. It was a rude joke. I was yeah, yeah, yeah but 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 you, you don't know. need IVF when you're already halfway there. Like, it, it, yeah, anyways, yeah, but it's, it's stupid. Yeah, it just is what it is, and they decided. Yeah. Or he. Okay, here's what again the word claim here. Um, he asserts. Let's use that word. He asserts that she is sterile or or or, or not fertile. There we are. Yeah. I think that's it. <sighs> okay, that's that's that's. that's uh, that's the narrative, but <laughs> I don't know if it's legit. It could just as easily be she paid him for U.S. citizenship, and it's yeah. like, uh, yeah. yeah, and no, you're not touching me. <laughs> it's yeah. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh shit! Oh shit! But uh, yeah, but other than that, potentially she is. Star- anyone, anyone that, yeah, yeah I like Go I said, ahead. I don't know him personally, or I've never yeah. seen him, but. Anyone that has the name Tech or it, Geek it, in their name usually looks like Beetlejuice. So it, yes, 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 that's right. Yeah, so. but by the way, in all fairness, uh, I guess what he looks like is kind of like a younger Deepak Chopra. Like a younger, thinner Deepak Chopra. Oh, so he's not... I, I always assumed he was like white or like something. Dude, he's half Pakistani. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you wouldn't tell. We don't, we don't need to dox him. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, I just didn't know. Oh, but like I said, I just got him confused with uh, Miranda. Yeah, John um, Miranda. John, yeah, yeah. yeah. Miranda. Uh, uh, John Miranda. Oh that... yeah, this was the guy that. Yeah, that was the guy that was. You were like telling him, "Why are you saying that? No wonder your wife divorced you because she's trying to get away from Russia." And this guy's like. He wants to move to Russia. Is that the same guy? Yeah, he, no, he wants to like uh, he wanted he was, to like, go living to in Ru- Sweden. Or yeah, yeah, he's living in Sweden. It, the interesting thing is, and I didn't hit him with this because it'd be just too cruel. But I didn't hit him with why don't you just move to Russia because it's just too cruel. But it's uh, obvious. It's uh, why don't you just move to Russia? Well, we all know why. He knows it's a fucking frozen wasteland and it's uh, you know a shithole. Uh, and it's, it's like asking someone to move to hell, and yet he wants Russia to spread all over like a cancer into Europe because he's crazy. You know, and, and the horrible thing, what I didn't confront him with either, but probably should have, is they're not paying you for this. That's the insanity yeah. of these people. The Russians are not paying this guy, but he's like sacrificed his wife, his life. Yeah. You know, he's he claims he's living out in the snow. So at this point, he's basically sacrificed human society. <laughs> He's and all, all he's doing is propagandizing for Russia when he gets a chance. I mean, look at where you're at. That's where we'll all be at if we follow your advice. <laughs> we'll all be sleeping out in a sleeping bag out in the snow and, and ice fishing because that's all the Russians have to offer. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's yeah. like Jesus Christ. Uh, but that's that's the ultimate insanity. He he feels he's making a point against American degeneracy and shit, and and the Russians have the moral ethic and what moral ethic it's kill gays and it's like (laughs) yeah and it like like with real so with real tech what happened was i came back from the bathroom after he had regaled brooke by how long his dick is and when i got back i had no idea what the conversation was about and i was just sitting it down settling in and he says my doctor's taiwanese turned out he was claiming (laughs) well he was insisting to brooke uh uh, my doctor looks at my dick and says i should be a porn star and uh so he just he said this on record he said this and so i came back i i had not heard that but that's when he was you know trying to get on my good side with this get me to back him up he said my doctor's taiwanese and I said, oh, good. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know. That's all I heard. I didn't hear all the stuff that preceded right. it. And then he said, Taiwanese. And I said, yo, great. Yeah, hey, that's good. Cool. <laughs> and and uh, then I was told by Brooke, yeah, yeah. He's saying that she saw how big his dick was and that he needs to be a porn star. And I'm like, good God. How does it come down to this? How does it come down? When I go to the bathroom. <laughs> I leave people, and it comes down to always like uh, donkey dicks and dolphin rape, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, what, what the fuck? It, it's like yeah. this. People are just smut. They yeah, smut. smut people, people, people smut out on me when I. Jesus Christ! And like I, I genuinely got offended 
I, like not like um, I didn't take it personally, but I was just like it was just gross when dude was talking about those bad dragons. It's like why? Who wants to hear that? Thank you. Thank, that's I mean, wait, by the way, I still don't know exactly what he said. It. What did he say? What did he say? He was talking about dildos, right? That's all I know. But it was something. Yeah, it's this. It's this like giant dildo thing that like it just they have crazy designs and like it it's some kind of gimmick they get to sell the sex toys but it's like but who just brings that up it's like that's not you don't want to hear like no one wants to sit there and hear what you're sticking yeah, up it, well, not it's when there's no context see it would yeah, be it would, it, exactly, that's it, what i mean yeah it would, it would be, be funny in like okay you bring it up a couple times to make either a funny joke or some kind of reference well, well it'd but, be funny say if our or or appropriate if we had like one of the ladies here and the subject came up and she brought it up and, and yeah. then we're all kind of just exploring the issue just as yeah. a gender thing as a sexual thing like you know this is what we women do when we're alone or something you yeah. know but but but, but for these him are, for uh, him you... among guys <laughs> yes go on yes yeah, that's a whole nother factor. That's like, yes, it was ugh. just him and guys. There, there was no girls there. But these things yeah. are like these things are like extreme sex toys. These are yeah. for like like uh, jaded jaded dykes and shit. <laughs> it's like jaded. well that that and just like super like prof these are the professional level ones. I would say the only time I've ever seen them. But but I don't even see shit like that stuff. on on. I don't even see things like that on cam girls. Camp girls may have some because usually yeah. they wouldn't do that. They don't. Yeah, they, no, they they use for, dildos. They use dildos, but I don't see them. You know. And by the way, just so people understand, the the cam girls I'm exposed to come up constantly whenever I'm cruising for porn. It's not like yeah. I use their services, uh, and and it's not nothing moral, nothing moral about it. It's just I can't understand why anyone would pay for porn when it's so ubiquitous <laughs> and it's free. Why would you? Yeah. Why I, I don't understand why people do that, but people do it. But the advertisements are you can't escape them. So when I cruise for yeah. porn, that's just the price you pay. Is you get exposed to these commercials, but I never see them use this fancy Cthulhu shaped fucking deal. Well, that and, was that was his personal one or something because he kept bringing that one up. Yeah, it, there the one he I'm had made that, for himself. That's the one he uses yeah. to stimulate his colon. Ever since he was stimulated as a child, it's the only one that gets him off. Yes, that's uh just for those of you who do it's not know. No, by the way, just for those of you who do not know, this is not like I'm insulting him just out of vitriol. The reality is that all uh, so many of these people are products of male rape, and the point is that a lot of these guys, once they're stimulated in terms of their prostate, it's like after that, they can't they can't achieve orgasm without prostate stim stimulation. So it's got to be that or nothing. So it becomes the only way they can have an orgasm. And so guaranteed he's one of those because that's why he brought it up. That's why he cruises Bad Dragon. That's the only context that makes sense. Got it? Do you understand what I'm saying? And so he's almost like probing, to use a pun, to see who else is right. in the same boat so that so that other people can re relate. And he was saying yeah. like, oh, but they're, they're non-toxic. And I'm like thinking to myself like, yeah, he's if advertising toxic... for them. He's advertising for them that they're non-toxic or get. But but it was like I was saying, what do you mean about toxic dildos? Are you telling me that vaginal juice like melts this uh, plastic somehow and it somehow gets absorbed? What the fuck? That's what I was gonna say. I was like, I've never heard. Like usually it's like, quote unquote, food safe. But like I don't know anything about it. It's like. Uh, yeah, I mean, whoever heard of a toxic? Don't use a yeah, dildo. Was... That's toxic. It's like, like who's buying? That's what I, that was the idea. It's like who's buying dollar store dildos? That's what it sounded like. Yeah, it's like, like come on, this is bizarre. Yeah, you know, there you go. Well, that that's what he had to fall back on with before he became part of the MK Ultra program and they started paying his rent and shit. But now he collects the dildos and the bongs and the yeah, it's a. Uh, yeah, he he's got it all. He's in he's in pig heaven, you know, uh, both ends. Yeah, exactly. Su yeah, sucking in one end and taking it up the other. But go on. <laughs> but yeah, if that's true, then it's like he's spending hundreds of dollars on. But yeah, like you're saying, whether it's coming or going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Blowing your brains out or whatever else is going on. Yeah, uh, or tickling his prostate. Yeah. <laughs> so he's buying premium everything. Yeah. And not working. So yeah. He's just, Bizarre. It, and he's it's not really dealing weird. drugs. He ain't dealing drugs. We know that much. Yeah. Or, or else he'd be popular and have chicks. Uh, it's uh, it's 
Yeah, no, he's he, he, it's all MK Ultra shit, you know, and uh, uh, you know, tell people about that because it, it just uh, Peter, of course, just retreated into the night. He had nothing to say, but you know, I mean, you're talking about a kid. Well, I mean, he's in his mid forties, of course, so he's old. But at the same time, I mean, comparatively speaking, but at the same time, he's pushing out memories like he's in his sixties, like Mama Cas and shit, Mama Cats and shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him he's like he's talking about i remember rasputin records like dude that was the 70s i don't think you were there yeah and yeah. and yeah they they had the storefront but he was the way he was describing it to me was like back in the day yeah yeah rasputin so i'm like dude <laughs> yeah that's because like, like basically yeah. what they were doing this is my conjecture is that yeah. they were like showing him like what is it like the like the home, you know, the home movie footage of what San Francisco looked like in the '60s, and he was yeah. just like had his eyes. What is it? Like, yeah, yeah, it felt like uh, what? What is that movie with the uh, Malcolm McDowell? It's a uh, uh, yeah. uh, Clockwork Orange. They yeah, they yeah, Clockwork yeah. Oranged his eyes. His eyes are Clockwork Orange. Yeah, open. exactly. They did that, and then they were just showing him just San Francisco in the '70s and the '60s, like on loop. Yeah, and then they had your things playing in the background at the yeah. same time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, it's true. It's true. It, it almost had to be like. Yeah, yeah. Because tell him, tell him he he was bringing up episodes that are like scrubbed from the internet, like years ago and shit. Like, uh, and original... like mix, they were all mixed up in this weird soup. Yeah, in yeah. His brain. It was weird. Yeah. It was weird. No, it's true. It's true. And and, and he, he he had this uh like conflation of everything into this own bizarre narrative that somehow fit into his life, that his yeah. life was somehow I intertwined with mine. And, uh, and so yeah. it's, it's, there you have it. It's just, uh, oh, disgusting. Um, it, that yeah. was like, uh, th that was like, y you know, it's an experience that leaves you feeling violated. It's just, <laughs> it's, uh, and then him and Brendan, Brandon Young together, him and Brandon Young together, the way they bounced off each other was so creepy. Uh, it, it's like, uh, so I don't know if you heard that vibe, just the two of them, it, you know, the way that they fed off each other with this kind of like reinforcement. So uh, definitely working together. Yeah, they were like really, they were really jiving. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, there you go. Um, and the, the Stephen King stuff. Among other things. And among other things, everything else as well. That I kind of tuned them out and I just left them to be because I was like, I didn't really have, once they get on that stuff, I just kind of, like, I didn't have anything to say. Thank you. Yeah. No, there's, there's nothing to say. I mean, you're, you're left with two people who. Like, are, I remember I had this friend who was, or I, guess, I wouldn't say friend, I guess, like <laughs> someone I knew in school, in the school age, elementary school, sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And this dude, he was Jewish, by the way, his family was Jewish. But, um, <laughs> but he was, like, obsessed with Stephen King. And this dude was, like, a menace. Like, he was, like, pulling pranks on people, like, bullying, like, sketch, you know, weird Jesus. stuff. And then by the time we made it to high school, like, the high school was, the transfer to high school was so bad that he, like, almost, he tried to kill himself or something. Jesus. Yeah, but <laughs> but this kid, yeah, he, uh, he was obsessed with, like, Stephen King to stand in sixth grade and, <laughs> you know. So he was obviously intelligent, but he just like was into shit that warped his mind. Thank you, thank you. That's so, that, that, there. You are, Stephen. So he just ended up. Now he just like owns a coffee shop around near me, like locally, or like I don't know if he owns it or runs it, but yeah, most it's, likely his trust fund kicked in. He just that's it. it or yeah, that's it. That's that's exactly what happened. That's exactly yeah. what happened. I, I mean, it's. Uh, Oh, I, I mean, he sure as hell didn't earn it. And uh, but he was trying to explain to me what the stand was about in like sixth grade. And then I was like, OK, maybe I'll read it. And then he pulls out the fucking book and it's like a thousand pages. I was like, dude, I'm not reading that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, no. I mean, it's just so like he just gave me like a summary of it for like two years straight. Jesus Christ. <laughs> That is, that's wretched. That is wretched. Yeah, I know. It was, it was bad. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, to have your life centered on something, it's not even a positive book. I mean, it's... it's... No, it was like the worst thing you could give to, like, someone in puberty, I feel like. In yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, and uh, no, Stephen King is not healthy. Um, it was like his version of, like, literature porn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's true. It's true. But it was all just, like, 
non-consensual who knows i I forgot what was even in the book just didn't sound good no no just a bunch of negative stuff and uh it it's like uh negative people um and uh supposedly the good people you know go to the mountains where good people live are rustic people country people are good people and and all the bad people of course go to uh you know las vegas but uh the Uh, that it has, of course. Uh, now, this they made a big deal of in the t- TV series, the original series, which was unwatchable, and uh, I'm sure the uh, whatever other remake of it would be just as unwatchable to me. I'm sure, but um, probably to a degree, it's in the book. I'm not. I, I I'm not sure. I think they added it in for TV. The magical Negro. Uh, you know, this is an important thing for Stephen King to every once in a while throw in the magical Negro. Uh, it, that that's to make up for all of the uh, what otherwise. What does that even mean? It, it, the, the magical Negro uh, is the literary uh, gimmick. It's it's like a it, you, what do they call it? A MacGuffin when everybody's pursuing yeah. something. That would be like uh, the gauntlet in the MCU universe. You know where yeah. Thanos has the gauntlet now. That's the MacGuffin. Uh, you know yeah. with uh, the magical Negro is is that it's the literary conceit where. Uh, you got to bring in a Negro and you got to make them look uh, like they're good. And so they're magical. It's like this, this, right. this Negro gave me wisdom. I, I, uh, this, this life altering insight comes from some black person who enters the story only to change the main white character's life. Uh, and make the main white character say, I owe it all to this wonderful black person. That's, that's what the, the it, it is most obscenely presented in the green mile which people cry over the green mile which is like (laughs) if you've ever seen the green mile big black guy in prison and he can bring mice and people back to life and he is like um yeah (laughs) i mean it's like then they then they kill him and and you you just weep you just weep i always always thought that movie that it's so fucking. I cannot stand that film. I cannot stand that film. If I were black, I would like, be like. If it wasn't for the actors being so good, it would have just totally flopped and uh, blown, uh, like, got uh, destroyed. Oh God, who are, you, who are you calling good? It's, who's the guy who's in that stupid film we all hate? Uh, that uh, guy played in the U boat movie recently. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah well, that, I'm saying, I'm saying they 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 paid. The best they could find. I'm saying, yeah, if they didn't yeah, have the, if they didn't yeah. have the budget. Yeah, top, top, top line names. If they didn't yeah, have the they top billing, cooked. top they billing. They, they had top yeah. billing. Yeah, they yeah. had top billing. But yeah, the um, uh, I mean, oh my God, this story is just. If I were black, I would find that so offensive. It, it's just like uh, he's he's not. And they try they tried to pull. I I don't know where the story came from, but it almost seemed like uh, they were trying to do the uh, what's the of uh, was it. Uh, to what was it called? It was so bad. I thought it was a Stephen was it, King story. The one, the one where there's like the two guys, and then the guy like accidentally kills the mouse, and then he has to like off him at the end. <laughs> what is that? It's like a very famous book. Oh, uh, oh, of mice and men. Of, of mice, mice and, and men. men. Yeah. So they had. Yeah, they, yeah. So it, that's what I thought it was when I was little. I was like, is this like a some fucked up version of of mice and men? <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> That, that, that that's funny. In hindsight, it's actually pretty yeah. funny. But by, by the way, just so people know, uh, 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 when I looked it up, because I'm forgetting the author, although he's a very famous San Francisco author, he's affiliated Steinbeck. 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 That's it, John Steinbeck. <laughs> just so people know, there's no mice that die in the book of Mice and Men. It's uh, he likes petting rabbits. That's his thing. It was a rabbit. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. He, he pets rabbits, Sorry. but then he winds up killing this girl when he's petting her too hard because he pets her like a rabbit. Okay, right. so that's like um, read into that what you will already. Uh, we're we're going into uh, dangerous metaphor territory with that. Uh, but well, I think yeah. that was the implication, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the implication the, is the the whole the the yeah. other guy was just saying like, oh, everyone's gonna think you were trying to do. Something that's right. Yeah. That's right. So that's... that's why I have to off you because it'll be worse off for you. Yes, it, you know, that's this right. is worse for me than it is for you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Then he then he has to kill him in the end, uh, blow his brains out. Yes. Look at, look over there. It's a beautiful sunset or something. Yes, yes. Like it's become memeified because it was just so. Like, yeah. awful 
awful. Yeah, yeah it's just just trash. <laughs> they made us read that in high school. No, it's required like, what reading. Did, what did I just read? <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's required reading. Yeah, well, at least it's not Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian. That that that, that, that they're that calling that great American literature these days. Yeah, it, it, look it up. Look up. You know, on YouTube. Spare yourself the reading experience. I mean, it it's like poetic in it its own called? sense. Blood Meridian uh, by Cormac McCarthy. He's the same guy who brought us No Country for Old Men. He he wrote the novel. He's the guy who wrote the novel. Uh, he's oh, dead now. This guy. Yeah, this guy. Yeah, yeah, but but if you ever look up Blood Meridian, just talk about a sex fantasy. I mean, this is your average person in the frontier West was malnourished. So your average right. cowboy, your average person is about what five foot nine, maybe if they're a big guy. Really, it, it'd be that. It'd be that would be the norm for a big guy. Uh, you know, something like five foot nine, uh, you know, you'd be rare to have somebody six feet because not everybody's eating that beef. They call them cowboys. Right. Doesn't mean they're eating that beef. They're, they're bringing it into, into the city. They're bringing it into places where it can be sold, but they're not necessarily yeah. eating that if shit. You see, yeah, if you, yeah. if you've ever seen like the old Lucky Luke comics and shit, like yeah. those cowboy comics, it's like dudes eating a can of beans. Yeah, yeah they're beans. Horse. Beans. Yeah, they're, they're living off beans. And they're just like, these are half-starved people on a frontier. And the main character of the book is like six foot seven, six foot nine. Okay, already we're <laughs> indulging ourselves in sheer fantasy, but he's not supposed to be human. He's supposed to be a devil or something. And he's albino. So, uh, and he's big and bald. He's bald, albino, and he's like, this is the main character. And, and he's supposed to look like an obscene giant waddling baby, like a, like a, like a cruel Buddha, like an anti-Buddha. Uh, though I don't believe he ever uses that metaphor, but he, he's, he's just going around driving everyone to kill each other. And that's a, and of course he, he triumphs in the end. It's the triumph of evil in, in the end. And basically right. one of these young men whose life he's turned upside down, uh, it decides he's going to try to kill him, but the assassination fails. And then he takes him into the back room of a bar and rapes him to death. That's the conclusion of the book. That is the conclusion of the novel. You and it's like, uh, uh, what is the moral lesson? <laughs> Wait, what is the life lesson to be taken from this? It is like, uh, um, this is of course, uh, it's it. I guess it's 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 basically it's basically sado porn. It's basically sado porn. Yeah. It's, it's an exercise in literary porn. Um, Which is what's weird. It's like always these old white guys that do that. Like, uh, yeah, what's yeah. his name? Thank R. you. R. Martin and all this. Yes. It's really weird. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. They all have, like, they fit the same archetype. I don't mean that for yeah. any other reason. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, really. It, it's like, uh, but... Um, yeah, it's it's something that uh, they they're seriously trying to consider making that into a film. I have no idea how they will do that. Um, they they say that this guy's um, novels are almost impossible to film. That old No Country for Old Men was one of the few successes, or maybe the only success in terms of interpreting his book into film. <laughs> yeah, on the, this Google search, it says, "Why is Blood Meridian unfilmable?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> There you and go. In, in quotes, in quotes, they say unfilmable due to its violence and themes. Uh, it, yeah, it's well. I mean, it's what are you going to see on screen? It, it's this like, is a Wall Street Journal quote. Yeah, Very difficult to do requires yeah. someone with a bountiful imagination and a lot of balls. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's basically: are you going to show the scalping? Are you going to show the male uh, rape? Are you going to show? Yeah, it, it says it, the apocalyptic vision of the American West is Judge Holden, yeah. the enigmatic albino giant, pedophile philosopher, ruthless murderer. Yeah, <laughs> like, thank you, thank you. That's it, the character. That's the bio of the it, character. Yeah, that's the hero. Yeah. Oh, that's the hero yeah that's the hero uh and and uh it, it, it's like uh is his name judge or is he a judge that's he, his name he takes on the title of judge he basically oh, okay. it, it happens basically where in a uh bar there's guys uh bragging about their crimes and uh, then how they got away with their crimes. Uh, and uh, I like how they say that Mark Carthy doesn't clarify whether or not the judge murders or kill or rapes the kid or does something different altogether. 
it's like oh believe me like it's... it wasn't really that ambiguous I don't no no well it's what they're trying to imply is perhaps he is turning him into a fellow demon perhaps he's a metamorphosizing him into a fellow demon or something but uh the implication i got was the uh lads being raped to death uh so it's uh it, but at any rate uh the, the judge being a pedophile um, is like, he, first off, it starts off in a revival tent and the revival tent, the preachers preaching about, you know, everybody's going to go to hell. And then he wanders into the revival tent. Everybody stares at him, of course, because nobody on earth looks like that. <laughs> and then when he goes up on the stage next to the preacher, then almost as just a joke, he's like, uh, you know, uh, Brandon Young style. He, he just says, uh, this guy ought to know about preaching about sin because he's wanted in another country, county, another county for, you know, all the boys he's been fucking up the bunghole. And everybody, oh, and then the preacher said, he lies. He lies. I do not know this man. I have never done so. Oh, yes, he has. How can you question me? And, and then he gets everybody to lynch this guy. And afterwards just laughs like it was, you know, like a practical joke. And then, uh, you know, it just goes downhill from there. It's <laughs> then after that, it's just a roller coaster ride of, you know, scalping. And, uh, you know, it's it's like uh, and, and then uh, by the time you're done with it, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's the way I described it. It culminates in uh, he's, he's raping some kid to death. It's like, where do you go from here? And it's considered one of the this guy's considered one of the great American novelists. He's, he's considered like uh, right. This is bonkers. It, 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 and he may and well people that are like yeah. five stars. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. But then they say, I'm unable to commit to this being my quote unquote favorite book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because they, of the theme. Yeah, oh, like, yeah. Then they would look like a crazy person. If oh, they, oh, well, they, they, saying, they look like this a, is my favorite book. De degenerate. The word you're looking for is they look like a degenerate. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I like this, this two star review. Lack of punctuation. Complete abortion of the English language. Yeah. Absurd and needlessly confusing. Yeah, it, there's this one critic said it's just uh, bad poetry. He said all it, is, yeah. it really is is just bad poetry. Uh, the uh, pages I got off the PDF were yeah, they were like almost unreadable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like he was. Tr it, it's like when you're trying to like uh, fluff up an essay. You're like, yeah. like, <laughs> like words. And shit. That's what. That's what the impression I got. He's like adding adjectives just to make it sound cool. <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, there you are. So, so he takes on this title of judge, and essentially, people let him take control of their lives. And in the end, of course, he's dancing around saying, I will never die. I will never die. And, uh, okay, so evil is eternal, and evil wins in the end. It, it's like, this This is like the message. It is a nihilistic message. It is a yeah. message. So it's a message of pure nihilism. It is... I could understand why it appeals to the Adamites uh, and the. Uh, this is like uh, one of those coming out novels for uh, uh, the Herodian insurgency, and uh, this is something that uh, I can easily imagine is the only kind of book that someone like Daniel Arola could even read. Uh, he would read something like that it, the, for all the reasons right. that Brendan just articulated because it's not really reading. <laughs> You're not really following grammatical syntax. It's like he's like, yeah, it's not. Yeah, the syntax is off. Yeah. And I, I get it. Like he was trying to be different. But this is this is yeah. too much. <laughs> yes. It's like, what do you call it? Uh, what do you call it when you sit down in front of a psychiatrist and they call it the flow of information? I forgot what it yeah. is. Stream of consciousness. Stream of consciousness. But Stream but, of but, yeah. But deliberately, he fucked it up or something. Yeah, yes, yes, that's right. That's right. And this, it is, like, really hard to read, actually. Yeah, yeah, and, and this, being... if you take a look at the author, the author presents himself photographically like he's a cowboy. Like he's a cowboy. It's like, what is your <laughs> message? What is your message? It, it, that he's the guy in the novel. Yeah, I guess. I guess it's to be that gotta guy. be it. That's gotta be it. He, he wants to be him, yes. Oh. Mm. And yeah. um, uh, so uh, obviously this is like um, a, uh, uh, but all kinds of people. Are <laughs> they, put, they put his influences, yeah. William Shakespeare. <laughs> that, that's, that takes balls. Ernest that's, Hemingway. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a bit more applicable simply because to me, Ernest Hemingway is simple minded. You know, to me, I, yeah. I, I never found Ernest Hemingway in any way, shape or form a author that 
captivated me in any way. I, I that's, yeah, Dostoevsky. Dovetsky. Dostoevsky. Yeah, that just means it's inaccessible. That just means it's inaccessible. Yeah, a Russian yeah. author. It's it's like they say in Europe. The greatest novelist yeah. in all of the world of literature. Did uh, what, yeah. did, what did he write? Uh, who Dostoevsky or Cormac McCarthy? <laughs> Do, Dostoevsky. No, the other guys. No, Dostoevsky. Oh, crime and punishment. Duh. Okay, I got it. I got yeah, it. yeah. It, it's uh, you, you know what talk they talk about unreadable. Like, uh, like yeah, a thousand pages. Well, 2, you, pages. Yeah, well, you know what they say about European hell. A, a European version of hell, uh, as they say, is all the chefs are British, all the lovers are Swiss. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, uh, all the lovers are Swiss. Uh, all the police are German. All the mechanics yeah. are French. Uh, yeah. uh, all the trains are run by the Italians. Uh, uh, everything is managed by the Polish people. You know, it's Polish yeah. management. Uh, you know, which is another way of saying it's all fucked up. Uh, they they say this other parts of the joke I never understood until later in my life when I suffered the company of these people specifically, uh, and they they said that uh, all the, all the authors are Russian. That that would be the other part of European hell. Uh, the um, so what what else was there? Yes, uh, all the producers are Norwegian. I never understood that until I tried to work with Rob Nilsson, who was this Norwegian <laughs> director and producer. <laughs> Who produced two award-winning films uh, that he won the uh, top awards at the Sundance Film Festival, which later on became something else like the American Film Festival, or maybe the American Film Festival became Sundance, and he won one award at the French one for the movie Heat and Sunlight about the Biafran Civil War. Th these are unwatchable films, by the way. You're not missing anything by not having known these films existed. Uh, the other one was yeah. Northern Lights that won this award. Cannes Film Festival was where he won the award for Heat and Sunlight, and his whole career just died after that his whole career he was like m night shalyamon you know when m night shalyamon yeah. first came out and they said is this the next hitchcock and then after that it just yeah yeah then after that he just totally fell on his face and never got up and that was rob <laughs> nilson and rob nilson was inspired by the director named cassavetes which does nothing but focus on people's faces it's just like you can't watch these films they're unwatchable and uh right. they're painful and, and so yeah so that was a european hell joke about no all the producers are norwegian all the comedians are romanian that's what they they, they said <laughs> And, and and Peter Moon will gladly explain it's that. Funny to yeah. It's, yeah. it's funny because yeah. it's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 All, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, all the books are are written by Russians. The comedy is Romanian. The uh, uh, yeah, the uh, producers are Norwegian. Yeah, the uh, uh, it, it, yeah. Last time, yeah. Recently, I saw a Norwegian interview and uh, or like the dude was Norwegian. He's doing a interview in english but yeah. his like his production quality was so bad it was like it looked like something he had like 90s typeface and an old cgi like it looked like reading rainbow and shit oh god and oh. it's like dude you, these computers like they, like this shit's like preset on them you could have updated that like, many times <laughs> oh, yeah. like like you could have used freaking iMovie off your mac and been, <laughs> been something better than that it's like come on dude no, thank you. Oh my God! Yeah, they probably think it's some sort of statement. He would say, "Yeah, yeah." yeah. He would say it's a statement why I use this old technology. That's my statement. Yeah, and uh, staying true to my, you know, my roots or something. Mm. Some asinine thing like that. Whatever rationalization he's got. Uh, uh, oh my God! And and these like, oh God! I hope you're not working tomorrow. Are you gonna be okay? Tomorrow? Oh yeah, I have to go. Yeah, it's, oh, I'm, shit. I'm working. But, oh my god! Well, but it was uh, a good combo, and there's like you. an eclipse going on soon. Yeah. Oh, true, That's true. Hey, can you see it out your um, window or <laughs> out your warehouse yeah. window? <laughs> yeah. I have to go past all the dogs and stuff. It's gonna take a while. Oh god, yes. And uh, did the dogs know you at this point? They they know you. They're not set off by you. Uh, you well, you know. <laughs> That's for me to know and someone else. To yes, find out, excellent guess, point. So. Excellent point. Good point. Well taken. <laughs> well, we love you dearly, and of yeah. course, stay safe and be well. Um, hugs, and um, for God's sake, uh, it, yes, be prepared uh, with saging whatever you do to ward off um, the the assault of uh, right. Yeah, the endless assault uh, that these people throw against you. Yeah, but, but take heart in the fact that they obviously consider you uh, the greatest threat. <laughs> Uh, in in their in their miserable lives.
Yeah. So yeah, well, yeah. There, there you go. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, 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 there must be a good future for you. Uh, and um, true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, all right then. That's good news. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. And many blessings, and yeah, everyone, you know. Try not to eat food during the eclipse if you can. Oh, what is? Give us some some of the story behind that. Or it's, I mean, it's gen. According to Jyotish, it's generally advised not to eat uh, during an eclipse, especially a lunar, because it it can um, contaminate the food with. Basically, it causes imbalances, and you don't want to put yourself in that position. That is incredible. I want to thank yeah. you so much for that. When did the eclipse really begin? Because did it begin before the show? Um, did it begin before the show? Because or the influence? Would the influence have begun before the show? Yeah, it's basically happening now. Um, let me see if I can try and see it. Yeah, yeah, because uh, if the influence happened before the show, that would explain what happened to me. <laughs> And uh, so um, when uh, we're going to see if he can see what's happening. Uh, and uh, other than that, of course, I will, uh, as I said, uh, just go straight into monologue, suck all the oxygen out of the room uh, by the time uh, our friend. Yeah, awakens. well, um, it looks like we didn't really get hit by it as much okay. as far as like visually, but the influences were there pretty much. That explains a lot. It's currently, yeah, it's currently in the in the vicinity. Definitely, I'll, I'll talk to you about that privately as, as to what happened later. Yes. Uh, so that's funny as hell. Uh, but um, okay, well, um, thank you so much for helping me through this point in into the night. Yes. And uh, um, of course, hopefully, you'll be able to show up on Wednesday. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. Yes. Try and survive. <laughs> Try and survive till then. <laughs> yes. Right, I, I can make it, you know, if I made it this far. Yes, yes, you okay. will. You will definitely yeah. make All right. it. All Divine right. willing. Okay. Yes, right. bye for now. Thank you. Okay, that's Brendan Zogit. Everyone maintain him in thought and prayer. Uh, of course, uh, they were hitting him um, in every way imaginable. We are now going to dive deep into uh, the monologue uh, for tonight, and I do want... Uh, uh, people to understand. Obviously, I need your help. Uh, we've had some help from our dear friend, uh, my brother from another mother in New York City, uh, the belly of the beast. And that, of course, is um, our Stephen Myers. And hopefully he will, uh, you know, join us again on the show as he's done a few times in the past, in the near future. And uh, in the interim, I uh, definitely want everyone to um, emulate his contribution, and I certainly need more. So we're trying to raise as much money as possible. Let's try and get another $75 tonight. And of course, as far as I'm concerned, I do earn my pay. I give you top-of-the-line analysis, and that analysis uh, begins now. Uh, so let's start with the moral plea behind Kate Middleton's cancer disclosure. Uh, as I've said, um, after weeks of conspiracy theories and online demands for her private medical information, uh, the Princess of Wales offered an appeal for basic public decency. Um, now, there's no good way. There is no good way to break bad news. Uh, but some ways are more testing than others. Uh, some people, whether from cowardice or an excess of bravery, refuse to break it, even to themselves. The toughest of duties, or uh, I think it's widely agreed, has to be the delivery of dark tidings to loved ones. But in the wake of a statement made by Catherine, Princess of Wales, on Friday into this weekend, we can now think of something worse. Imagine having to share your bad news with Millions of unknown ones, fascinated ones, prurient ones, pitying ones, or pitilessly mocking ones, none of whom you personally know, and all of whom either yearn or presume to know you from the inside out. How do you begin to break such news without breaking up? 
Now, the statement was filmed outside with Kate sitting on a bench in uncertain sunshine, calmly disclosing to the camera that having endured abdominal surgery in January, she was now undergoing preventative chemotherapy for an unspecified cancer. In a bold assertion, she said, I am well and getting stronger every day. As a multitude of viewers parsed every inch of her appearance. A host of golden daffodils behind her was a pledge of British springtime. A natural chorus, as it were, to the invocation with which Kate signed off, asking that her fellow sufferers do not lose faith or hope. That quiet decree could have been spracketh by the late Queen Elizabeth II, who was well versed in stoic fortitude. In other respects, what was remarkable about the Princess of Wales's revelations was how unroyal they were. No titles were used. She referred to her husband as William and to their young family. No mention was made of King Charles, who is also being treated for cancer. The whole tenor of the statement was intended to establish an affinity between Kate and any other parent anywhere whose prime of life had just been invaded and upended by the bitterest of shocks. Whether this reaching out is a matter of instinct or design is not even the point. Some public figures have a talent for kinship, and some don't. Kate has it, as did Ronald Reagan, whose letter of 1994 began, I have recently been told that I am one of the millions of Americans who will be afflicted with Alzheimer's disease. This is about me, yes, but it's not about me alone. Evidently, we have come quite a ways since 1951, when it wasn't just the British public that was left uninformed about the plight of King George VI, who had lung cancer. Allegedly, even he was left in the dark. To claim that relations between the British royal family and the wider world are now bathed in a clear light of transparency and honesty, however, would be a stretch. If anything, we have simply traded one darkness for another. The old cloud of unknowing has made way for a roiling murk of misinformation and surmise. When Kate was admitted to hospitalization in January. Those who responded with a sympathetic murmur of that sounds wretched, get well soon, betrayed their laughable innocence. The collective cry in print media, and especially online, struck a more ravening note, as if to say, what are we not being told? Be warned, if you don't tell us the truth, will have no alternative but to make it up. That demand was sharpened by a failed attempt to meet it. On March 10th, Mother's Day in Britain, in the genial shape of a photograph of Kate and her three children, the image, it was soon discovered, had been edited. Every pixel was then examined for manipulation and possible mendacity. A gap opened up between the real and the contrived, and outlandish theories rushed in to fill the space. When William and Kate had the audacity to visit a farm store in Windsor, and the misfortune to be filmed in the act, the visual testimony was swiftly picked apart. Social media buzzed and writhed with talk of doppelgangers, the most balanced comment came on the front page of Britain's Daily Star, where the headline read, 
world goes mad after woman goes shopping. The lost error of George the Sixth suddenly felt like a haven. Stiff, maybe, but safe. Is that why Kate, William, and their advisors took the decision to have her issue the most recent statement? Did they think enough is enough? If so, one cannot blame them. However shielded from the storm Kate and William's children are, it cannot be easy for them to fend off the realization that their mother stands at the very eye of global gossip, at the mercy of a raging meme, indeed that insists that the role of their mother is being played by someone else. Spare a thought for William II, uh, the motherless king-to-be, who continues to perform his royal functions while both his wife and his father are being treated for cancer. Logically, the only cure for such lunacy was to show the Princess of Wales alive and well, or as well as she can hope to be, given her ordeal. Whether such logic and such a tranquil plea for moral decency will lay the rumors to rest and shame the rancorous is open to question. Feed the beast, and it cometh back hungry for more. Now you understand my own life as a micro-influencer, stalked by gang stalkers relentlessly, remorselessly, and seemingly eternally. And perhaps you can understand why I talk it out on live stream in the public eye. With such being said, my homeland and heartland of Taiwan, well, the world's most dangerous place has only gotten more dangerous. The entire world is on the brink, as my Taiwan admits to United States troops now being stationed on the communist Chinese border. A couple of years ago, The Economist magazine declared on its cover that my Taiwan, my tiny island China, home to 24 million people, was the most dangerous place on earth. The reasons it came to that conclusion remain sound. In fact, they've only grown stronger recently. The backdrop to the tensions over my Taiwan is, of course, the expanding geopolitical rivalry between the American and Communist Chinese empires. Ever since the first, well, ever since the rise first of China, Chinese Communist dictator Xi Jinping, and then of former United States President Donald Trump, Both empires have fundamentally shifted their attitudes towards the other. From benign, to wary, to hostile. Perhaps the extraordinary and rapid growth of Red China and the reality of uh, America's dominant status made this inevitable. A rising power faces an established one, creating a situation that may be In the words of author and Harvard international security scholar Graham Allison, destined for war. But are we destined for war? The United States and the People's Republic of China are unusual in that while they are increasingly geopolitical rivals, they are also deeply intertwined economically. Exempli gratiae. During the Third World War, that we so misnomer the Cold War, at the peak of United States Greater Soviet's trade, the Twa empires exchanged five billion United States dollars of goods with each other in a single year. The Communist Chinese Empire and these United States do 5 billion United States dollars in trade every few days. And that number has not dropped that much 
even as tariffs, bans, and restrictions on trade have grown in recent years. In addition, the Communist Chinese Empire does not seem to be a revolutionary state seeking to overthrow the international system and present the world with an alternative ideology to America. That ideological rivalry at the heart of the Third World War, so misnamed the Cold War, is largely absent today. One thing that is present, however, is nuclear deterrence. Red China and these United States both have large arsenals, which should have the effect they have had elsewhere, from the United States and Greater Soviet Union to Pakistan and India, in deterring all-out war. Taiwan, in the meantime, has officially confirmed the presence of United States troops stationed on our islands in the Taiwan Strait permanently, a development that could further escalate tensions with Communist China on mainland Asia. The NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, passed in 2023, facilitated the deployment of these troops to conduct training programs for Taiwanese frontline forces. The move comes as Red China continues to assert its disputed claim over Mai Taiwan, viewing it as a renegade province despite never having ruled it. The heightened military activities by Red China in and around the Taiwan Strait have prompted Taiwan to bolster its defense capabilities. In response to queries about the presence of the United States Army Green Beret Special Forces, also known as the Green Berets, period, uh, officially or more technically uh, filed as U.S. Army Green Special Forces, Taiwanese Defense Chief Chiu Kuo Ching said, no matter the situation, there may be blind spots or shortcomings, so we need to communicate with our allies, whether it is a team, a group, or a country. We can learn from each other to see what strengths we have. This is a fixed thing. Former President Tsai Ing-wen had mentioned in 2021 occasional training sessions with U.S. instructors in 2021, but Chu's recent statement is the first official confirmation of the long-term nature of these activities. According to reports from my Taiwan's UDN, the United Daily News, U.S. Army Green Berets from the 1st Special Forces Group are now permanently stationed at bases of the 101st Amphibious Reconnaissance Battalion, a Taiwanese Army Special Operations Force, located in outlying island counties of Penghu and Kinmen. Notably, Kinmen lies just over a mile from Chaikom, or Chinese Communist Shores. Additionally, Reports suggest an American military presence in the northeast city of Taoyuan on Taiwan's main island, with service members providing specialized training on drone equipment for Taiwan's elite airborne special service company. Now, as far as I understand, both the United States Army and uh, the Chinese Foreign Ministry of the Communists have yet to comment on these developments. The presence of U.S. troops in Taiwan marks a significant development in the region's geopolitical landscape. The United States officially withdrew its military presence from I, Taiwan in 1979 following the normalization of Sino-American relations. However, under the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act, the United States remains committed to providing my Taiwan with defensive weaponry and ensuring our security against coercion or aggression. While uh, my Taiwan has refrained from commenting on specific reports, it has reiterated that all foreign military exchanges adhere to an annual plan. And yet, and yet, there is the problem 
of my Taiwan that sits at the heart of Sino-American relations. The Communist Chinese Empire has never accepted that my Taiwan can be an independent country. This is not a Xi Jinping innovation. It is in the Constitution of the People's Republic of China. Every Chai Kum, every Chinese Communist leader, beginning with Mao Zedong, has affirmed the goal of reunifying the Twain, the Tua Chinas. But in the past, Communist China believed that it could wait because time was on its side. Eventually, the mainland, with its massive economy and billion-plus population, would withdraw my tiny island of 24 million into its orbit. That was the thinking. But that premise is proving untrue. My Taiwan has developed into a feisty democracy with a political culture defined by our political system in stark contrast to collectivist China. Over the past few decades, my Taiwan has gotten more determined not to reunify with Red China on the mainland. So, Xi must be looking at this situation and feeling that time is not on his side. That perhaps it would be better to act sooner than later. For the American Empire, and our many allies in Asia, Commu Chinese aggression to retake my Taiwan would be unacceptable. Washington has been willing to accept Red China's claims on Taiwan as long as it did not use coercion to achieve them. Taiwan policy, for all sides, has been about tolerating fantasies about the future as long as there are no practical changes in the present. Most people in my Taiwan simply want to maintain the status quo and keep things going as they are. While the recent elections on my island China brought to power for a third term, a party that is closely associated with the idea of an independent Taiwan, it's worth noting that it got only 40% of the vote, with the other 60% going to Tua candidates with less independence-minded positions. What does all this mean? That this issue will need to be managed rather than solved, and managed very carefully by both Washington and Beijing. This is one place on earth where there should be little room for macho rhetoric and provocative actions. All three sides should keep talking to ensure there are no misperceptions or miscalculations. None of this is morally satisfying, but the stakes are high enough that one thing is very clear. Were these tensions to be mismanaged, were this conflict to turn into war, it would be lose, lose, lose for all three parties. Indeed, the entire world would suffer cataclysmic consequences. Better to kick this can down the road as long as possible and hope it does not explode. To help contain the potential for such a release of energy. In the most explosive sense, the Empire of Japan and the Dominion of Canada may join the Pacific Defense Alliance. The United Kingdom, these United States, and Australia are rushing to expand their trilateral defense partnership, AUKUS, an acronym for Australia, United Kingdom, United States, to other allies, ahead of potentially tumultuous elections in all three countries over the next 14 months. A senior diplomat involved in the negotiations told the Politico news agency that Japan and Canada intend to join the so-called second paragraph of the AUKUS agreement, according to which the participants will sign a broad cooperation in the field of military technology by the end of 2024 or early 2025. 
This comes to mid fears in Washington, London, and Canberra that Donald Trump could cancel the AUKUS agreement if he wins the United States presidential election in November. The AUKUS security agreement was first announced in September of 2021. Its first part, paragraph 1, provides for United States and United Kingdom assistance to Australia in the construction of nuclear submarines. Paragraph 2 of the agreement allows the three countries to agree on agreements to develop advanced military technologies in areas such as artificial intelligence, hypersonic missiles, and quantum technologies. It was always envisioned that Paragraph 2 could be expanded to include other United States allies, including the Empire of Japan, Canada, New Zealand, and South Korea. A second diplomat involved in these talks said that U.S. President Joe Biden's administration is now pushing very hard to get some things done on AUKUS Paragraph 2 now, before the U.S. elections in November. In March of 2023, Prime Ministers Anthony Albanese of Australia and Rishi Sunak of the United Kingdom, as well as U.S. President Joseph Biden, announced an agreement between the AUKUS Alliance states, the member states, to provide the Australian Navy with nuclear submarines. Japanese media reported that the AUKUS countries are interested in using Japanese technology, including for the development of hypersonic weapons and enhanced electronic warfare capabilities. Of course, for the moment, in large part, our world still runs on oil. But in our new emergent economy, we're really dealing with oil and beyond. And this is how Red China, Russia, and Iran are forging closer ties. I'm going to assess the economic threat posed by the anti-Western axes. Vladimir Putin, Russia's dictator for life, and Ibrahim Raizi, his Iranian counterpart, have several things in common. Both belong to a tiny group of dictators personally targeted by American sanctions. Even though neither travels much, both have been to Red China on the Asian mainland in recent years, and both seem increasingly fond of one another. In December, they met in the Kremlin to discuss the war in the Gaza. On March 18th, Mr. Raizi was quick to congratulate Mr. Putin for his decisive electoral victory. For much of history, Russia, Iran, and Red China were less chummy. All of them imperialists at heart, they often meddled in one another's neighborhoods and jostled for control of Asia's trade routes. The new conflict, uh, a cold conflict for the Silk Road. Lately, however, America's actions have changed the dynamic. In 2020, two years after exiting a deal that limited Iran's nuclear program, Uncle Sam reimposed an embargo. More penalties were announced in January this year to punish Iran for supporting Hamas and Yemen's Houthi rebels. Russia fell under Western sanctions in 2022, after invading Ukraine, and they were recently tightened. Meanwhile, the Communist Chinese Empire faces restrictions of its own, which could become more, well, much more stringent if Donald Trump is elected president in November. United by a common foe, the Triacs now vow to advance a common foreign policy. Support for a multipolar world no longer dominated by the American empire. All see stronger economic ties as the basis for their new alliance. 
Red China has promised a no-limits partnership with Russia and signed a 25-year, 400 billion United States dollar strategic agreement with Iran in 2021. All three countries are joining the same multilateral clubs, if you will, such as the BRICS, the acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. The bilateral trade between them is growing. Plans are being drawn up for tariff-free blocks, new payment systems, and trade routes that bypass Western-controlled locations. For the American empire and our allies, this is the stuff of nightmares. A thriving anti-Western synaxis could help foes dodge sanctions, win wars, and recruit other malign actors. The new Entente involves areas where links are already strong, others where collaboration is only partial, and some unresolved questions. What might the alliance look like in five to ten years? Start with booming business. Red China has long been a customer of petrostates, including Iran and the Russian Empire. But these trois also used to sell lots of oil to Europe, which was close to Russia's fields and easy to reach from the Gulf. Since Europe started snubbing them, Red China has been buying barrels at bargain prices. Inflows from Russia's western ports have risen to half a billion barrels a day, up from less than 100,000 pre-war, or so such as reckoned by Raid Yansong of Kepler, a data firm that I've sourced. In December, that pushed imports of Russian crude to 2.2 million barrels a day, or 19% of Red China's total, up from 1.5 million barrels a day 20 years ago. In the second half of yesteryear, Iran's exports to Red China averaged 1 million barrels a day, a 150% rise from the same period in 2021. Whereas Western sanctions allow anyone outside the G7 to import Russian oil, the Iranian energy industry is subject to so-called secondary sanctions, which restrict third countries. Since 2022, however, the Biden administration has relaxed enforcement, willing to see rules broken if it means lower prices. The result has been a surge in commu Chinese imports, with the beneficiaries not Red China's state-owned firms, which could one day be exposed to sanctions, but smaller teapot refineries, with no presence abroad. As a bonus, Red China also gets cheap gas from the Russian Empire. Imports via the power of Siberia pipeline have doubled since Mr. Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Russia and Iran have little choice but to sell to the Red China. In contrast, Communist China is only subject to restrictions on imports of Western technology. It does not face finance bans or trade embargoes. Thus it can, and does, buy oil from other countries, which gives it the upper hand in negotiations. Red China gets Russian and Iranian supplies at a discount of 15 to 30 United States dollars on the global oil price, and then processes the cheap hydrocarbons into higher value products. The production capacity of its petrochemicals industry has grown more in the past 20 years than that of all other countries on earth combined since 2019. Red China also cranks out enormous volumes of refined oil products. So, let's start talking trade instead of aid. 
boosting commodity trade between the three empires was always going to be the easy bit. Everyone wants oil. Once on a ship, it can be sent anywhere. Yet the communist China on the Asian mainland has an informal policy of limiting dependence on any commodity supplier to 15 to 20 percent of its total needs, meaning that it is close to the maximum it will want to import from Iran and the Russian Empire. Although the trade is still enough to provide the Tua empires with a lifeline, it is helpful only if they can spend the hard currency earned on importing goods, hence the ambition to develop other types of trade. Red China's exports to the Russian Empire have duly soared as COVID-19 restrictions strangled its economy. Red China sought to compensate by boosting manufacturing exports. Instead of shoes and t-shirts, it tried to sell high-value wares, such as machinery and mechanical devices, for which the Russian Empire acted as a test market. Yesteryear, the biggest importer of Kamu Chinese automobiles was not Europe, a big electric vehicle buyer, but the Russian Empire, which purchased three times as many petrol cars as it did before the war. Purchasing manager surveys prove that Iranian companies are constantly short of raw materials, a category including both sophisticated wares, like computer chips, the oil of the 21st century, and more basic ones, such as plastic parts. This hampers Iran's manufacturing industry, which is as large as its petroleum sector. Yet Red China exports few parts and just 300 to 500 cars a month to Iran, compared with 3,000 or so to neighboring Iraq. Not many of Red China's manufactured goods exporters, which sell a lot to the West, are brave enough to risk American retribution. In theory, more business with Russia could help Iran. The two countries supply each other with useful goods. Since 2022, Iran has sold Russia drones and weapon systems that are causing damage in Ukraine, its first military support for a non-Islamic country since the revolution in 1979. Early this year, Iran also sent Russia 1 million barrels of crude by tanker, another first. But sanctions make deeper ties tricky. Although Russia stopped releasing detailed statistics in 2023, ship traffic data in the Caspian Sea show only a modest rise since 2022, when the country's leaders set an ambitious target to boost bilateral trade. Limited trade between Iran and the Russian Empire means they lack common banking channels and payment systems. Despite government pressure, neither SPFS, which is Rossio's alternative to SWIFT, the global interbank messaging system, or MIR, Rossio's answer to American credit card networks, is widely used by Iranian banks. Efforts to de-dollarize trade led to the creation of a double royale exchange in August of 2022, but transaction volumes remain low. To resist sanctions in the longer run, Iran and the Russian Empire also need investment, the weakest area of cooperation at present. Red China's stock of foreign direct investment in the Islamic Republic has been flat since 2014, even as it has poured money into other emerging economies and at roughly 3 billion United States dollars remains puny for an economy of Iran's size. Deals agreed during the last visit of Iran's president to Beijing which could be valued at 10 billion United States dollars at most, are dwarfed by the 50 billion United States dollar China pledge to Saudi Arabia, Iran's great rival, in 2022. 
Although Red China remains involved in uh, Russian projects such as the Arctic LNG, liquid natural gas, a gas liquefaction facility in the Empire's North, it has not snapped up assets dumped by Western firms. As noted by Rachel Zimba of CNAS, CNAS, a think tank that I've sourced from. Nor has the communist Chinese backed any new ventures. The Russian Empire had been expecting Red China to bankroll the power of Siberia 2 pipeline, due to carry 50 billion cubic meters of gas to the Middle Kingdom when complete. Almost as much as Russia's biggest pipeline used to deliver to Europe. Without Red China's support, that project is now in limbo. I guess it all comes down to a little help from your friends with infamous, uh, well, emphasis on how little you get. <laughs> oh, Mary's in the chat and says, good evening and morning. Uh, so... Let me give a nice response to uh, Dear Mary. And uh, here we are. And I want to thank you all, of course, who have stuck with me to the point of monologue. And hopefully more shall return. Uh, speaking now to uh, an empty audience, as far as I'm concerned, I'm spoiled by the larger numbers we've had recently, but I guess I wasted too much time, uh, per some people's perception, Talking to our dear friend Brendan Zogit, but uh, he, of course uh, he, we need to speak these things out, let people know what's going on with us. And uh, ultimately, that's what uh, people should be hearing. Now we get down to the serious part, the analysis, and I could use a little help from my friends. Make certain you contribute, of course. I'm more than earning my pay by providing you information you will get absolutely nowhere else. Now, this alliance that I've placed under analysis has already achieved something remarkable. Saving its junior members from collapse in the face of Western embargoes. But has it reached its full potential? That answer depends on the ability of its members to surmount external and internal obstacles. Various forums aim to promote cooperation and cross-border investment. Last July, Iran became the ninth member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a China-led security alliance that also includes the Russian Empire. In December, it signed a free trade agreement with the Russia-led Eurasian Economic Union, which covers much of Central Asia. In January, it joined the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, an emerging market group that includes both the Communist Chinese and Russian empires. These get-togethers give the trio more chances to talk. At recent summits, Iranian and Russian ministers have revived negotiations to extend the INSTC, the International North-South Transport Corridor, a 7,200-kilometer route connecting Russia to the Indian Ocean via Iran. At present, Russian grain must travel to the Middle East through the NATO-controlled Bosphorus, the proposal, which includes a mixture of roads, rail, and ports, could turn Iran into an export outlet for the Russian Empire. Iran and Russia's bureaucracies have relatively little experience of working with one another, and the amount of investment required is daunting. The Russia-backed Eurasian Development Bank estimates it to be 26 billion United States dollars in Iran and Russia alone. Mustering such funding in 12 countries not known for investor friendliness would be hard at the best of times, let alone under sanctions. Still, the idea is gaining traction. On February 1st, envoys discussed the next steps for the Rasht Ashtara Railway a 1.6 billion U.S. dollar project 
that could ease cargo transit in northern Iran. Yesteryear, the Russian Empire used part of the INSTC to move goods to Iran by rail for the first time. The more serious problem is that Iran and Russia's economies are too similar to be natural trading partners. Of the top 15 categories of goods that each exports, nine are shared. Ten of their 15 biggest imports are also the same. Only trois of Russia's 15 most wanted goods count among Iran's top exports. Where Iran does have demand gaps, Russia could fill, such as in cars, electronics, and machinery, Russia's production capacity is constrained. With gains from trade curtailed by various sanctions, the relationship between the two countries will instead be a competitive one, particularly when it comes to energy exports. Since the West imposed an embargo on Russia's oil, the country has been vying with Iran to win a bigger share of Red China's imports, resulting in a price war. It is a battle that Iran is losing. Russia is a bigger oil producer, and its energy is not subject to secondary sanctions. Some of its crude can also be piped to Red China, a cheaper option. Having the upper hand makes the Russian Empire uninterested in offering assistance to its allies. Early in the war, Ukraine's supporters feared that Russia and Iran would team up to evade sanctions. Instead, Russia developed its own shadow fleet of tankers and gave no access to the Iranians. In fact, Yezar al-Meliki of Miz, MWES, a research outfit, has confirmed that Iran has sought Russian funds and technology to tap its giant gas reserves. But Russia has provided little help so far. In other areas, the Communist Chinese Empire has become a competitor to Iran. Until recently, the Islamic Republic's sizable manufacturing base was a source of resilience. The country could take advantage of a devalued currency to sell nuts and toiletries. Uh, in fact, Esfendiar Batman Gelidi, or Gelidi, of Burz and Bazar Foundation, another think tank, has confirmed that its hope in time was to climb the value chain, exporting air conditioning units and perhaps even cars. Red China is dashing such dreams. As it shifts toward, well, as the Reds in mainland Asia shift towards higher value exports. The communist Chinese are flooding Iran's target markets with cheaper, better versions of these goods. The West seems to have little appetite for wholesale secondary sanctions, but existing measures will continue to cause trouble. In December, America announced penalties for anyone dealing with Russian firms in industries including construction, manufacturing, and technology. These look similar to those it imposed on Iran in 2011, the year my late and sainted Cyrus, my womb matron, my mother died, was slain, the term they use for Vampia. These sanctions, which were later suspended in 2015, after the nuclear deal was signed. Before the suspension, the measures caused Iran's imports from Red China to plummet. There is evidence that some commu Chinese banks are already dumping Russian business. Although these new sanctions do not target Russia's energy sector, they could hinder Russia's oil trade with customers other than Red China if banks react by pausing business with the energy giant. Since October, America has also imposed sanctions on 50 tankers that it says breach sanctions on uh, the Russian Empire. 
Around half of them have not loaded Russian oil ever since. All this is making exports to Red China both more necessary and more difficult for the Russians, which are bound to increase competition with Iran. America could fan the flames further by leaning on Malaysia to inhibit oil smuggling in its waters, choking off Iranian flows, and Red China itself is undergoing growing scrutiny. In February, the European Union announced sanctions on three commu Chinese firms it reckons are helping the Russian Empire. So this brings us down to the scarometer. Hmm. At this stage, then, the anti-Western Entente is worrying, concerning would be the term, but not truly scary. How will it develop over the years and decades to come? The likeliest scenario is that it remains a vehicle that serves the communist Chinese empire's interests, above all, rather than becoming any true partnership. Red China will abuse it for as long as it can reap opportunistic gains, and stop short of giving it proper wings. Red China will decline to put weight behind alternative trade routes. Well, not only will Red China decline to put weight behind alternative trade routes but are, or payment systems, not wanting to put at risk its businesses in the West. Yet that might change if America, perhaps during a second Trump presidency, attempts to force Red China out of Western markets. With nothing more to lose, Red China would then put far greater resources into forming an alternative bloc and would inevitably attempt to build on existing relationships and broaden its alliances. Junior partners may not be pleased. Their manufacturing industries would suffer as Red China redirected its exports. America would also suffer. Our consumers would pay more for our imports. And in time, our leaders would see the first serious challenge to their dominance of the global trading system. But time is not on Rossi's side. Almost overnight, pundits and analysts have begun singing a very different tune. Until recently, Ukraine was clearly winning and Rossi was clearly losing. Then suddenly... After Ukraine admitted in November that its counteroffensive had failed, it became as clear that, well, clear to all, that the Ukraine could not win and Russia could not lose. And uh, so, let me give a nice return here to our dear Mary. Return to my analysis. Now, everyone. From Pope Francis to Hungary's Mejarozags, authoritarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, to Senator J.D. Vance, the Republican from Ohio, to Vladimir Putin himself, is absolutely persuaded that a Russian victory is inevitable and that Ukraine would be better off negotiating now before it loses still more territory or even its sovereignty. The defeatist argument basically rests on the view that time is on Russia's side. Since it has more of everything, Russia can simply pound away, lose thousands of soldiers, and just wait for Ukraine's bullets to run out, its morale to vanish. Later, rather than sooner, Ukraine will be enervated, and even though the Russian Empire may be equally enervated, Ukraine, having less of everything, will simply have to give up. Or as the Pope euphemistically put it, have the courage of the white flag. But that view is wrong. And there are several reasons why time is on the side of the Ukraine. Russia is taking enormous losses. According to current conservative American estimates, some 300,000 Russians have been killed or critically injured. 
Great Britain says it's 355,000 at a conservative guess. Ukrainians put the figure at 425,000, closer to half a million. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky recently said 180,000 Russians have been killed and 31,000 Ukrainians. Whatever the exact number, it's clear that Russia is being bled dry and its armed forces are being severely degraded. Small wonder, as patriotic Russian bloggers openly admit, that there is discontent among front-line Russian soldiers. Desertions are on the rise and would be higher were it not for ex the extremely punitive consequences that failure to escape produce. Small wonder as well that the mothers, wives, sisters, and girlfriends of the soldiers are openly demanding that their menfolk be brought back home. Russians may or may not be passive by nature and unwilling to follow in Alexei Navalny's footsteps, but even they, like all people everywhere, have limits to what they will put up with. The tens of thousands who attended Navalny's funeral and who took part in the Noon Against Putin demonstrations on March 17th, the hundreds of thousands who supported Boris Nadezhdin's brief presidential run, and the thousands of Bashkirs who took to the streets are all evidence of the fact that something is changing within the hearts and minds of Russians. Skeptics should remember that the mass movements that rocked the Greater Union of Soviet Socialistic Republics in the late 1980s all began with small gatherings of dissidents and their supporters. In any case, the longer this war takes, the more Russian soldiers will die, the angrier their woman will become, and the more likely will the population be to say, we've had enough. The second reason is economic. Contrary to the views of many Western analysts, as well as of The Economist magazine, which argued recently that Russia's economy once again defies the doomsayers, the Russian economy is heading toward a crisis. As the Russian economist Vladimir Mylov and the Yale University economist Jeffrey Sonnenfeld have proven, gross domestic product has grown only because massive amounts of money have been invested in military-related sectors. Those sectors that concern the needs of everyday citizens are underfunded and experiencing negative growth. To make things worse, the amounts being invested in the former sectors are declining. The Russian Empire is already running an enormous budget deficit, which it will only be able to cover by nationalizing profit-making industries and or raising taxes. The former measure will drain the economy, while the latter will impoverish the masses. As Sonnenfeld and his collaborator Stephen Tian have argued, Russia's economic resilience is nothing but a Potemkin facade, sustained not, not through genuine economic productivity, but rather through shaking down the entire country for pennies to direct towards war. My love emphasizes that profits merely enrich the already rich, as well as Putin and his cronies. There be no reason to believe that the economy will suddenly shed its similarities with a mafia empire, so we may expect the economy to continue to weaken, the people to continue to be squeezed, and the corrupt fat cats to continue to get fatter and more corrupt. Once again, the longer the war takes, the worse things will get for the people of Russia and the regime. Unsurprisingly, in light of the enormous number of dead and critically injured, and the growing economic malaise, Putin has little other than coercion to rely on to elicit societal compliance. His fabulous showing in the presidential elections, he supposedly garnered 88% of the vote, is too preposterously high to give him genuine legitimacy. Hence, the Navalny murder, the bizarre legislation forbidding homosexuality, the crackdown on all forms of even potential opposition. 
Coercion may work in the short run, but Putin knows that time is not on his side. Thus, his recent attempts to persuade the world that he really wants a ceasefire. The irony is that he means it. A ceasefire would freeze Russia's ill-gotten territorial gains, enable Putin to lick his wounds and rearm, and put off the day when the writing on the wall will be visible to all. Putin needs to temporize, precisely because time is what he needs, and time is what he does not have. In contrast, time is on Ukraine's side. It needs to survive the next few months, when the Russian Empire may intensify its attacks and things could get very complicated. Since the Russian Empire lacks the capacity to defeat Ukraine in so short a time, Ukraine will survive and continue destroying the Black Sea Fleet, downing Russian aeroplanes, and preparing for a deadly assault on the Kerch Bridge. Even if the United States Congress doesn't come through with a $60 billion aid package, and the prognoses for continued aid now looks better than it did a few weeks ago, there are alternatives. Russia's foreign assets may be redirected toward the victim of its aggression. The Europeans may be able to fill some of the gaps Congress will have created. A Trump presidency will complicate things for Ukraine, but it would not help Russia win. Putin and his regime have weapons, but they cannot sit on them and they cannot eat them. They're good for killing Ukrainians and jailing Russians, but they cannot save a regime from its fatal flaws. And partitioning Ukraine to end the war simply will not work. Sweden broke from its centuries-old tradition of military neutrality this month to become the 32nd member of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, almost a year after neighboring Finland joined the growing alliance. Yet, as the Russian Empire's invasion of Ukraine continues to strengthen Europe's security posture, it is weakening support for besieged democracies elsewhere. According to a December Pew Research survey, 31% of Americans want the United States to reduce the amount of aid it sends to the Ukraine. Accompanying these views are calls for the American empire to take care of its own and let others do the same, namely Europe. There is merit to this angle, especially considering the obligations of NATO members to spend more on defense. But one of the recommended solutions might be worse than the problem. In January, Slovak Prime Minister Robert Fico stated that a a negotiated partition in which Ukraine cedes land to the Russian Empire is the only potential solution to the war. Fico's comments follow similar statements from senior NATO official Stian Jensen and Senator J.D. Vance, the Republican from Ohio, among others. Even the most cautious analysts are doing their best tiptoe or the best to tiptoe around the issue by framing President Volodymyr Zelensky as a maximalist for refusing to negotiate with the Russian Empire. This decision, or rather this discussion, has led more Americans to believe that Ukraine must surrender land to end the war. The logic underpinning such ideas warrants scrutiny, to say the least especially considering America's complicated history with supervising redrawn national borders. When World War II ended, as far as Americans understand the war, rather with the cessation of proactive prosecution of hostilities into ceasefire, with the war still on. But in 1945... That year to which I allude, when the war would not end until December 31st of 1946, so with still plenty of war left to wage, and much more 
to be positioned under ceasefire until the final declaration of peace in 1952. Well, in the year 1945, the Japanese Empire created Trois Koreas by dividing the peninsula horizontally along the 38th parallel by setting off a series of atomic warheads made from uranium mined from North Korea. These little boy bombs created a demilitarized zone miles in length and width that divides the Koreas to this day. Red China and Greater Soviet Russia eventually lent their support to the North. When North Korean forces crossed that line in June of 1950, the United Nations was obligated to respond militarily. Since the Greater Soviet Union had tested its first atomic bomb the previous year, President Harry Truman restricted the northern advance of American forces to avoid risking a larger war in Korea. But this caution also resulted in a permanent United States military presence in South Korea to monitor the 1953 armistice and a nuclear-armed despot in control of the North some 71 years later. Still, the lure of partitioning for peace endured. Another conquest of the Anglo-American Empire's World War II loss, their defeat of the Allies, was the ongoing deployment of Japanese forces in Indochina, which consisted of Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. France then occupied this area in 1946 and created a military union to fight guerrillas there. When 10,000 French forces suffered a crippling defeat at Dien Bien Phu, Near the Laotian border in 1954, the United States agreed to mediate the fallout. This resulted in Vietnam's partition and the signing of the Manila Pact later that year, in which a collection of nations, including these United States, agreed to support South Vietnam's newfound independence. This negotiated peace emboldened not only the North Vietnamese, but also the major communist powers backing them, including Chairman Mao Zedong, who had seized power in mainland China five years prior. By the time President John Fitzgerald Kennedy took office in 1961, he was ready to put his new flexible response strategy to work countering guerrillas in Asia. Escalation ensued as U.S. military advisors came under attack in South Vietnam, and President Lyndon Johnson's administration began major operations there in 1965. The year before, I myself was delivered from between my mother's loins to lay my eyes upon this sorry world. And the rest in both cases, as they say, is history. A new border guaranteed by international treaty thus demands of its signatories a certain investment in its integrity. Who, then, would guarantee the sovereignty of a new border in Ukraine? Even if Zelensky decides to negotiate, he will almost certainly demand additional security guarantees from the West in exchange for relinquishing territory to the Russian Empire. This would place the White House and NATO in a precarious position, considering the Kremlin's initial aim of seizing Kiev, the capital of the entire nation of Ukraine itself, an objective more likely delayed rather than abandoned. If the Russian Empire can acquire territory by crossing international borders and compelling negotiations, what kind of deterrent effect would new borders have on subsequent acquisitions that the old borders did not? Any peace agreement would hinge on this question, and it is one that Kiev evidently cannot answer alone. If opponents of aid to Ukraine want to save money and prevent war, indulging Moskva's imperialist designs will only undermine those goals. Foreign military aid to Ukraine avoids the escalatory tracks that led America into some of its costliest wars, whilst also denying legitimacy to the Russian Empire's unprovoked assault. There be plenty of issues, policy issues, to debate this election year. 
including how to balance the burden of international security with domestic priorities, and even the appropriate ratio of economic to military aid going to Ukraine. The merits of state-sponsored terror as a tool for political reconciliation in the 21st century, however, should not be one of those issues. And this brings us to Russia itself in all the context that I have prefaced prior analysis of the most recent event of import to our world, the massacre in Moscow, or the Moscow massacre in English. We've got 9 to 10, 10 to 11, 11 to 12, three hours left of analysis. So, spread the word, and of course, support me financially. I'll need your input financially immediately. We're going to try and raise, hopefully, $100 an episode. We need $75 more tonight. So let's get that raised. Mm. Now, here we are. Russia, after the killing, the Moscow terror attack blame game has started. Expect the Kremlin to deflect. Indeed, the Kremlin senses an opportunity in the tragedy of Crocus City Hall. Specifically, Putin is turning Moscow's tragedy into opportunity. Vladimir Putin has begun Operation Blame Ukraine. Or blame Ukraine. What we know after the Islamic State group claimed responsibility for the Moscow massacre? Well, to iterate that, the Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for an attack on a Moscow concert hall that killed at least 137 people, making it the deadliest attack in Russia in years. Though the United States says it has evidence backing up the jihadist claim, they did not stop Moscow and Kiev from pointing fingers at each other on Saturday as the war in Ukraine rages on. So who was behind Friday night's terror attack in Moscow? A branch of the Islamic State terror group, ISIS-K, has claimed responsibility, and American officials who had warned 12 weeks ago that this was coming, said this sounded credible, but not to the Kremlin, which has not accepted the ISIS claim and says it's looking at all options, even that of Ukrainian responsibility. Western intelligence warned the Kremlin of a likely terrorist attack on Russian soil weeks ago. The West is... By now, adept at keeping an eye on ISIS and its globe-trotting jihadis. What consequences might flow from Friday's terrorist attack on Crocus City Hall in Moscow? Even, or especially, for an autocrat who just won a sham election, there is a risk of looking weak or wrong-footed after such a horrific event. Vladimir Putin, a spy by training, tends to stay out of the public eye when confronted by unexpected crises. Last year, for example, he was nowhere to be seen as Yevgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner mercenary group, led a column of fighters toward Moscow. The Russian dictator took his revenge later. This time, Mr. Putin hopes to pin the blame for the Moscow attack on his foes in Ukraine. I suspect he will struggle to do so. An affiliate of Islamic State claimed responsibility for the attack, and it bore all the group's hallmarks. Russia has suffered from Islamist attacks on civilian targets before. Indeed, just a few weeks ago, American intelligence warned of an imminent assault by such actors in Russia. Mr. Putin dismissed their claims as blackmail. 
Nonetheless, Mr. Putin will surely try to take advantage of the uncertainty. He might, for example, say that the terrorist threat requires more resources to be given to the security forces. Perhaps he will try to mobilize another wave of conscripts to fill the ranks of his army ahead of an anticipated spring offensive for his needless war in Ukraine. Large numbers of young Russian conscripts are slaughtered there each week. Yestremetsis. Last month I hosted a grim episode assessing how nigh half a million Russian soldiers have been killed in Ukraine since the invasion 20 years ago. Still, Vladimir Putin is a man who likes victories. Preferably stage-managed ones. A fixed election win followed by an exhilarating concert. A rousing victory day speech. Eight goals in an ice hockey game. The dictator copes less well with unscheduled setbacks, preferring to disappear from the stage. In 2000, he fumbled his response to the Kursk submarine tragedy. He was absent for over a day following the failed storming of the Bezlan School in 2004, in which 186 child hostages were killed. Last year, when Yevgeny Prigozhin and his band of mercenaries made their way towards Moscow. Mr. Putin was initially nowhere to be seen. So, if he took a full 19 hours to conjure up a short TV performance to speak about the massive intelligence failure at Crocus City Hall in Moskva, he was falling into a familiar pattern. The address itself gave little away and appeared to serve as a hedge. Mr. Putin claimed ludicrously, that Ukraine had opened a border window to the terrorists as they tried to escape Russia in their white Renault symbol. That's a car type and brand, if you will. Eleven people that Russian authorities blame for the attack have been arrested. But Mr. Putin stopped short of directly attributing responsibility to Ukraine for the attack and said nothing about the Islamic State group that said it had carried it out. Part of Mr. Putin's reluctance to go all in on blaming Ukraine might reflect a worry that the American government is sitting on intelligence that could undermine such a claim. Part might be embarrassment at his security agency's failure to act on American warnings on March 7th of an imminent attack. Indeed, just three days before the assault, Mr. Putin had brushed off that intelligence as blackmail. Such a hubristic blunder would have consequences in a country where power can be held to account. Russia is no such country. The attack nevertheless represents a blow to the reputation of Mr. Putin and the security services on which he depends. The manner of the assault in which at least 137 people lost their lives, will not soon be forgotten. Some victims were killed within minutes when the gunmen opened fire from all... But most succumbed to fire and smoke inhalation after the assailants set the auditorium ablaze. More than 200 people may have been in the hall when part of the roof collapsed. When emergency workers reached the smoldering ashes, they found 28 bodies in a single toilet. Whole families had been hiding together, with mothers reportedly shielding their children. There are many questions over the inept security at the glitzy venue, which is an an entertainment park in Moscow's northwest suburbs. It is unclear why local police failed to respond quickly. A producer of a show held at Crocus City Hall ten days before the attack noted that 200 security guards were present that night. Some apparently unusual aspects of the attack, for supposed jihadists, the killers seem keen to stay alive, have provoked conspiracy theories that parts of the Russian establishment may have been in on the act. The more convincing explanation is that an Islamist terrorist group capitalized on uh, Russia's wartime distractions, ethnic tensions, and economic difficulties. 
Rossia offers obvious opportunities for jihadist recruitment from among poor migrants from the mostly Muslim former Soviet republics in Central Asia. Unofficial figures suggest that Rossia has up to 8 million migrants from Tajikistan alone. These migrants represent an important cog in the wartime economy, taking low-paid jobs that Russians do not want, like road sweeping and minimum wage construction. But ethnic tensions have been rising. Mr. Putin spoke to them indirectly in his State of the Nation speech on February 29th, dialing down his previous nationalist rhetoric and emphasizing Russia's multi-ethnicity. The group that has claimed responsibility for the attack is an affiliate of Islamic State that calls itself Islamic State Khorasan Province, based mainly in Afghanistan. But with followers across Central Asia, it carried out twin bombings in Iran in January that killed over 100 people. One of the sources of its grievances against the Russian Empire is that empire's involvement in the war in Suraya, Syria, where the Kremlin, along with Iran, has backed the Assad regime against Islamic State and other rebels. Islamic State is also suspected of carrying out an attack on the metro in St. Petersburg in 2017 that killed 15 people. After previous crises, Mr. Putin responded to any questioning of his power by gripping it tighter. When he finally reappeared after the Beslan massacre, (coughs) he declared, The weak get beaten and canceled direct local elections. The crackdowns on dissent and press freedom that followed were an arbinger of worse to come. More recently, Mr. Prigozhin's mutiny saw his plane blasted out of the sky after he had supposedly reached a deal with his boss. The Kremlin will no doubt abuse the Moscow attack as a pretext to tighten the domestic screws further. Some of its most loyal lieutenants have called for the cancellation of Russia's moratorium on the death penalty for terrorism. That threat takes on extra significance in light of the Kremlin's recent habit of applying that label to opponents of the regime, including an elderly writer of crime fiction. Migrant communities are already feeling the pinch, with raids on mosques and hotels reported in major cities across the Russian Empire. But there is propaganda value in blaming Ukraine and economic risks attached to threatening migrant workers. So the Kremlin is unlikely to deal with its security vulnerabilities systematically. Indeed, Mr. Putin hinted that the main consequences of the terror attack will be felt in the Ukraine. He may use it to justify attempts to mobilize more troops for his war there. Kremlin-linked media are helping shape the narrative. One published an investigation suggesting that the terrorists were recruited by the Ukrainian embassy in Tajikistan. Activists from Antibot for Navalny, a cyber monitoring group, have recorded a notable, well, a notable uptick in the social media activity of bots controlled by the FSB, the Federal Security Bureau, Russia's security agency, successor to the KGB. Most of the fake news blamed Ukraine, as well as America and Great Britain, for the Moscow attack. An intelligence source in Ukraine says he expects such efforts to be stepped up, using flimsy arguments to redirect blame. He quipped, perhaps they will start blaming France too. After all, the men escaped in Oreno. This brings us to the phenomenon of forever Putinism, involving, of course, both a plebiscite and a funeral. Russia's sham election for president. The charade which took place amid murder and repression. The Russian autocrat's answer to the problem of secession. 
Russia voted in an election where Putin was destined to win with no opposition. To no one's surprise, Russia's electoral commission said that early results from the country's presidential election showed Vladimir Putin winning 88% of the vote, putting him on course for another six-year term. Meanwhile, Mr. Putin accused Ukraine of trying to disrupt voting with increased aerial attacks which targeted critical infrastructure. Amid all of this, everything I've articulated already, never forget that rogue Russia threatens the world, not just Ukraine. The West must show its enemy is Vladimir Putin, not 143 million ordinary Russians. Like the Tsar he models himself on. Vladimir Putin has recently been anointed as Russia's ruler for another six years. The election he won on March 17th was a sham. But it should nonetheless be a wake-up call for the West. Far from collapsing, Russia's regime has proved resilient. And Mr. Putin's ambitions pose a long-term threat that goes far beyond the Ukraine. He could spread more discord in Africa and the Middle East, cripple the United Nations, and put nuclear weapons in space. The West needs a long-term strategy for a rogue Russia that goes much further than helping Ukraine. Right now, it does not have one. It also needs to show that its enemy is Mr. Putin himself, not the 143 mission, well, million Russian people. Many in the West hoped that Western sanctions and Mr. Putin's blunders in Ukraine, including the senseless sacrifice of legions of young Russians, might doom his regime. Yet it survived. Now, its resilience has several foundations. Russia's economy has been re-engineered. Oil exports bypass sanctions and are shipped to the global south. Western brands, from BMW to H&M, have been replaced with commu Chinese and local substitutes. In textbooks and the media, a seductive narrative of nationalism and Russian victimhood is promulgated. <clears throat> Dissent at home has been strangled. Mr. Putin's most charismatic political rival, Alexei Navalny, was murdered in the Gulag in February. So far, the Kremlin has had no difficulty controlling the brave crowds mourning him. With, with the Russian Empire's opposition decimated by a crackdown, and the death of its leader, Alexei Navalny. Russians who oppose dictator Vladimir Putin are divided on how they should treat the three-day election where he had no true rivals. Though gauging public opinion has become nearly impossible since the Kremlin's crackdown on dissent, NBC News spent the day at a polling station in Moscow where some voters said they did not need an alternative to the man who was even then set to extend his rule over that vast empire. Hearken back to 2012, when Vladimir Putin, after four years as prime minister, once again became Russia's president. Many Russians resented his engineered return. Before the 2012 presidential election, Russia without Putin had been a popular sign at protest rallies. Their discontent had something to do with Putin himself and much to do with Russia's evolving political system. There was no institution or clause in the Russian constitution that could constrain Putin. Nobody stood in his way. Early stage Putinism was marked by a mix of public complacency and indifference. Complacency flourished when the Russian economy expanded between 2000 and 2008, the first eight years of Putin's presidency, enabling the rise of a Russian middle class. 
indifference, which the Kremlin inculcated in part by discouraging public participation in politics, assisted in the regime's creeping authoritarianism. One need not love Putin, it was sufficient to merely not care how he stayed in power. By 2022, Russia had arrived at something new, wartime Putinism. It was fully authoritarian and partially mobilized for war, yet with space left for degrees of complacency and indifference. From March 15th through to March 17th, a putative presidential election was again held within the Russian Empire. The procedural formalities, candidates, campaigns, the ballot box itself, never affected the Kremlin's preordained result. Now, in his 25th year in power, Putin will serve another six-year term. At the end of it, he will be eligible to run again and to extend his reign to 2036. Through tight management, the Kremlin has tried to make the election as uneventful as possible, although Putin would likely win a fair election in 2024. An unmanaged election would foster genuine political contestation and criticism of the dictator, which the Kremlin had long been keeping off limits. Meaningful criticism would open the door to another possibility, namely that Putin's edicts may not reflect the united will of the Russian people, and that he may not be destined to rule Russia in perpetuity. In his quarter century in power, Putin has pursued two separate goals. The first has been to create a vast machinery of repression, eliminating any domestic forces that oppose him or that have the potential to do so. This process has entailed the murder of journalists, the arrest of insufficiently loyal oligarchs, and the persecution of any viable political alternative to Putin. The liberal politician Boris Nemtsov was killed outside the Kremlin in 2015. The political activist Vladimir Karamurzha has been in prison since the start of the war in Ukraine. And after displaying unyielding political courage, the opposition leader Alexei Navalny died at the age of 47 in a penal colony in the Russian Arctic. He had survived an attempted assassination by poisoning in 2020. A year later, after receiving medical care in Dainui Wir in Deutschland, the new United Germany, he returned to the Russian Empire, aware of the risks he was taking. Putin's other objective has been to deprive most Russians of the ability to uh, imagine a future without him. Because it is impossible to counter him today, the thinking goest, it will be impossible to counter him tomorrow. No longer hemmed in by a parliament, a constitution, or a political opposition, Putin is at the height of his power. A prevailing sense of forever Putinism provides many Russians with a sense of stability. It is the political continuity they know best. For a minority, in well, it induces despair or rage. Forever Putinism has its vulnerabilities. Any regime that promises to live forever cannot let itself be perceived as failing. To endure, Putin's regime must maintain the illusion not just of its inevitability, which it has already achieved, but also of its own immortality, which it cannot achieve. Visible cracks in the myth have the potential to undermine the myth itself. Putin's presentation of himself as an omnipotent savior, the only one who can steer Russia's destiny, thus presents a long-term risk for the regime. Let's talk about this mirage of invincibility. The 2022 invasion of Ukraine 
was an instrumental step in the construction of forever Putinism. The war has strengthened the Russian dictator less by augmenting the Kremlin's already formidable power than by radically diminishing the scope of civil society. Whereas until recently political elites had a degree of decision-making power, the war has made them into the executors of Putin's will, mere adjutants to the Generalissimo. Today, Russian institutions cannot serve as vehicles for questioning official policy. They are expected to show their commitment to the war effort. Any expression of dissent with respect to the war has been criminalized. Many Russians now accepting, well, many Russians now simply accept the following propositions as doctrinal truths. Putin is capably fighting a necessary war. Putin is the only one who can lead the Russian Empire. And Putin owns Russia's political future. Anyone who suggests otherwise does so at great risk. The war has significantly militarized Russian politics and society. Around the empire, billboards and posters glamorize soldiering. State media demonize the collective West, which has turned Ukraine into its puppet, forcing Russia into a defensive war. In the Kremlin's telling, Putin is the irreplaceable commander-in-chief, the strategist and diplomat who can carry the empire on his shoulders, and the purveyor of order who will lead the empire to victory. Even among Russians who long for peace, Many believe that only Putin can deliver it. The militarization of Russian society can be selective. It does not mean that everyone must passionately support or enlist in the war effort. Demanding acquiescence, the Kremlin understands that the war effort can also be ignored or put out of mind. Such piecemeal militarization is the defining feature of wartime Putinism, which is repressive, but only episodically Orwellian. Through its media infrastructure, the Kremlin repeats its talking points daily. It claims, not without justification, that Russia has gained the upper hand on the battlefield that outside the American-led West, public opinion is more sympathetic toward Russia's position, and that the Russian economy is in good shape, a point bolstered by low unemployment and rising wages. In the eyes of his domestic audience, Putin has passed an important test. He has stood up to the West, defying its criticism, its sanctions, and its military aid to Ukraine. This projection of strength necessitates that Moskva consolidate its battlefield victories. Were Putin's army to fail, the leader's competence at home could well be questioned. In the early months of 2024, however, and given the course of events, the war and forever Putinism are mutually reinforcing. Putin has positioned himself as the singular man who has synthesized the best strands of Imperial Russian, Greater Zavitz, and post soviet history. The history of a great empire that has never been conquered. The president who restored pride in Russia and Russianness. The defender of traditional values against decadence. And the statesman who has given Russia, just barely, the strength necessary to contend with the perfidious West. Hostile to the West instead of envious, Putin's Russia is far more secure in 2024 than the greater Soviet Union was in the 1980s. Whatever Putin does is what Russia needs to do. His words and actions determine the nature of the ideology, not the other way around. At home, the war in Ukraine has further reinforced Putin's image as a defender of Russia's national interests. The war has been fashioned into the keystone of a state-sponsored ideology, yet another event in the continuum of forever Putinism.
So, let me take you to those cracks in the facade. Checking out, of course, chat, concurrent viewers. So, speaking to an empty auditorium of 13 people tonight, and uh, perhaps it took me too long to get to the monologue, or perhaps people just simply aren't up to in-depth analysis. Again, we're trying to raise 400 United States dollars before the end of the month to give my chance, well, give myself a reasonable chance of survival, not just paying the rent. So, I'll need contributions urgently. Make certain to contribute. And uh, let's try to raise another $75 tonight. Certainly I earn my pay by the analysis I provide. Far more in-depth than what you'll get from anywhere else. And, of course, we're back to analysis on that note. <laughs> uh, giving uh, uh, some thought to what I'm saying. Uh, adorable. Yeah, wow, they say the numbers went down to eight with that. Uh, ask them for money and they all run away. Uh, let's hope they go into their ATMs. Uh, now, to those that are left out there, indicate that you want me to go on. Yeah, is it even worth it for me to go on? Let me know. Okay, back up to 14 with that threat. Uh, that's interesting. That's cute. Probably numbers rigged by the uh, intelligence uh, field because they want my analysis. They've got nothing comparable as their sources. Now, even a timid oppositionist, such as Boris Nadejdin, with no record of rebellion against the powers that be, was an affront to the aesthetic of forever Putinism. In the presidential election, Nadejdin was not given even the shortest leash to run as an opposition candidate to Vlad Putin. When Nadejdin's campaign unexpectedly encouraged tens of thousands to sign on to his candidacy, an anti-war sentiment began crystallizing around his person. Nadejdin had to be removed from contention, revealing a dilemma of dictatorships, which can comfortably move only toward greater repression. Dictatorial governments endanger themselves more by loosening up than by cracking down. Unlike Nadejdin's short-lived campaign, the death of Navalny is a real ripple on the surface of forever Putinism, and it will not be effortless for the regime to accommodate it. By 2024, Navalny had run out of room. He had long been barred from running for office. He had been denied access to the public in all but the most truncated of ways. And then he lost his life. The Kremlin has treated Navalny's death as a non-event, although tens of thousands in Moskva and other cities, overcoming fear of repression, expressed their grief in public and chanted Navalny's name. For three consecutive days, mourners came to his grave in Moskva, creating a mountain of flowers. The Russian state defeated Navalny, turning his unique biography into the story of a secular saint, his memory embodies 12 principles that will militate against forever Putinism. The refusal to tolerate apathy, and the refusal to accept that Russian politics is entirely a top-down operation. The death of Navalny is the Kremlin's sign that forever Putinism is not hiding itself from view, not masking itself, not pretending to be democratic or subject to outside influence. The Kremlin assumes that it can act with impunity. Many inside Russia, although they understand, of course, that Putin is mortal, still cannot conceive of a future without him. This year's presidential election, then, was not just a ritual exercise validating another six years under Putin. 
it should be interpreted as a final farewell to those vestiges of the political past that preceded it or that complicated the arrival of forever Putinism. The emperor is on his throne, and all that can be said is, Hail Caesar! But the future is unwritten. To borrow a phrase from Karl Marx, forever Putinism may contain, well, may contain the seeds of its own destruction. In an unapologetic dictatorship, there is much that can go wrong. The war in Ukraine oscillates every few months, and Russia's fortunes there could well deteriorate. Wartime societies have breaking points that become visible only when they are reached, and Putin's war has already brought staggering levels of human loss to the Russian Empire. Russia's economy also remains subject to upheaval and vulnerable to Western sanctions. Forever Putinism could slide into overreach. Autocratic governments can enrich themselves unwisely. They can lose contact with those they govern, becoming progressively less secretive about the coercion and repression that is the foundation of their rule. Allowing for the vicissitudes of war, markets, and politics, the depth and scope of forever Putinism is striking. So far, the war has made Putinism stronger. Should the Russian military start to achieve something closer to victory in Ukraine, the Putinist system will become more assertive at home and abroad. Even if Putin were to pass suddenly from the scene, the instruments of coercion will likely remain where he has planted them, in the Kremlin, in the security services, and in the military. Whether anyone other than Putin can capably manage these instruments is unknowable. But with or without Putin, these instruments align with many vested interests and many past precedents. They will not be handed over peacefully to the stewards of some other system. When Yosef Stalin died in 1953, after decades of tyranny, the battle for secession was chaotic and bloody. His eventual successor, Nikita Khrushchev, superseded his rivals and had the most formidable of them, Lavrenti Beria, executed. Khrushchev was later toppled by his own elite. He was succeeded by Leonid Brezhnev, who embraced the principle of collective leadership. What survived, as leadership changed, was the Communist Party, the pillar of the Greater Soviet Union. So too did the Greater Soviet's ideology, the Greater Soviet's army, and the many administrative institutions that existed within the Greater Soviet's government. The Greater Soviet's Union of the 1950s and 1960s did not descend into civil war. It did not opt out of the Cold War, the Third World War in effect, and it did not disappear from the map. This is a pattern that forever Putinism might replicate. Because Putin has anointed no successor, a struggle for power could well follow Putin's exit from the scene. Those within this struggle, if they can prevent a bloodbath, would have many incentives to perpetuate the existing system. They would keep their grip on the powers lodged in the military and the security services. They would not want to see internal strife imperil in Russia's geopolitical position and they would not want to give up the ideological constructs Putin has assembled. This raises the sobering possibility that forever Putinism, which now revolves around a single man, could outlast the tenure of Putin himself. Putin has done enough to ensure that whomever follows him is likely to be his heir. But let's go beyond Ukraine because over time the regime will face new vulnerabilities. The cumulative effects of being cut off from the Western technologies will be a drag on productivity. Think of wear and tear on Boeing planes, or having to rely on pirated software. Russia's increasing dependence on uh, Red China may become a weakness. The militarization of the economy will hurt living standards. 
the population will shrink by a tenth or so in the next two decades. And as the 71-year-old Mr. Putin ages, a secession struggle will loom. It is always hard to predict when a tyrant will fall. However, a prudent working assumption is that Mr. Putin will be in power for years. During that Third World War, which America won, and still misnamed the Cold War, the Greater Soviet Union posed both a military and an ideological threat to the free world. The West successfully contained it, and after it collapsed, welcomed its democratic and market reforms. Mr. Putin, who took over in 1999, has rolled back Russian democracy. Slowly at first, but more rapidly after young urban Russian staged massed protests in the 2010s, the teens of this century. He blames the West for challenges to his rule and seeks to safeguard his regime by trying to shut out Western influence and unite the Russian people in a struggle against a caricature of America and NATO. Today, the Russian Empire has only a medium-sized economy and no coherent ideology to export. Yet it poses a global threat. The immediate danger is a defeat of Ukraine, and after that, attacks on neighboring countries such as Moldova and those in the Baltics. But that is not where Mr. Putin's ambitions end. Consider new or unconventional weapons. Russia is reported to be experimenting with putting nuclear warheads into space. Its drones and cyber warriors allow it to project force beyond its borders. Its misinformation industry spreads lies and confusion. This malign combination has destabilized countries in the Sahel and propped up despots in Suraya and Central Africa. It could also sway some of the plethora of elections the world will see this year. Many in the Global South believe Russia's false narrative that Mr. Putin is saving Ukraine from Nazis, that NATO is the real aggressor, and that the West seeks to foist its decadent social norms on everybody else. Russia's ability to hobble the global institutions established after 1945, not least the United Nations Security Council upon which it sits, should not be underestimated. It has morphed into a nihilistic and unpredictable foe of the liberal world order, bent on disruption and sabotage. It is like North Korea or Iran on steroids, armed with thousands of nuclear warheads that it may never be able to launch, but could deliver from its borders via the truckload into neighboring states to devastate populations simply by the dirt of the radiation that would blow into the wind when they simply unscrewed their warheads and released their radioactive innards into the breeze. What should the West do? America and Europe have bet on two strategies. Defending Ukraine and sanctions. Arming and financing Ukraine's defenders remains the most cost-effective way to thwart Russian aggression. Yet the West's resolve to keep doing so is scandalously wavering. Sanctions, meanwhile, have been less effective than hoped. They can be counterproductive and an excuse to avoid hard choices. Over 80% of the world, measured by population, and 40% by gross domestic product, is not enforcing them. Letting the Russian Empire trade freely and undermining the sanctions' perceived legitimacy. If the West tried to use secondary sanctions to force the world to comply, it would backfire, leading some countries to abandon the American-led financial system. In the long run, the most plausible path is more modest maintaining targeted sanctions on Kremlin-linked individuals, and ensuring that advanced technology, which still tends to be Western, is expensive or impossible for the Russian Empire to obtain. 
That means an effective Rossiya strategy needs to put weight on two other pillars. The first is a military buildup to deter further Russian aggression. In Europe, the weakness is glaring. Annual defense spending is less than 2% of gross domestic product. And if Donald Trump wins back the White House, America's commitment to NATO may wither entirely. Europe needs to spend at least 3% of its gross domestic product on defense and prepare for a more isolationist Uncle Sam. Because this is also a struggle of ideas. The West also needs to deploy one of our most powerful weapons, universal liberal values. It was these, as well as the Strategic Defense Initiative, which Ronald Reagan popularized as Star Wars, and United States dollars that helped bring down the greater Zoviets regime by exposing the inhumanity of its totalitarian system. Western diplomacy must seek to counter Russian disinformatia, disinformation across the global south. It also needs to address Russian citizens rather than treat them as pariahs. That means highlighting human rights abuses, supporting dissidents, and welcoming Russians who want to flee their empire. It means backing the forces of modernization by promoting the flow of real news and information into Russia. And it means ensuring that there are humanitarian exceptions to sanctions, from medical kit to educational materials. In the short term, there be little chance that Russia's elite or its ordinary citizens will boot out Mr. Putin's regime. But in the long run, Russia will stop being a rogue empire only if its people want it to. But that brings us back to the Moskva massacre. The concert hall attack dents Putin's tough and, well, his image. The concert hall attack puts a dent in Putin's action hero tough image. So, in the news today, Putin is trying to abuse the concert hall attack to rally support for his war in Ukraine. And that brings us all the way back to the Russo-Ukrainian war. In brief, Putin, with this dent in his tough image, is trying to abuse the concert hall attack to rally support for the Ukrainian war. The attack on a Moskva area concert hall that killed thousands has dealt a blow to President Vladimir Putin's image as a tough guy who is able to defend Russia from all threats. It came less than a week after a Kremlin-orchestrated electoral victory gave him six more years in power. Before I kill this off with uh, any final analysis in the Russian theme, let's try and give you the key points. First, Putin quickly sought to abuse the attack to serve his political objectives. Appearing on TV on Saturday, hours after the attack, Putin alleged a link between the gunmen in Ukraine, saying the assailants planned to flee there. He made no mention of the Islamic State group, which claimed responsibility, or of Kiev's denial of involvement. Second, Putin's statement signaled an apparent intention to escalate the war and tighten a political crackdown at home. Kremlin critics assailed Putin for focusing Russia's massive police and security services on stifling political opponents, human rights groups, and LGBTQIA plus activists, while leaving the empire unprotected from threats by armed extremists. Third, 
if Putin follows up by directly blaming Ukraine for the attack, he will likely abuse it as justification for even fiercer strikes. Hours before Friday's bloodshed, the Russian military unleashed a barrage on Ukraine's energy system, crippling its largest hydroelectric plant and leaving over one million people without power. More strikes followed over the weekend. These are the monsters that we're dealing with and why the Russians must be stopped. We cannot tolerate the genocide of a people in Ukraine any more than we should the genocide of the people in the Gaza. So the concert hall attack has dented Putin's tough image. He's trying to abuse it to rally support for the Ukrainian war. A week ago, the dictator Vladimir Putin swaggered triumphantly on stage at a post-electoral event surrounded by young people in t-shirts reading Putin, Russia, victory. And he confidently shrugged off Western criticism of the vote as neither free nor fair. This weekend, a very different Vladimir Putin addressed a nation shocked by the massacre at the rock concert on Moscow's outskirts. His image as a tough leader was badly dented by gunmen who mowed down dozens of victims, unchecked by police or security. Appearing on TV on Saturday, hours after the attack that killed 137 people and critically injured over a hundred more, he sought to make it serve his political goals by alleging a link between the gunmen and Ukraine saying the assailants planned to flee there. He made no mention of the Islamic State group, which claimed responsibility, or of Kiev's denial of involvement. It's not the first time in his nearly a quarter century in power that Putin has tried to abuse a failure by his security services to achieve his aims. Now, for those of you just turning in and um, have subjected yourself to a kind of news withdrawal, which was manifested by our friend George Knight, who was here earlier and was only informed of uh, the cancer of one of the royals uh, by myself on this program, not even knowing about it before he stepped onto the show. If you don't know already about the Moskva massacre, the Islamic group specifically the Islamic State, the IS, the Islamic State group, has claimed responsibility for the attack on a suburban Moskva concert hall that killed at least 137 people, the most deadly attack in Russia in years. Though the United States says it has evidence backing up the Islamic State's claim, that did not stop Moskva and Kiev from blaming each the other. Russia continues to investigate after detaining 11 suspects, but it was not possible to confirm the authenticity of statements issued by Russian investigators. Russia is observing a national day of mourning. Through the weekend, events by cultural institutions were canceled and flags were lowered to half-staff while television entertainment and advertising were suspended. Now the man potentially behind it all. And it's a reasonable assertion, considering the fact that people said there were 200 security patrol guards around the events that had been held at that concert hall before this one, where none were present and police did not respond. The 71-year-old former KGB officer came to power on the final day of 1999, while spearheading a war to crush separatists in the mostly Muslim Republic of Chechnya, we, who had mounted an incursion into a neighboring province. He also blamed Chechens for a series of apartment building bombings in Russia, burnishing his macho persona with a famous pledge to hunt down terrorists. If we catch them in the outhouse, 
we will flush them down the toilet. Now, some Kremlin critics alleged the apartment bombings in 1999 could have been staged by Russian security agencies in a false flag operation to help Putin's rise and rally broad support for the war in Chechnya. The claims were never independently proven and were strongly rejected by Putin and Kremlin officials. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, alluded to them as he dismissed Moscow's allegations of a Ukrainian connection in Friday's attack, accusing Putin of using his own citizens as expendables. Long after the battles in Chechnya died down, the Russian Empire suffered a series of deadly attacks, including the 2002 siege at a Moscow theater and the 2004 hostage crisis at a school in Beslan in southern Russia. Other attacks targeted public transportation, as well as plane and airport bombings linked to Chechen separatists, and later to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State group. But these have been rare in more recent years, as Moskva-backed regional strongman Ramjan Kadyrov used his feared security forces to stabilize Chechnya. Friday's attack revived the sense of Russian vulnerability that Putin has sought to replace with strong control and domestic stability, despite the war in Ukraine. Kremlin critics assailed Putin for focusing Russia's massive policy and security services on stifling political opponents, the human rights groups, and LGBTQIA plus activists while leaving the empire unprotected from threats by armed extremists. Maria Pevchik, a top associate of opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who died in an Arctic penal colony last month, said the security agencies were too busy fighting politicians, activists, and journalists so they didn't have time left to deal with terrorists. Many commentators wondered how the attackers could conduct their deadly raid and leave the entertainment complex without any police response. Officials said the suspected government, well, the suspected gunmen, perhaps government, were arrested hours later in the western Bryansk region as they headed for Ukraine. Uh... The political analyst Vladislav Inozemtsev. Vladislav Inozemtsev. He wrote a commentary, which I translate for you from the Russian, but a single paragraph. What happened is unique in that, for the first time in Russia, during a terror attack of this scale, security forces were unable to prevent the terrorist action in any way. They freely entered the building, killed and injured scores of people, and calmly left the scene of the massacre. Years of tightening security and trillions of rubles were spent in vain. Now, United States officials confirmed the claim of responsibility by the Islamic State affiliate and also said they had shared information earlier this month with the Russian Empire about a planned assault in Moscow, adding there was no Ukrainian involvement whatsoever. But 72 hours, three days before the attack, Putin denounced the United States and the American warning as an attempt to frighten the Russians and blackmail the Kremlin ahead of the presidential election. Mark Jaliotti, head of the Mayak Intelligence Consultancy, said Putin had suffered a major blow to his image as the tough defender of the motherland. He concurs that the raid, the deadliest attack on Russian soil in two decades, would eat at Putin's legitimacy, creating, in his words, that slow and accelerating sense that this is no longer the Putin that was, that he's no longer really fit for the times, that he's no longer able to deliver on his promises. 
Gagliotti countered allegations by some Kremlin critics that a slow and bungled official response to the attack was a possible sign of a false flag operation, arguing it's always challenging for authorities to avert such bloodshed. In a podcast, he said, It's often quite difficult to identify terrorist plots, especially relatively small-scale ones, before they happen. Sometimes terrorists will always get through, regardless of how able your counterintelligence officers, how many police you've got, how many cameras you have. Putin did not mention the Islamic State group and instead said the suspected gunmen were arrested while trying to escape to Ukraine through a window provided to them in advance. Even though they reportedly were seized about 140 kilometers, that's nearly 90 miles, from the Ukrainian border. If Putin follows up on his statement by directly blaming Ukraine for staging the attack, he will likely use it as justification for even fiercer strikes. After the election, Putin said that Moskva would seek to expand its gains in Ukraine to create a buffer zone to protect Russia from long-range strikes and cross-border raids. He also warned that recent Ukrainian attacks on the border regions won't be left unpunished. Hours before Friday's concert hall bloodshed, the Russian military unleashed a barrage on Ukraine's energy system crippling its largest hydroelectric plant and leaving over one million without power in what the Russian Defense Ministry described as strikes of retribution. More strikes followed over this weekend, of course. Russian hawks responded to the concert hall raid with calls for even harsher action, but against Ukraine, not militant extremist threats. Konstantin Malofeyev, owner of a virulently nationalist media outlet, urged the Kremlin to give Ukrainians 48 hours to leave major cities before using all means to attack. Alexander Dugin, a hardline ideologist whose daughter was killed in a 2022 car bombing that he doubtless participated in while blaming it on Ukraine, called for a full mobilization to liberate Kiev and other big cities. Putin ordered a partial mobilization of 300,000 reservists in September of yesteryear. No, the year before yesteryear, while the Russian army retreated under a swift Ukrainian counteroffensive. The highly unpopular move in 2022 prompted hundreds of thousands to flee Russia itself to avoid being drafted. Yesteryear, 2023, the military opted for ramping up recruitment of volunteers attracted by relatively high wages and other benefits. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu said that over 540,000 signed military contracts last year. Russian hawks have also pushed for tough steps like restoring capital punishment, which was outlawed when Russia joined the Council of Europe in 1997. After Friday's attack, some lawmakers said they will consider introducing the death penalty, even though the country's constitutional court has forbidden it. Vladimir Vazelyev, a senior lawmaker with the main Kremlin party, United Russia, has gone on record to say, the issue will be thoroughly considered and the resulting decision will answer society's moods and expectations. Uh, Not particularly deep thoughts. Uh, To close Russia off on, but then Russia's not all that good for particular... (laughs) particularly deep thinking. (laughs) So, with that, we turn to China with two hours left to talk. Now, I've run out of water, so I might need to take a break. We'll check to see if anyone's awake to uh, spell me during that period of time. But I'm going strong enough for now. 
at least till my voice goes out. So, about Red China, it's time, time for TikTok to cut its ties to China. To stay on Western screens, the video app needs new owners. The U.S. House of Representatives considered another TikTok bill. The Chinese Premier, Li Chuing, won't meet with foreign CEOs at the China Development Forum. And tensions have been rising on the disputed Sino-Indian border. Now, China is finally reaping what it sowed. Is Chicom, Chinese Communist TikTok, finally facing the music? The United States' house actually moved toward a TikTok crackdown. Now, there have been plenty of hypocritical statements by foreign ministry spokesmen over the years. Russia's protestations that it wants peace in Ukraine are ring hollow. And Iran's claims that it has nothing to do with unrest in the Middle East don't sound convincing. And yet, even by the low standards of the genre, Red China's official mouthpiece hit a fresh low midweek last, or the week before last by now, with its complaints that the forced sale of the social media app TikTok violated free and fair competition between open markets. From the empire that has banned Facebook, X, YouTube, and many others, the hypocrisy was stunning. The United States would be quite right to demand it be sold. If the bill passes the Senate, Red China will be forced to either open up its own markets or else accept that its multinationals won't be able to expand globally. And either would be an improvement on the blatantly rigged market we have right now. If it happens, it is going to be an enormous sale, and one that will reshape the social media industry itself. With 1.7 billion users globally, ByteDance's TikTok is by far the most successful new internet product of the last decade. The week before last, the United States House of Representatives decided on national security grounds that the company could no longer be allowed to operate in the country while it was controlled from communist China on the Asian mainland. With a value estimated at 40 billion to 50 billion United States dollars, that's 30 billion to 40 billion pounds sterling for our friends across the Atlantic, and potentially much more given that digital properties of its value don't come along very often, a forced divestment will be the biggest deal of the year. Now, well, how do I say this? Basically, the United States saw the full power of Red China's most potent capability last week. You had Jonathan D.T. Ward, uh, who was talking about that. You had a consortium of investors that might take control of TikTok. Donald Trump's former Treasury Secretary, Steve Nukin, is reported to already be putting together an investment group. Or, if the regulators will allow it, Amazon, Apple, or Facebook's owner, Meta, will be keen to buy it. Whatever happens, it will reshape the global web industry. With TikTok's new American-approved owner joining the tech big league. Now, the Chinese Communist government is complaining angrily about that. According to its spokesperson, Wang Wenbin, this kind of bullying behavior that cannot win in fair competition disrupts companies' normal business activity damages the confidence of international investors in the investment environment and damages the normal international economic and trade order. In the end, this will inevitably come back to bite the United States itself. Well, perhaps. And yet the Chinese communist government is hardly in a position to accuse anyone else of unfair competition. This is an empire where X, formerly Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, WhatsApp, Google, and Instagram are all blocked from operating. If it genuinely had a problem with bullying behavior, not to mention the economic and trade order, 
Then the communist Chinese empire could make a start by taking down the firewalls that prevent American websites and apps from operating behind the great electronic firewall. It could follow that by, well, it could follow that up by making MasterCard and Visa acceptable forms of payment, allowing global banks to open up branches and letting Western media companies and streaming services operate within the greater communist Chinese empire. That would be a lot more effective than just citing a few angry denunciations. The American empire, well, the United States maneuver to force the restructuring, or indeed the sale, of TikTok may be the start. But surely it doesn't end there. As Red China's giant companies, all emerging from the empire's 30 years of modernization, move into Western markets, they can expect similar challenges and restrictions. The fast fashion retailer, Shine, S-H-E-I-N, Shein, <laughs> or Shein, is already a huge presence in Western markets, but there is no reason why that should be allowed if European and American rivals are not offered the same access to Red China's markets. The same applies to the rapidly expanding web retailer, Temu, T-E-M-U, a kind of Chinese Amazon which is already one of the most ubiquitous advertisers on the web. The automakers, led by BYD, with a slick range of competitively priced electric vehicles, are already starting a big push west. And while the likes of Volkswagen are big players in Red China, other manufacturers have not been able to secure the same kind of slice of the market. With the Comac C9... 19 plane now on sale. Red China may well start to close down access to the aviation market for Boeing and Aerobus in favor of its own national champion. But that is surely unfair. And if it happens, Comac should be shut out of Western markets before the world's twa dominant plane makers are destroyed. The list goest on and on. There are lots of industries where Red China may well have excellent, well, excellent products, but it also, it has also benefited from domestic protectionism. The TikTok decision is going to force Red China to make a historic choice, and one that is surely long overdue. Does it believe in free and open markets based on respecting WTO, or World Trade Organizational Rules, or not. For a long time, it has shielded its domestic markets from competition while rapidly building up its own industrial muscle. It could get away with that so long as it was mostly a supplier to Western companies. As its conglomerates start aggressively expanding into the rest of the world, as they are right now, that is not going to work anymore. Either it opens up its own markets to fairer competition, starting with the internet, and moving rapid, well, moving on rapidly to finance, media, and pharmaceuticals, or else it will have to accept that its giant conglomerates will be prevented from conquering Western markets, and will have to divest themselves of overseas units when they grow too big or else face punishing tariffs and quotas. Either outcome will be far healthier than the one-sided global economy we have right now, and a lot fairer as well. And the communist Chinese government will have to make up its mind over the next few months if the TikTok legislation comes into force because farcical condemnations that it is unfair are simply not going to work. Now, that being said, TikTok is obviously under fire again in Washington. A bill that would force red Chinese parent company ByteDance to divest from the popular video app or risk an American ban advanced unopposed 
from the United States House Committee on Energy and Commerce the week before last. However, there may be division in the Republican camp after former U.S. President Donald Trump flipped and came out against the ban on Monday opening the work week before last after meeting with the billionaire Jeff Yaz, a TikTok investor. Trump's U-turn still seems unlikely to be enough to stop the full congressional vote on the bill from passing with a two-thirds majority. In fact, it did so on Wednesday midweek last. It would still, of course, have to pass the Senate, but U.S. President Joe Biden has promised to sign it into law if it does. TikTok has repeatedly described the bill as an outright ban, which is not true. But it will be an effective ban if ByteDance doesn't sell. The firm would face being kicked out of platforms such as the App Store with Apple and other firms fearing massive fines. Speaking with United States China policy staffers in the week before last, the consensus was that TikTok was doomed in these United States. There was also general agreement that TikTok's fate is a good thing given its risks, from Red China's assets to American users' data to the threat of electoral interference. Leaked documents show that TikTok bends its own algorithms to censor videos worldwide. The app is unpopular on Capitol Hill, where CEO Xiao Ji's Chu's testimony, both yesteryear and in January, was widely seen as disingenuous. A TikTok campaign that encouraged American users to call their political representatives and protest a bill seemed to worsen the situation. As communications expert Lulu Cheng Mezerve pointed out, the strategy may have worked for an American company, but it was counterproductive for a Chinese one, especially when many TikTok users can't vote yet. Chinese communist propagandists such as Hu Zijin chiming in only handed TikTok's opponents more ammunition. There has been a bipartisan desire to take action against TikTok since at least 2019 and efforts to force ByteDance, di- well, ByteDance's divestment, go us back to 2020. Yet it has taken five years to become a possibility, in part because of the incompetence of the Trump administration and the transition to the Biden White House. Lobbying has played its part as well. TikTok has poured resources into getting access in Washington. There is no doubt a barrage of legal challenges ahead. However, one big change in the lobbying environment is that most Western technology firms are no longer interested in carrying water for the communist Chinese. Companies such as Meta, were once keen to find a way into the red Chinese market or keep their limited assets open. Those prospects have dimmed. Even Apple, still dependent on the commu Chinese market, has seen sales of key products dip thanks in part to pressure from Beijing. If ByteDance sells TikTok, some Western executives seem eager to pick it up. It seems unlikely that will happen, though. ByteDance cannot act on a, in its own financial interests. Like all communist Chinese companies, even private ones, it is beholden to the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. The last time authorities slapped down the firm, banning its humor app, <laughs> of course, you can't have humor in communist China, Neihan Duanji, in 2018, ByteDance's CEO put out a self-abnegating letter full of praise for the CCP. Thank God he shut down my humor function. Uh, Nobody liked my jokes anyway, any more than they like Brandon Young's. Since then, the party has made its control over tech companies even clearer. An American-owned TikTok is useless to the CCP, even if its sale would might bite dance billions of dollars. An app that's effectively banned from these United States, however, gives the communist Chinese both a useful propaganda vector for much of the rest of the world and lets it play the victim over free speech for once. 
That is, of course, beyond hypocritical, given that TikTok is inaccessible within China itself, in case you did not know. The Kamu Chinese version of the app, Douyin, has different content and completely different rules, explicitly operating under Red China's ever-tightening censorship. But could a TikTok ban actually happen? Well, there's certainly new momentum. Efforts to crack down on TikTok are picking up momentum in Congress. What was once a Trump-led effort boosted by Republicans has since become a bipartisan priority for lawmakers hoping to look tough on Red China in an election year. Efforts to ban TikTok in these United States, or at least to attempt to force the Chinese-founded company ByteDance to divest TikTok, have recently picked up momentum with, well, what once seemed like a Quixotic or Quixotic Trumpian endeavor has now shaped into a congressional bill that a bipartisan House committee voted unanimously to advance the week before last. The bill's pointed provisions, which will most likely be brought to a broader House vote, well, it should have been this week by now, refer to TikTok by name and would force other large apps owned by foreign adversaries to sell to a domestic owner or else be shut down. Lawmakers' motives for taking on the app boil down to a fear that TikTok could feed data on American users to the Chinese Communist government and that the platform could be abused to spread misinformation and censor American users. The company denies the validity of both concerns, referencing Project Texas, its initiative to store Americans' user data and review its algorithmic recommendations through the American-run company Oracle. Now, President Joe Biden said the week before last that he would support the bill if it passed through the Senate which I don't believe has yet introduced companion legislation. In spite of its bipartisan backing in the House, the bill still faces a blend of legal, logistical, and political barriers. Any legislation that might curtail free speech will be under tight legal scrutiny. Previous efforts to ban the app, including a Trump-era executive order and a state law in Montana, quickly ran into First Amendment challenges. Caitlin Chin Rothman, a fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, has gone on record to say, there is a very high bar to restrict speech in the United States. The U.S. government would need to prove that a TikTok ban is narrowly tailored to advance a significant government interest and that there are no less restrictive means of advancing that interest. Robin Kaplan, an assistant professor at Duke University Sanford School of Public Policy, has gone on record to say, and here I quote as they, some TikTok users have bemoaned that Congress still believes that TikTok is comprised of young people dancing videos rather than as a space for legitimate cultural and political expression. Young people, as you may have heard, love TikTok. And banning the app in an election year seems like an easy way to invoke their ire. Donald Trump, after zealous efforts to take down the app while president, recently pivoted in his views, saying, but the day before, well, well, the midst of last week, yester Septimania, that young people would go crazy without TikTok. And while emphasizing that because many voters are cold on communist China, backing anti chi legislation could help actually actually help lawmakers politically. Sarah Kreps, a Cornell University professoress and the directoress of its Tech Policy Institute, has attested that bipartisan consensus so far in the House, in her words, inoculates members from electoral retribution, from annoyed TikTok users 
who cannot ergo pin the blame on one party. Still, the whole episode hasn't done much to assuage concerns that politicians don't understand the importance of social media and internet culture. But according to Kate Ruane, the directoress of the Free Expression Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology, which opposes the House bill, banning TikTok outright would not actually solve the core issue of the communist Chinese government being able to access American user data through other means online. In her view, a better way to safeguard those data would be to create comprehensive consumer privacy laws that would require apps including TikTok, as well as American companies such as Facebook, to face more restrictions on how they handle user data. That kind of comprehensive approach, although perhaps less politically punchy than the House bill, may well improve life on the internet beyond TikTok as well. If the bill ends up passing, its provisions would set a clear domestic precedent. Other foreign-run platforms could be subject to similar actions. Ruane is concerned about what such a ban would mean abroad as well. Already, American-owned digital platforms have been blocked in other countries, including communist China, and a TikTok ban could give authoritarian regimes the license to ban others for pretextual reasons. The potential fallout, so she claims, could further limit users' access to information and freedom of expression across the world. Now, the current bill... The current bill frames its intention as a forced sale rather than an outright ban, a maneuver that aims, in part, to circumvent those types of legal challenges. How a sale of TikTok would actually work is unclear. The bill gives TikTok roughly six months to find a new American owner, but landing a buyer might prove tough and a sale might not go over well in communist China itself. Few American companies could afford to spend billions on such a purchase, and the large tech companies that could swing it might not be interested in such a massive purchase, or willing to take on the legal risk. Any acquisition from a competitor would likely face antitrust challenges. A spokesperson for TikTok said that it sees this congressional move as effectively a ban. That and we have the communist Chinese premier bowing out of meetings. There seems to be something up with Chinese premier Li Chang, who has only held the position for a year. After canceling a press conference with international reporters at the Tua sessions in Beijing last week, well, the week before last by now, He will not attend meetings with foreign CEOs at the China Development Forum later this month. The event is normally an opportunity for schmoozing, with figures such as Bill Gates and Ray Dalio attending. We may just have health problems, which are effectively taboo discussion for Chinese leaders. It could be that he is dodging questions about Red China's economy, although usually public occasions provide a chance to put forward Beijing's arguments. But it may also be that he is avoiding even formal contact with foreigners amid internal paranoia about espionage in communist China, or trying not to raise his own profile, fearing being seen as a rival of Chinese communist dictator Xi Jinping, which would quickly lead to his demise. So, such being speculated, um, numbers uh, holding, they've been kind of going uh, a bit up and down. Uh, getting larger now that I mention it, uh, going up in number. Um, still got a while before even reaching the final hour, so I can talk about the territorial disputes heating up while my voice lasts. Basically, at sea, India has withdrawn its troops from the Maldives Islands after a pro-communist Chinese president ordered them out. Red China and Asian India are arguing over their disputed border again after Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi made a visit to Arunachal Pradesh in northeastern India to open a mountain tunnel that will make it easier and quicker to dispatch Indian troops to the border. 
India has already reinforced its Himalayan garrison as tensions with Red China rise. Meanwhile, Red China and the Philippines are exchanging heated words after Philippine President Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos described his country as being on the front lines of a coming conflict. Harsh rhetoric has become the norm for Beijing in these simmering conflicts. And this is what brings us to, well, perhaps I should get into that next episode. Or perhaps I should dive into it this episode. Let's see our numbers. See if I can hold my voice. We've got pretty good numbers. But I really should uh, take a break and find myself some water. Or um, just continue. And um, see if my voice can last. So uh, shall I try waking up poor Aristides? Hate to bother him. Uh, You know, the poor guy works for a living. But then so do I. (laughs) This is my work, and again, I must emphasize my need for your help, your financial help, because there's nowhere else in the world you get this analysis. Uh, So understand that uh, the in-depth analysis that I provide you, well, you're, you're basically privileged. And yes, by moral standards you should pay for that privilege. So I need your contributions. We're trying to make 75 more dollars tonight. So I need a contribution of 75 United States dollars. So I do need that. Let me check my inbox, see if we've got any uh, incoming messages from uh, my PayPal accounts. And uh, by all means, we need that $75. Let's try and get that to me in the final time remaining. And uh, for those of you who hear this after the upload, that contribution is sorely needed, so provide it. Uh, Quite seriously, you won't be able to hear from me if I don't uh, pay the rent because I'll be homeless. So let's make that rent. I need to raise at the absolute minimum $320. We've already received uh, 25 United States dollars, so we can take that $20 off and say 300 bucks, 100 bucks each episode. Let's try and raise another uh, 75 to 100 dollars tonight, and uh, the it's right there on your screen. Support at PayPal.me forward slash Douglas D Dietrich. Um, let's get that going. In the interim, uh, while my voice lasts. Let's talk about the mainland China missile gap. Red China leads the world in developing, testing, and deploying hypersonic weapons, beating out the Russian empire, while these United States, having already spent 12 billion US dollars, has yet to field even one. These weapons can travel five times the speed of sound, making interception by existing defensive systems difficult at best. On Tuesday of last week, senior United States defense intelligence analyst Jeffrey McCormick told Congress that the communist Chinese empire has the world's leading hypersonic arsenal. Thanks to Beijing's two-decade-long effort, in his word, to dramatically advance its development of conventional and nuclear-armed technologies and capabilities through intense and focused investment, development, testing, and deployments. Russia's state media claims that Yemen's Houthi rebels have successfully tested a hypersonic missile in the Red Sea. Citing a military source on Thursday of the week before last, Russia's state media RIA Novosti reported that the Houthi rebels have successfully tested a hypersonic rocket in Yemen, potentially raising the stakes in the Iran-backed group's ongoing attacks on shipping in the Red Sea by orders of magnitude. Sourced Russian report states that the Houthis 
intend to begin manufacturing it for use during attacks in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, as well as against targets in Israel. Ergo, the Sino-Slavic synaxial war machine could soon overwhelm the West. Putin is squeezing every rubble he can out of the Russian state in pursuit of victory in Ukraine. Increasingly, his war-driven economy is propped up by support from the communist Chinese, with Russia fast becoming a proxy in Xi Jinping's zero-sum contest with the West. Unless this reality is effectively addressed by the Western coalition, the free world risks first losing Ukraine, then my Taiwan, and ultimately any hope of maintaining the current rules-based international order at all. Crucially, no true strategic partnership exists between Beijing and Moscow. Red China has no intention of power sharing with the victorious Putin in a future post-American-led world. But this is precisely what makes the current situation so dangerous. Backed by Beijing, protracting Putin's war of attrition in Ukraine will not only weaken Russia, it will by degrees weaken and divide the Western coalition and ease Red China's path to supremacy over a new alliance based on authoritarian cronies and client states in the global south. It seems clear that Red China is now deliberately awarding Putin massive trade surplus subsidies worth 38 billion United States dollars in 2022 to fund his pointless and reckless war in the Ukraine. Russian oil and gas tax revenues in February of 2024 at over 10 billion United States dollars were up 80% from a year before. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, meanwhile, has raised its forecast of Russian economic growth in 2024 from 1.1% to 2.6%. Putin can now afford to direct 40% of his 2024 budget or 10% of gross domestic product, on military spending. Manpower is still available, insufficient quantity to serve as expendable cannon fodder. Manufacturing tanks and shells to devastate Ukraine is not productive output in any real economic sense. But in effect, Red China is largely footing the bill. Xi Jinping's efforts to revive the communist Chinese economy have been piecemeal and ineffective. And there is no real prospect for renewed growth that does not entail massive increases in energy consumption. Beijing is accordingly quite content buying fuel from a dependent Putin. The relationship is symbiotic. The Russian Empire fires up to five times more shells at Ukrainian forces than vice versa, and is managing to produce more ammunition itself than Ukraine is receiving from its allies. Western production is falling behind, disrupted by the effects of COVID on the workforce and sourcing chains, unable to keep up with Ukraine's needs. Meanwhile, Red China colludes with the Russian Empire's highly successful efforts to circumvent Western coalition sanctions on trade materials needed in the battlefield, including some drones, missiles, sophisticated microchips, but also numerous basic components manufactured in the West, including these United States. These items, having been sold legitimately to third countries, are being trafficked into the Russian Empire across permeable customs barriers, including Kazakhstan's, despite government assurances that Western sanctions regimes are fully supported there. A Norwegian consultancy estimates sanctions circumvention as having saved Moskva eight and a half billion United States dollars in 2022. It all follows from, well, it follows from all the aforesighted, that what began as Putin's war has by degrees become Xi Jinping's. Red China has no need to risk Western sanctions by directly arming Putin's legions, solely by, by, by vicarious means. The Chinese Communist Party is turning this worsening geostrategic conflict to its unilateral advantage. Disrupting coalition efforts to defend Ukraine 
advances the most cherished aims of the leadership in Beijing, annexing my Taiwan, and hastening the end of the Western world order based on liberal values. It is high time that we assessed, frankly and honestly, the existential threat that the People's Republic of China's regime poses to global peace and prosperity. Now, Beijing's annual meeting of the China Communist Party elite pledged to pool the empire's resources into tech as per Xi's tech mantra, which is, Tech will save us. Maybe. At the Great Hall of the People last week, well, week before last by now, members of Red China's ruling party gathered to talk about how to boost innovation, particularly in disruptive and frontier technologies. You like that? That came with a 10% increase in this year's national budget for science and technology to 51.6 billion United States dollars. Now, after Beijing's bruising crackdown on the internet sector, it seems that the communist dictator Xi Jinping is looking to other segments of its vast tech industry, like chips and AI, really expert systems, or ES, for answers on how to revive growth. But it was difficult to find those answers in the Great Hall itself. The meeting this year was more muted than in times past, which appears to have been by design. Attendees in Beijing waved away questions about Premier Li Qiang's cancelled press conference or geopolitical tensions, with one telling journalists simply to study the Premier's work report. Others avoided answering because they were pressed for time. In pre-COVID years, I recall delegates being chattier and more willing to mill about the Great Hall, even if only to promulgate the party's message. After taking a break from multiple rejections for tea, served in a customized Great Hall paper cup, Sarah Jang of Bloomberg finally managed to stop a member of the Chinese political advisory body from Guangdong, who said his focus this year was on promoting new productive forces through technological innovation. But when asked about how this would help Red China deal with American curbs on chip and tech imports, he paused before mustering, I have not thought about this deeply yet. Then he quickly dashed off. A few reporters later cornered a delegate from the National People's Congress who initially tried to escape after just a few questions. The aforesighted Sarah Jang threw in a query about American tech sanctions, and he could not resist an answer about how it was a sign of Washington's, well, Washington's desire to suppress China's inexorable rise, meaning that self-sufficiency was the only path forward. Yet when the intrepid Bloomberg investigatoris followed up to ask about why Li Cheng was no longer speaking to the press, the delegate said he had nothing to say. Sarah also got a microdose of information from 360 Security Technology Incorporated Chairman Zhao Hongyi while he was exiting the hall. Walking in lockstep, he told her that Red China's AI companies had developed quickly and basically managed to catch up to OpenAI's chat GPT capabilities, but declined to comment more specifically about the AI gap between the American and Chinese empires. The party's delegates are not in an easy position. On the one hand, no one wants to say anything politically incorrect in this restrictive climate. On the other, there are, well, there are no easy answers. New productive forces may be the catchphrase of the day, but there is only so much that can be said on how those forces will be unleashed on the economy and uh, tech sectors. Red China is facing the prospect of tighter American chip export controls, higher limits on commu Chinese access to Americans' personal data, and official probes of security risks in Chicom vehicles. That could ding everything from apps like ByteDance Limited's TikTok to AI development efforts by Baidu Incorporated, and the rise of EV or electric vehicle manufacturers, well, electronic car makers, like BYD Company. The external pressure is driving money into things like the state-backed Big Fund. You like that? Big Fund. 
<laughs> which is raising more than 27 billion United States dollars for its largest chip fund yet, and eliciting riposts like mandates for staffers at state affiliated institutions to ditch their iPhones. For many commie Chinese tech companies, de risking from the American empire has become a matter of survival. In private conversations, you'll hear little confidence that relations between Beijing and Washington will ever improve, regardless of which way the United States election in November swings. That will make it harder for Chinese origin players like ByteDance, which is facing a new bill in Congress that could ban TikTok in these United States, and the now Singapore-based Shein, <laughs> Shine, S-H-E-I-N, which has hit bumps on its own path towards an American public listing. Domestically, the mood behind the Great Wall has also shifted. In the days before the pandemic, I remember crowds of journalists surrounding tech leaders like Baidu's Robin Lee and Tencent holding Limited's Pony Ma at the Great Hall. Since yesteryear, the internet moguls have mostly been replaced by chip researchers and engineers. Local residents speak of layoffs at internet companies, greater scrutiny of foreign consultancies, and disrupted visa applications to the United States. There's also pent-up frustration over how the government has steered the tech sector, including the back-and-forth last year of regulators' pronouncements on gaming curbs and cross-border data flows. And although there are growing signs of revival for the sluggish economy, weak consumption is putting the focus on discounted spending and triggering price wars in everything from EVs, the electric vehicles, to cloud computing. All this makes it understandable why the party wants to unleash new productive forces and to pool talent into tech innovation. That may be key to achieving the country's 5% gross domestic product growth target this year, a goal many economists argue may be unrealistic. How to do so effectively, however, remains an unanswered question. So, let's, uh go back to the live stream check into our numbers check into the fact that we have an hour and a half remaining check to see if Aristides ever woke up <laughs> oh my god what would he say if he did wake up imagine handing the stage over to him he'd be rubbing his eyes poor guy yes oh feel so bad for him but hey he's going to bed earlier and that's good so, let's uh, reiterate, Russia is still reeling after the worst terrorist attack in decades. And uh, basically, uh, Russia held a day of mourning throughout the day that I held my transmission after an attack at a concert venue near Moskva left at least 137 dead, including three children. ISIS has claimed responsibility for the massacre, which saw armed assailants storm the Crocus City Hall as crowds gathered to see the band Picnic. That's the name of the band. Nearly a dozen people have been detained in connection with the attack, according to authorities. Among them, four suspected gunmen have been charged with committing a terrorist act, which under the Russian criminal code is punishable by up to life imprisonment. Russia's dictator Vladimir Putin said, with no evidence, that the suspects plan to flee into Ukraine. The Ukraine has denied any connection. Also, uh, Kensington Palace thank the public for their tremendous support over the weekend after Catherine, Princess of Wales, announced Friday that she has cancer. The royal family, however, is not expected to reveal any further medical details, such as the type of cancer or what stage it is. So that kind of draws everything into a nice close circle. Um... All right. Uh, uh, do any of you want more? 
Oh, uh, I need, uh, are, are you guys ready and up for more punishment? <laughs> I need some response from uh, the chat room. Yay or nay? You've had enough? Uh, I can, I can refresh myself now with rehydration. I can, uh, prepare to go to sleep a little earlier so I can get up for a two o'clock, uh, telephone appointment tomorrow. <laughs> Some response would be nice. How about, I love you, Doug. Something like that. Uh, at any rate, uh, my love to all those who support me financially or morally, and I damn well need your financial support. Um, so whoever's listening to this, when it uploads and publishes, I need your contributions, at least 75 United States dollars from someone for this episode. So please get that to me as soon as possible. And, uh, that will go towards rent. We'll try to raise a hundred dollars more with each of the next two episodes. And, um, that will help immensely. Of course, realistically, we want to raise maybe $150 with each of the next two episodes so that I have money for the 72 hours between the time I pay rent and the time my check deposits. <laughs> is, what, what is that? Mary put in this little face that looks like it's doing a shush, like a, uh, like a whisper symbol, like, shh, be quiet. Is that what that is? Uh, anyhow, that's cute. So I'll follow that advice. Let me recover my voice. All right, Mary. Love you. She says, I'm listening while I'm beating, <laughs> but it'll be going, I'll be going to bed shortly. Sorry, I have no funds to give. That's cute. That's, well, I, I understand. No worries, Mary. Uh, look, most of the people who listen to me live in tent cities or uh, trailers or something. It's like uh, par for the course. It's uh, the sad state of affairs that we live in. Uh, she says, I'm listening, not chatting. <laughs> they, uh, such uh, being said um, so um, uh, there we are Mary and thank you for sharing that um, and uh, let, let me see if I can give her something uh, 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 you know that is uh, oh okay here we are there's a little something for her uh, alright um, at any rate um, I understand where she's coming from 100% and there you go alright um, so such being said, uh, nobody else seems to be saying anything. I'll retreat into the gentle day. Uh, I'll leave a message with everyone. Uh, and uh, I'll, uh, um, okay, uh, gives me a nice big grin. There we are. And uh, all right, from the rest of you, uh, get those contributions coming because otherwise I can't be coming back, especially considering the fact that they might cut off the affordable connectivity program. Uh, then, of course, I'll be paying through the ass for uh, the internet, which I use to talk to you on. And um, at that point, uh, we're going to have to ask for more contributions. So um, it falls increasingly on you if the government doesn't live up to its responsibilities and maintain the poor on the internet. Um, and, of course, that is something that we'll all pay a price for. That means you won't be able to hear me anymore uh, without contributions. Uh, so keep those contributions coming and, uh, I'm going to be, um, ending stream. Uh, it's going to be, um, just a few minutes before the final hour. Usually we have, uh, Peter Moon coming on to join us at that time. Uh, as he said, he might be trying to get some sleep, uh, before seeing his dentist today. And that's certainly, uh, understandable. Um, but with that, we're going to, uh, cut the cord for tonight and uh, rejoin everybody uh, on Wednesday, which will be here practically tomorrow as far as I'm concerned, or the day after. It'll feel like uh, no time has passed at all by the time we return. So um, join us then, and uh, we'll all go back to work. Uh, this being, of course, my job. And uh, remember, it's your war. You gotta fight it, but wars take funding you've also got to fund it. So I need your help. And uh, if I don't receive it, I can't be coming back because I'll be homeless, unable to make the rent. 
again, $75 for this episode. Uh, we're trying to raise 100 with each episode. We're trying to make uh, over $300 before the end of the month so I can last through to the deposit of my next check. And with that, a gentle day to all of you. We are ending stream. Oh, Mary says, have a good morning. Hope you get what you need. Thank you, honey. Uh, make certain to pray for it. Uh, prayer is a form of magic. It does help. All right. All right. We are ending stream.